112, of Asmund Grankelson. There was a man called Grankel, or Grankadil, who was a rich bond, and at this time rather advanced in age. In his youth he had been on Viking cruises, and had been a powerful fighter. For he possessed great readiness in all sorts of bodily exercises. His son Asmund was equal to his father in all these, and in some, indeed, he excelled him. There were many who said that with respect to comeliness, strength, and bodily expertness, he might be considered the third remarkably distinguished for these that Norway had ever produced. The first was Hakon Athelstan's foster son. The second, Olaf Tryggvason. Grankel invited King Olaf to a feast, which was very magnificent, and at parting Grankel presented the king with many honorable gifts and tokens of friendship. The king invited Asmund, with many persuasions, to follow him, and as Asmund could not decline the honors offered him, he got ready to travel with the king, became his man, and stood in high favor with him. The king remained in Halagaland the greater part of the summer, went to all the things, and baptized all the people. Thor Hun dwelt at that time in the island Jarki. He was the most powerful man in the north, and also became one of Olaf's lender men. Many sons of great bonds resolved also to follow King Olaf from Halagaland. Towards the end of summer King Olaf left the north, and sailed back to Thrandjum, and landed at Nidaros, where he passed the winter, A.D. 1021. It was then that Thorkel the Fosterer came from the west from Orkney, after killing Einar Rangmund, as before related. This autumn corn was dear in Thrandjum, after a long course of good seasons, and the farther north the dearer was the corn. But there was corn enough in the east country, and in the uplands, and it was of great help to the people of Thrandjum that many had old corn remaining beside them. 113. Of the Sacrifices of the Thrandjum People in autumn the news was brought to King Olaf that the Bonds had had a great feast on the first winter day's eve, at which there was a numerous attendance and much drinking. And it was told the king that all the remembrance cups to the Azus, or old gods, were blessed according to the old heathen forms. And it was added, that cattle and horses had been slain, and the altars sprinkled with their blood, and the sacrifices accompanied with the prayer that was made to obtain good seasons. It was also reported that all men saw clearly that the gods were offended at the Halagaland people turning Christian. Now when the king heard this news he sent men into the Thrandjum country, and ordered several bonds, whose names he gave, to appear before him. There was a man called Olver of Egja, so called after his farm on which he lived. He was powerful, of great family, and the head man of those who on account of the bonds appeared before the king. Now, when they came to the king, he told them these accusations. To which Olver, on behalf of the bonds, replied, that they had had no other feasts that harvest than their usual entertainments, and social meetings, and friendly drinking parties. But as to what may have been told you of the words which may have fallen from us Thrandjum people in our drinking parties, men of understanding would take good care not to use such language, but I cannot hinder drunken or foolish people's talk. Olver was a man of clever speech, and bold in what he said, and defended the bonds against such accusations. In the end, the king said the people of the interior of Thornja must themselves give the best testimony to their being in the right faith. The bonds got leave to return home, and set off as soon as they were ready. 114. Of the sacrifices by the people of the interior of the Thrandjum district. Afterwards, when winter was advanced, it was told the king that the people of the interior of Thrandjum had assembled in great number at Marin, and that there was a great sacrifice in the middle of winter. At which they sacrificed offerings for peace and a good season. Now when the king knew this on good authority to be true, he sent men and messages into the interior, and summoned the bonds whom he thought of most understanding into the town. The bonds held a council among themselves about this message. And all those who had been upon the same occasion in the beginning of winter were now very unwilling to make the journey. Olver, however, at the desire of all the bonds, allowed himself to be persuaded. When he came to the town he went immediately before the king, and they talked together. The king made the same accusation against the bonds, that they had held a midwinter sacrifice. Olver replies, that this accusation against the bonds was false. 
We had, said he, yule feasts and drinking feasts wide around in the districts. And the bonds do not prepare their feasts so sparingly, sire, that there is not much left over, which people consume long afterwards. At Marin there is a great farm, with a large house on it, and a great neighborhood all around it, and it is the great delight of the people to drink many together in company. The king said little in reply, but looked angry, as he thought he knew the truth of the matter better than it was now represented. He ordered the bonds to return home. I shall some time or other, said he, come to the truth of what you are now concealing, and in such a way that ye shall not be able to contradict it. But, however, that may be, do not try such things again. The bonds returned home, and told the result of their journey, and that the king was altogether enraged. 115. Murder of Olver of Egja. At Easter, A.D. 1021, the king held a feast, to which he had invited many of the townspeople as well as bonds. After Easter he ordered his ships to be launched into the water, oars and tackle to be put on board, decks to be laid in the ships, and tilts, one, and rigging to be set up, and to be laid ready for sea at the piers. Immediately after Easter he sent men into Veridal. There was a man called Thorold, who was the king's bailiff, and who managed the king's farm there at Haug, and to him the king sent a message to come to him as quickly as possible. Thorold did not decline the journey, but went immediately to the town with the messenger. The king called him in and in a private conversation asked him what truth there was in what had been told him of the principles and living of the people of the interior of Thrandjum. And if it really was so that they practiced sacrifices to heathen gods. I will, says the king, that thou declare to me the things as they are, and as thou knowest to be true, for it is thy duty to tell me the truth, as thou art my man. Thorold replies, Sire, I will first tell you that I have brought here to the town my two children, my wife, and all my loose property that I could take with me, and if thou desirest to know the truth it shall be told according to thy command. But if I declare it, thou must take care of me and mine. The king replies, Say only what is true on what I ask thee, and I will take care that no evil befall thee. Then said Thorold, If I must say the truth, king, as it is, I must declare that in the interior of the Thrandjum land almost all the people are heathen in faith, although some of them are baptized. It is their custom to offer sacrifice in autumn for a good winter, a second at midwinter, and a third in summer. In this the people of Ina, Sparby, Veridal, and Skon partake. There are twelve men who preside over these sacrifice feasts. And in spring it is Olver who has to get the feast in order, and he is now busy transporting to Marin everything needful for it. Now when the king had got to the truth with a certainty, he ordered the signal to be sounded for his men to assemble, and for the men-at-arms to go on board ship. He appointed men to steer the ships, and leaders for the people, and ordered how the people should be divided among the vessels. All was got ready in haste, and with five ships and three hundred men he steered up the fjord. The wind was favorable, the ships sailed briskly before it, and nobody could have thought that the king would be so soon there. The king came in the night time to Marin, and immediately surrounded the house with a ring of armed men. Olver was taken, and the king ordered him to be put to death, and many other men besides. Then the king took all the provision for the feast, and had it brought to his ships. And also all the goods, both furniture, clothes, and valuables, which the people had brought there, and divided the booty among his men. The king also let all the bonds he thought had the greatest part in the business be plundered by his men at arms. Some were taken prisoners and laid in irons, some ran away, and many were robbed of their goods. Thereafter the bonds were summoned to a thing. But because he had taken many powerful men prisoners, and held them in his power, their friends and relations resolved to promise obedience to the king, so that there was no insurrection against the king on this occasion. He thus brought the whole people back to the right faith, gave them teachers, and built and consecrated churches. The king let Olver lie without fine paid for his bloodshed, and all that he possessed was a judge to the king. And of the men he judged the most guilty, some he ordered to be executed, some he maimed, some he drove out of the country, and took fines from others. The king then returned to Nidaros. End notes. 1. The ships appear to have been decked fore and aft only. 
and in the middle, where the rowers sat, to have had tilts or tents set up at night to sleep under. L. 116, of the sons of Arn. There was a man called Arn Arnmodson, who was married to Thora, Thorstein Galch's daughter. Their children were Calf, Finn, Thorberg, Amund, Kolbjorn, Arnjorn, and Arn. Their daughter, who was called Ragenhild, was married to Herek of Thjada. Arn was a lenderman, powerful, and of ability, and a great friend of King Olaf. At that time his sons Calf and Finn were with the king, and in great favor. The wife whom Olver of Egja had left was young and handsome, of great family, and rich, so that he who got her might be considered to have made an excellent marriage, and her land was in the gift of the king. She and Olver had two sons, who were still in infancy. Calf Arneson begged of the king that he would give him to wife the widow of Olver, and out of friendship the king agreed to it, and with her he got all the property Olver had possessed. The king at the same time made him his lenderman, and gave him an office in the interior of the Thrangem country. Calf became a great chief, and was a man of very great understanding. 117 King Olaf's Journey to the Uplands when King Olaf had been seven years, A.D. 1015-1021, in Norway the earls Thorfinn and Bruce came to him, as before related, in the summer, from Orkney, and he became master of their land. The same summer Olaf went to north and south more, and in autumn to Romsdal. He left his ships there, and came to the uplands, and to Lesjar. Here he laid hold of all the best men, and forced them, both at Lesjar and Davra, either to receive Christianity or suffer death, if they were not so lucky as to escape. After they received Christianity, the king took their sons in his hands as hostages for their fidelity. The king stayed several nights at a farm in Lesjar called Bor, where he placed priests. Then he proceeded over Orcadal and Lorodal, and came down from the uplands at a place called Staffabreca. There a river runs along the valley, called the Ada, and a beautiful hamlet, by name Lore, lies on both sides of the river, and the king could see far down over the whole neighborhood. A pity it is, said the king, so beautiful a hamlet should be burnt. And he proceeded down the valley with his people, and was all night on a farm called Ness. The king took his lodging in a loft, where he slept himself. And it stands to the present day, without anything in it having been altered since. The king was five days there, and summoned by message token the people to a thing, both for the districts of Vagar, Lear, and Hedel. And gave out the message along with the token, that they must either receive Christianity and give their sons as hostages, or see their habitations burnt. They came before the king, and submitted to his pleasure, but some fled south down the valley. 118 The Story of Dale Gudbrand There was a man called Dale Gudbrand, who was like a king in the valley, Gudbrandstall, but was only hearse in title. Sigvat the Skald compared him for wealth and landed property to Erling Skjalgsen. Sigvat sang thus concerning Erling. I know but one who can compare. With Erling for broad lands and gear. Gudbrand is he, whose wide domains. Are most like where some small king reigns. These two great bonds, I would say equal each other every way. He lies who says that he can find. One by the other left behind. Gudbrand had a son, who is here spoken of. Now when Gudbrand received the tidings that King Olaf was come to Lear, and obliged people to accept Christianity, he sent out a message token, and summoned all the men in the valley to meet him at a farm called Hunthorpe. All came, so that the number could not be told, for there is a lake in the neighborhood called Laugen, so that people could come to the place both by land and by water. There Gudbrand held a thing with them, and said, A man is come to Lore who is called Olaf, and will force upon us another faith than what we had before, and will break in pieces all our gods. He says that he has a much greater and more powerful god, and it is wonderful that the earth does not burst asunder under him, or that our god lets him go about unpunished when he dares to talk such things. I know this for certain, that if we carry Thor, who has always stood by us, out of our temple that is standing upon this farm, Olaf's god will melt away, and he and his men be made nothing so soon as Thor looks upon them. 
Then the bonds all shouted as one person that Olaf should never get away with life if he came to them, and they thought he would never dare to come farther south through the valley. They chose out seven hundred men to go northwards to Breda, to watch his movements. The leader of this band was Gudbrand's son, eighteen years of age, and with him were many other men of importance. When they came to a farm called Hof they heard of the king. And they remained three nights there. People streamed to them from all parts, from Lesjar, Lor, and Vagar, who did not wish to receive Christianity. The king and bishop Sigurd fixed teachers in Loth and in Vagar. From thence they went round Vagarost, and came down into the valley at Sil, where they stayed all night, and heard the news that a great force of men were assembled against them. The bonds who were in Breda heard also of the king's arrival, and prepared for battle. As soon as the king arose in the morning he put on his armour, and went southwards over the Sil plains, and did not halt until he came to Breda, where he saw a great army ready for battle. Then the king drew up his troops, rode himself at the head of them, and began a speech to the bonds, in which he invited them to adopt Christianity. They replied, We shall give thee something else to do today than to be mocking us. And raised a general shout, striking also upon their shields with their weapons. Then the king's men ran forward and threw their spears, but the bonds turned round instantly and fled, so that only few men remained behind. Gudbrand's son was taken prisoner, but the king gave him his life, and took him with him. The king was four days here. Then the king said to Gudbrand's son, Go home now to thy father, and tell him I expect to be with him soon. He went accordingly, and told his father the news, that they had fallen in with the king, and fought with him, but that their whole army, in the very beginning, took flight. I was taken prisoner, said he, but the king gave me my life and liberty, and told me to say to thee that he will soon be here. And now we have not two hundred men of the force we raised against him. Therefore I advise thee, father, not to give battle to that man. Says Gudbrand, it is easy to see that all courage has left thee, and it was an unlucky hour ye went out to the field. Thy proceeding will live long in the remembrance of people, and I see that thy fastening thy faith on the folly that man is going about with has brought upon thee and thy men so great a disgrace. But the night after, Gudbrand dreamt that there came to him a man surrounded by light, who brought great terror with him, and said to him, Thy son made no glorious expedition against King Olaf. But still less honour wilt thou gather for thyself by holding a battle with him. Thou with all thy people wilt fall, wolves will drag thee, and all thine, away, ravens will tear thee in stripes. At this dreadful vision he was much afraid, and tells it to Thord Istermich, who was chief over the valley. He replies, The very same vision came to me. In the morning they ordered the signal to sound for a thing, and said that it appeared to them advisable to hold a thing with the man who had come from the north with this new teaching, to know if there was any truth in it. Gudbrand then said to his son, Go thou, and twelve men with thee, to the king who gave thee thy life. He went straightway, and found the king, and laid before him their errand. Namely, that the bonds would hold a thing with him, and make a truce between them and him. The king was content, and they bound themselves by faith and law mutually to hold the peace so long as the thing lasted. After this was settled the men returned to Gudbrand and Thord, and told them there was made a firm agreement for a truce. The king, after the battle with the son of Gudbrand, had proceeded to Lid's Tad, and remained there for five days, afterwards he went out to meet the bonds, and hold a thing with them. On that day there fell a heavy rain. When the thing was seated, the king stood up and said that the people in Lesjar, Loaf, and Vagar had received Christianity, broken down their houses of sacrifice, and believed now in the true God who had made heaven and earth and knows all things. Thereupon the king sat down, and Gudbrand replies, We know nothing of him whom thou speakest about. Dost thou call him God, whom neither thou nor any one else can see? But we have a God who call be seen every day, although he is not out today, because the weather is wet, and he will appear to thee terrible and very grand, and I expect that fear will mix with your very blood when he comes into the thing. But since thou sayest thy God is so great, let him make it so that tomorrow we have a cloudy day but without rain, and then let us meet again. The king accordingly returned home to his lodging, 
taking Gudbrand's son as a hostage. But he gave them a man as hostage in exchange. In the evening the king asked Gudbrand's son what like their god was. He replied, that he bore the likeness of Thor, had a hammer in his hand, was of great size, but hollow within. And had a high stand, upon which he stood when he was out. Neither gold nor silver are wanting about him, and every day he receives four cakes of bread, besides meat. They then went to bed, but the king watched all night in prayer. When day dawned the king went to mass, then to table, and from thence to the thing. The weather was such as Gudbrand desired. Now the bishop stood up in his choir robes, with bishop's coif upon his head, and bishop's staff in his hands. He spoke to the bonds of the true faith, told the many wonderful acts of God, and concluded his speech well. Thord Istermich replies, Many things we are told of by this horned man with the staff in his hand crooked at the top like a ram's horn. But since ye say, comrades, that your God is so powerful, and can do so many wonders, tell him to make it clear sunshine tomorrow forenoon, and then we shall meet here again, and do one of two things, either agree with you about this business. Or fight you. And they separated for the day. 119, Dale Gudbrand is baptized. There was a man with King Olaf called Colby and Sturk, the Strong, who came from a family in the Fjord district. Usually he was so equipped that he was girt with a sword, and besides carried a great stake, otherwise called a club, in his hands. The king told Colby and to stand nearest to him in the morning. And gave orders to his people to go down in the night to where the ships of the bonds lay and bore holes in them, and to set loose their horses on the farms where they were, all which was done. Now the king was in prayer all the night, beseeching God of his goodness and mercy to release him from evil. When mass was ended, and morning was grey, the king went to the thing. When he came there some bonds had already arrived, and they saw a great crowd coming along, and bearing among them a huge man's image glancing with gold and silver. When the bonds who were at the thing saw it they started up, and bowed themselves down before the ugly idol. Thereupon it was set down upon the thing field, and on the one side of it sat the bonds, and on the other the king and his people. Then Dale Gudbrand stood up, and said, Where now, king, is thy God? I think he will now carry his head lower, and neither thou, nor the man with the horn whom ye call bishop, and sits there beside thee, are so bold today as on the former days. For now our God, who rules over all, is come, and looks on you with an angry eye, and now I see well enough that ye are terrified, and scarcely dare to raise your eyes. Throw away now all your opposition, and believe in the God who has all your fate in his hands. The king now whispers to Colby and Sturk, without the bonds perceiving it, if it comes so in the course of my speech that the bonds look another way than towards their idol, strike him as hard as thou canst with thy club. The king then stood up and spoke. Much hast thou talked to us this morning, and greatly hast thou wondered that thou canst not see our God, but we expect that he will soon come to us. Thou wouldst frighten us with thy God, who is both blind and deaf, and can neither save himself nor others, and cannot even move about without being carried. But now I expect it will be but a short time before he meets his fate, for turn your eyes towards the east, behold our God advancing in great light. The sun was rising, and all turned to look. At that moment Colbian gave their god a stroke, so that the idol burst asunder, and there ran out of it mice as big almost as cats, and reptiles, and adders. The bonds were so terrified that some fled to their ships. But when they sprang out upon them they filled with water, and could not get away. Others ran to their horses, but could not find them. The king then ordered the bonds to be called together, saying he wanted to speak with them. On which the bonds came back, and the thing was again seated. The king rose up and said, I do not understand what your noise and running mean. Ye see yourselves what your God can do, the idol ye adorned with gold and silver, and brought meat and provisions to. Ye see now that the protecting powers who used it were the mice and adders, reptiles and paddocks. And they do ill who trust to such, and will not abandon this folly. Take now your gold and ornaments that are lying strewed about on the grass, and give them to your wives and daughters, but never hang them hereafter upon stock or stone. 
Here are now two conditions between us to choose upon, either accept Christianity, or fight this very day, and the victory be to them to whom the God we worship gives it. Then Dale Gudbrand stood up and said, We have sustained great damage upon our God, but since he will not help us, we will believe in the God thou believest in. Then all received Christianity. The bishop baptized Gudbrand and his son. King Olaf and Bishop Sigurd left behind them teachers, and they who met as enemies parted as friends, and Gudbrand built a church in the valley. 120. Hedmark baptized. King Olaf proceeded from thence to Hedmark, and baptized there. But as he had formerly carried away their kings as prisoners, he did not venture himself, after such a deed, to go far into the country with few people at that time, but a small part of Hedmark was baptized. But the king did not desist from his expedition before he had introduced Christianity over all Hedmark, consecrated churches, and placed teachers. He then went to Hadeland and though ten, improving the customs of the people, and persisting until all the country was baptized. He then went to Ringerijk, where also all people went over to Christianity. The people of Romerijk then heard that Olaf intended coming to them, and they gathered a great force. They said among themselves that the journey Olaf had made among them the last time was not to be forgotten, and he should never proceed so again. The king, notwithstanding, prepared for the journey. Now when the king went up into Romerike with his forces, the multitude of bonds came against him at a river called Nitja. And the bonds had a strong army, and began the battle as soon as they met, but they soon fell short, and took to flight. They were forced by this battle into a better disposition, and immediately received Christianity. And the king scoured the whole district, and did not leave it until all the people were made Christians. He then went east to Solis, and baptized that neighborhood. The scald Otter Black came to him there, and begged to be received among his men. Olaf the Swedish king had died the winter before, A.D. 1021, and Anand, the son of Olaf, was now the sole king over all Sweden. King Olaf returned, when the winter, A.D. 1022, was far advanced, to Romerike. There he assembled a numerous thing, at a place where the Eidsvold things have since been held. He made a law, that the upland people should resort to this thing, and that Eidsvold laws should be good through all the districts of the uplands, and wide around in other quarters, which also has taken place. As spring was advancing, he rigged his ships, and went by sea to Tunsberg. He remained there during the spring, and the time the town was most frequented, and goods from other countries were brought to the town for sale. There had been a good year in Viken, and tolerable as far north as Stad, but it was a very dear time in all the country north of there. 121. Reconciliation of the King and Einar. In spring, A.D. 1022, King Olaf sent a message west to Agder, and north all the way to Hordaland and Rogaland, prohibiting the exporting or selling of corn, malt, or meal, adding, that he, as usual, would come there with his people in guest quarters. The message went round all the districts, but the king remained in Viken all summer, and went east to the boundary of the country. Einar Tambaskelfer had been with the Swedish king Olaf since the death of his relation Earl Sven, and had, as the Kag's man, received great fiefs from him. Now that the king was dead, Einar had a great desire to come into friendship agreement with Olaf, and the same spring messages passed between them about it. While the king was lying in the Gott River, Einar Tambaskelfer came there with some men. And after treating about an agreement, it was settled that Einar should go north to Thrandjum, and there take possession of all the lands and property which Bergliot had received in dower. Thereupon Einar took his way north. But the king remained behind in Viken, and remained long in Sarpsborg in autumn, A.D. 1022, and during the first part of winter. 122 Reconciliation of the King and Erling. Erling Skjogsen held his dominion so, that all north from Son Lake, and east to the Nays, the bonds stood under him. And although he had much smaller royal fiefs than formerly, still so great a dread of him prevailed that nobody dared to do anything against his will, so that the king thought his power too great. There was a man called a slack Fidiusgal, who was powerful and of high birth. Erling's father Skjalg, and Aslak's father Askel, were brothers' sons. 
Aslak was a great friend of King Olaf, and the king settled him in South Hordaland, where he gave him a great fief, and great income, and ordered him in no respect to give way to Erling. But this came to nothing when the king was not in the neighborhood, for then Erling would reign as he used to do, and was not more humble because a slack would thrust himself forward as his equal. At last the strife went so far that a slack could not keep his place, but hastened to King Olaf, and told him the circumstances between him and Erling. The king told a slack to remain with him until he should meet Erling and sent a message to Erling that he should come to him in spring at Tunsberg. When they all arrived there they held a meeting at which the king said to him, It is told me concerning thy government, Erling, that no man from Son Lake to the Nays can enjoy his freedom for thee. Although there are many men there who consider themselves born to Udal rights, and have their privileges like others born as they are. Now, here is your relation a slack, who appears to have suffered great inconvenience from your conduct. And I do not know whether he himself is in fault, or whether he suffers because I have placed him to defend what is mine. And although I name him, there are many others who have brought the same complaint before us, both among those who are placed in office in our districts, and among the bailiffs who have our farms to manage. And are obliged to entertain me and my people. Erling replies to this, I will answer at once. I deny altogether that I have ever injured a slack, or anyone else, for being in your service. But this I will not deny, that it is now, as it has long been, that each of us relations will willingly be greater than the other, and, moreover, I freely acknowledge that I am ready to bow my neck to thee, King Olaf. But it is more difficult for me to stoop before one who is of slave descent in all his generation, although he is now your bailiff, or before others who are but equal to him in descent, although you bestow honours on them. Now the friends of both interfered, and entreated that they would be reconciled, saying, that the king never could have such powerful aid as from Erling, if he was your friend entirely. On the other hand, they represent to Erling that he should give up to the king, for if he was in friendship with the king, it would be easy to do with all the others what he pleased. The meeting accordingly ended so that Erling should retain the fiefs he formerly had, and every complaint the king had against Erling should be dropped, but Skjalg, Erling's son, should come to the king, and remain in his power. Then Aslak returned to his dominions, and the two were in some sort reconciled. Erling returned home also to his domains, and followed his own way of ruling them. 123, here begins the story of Asbjorn Selsbane. There was a man named Sigurd Thorison, a brother of Thor Hund of Jarki Island. Sigurd was married to Sigurd Skjalg's daughter, a sister of Erling. Their son, called Asbjorn, became as he grew up a very able man. Sigurd dwelt at OMD in Thrandarns, and was a very rich and respected man. He had not gone into the king's service, and Thorar in so far had attained higher dignity than his brother, that he was the king's lenderman. But at home, on his farm, Sigurd stood in no respect behind his brother in splendor and magnificence. As long as heathenism prevailed, Sigurd usually had three sacrifices every year, one on winter night's eve, one on midwinter's eve, and the third in summer. Although he had adopted Christianity, he continued the same custom with his feasts, he had, namely, a great friendly entertainment at harvest time, a Yule feast in winter, to which he invited many. The third feast he had about Easter, to which also he invited many guests. He continued this fashion as long as he lived. Sigurd died on a bed of sickness when Asbjorn was eighteen years old. He was the only heir of his father, and he followed his father's custom of holding three festivals every year. Soon after Asbjorn came to his heritage the course of seasons began to grow worse, and the corn harvests of the people to fail. But Asbjorn held his usual feasts, and helped himself by having old corn, and an old provision laid up of all that was useful. But when one year had passed and another came, and the crops were no better than the year before, Sigrid wished that some if not all of the feasts should be given up. That Asbjorn would not consent to, but went round in harvest among his friends, buying corn where he could get it, and some he received in presents. He thus kept his feasts this winter also. But the spring after people got but little seed into the ground, for they had to buy the seed corn. Then Sigurd spoke of diminishing the number of their house servants. 
that asked Joan would not consent to, but held by the old fashion of the house in all things. In summer, A.D. 1022, it appeared again that there would be a bad year for corn. And to this came the report from the south that King Olaf prohibited all export of corn, malt, or meal from the southern to the northern parts of the country. Then Asbjorn perceived that it would be difficult to procure what was necessary for a housekeeping, and resolved to put into the water a vessel for carrying goods which he had, and which was large enough to go to sea with. The ship was good, all that belonged to her was of the best, and in the sails were stripes of cloth of various colors. Asbjorn made himself ready for a voyage, and put to sea with twenty men. They sailed from the north in summer. And nothing is told of their voyage until one day, about the time the days begin to shorten, they came to Karnsund, and landed at Ogvaldsens. Up in the island Karnt there is a large farm, not far from the sea, and a large house upon it called Ogvaldsens, which was a king's house, with an excellent farm, which Thorosel, who was the king's bailiff, had under his management. Thor was a man of low birth, but had swung himself up in the world as an active man, and he was polite in speech, showy in clothes, and fond of distinction, and not apt to give way to others, in which he was supported by the favor of the king. He was besides quick in speech, straightforward, and free in conversation. As Bjorn, with his company, brought up there for the night. And in the morning, when it was light, Thor went down to the vessel with some men, and inquired who commanded the splendid ship. Asbjorn named his own and his father's name. Thor asks where the voyage was intended for, and what was the errand. Asbjorn replies, that he wanted to buy corn and malt, saying, as was true, that it was a very dear time north in the country. But we are told that here the seasons are good, and wilt thou, farmer, sell us corn? I see that here are great corn stacks, and it would be very convenient if we had not to travel farther. Thor replies, I will give thee the information that thou needst not go farther to buy corn, or travel about here in Rogaland. For I can tell thee that thou must turn about, and not travel farther, for the king forbids carrying corn out of this to the north of the country. Sail back again, Haligalander, for that will be thy safest course. Asbjorn replies, If it be so, Bond, as thou sayest, that we can get no corn here to buy, I will, notwithstanding, go forward upon my errand, and visit my family in Seoul, and see my relation Erling's habitation. Thor, how near is thy relationship to Erling? Ask Jorn, my mother is his sister. Thor, it may be that I have spoken heedlessly, if so be that thou art sister's son of Erling. Thereupon Ask Jorn and his crew struck their tents, and turned the ship to sea. Thor called after them. A good voyage, and come here again on your way back. Asbjorn promised to do so, sailed away, and came in the evening to Juddar. Asbjorn went on shore with ten men, the other ten men watched the ship. When Asbjorn came to the house he was very well received, and Erling was very glad to see him, placed him beside himself, and asked him all the news in the north of the country. Asbjorn concealed nothing of his business from him, and Erling said it happened unfortunately that the king had just forbid the sale of corn. And I know no man here. Says he, who has courage to break the king's order, and I find it difficult to keep well with the king, so many are trying to break our friendship. Asbjorn replies, it is late before we learn the truth. In my childhood I was taught that my mother was freeborn throughout her whole descent, and that Erling of Seoul was her boldest relation. And now I hear thee say that thou hast not the freedom, for the king's slaves here in Jeddar, to do with thy own corn what thou pleasest. Erling looked at him, smiled through his teeth, and said, Ye Haligalanders know less of the king's power than we do here, but a bold man thou mayst be at home in thy conversation. Let us now drink, my friend, and we shall see tomorrow what can be done in thy business. They did so, and were very merry all the evening. The following day Erling and Asbjorn talked over the matter again, and Erling said. I have found out a way for you to purchase corn, Asbjorn. It is the same thing to you whoever is the seller. He answered that he did not care of whom he bought the corn, if he got a good right to his purchase. Erling said. 
It appears to me probable that my slaves have quite as much corn as you require to buy, and they are not subject to law, or land regulation, like other men. Aspjorn agreed to the proposal. The slaves were now spoken to about the purchase, and they brought forward corn and malt, which they sold to Aspjorn, so that he loaded his vessel with what he wanted. When he was ready for sea Erling followed him on the road, made him presents of friendship, and they took a kind farewell of each other. Aspjorn got a good breeze, landed in the evening at Karmsund, near to Ogvaldsens, and remained there for the night. Thor Ursel had heard of Aspjorn's voyage, and also that his vessel was deeply laden. Thor summoned people to him in the night, so that before daylight he had sixty men, and with these he went against Aspjorn as soon as it was light, and went out to the ship just as Aspjorn and his men were putting on their clothes. Aspjorn saluted Thor, and Thor asked what kind of goods Aspjorn had in the vessel. He replied, corn and malt. Thor said, then Erling is doing as he usually does, and despising the king's orders, and is unwearied in opposing him in all things, insomuch that it is wonderful the king suffers it. Thor went on scolding in this way, and when he was silent Aspjorn said that Erling's slaves had owned the corn. Thor replied hastily, that he did not regard Erling's tricks. And now, Aspjorn, there is no help for it. Ye must either go on shore, or we will throw you overboard, for we will not be troubled with you while we are discharging the cargo. Aspjorn saw that he had not men enough to resist Thor. Therefore he and his people landed, and Thor took the whole cargo out of the vessel. When the vessel was discharged Thor went through the ship, and observed. Ye Haligalanders have good sails, take the old sail of our vessel and give it them. It is good enough for those who are sailing in a light vessel. Thus the sails were exchanged. When this was done Aspjorn and his comrades sailed away north along the coast, and did not stop until they reached home early in Wider. This expedition was talked of far and wide, and Aspjorn had no trouble that winter in making feasts at home. Thor Hund invited Aspjorn and his mother, and also all whom they pleased to take along with him, to a Yule feast. But Aspjorn sat at home, and would not travel, and it was to be seen that Thor thought Aspjorn despised his invitation, since he would not come. Thor scoffed much at Aspjorn's voyage. Now, said he, it is evident that Aspjorn makes a great difference in his respect towards his relations. For in summer he took the greatest trouble to visit his relation Erling in Jeddar, and now will not take the trouble to come to me in the next house. I don't know if he thinks there may be a Thor or Sel in his way upon every home. Such words, and the like sarcasms, Aspjorn heard of, and very ill satisfied he was with his voyage, which had thus made him a laughing stock to the country, and he remained at home all winter, and went to no feasts. 124. Murder of Thor or Sel. Aspjorn had a long ship standing in the Naust, ship sheet, and it was a sneck, cutter, of twenty benches. And after Candlemas, February 2, 1023, he had the vessel put in the water, brought out all his furniture, and rigged her out. He then summoned to him his friends and people, so that he had nearly ninety men all well armed. When he was ready for sea, and got a wind, he sailed south along the coast, but as the wind did not suit, they advanced but slowly. When they came farther south they steered outside the rocks, without the usual ship's channel, keeping to sea as much as it was possible to do so. Nothing is related of his voyage before the fifth day of Easter, April 18, 1023, when, about evening, they came on the outside of Karmt Island. This island is so shaped that it is very long, but not broad at its widest part. And without it lies the usual ship's channel. It is thickly inhabited but where the island is exposed to the ocean great tracts of it are uncultivated. Aspjorn and his men landed at a place in the island that was uninhabited. After they had set up their ship tents Aspjorn said, Now ye must remain here and wait for me. I will go on land in the isle, and spy what news there may be which we know nothing of. Aspjorn had on mean clothes, a broad-brimmed hat, a fork in his hand, but had girt on his sword under his clothes. He went up to the land, and in through the island. And when he came upon a hillock, from which he could see the house on Ogvaldsens, and on as far as Karmsund, 
he saw people in all quarters flocking together by land and by sea, and all going up to the house of Ogvaldsons. This seemed to him extraordinary, and therefore he went up quietly to a house close by, in which servants were cooking meat. From their conversation he discovered immediately that the King Olaf had come there to a feast, and that he had just sat down to table. Asbjorn turned then to the feasting room, and when he came into the anteroom one was going in and another coming out, but nobody took notice of him. The hall door was open, and he saw that Thorer's cell stood before the table of the high seat. It was getting late in the evening, and Asbjorn heard people ask Thorer what had taken place between him and Asbjorn, and Thorer had a long story about it, in which he evidently departed from the truth. Among other things he heard a man say, How did Asbjorn behave when you discharged his vessel? Thora replied, When we were taking out the cargo he bore it tolerably, but not well, and when we took the sail from him he wept. When Asbjorn heard this he suddenly drew his sword, rushed into the hall, and cut at Thor. The stroke took him in the neck, so that the head fell upon the table before the king, and the body at his feet, and the tablecloth was soiled with blood from top to bottom. The king ordered him to be seized and taken out. This was done. They laid hands on Asbjorn, and took him from the hall. The table furniture and tablecloths were removed, and also Thor's corpse, and all the blood wiped up. The king was enraged to the highest. But remained quiet in speech, as he always was when in anger. 125, of Skjalg, the son of Erling Skjalgson. Skjalg Erlingson stood up, went before the king, and said, Now may it go, as it often does, that every case will admit of alleviation. I will pay thee the mulct for the bloodshed on account of this man, so that he may retain life and limbs. All the rest determine and do, king, according to thy pleasure. The king replies, Is it not a matter of death, Skjalg, that a man break the Easter peace, and in the next place that he kills a man in the king's lodging? And in the third that he makes my feet his execution block, although that may appear a small matter to thee and thy father? Skjalg replies, It is ill done, king, in as far as it displeases thee, but the deed is, otherwise, done excellently well. But if the deed appear to thee so important, and be so contrary to thy will, yet may I expect something for my services from thee, and certainly there are many who will say that thou didst well. The king replies, Although thou hast made me greatly indebted to thee, Skjalg, for thy services, yet I will not for thy sake break the law or cast away my own dignity. Then Skjalg turned round, and went out of the hall. Twelve men who had come with Skjalg all followed him, and many others went out with him. Skjalg said to Thor and Nefjolfsson, If thou wilt have me for a friend, take care that this man be not killed before Sunday. Thereupon Skjalg and his men set off, took a rowing boat which he had, and rowed south as fast as they could, and came to Juddar with the first glimpse of morning. They went up instantly to the house, and to the loft in which Erling slept. Skjalg rushed so hard against the door that it burst asunder at the nails. Erling and the others who were within started up. He was in one spring upon his legs, grasped his shield and sword, and rushed to the door, demanding who was there. Skjalg named himself, and begs him to open the door. Erling replies, It was most likely to be thee who hast behaved so foolishly, or is there any one who is pursuing thee? Thereupon the door was unlocked. Then said Skjalg, Although it appears to thee that I am so hasty, I suppose our relation Asbjorn will not think my proceedings too quick. For he sits in chains there in the north at Ogvaldsens, and it would be but manly to hasten back and stand by him. The father and son then had a conversation together, and Skjalg related the whole circumstances of Thororsel's murder. 126. Of Thorin Nefjolfsson. King Olaf took his seat again when everything in the hall was put in order, and was enraged beyond measure. He asked how it was with the murderer. He was answered, that he was sitting out upon the doorstep under guard. The king says, why is he not put to death? Thorin Nefjolfsson replies, sire, would you not call it murder to kill a man in the night time? The king answers, put him in irons then, and kill him in the morning. Then Asbjorn was laid in chains, and locked up in a house for the night. 
The day after the king heard the morning mass, and then went to the thing, where he sat till high mass. As he was going to mass he said to Thorin, Is not the sun high enough now in the heavens that your friend Askjorn may be hanged? Thorin bowed before the king, and said, Sire, it was said by Bishop Sigurd on Friday last, that the king who has all things in his power had to endure great temptation of spirit. And blessed is he who rather imitates him, than those who condemned the man to death, or those who caused his slaughter. It is not long till tomorrow, and that is a working day. The king looked at him, and said, Thou must take care then that he is not put to death today, but take him under thy charge, and know for certain that thy own life shall answer for it if he escape in any way. Then the king went away. Thorin went also to where Espjorn lay in irons, took off his chains, and brought him to a small room, where he had meat and drink set before him, and told him what the king had determined in case Askjorn ran away. Askjorn replies, that Thorin need not be afraid of him. Thorin sat a long while with him during the day, and slept there all night. On Saturday the king arose and went to the early mass, and from thence he went to the thing, where a great many bonds were assembled, who had many complaints to be determined. The king sat there long in the day, and it was late before the people went to high mass. Thereafter the king went to table. When he had got meat he sat drinking for a while, so that the tables were not removed. Thorin went out to the priest who had the church under his care, and gave him two marks of silver to ring in the Sabbath as soon as the king's table was taken away. When the king had drunk as much as he wished the tables were removed. Then said the king, that it was now time for the slaves to go to the murderer and put him to death. In the same moment the bell rang in the Sabbath. Then Thorin went before the king, and said, The Sabbath peace this man must have, although he has done evil. The king said, Do thou take care, Thorin, that he do not escape. The king then went to the church, and attended the Vesper service, and Thorin sat the whole day with Espjorn. On Sunday the bishop visited Espjorn, confessed him, and gave him orders to hear high mass. Thorin then went to the king, and asked him to appoint men to guard the murderer. I will now, he said, be free of this charge. The king thanked him for his care, and ordered men to watch over Askjorn, who was again laid in chains. When the people went to high mass Askjorn was led to the church, and he stood outside of the church with his guard, but the king and all the people stood in the church at mass. 127. Erling's Reconciliation with King Olaf Now we must again take up our story where we left it, that Erling and his son Skjalg held a council on this affair, and according to the resolution of Erling, and of Skjalg and his other sons. It was determined to assemble a force and send out message tokens. A great multitude of people accordingly came together. They got ready with all speed, rigged their ships, and when they reckoned upon their force they found they had nearly 1,500 men. With this war force they set off, and came on Sunday to Ogvaldsens on Karmt Island. They went straight up to the house with all the men, and arrived just as the scripture lesson was read. They went directly to the church, took Aspjorn, and broke off his chains. At the tumult and clash of arms all who were outside of the church ran into it. But they who were in the church looked all towards them, except the king, who stood still, without looking around him. Erling and his sons drew up their men on each side of the path which led from the church to the hall, and Erling with his sons stood next to the hall. When high mass was finished the king went immediately out of the church, and first went through the open space between the ranks drawn up, and then his retinue, man by man. And as he came to the door Erling placed himself before the door, bowed to the king, and saluted him. The king saluted him in return, and prayed God to help him. Erling took up the word first, and said, My relation, asked Jorn, it is reported to me, has been guilty of misdemeanor, king, and it is a great one, if he has done anything that incurs your displeasure. Now I am come to entreat for him peace, and such penalties as you yourself may determine, but that thereby he redeem life and limb, and his remaining here in his native land. The king replies, It appears to me, Erling, that thou thinkest the case of Eskjorn is now in thy own power, and I do not therefore know why thou speakest now as if thou wouldst offer terms for him. 
I think thou hast drawn together these forces because thou art determined to settle what is between us. Erling replies, Thou only, king, shalt determine, and determine so that we shall be reconciled. The king, thinkest thou, Erling, to make me afraid? And art thou come here in such force with that expectation? No, that shall not be, and if that be thy thought, I must in no way turn and fly. Erling replies, Thou hast no occasion to remind me how often I have come to meet thee with fewer men than thou hadst. But now I shall not conceal what lies in my mind, namely, that it is my will that we now enter into a reconciliation. For otherwise I expect we shall never meet again. Erling was then as red as blood in the face. Now Bishop Sigurd came forward to the king and said, Sire, I entreat you on God Almighty's account to be reconciled with Erling according to his offer, that the man shall retain life and limb. But that thou shalt determine according to thy pleasure all the other conditions. The king replies, You will determine. Then said the bishop, Erling, do thou give security for Espjorn, such as the king thinks sufficient, and then leave the conditions to the mercy of the king, and leave all in his power. Erling gave a surety to the king on his part, which he accepted. Thereupon Aspjorn received his life and safety, and delivered himself into the king's power, and kissed his hand. Erling then withdrew with his forces, without exchanging salutation with the king, and the king went into the hall, followed by Aspjorn. The king thereafter made known the terms of reconciliation to be these, in the first place, Aspjorn, thou must submit to the law of the land, which commands that the man who kills a servant of the king must undertake his service, if the king will. Now I will that thou shalt undertake the office of bailiff which Thor Urcel had, and manage my estate here in Ogvaldsens. Aspjorn replies, that it should be according to the king's will. But I must first go home to my farm, and put things in order there. The king was satisfied with this, and proceeded to another guest quarter. Aspjorn made himself ready with his comrades, who all kept themselves concealed in a quiet creek during the time Aspjorn was away from them. They had had their spies out to learn how it went with him, and would not depart without having some certain news of him. 128, of Thor Hund and Aspjorn Selsbane. Aspjorn then set out on his voyage, and about spring, A.D. 1023, got home to his farm. After this exploit he was always called Aspjorn Selsbane. Aspjorn had not been long at home before he and his relation Thor met and conversed together, and Thor asked Aspjorn particularly all about his journey, and about all the circumstances which had happened on the course of it. Aspjorn told everything as it had taken place. Then said Thor, Thou thinkest that thou hast well rubbed out the disgrace of having been plundered in last harvest. I think so, replies Aspjorn, and what is thy opinion, cousin? That I will soon tell thee, said Thor. Thy first expedition to the south of the country was indeed very disgraceful, and that disgrace has been redeemed. But this expedition is both a disgrace to thee and to thy family, if it end in thy becoming the king's slave, and being put on a footing with that worst of men, Thor Cell. Show that thou art manly enough to sit here on thy own property, and we thy relations shall so support thee that thou wilt never more come into such trouble. Aspjorn found this advice much to his mind. And before they parted it was firmly, determined that Aspjorn should remain on his farm, and not go back to the king or enter into his service. And he did so, and sat quietly at home on his farm. 129. King Olaf baptizes in Vors and Valders. After King Olaf and Erling Skjalgsson had this meeting at Ogvaldsens, new differences arose between them, and increased so much that they ended in perfect enmity. In spring, A.D. 1023, the king proceeded to guest quarters in Hordaland, and went up also to Vors, because he heard there was but little of the true faith among the people there. He held a thing with the bonds at a place called Vang, and a number of bonds came to it fully armed. The king ordered them to adopt Christianity, but they challenged him to battle, and it proceeded so far that the men were drawn up on both sides. But when it came to the point such a fear entered into the blood of the bonds that none would advance or command, and they chose the part which was most to their advantage, namely, to obey the king and receive Christianity. 
and before the king left them they were all baptized. One day it happened that the king was riding on his way a singing of psalms, and when he came right opposite some hills he halted and said, Man after man shall relate these my words. That I think it not advisable for any king of Norway to travel hereafter between these hills. And it is a saying among the people that the most kings since that time have avoided it. The king proceeded to Ostrovjord, and came to his ships, with which he went north to San, and had his living in guest quarters there in summer, A.D. 1023. When autumn approached he turned in towards the fjord district, and went from thence to Valders, where the people were still heathen. The king hastened up to the lake in Valders, came unexpectedly on the bonds, seized their vessels, and went on board of them with all his men. He then sent out message tokens, and appointed a thing so near the lake that he could use the vessels if he found he required them. The bonds resorted to the thing in a great and well-armed host. And when he commanded them to accept Christianity the bonds shouted against him, told him to be silent, and made a great uproar and clashing of weapons. But when the king saw that they would not listen to what he would teach them, and also that they had too great a force to contend with, he turned his discourse. And asked if there were people at the thing who had disputes with each other which they wished him to settle. It was soon found by the conversation of the bonds that they had many quarrels among themselves, although they had all joined in speaking against Christianity. When the bonds began to set forth their own cases, each endeavoured to get some upon his side to support him, and this lasted the whole day long until evening, when the thing was concluded. When the bonds had heard that the king had travelled to Valders, and was come into their neighbourhood, they had sent out message tokens summoning the free and the unfree to meet in arms, and with this force they had advanced against the king. So that the neighbourhood all around was left without people. When the thing was concluded the bonds still remained assembled. And when the king observed this he went on board his ships, rode in the night right across the water, landed in the country there, and began to plunder and burn. The day after the king's men rode from one point of land to another, and over all the king ordered the habitations to be set on fire. Now when the bonds who were assembled saw what the king was doing, namely, plundering and burning, and saw the smoke and flame of their houses, they dispersed, and each hastened to his own home to see if he could find those he had left. As soon as there came a dispersion among the crowd, the one slipped away after the other, until the whole multitude was dissolved. Then the king rode across the lake again, burning also on that side of the country. Now came the bonds to him begging for mercy, and offering to submit to him. He gave every man who came to him peace if he desired it, and restored to him his goods, and nobody refused to adopt Christianity. The king then had the people christened, and took hostages from the bonds. He ordered churches to be built and consecrated, and placed teachers in them. He remained a long time here in autumn, and had his ships drawn across the neck of land between the two lakes. The king did not go far from the sides of the lakes into the country, for he did not much trust the bonds. When the king thought that frost might be expected, he went further up the country, and came to though ten. Arner, the earl scald, tells how King Olaf burnt in the uplands, in the poem he composed concerning the king's brother King Harold. Against the upland people wroth. Olaf, to most so mild, went forth. The house is burning. All people mourning. Who could not fly? Hung on gallows high. It was, I think, in Olaf's race. The upland people to oppress. Afterwards King Olaf went north through the valleys to Doverfield, and did not halt until he reached the Thrandjum district and arrived at Nidaros, where he had ordered winter provision to be collected, and remained all winter, A.D. 1024. This was the tenth year of his reign. 130, of Einar Tambaskelfer. The summer before Einar Tambaskelfer left the country, and went westward to England, A.D. 1023. There he met his relative Earl Hakon, and stayed some time with him. He then visited King Canute, from whom he received great presents. Einar then went south all the way to Rome, and came back the following summer, A.D. 1024, and returned to his house and land. King Olaf and Einar did not meet this time. 131, The Birth of King Magnus There was a girl whose name was Alfhild, and who was usually called the king's slave woman, 
although she was of good descent. She was a remarkably handsome girl, and lived in King Olaf's court. It was reported this spring that Alfhild was with child, and the king's confidential friends knew that he was father of the child. It happened one night that Alfhild was taken ill, and only few people were at hand. Namely, some women, priests, Sigvat the Skald, and a few others. Alfhild was so ill that she was nearly dead, and when she was delivered of a man-child, it was some time before they could discover whether the child was in life. But when the infant drew breath, although very weak, the priest told Sigvat to hasten to the king, and tell him of the event. He replies, I dare not on any account waken the king. For he has forbid that any man should break his sleep until he awakens of himself. The priest replies, It is of necessity that this child be immediately baptized, for it appears to me there is but little life in it. Sigvat said, I would rather venture to take upon me to let thee baptize the child, than to awaken the king, and I will take it upon myself if anything be amiss, and will give the child a name. They did so. And the child was baptized, and got the name of Magnus. The next morning, when the king awoke and had dressed himself, the circumstance was told him. He ordered Sigvat to be called, and said. How camest thou to be so bold as to have my child baptized before I knew anything about it? Sigvat replies, Because I would rather give two men to God than one to the devil. The king, what meanest thou? Sigvat, the child was near death, and must have been the devil's if it had died as a heathen, and now it is God's. And I knew besides that if thou shouldst be so angry on this account that it affected my life, I would be God's also. The king asked, but why didst thou call him Magnus, which is not a name of our race? Sigvat, I called him after King Karl Magnus, who, I knew, had been the best man in the world. Then said the king, Thou art a very lucky man, Sigvat. But it is not wonderful that luck should accompany understanding. It is only wonderful how it sometimes happens that luck attends ignorant men, and that foolish counsel turns out lucky. The king was overjoyed at the circumstance. The boy grew up, and gave good promise as he advanced in age. 132, The Murder of Asbjorn Selsbane The same spring, A.D. 1024, The king gave into the hands of Asman Grankelson the half of the sheriff dom of the district of Halagaland, which Herak of Thjada had formerly held, partly in fief, partly for defraying the king's entertainment in guest quarters. Asman had a ship manned with nearly thirty well-armed men. When Asman came north he met Herak, and told him what the king had determined with regard to the district, and produced to him the tokens of the king's full powers. Herak said, the king had the right to give the sheriff dom to whom he pleased. But the former sovereigns had not been in use to diminish our rights who are entitled by birth to hold powers from the king, and to give them into the hands of the peasants who never before held such offices. But although it was evident that it was against Herak's inclination, he allowed Asman to take the sheriff dom according to the king's order. Then Asman proceeded home to his father, stayed there a short time, and then went north to Halagaland to his sheriff dom. And he came north to Langy Island, where there dwelt two brothers called Gunstein and Karl, both very rich and respectable men. Gunstein, the eldest of the brothers, was a good husbandman. Karl was a handsome man in appearance, and splendid in his dress, and both were, in many respects, expert in all feats. Asmund was well received by them, remained with them a while, and collected such revenues of his sheriff dom as he could get. Karl spoke with Asmund of his wish to go south with him and take service in the court of King Olaf, to which Asmund encouraged him much, promising his influence with the king for obtaining for Karl such a situation as he desired. And Karl accordingly accompanied Asmund. Asmund heard that Asbjorn, who had killed Thor Ursel, had gone to the market meeting of Vagar with a large ship of burdened manned with nearly twenty men, and that he was now expected from the south. Asmund and his retinue proceeded on their way southwards along the coast with a contrary wind, but there was little of it. They saw some of the fleet for Vagar sailing towards them. And they privately inquired of them about Asbjorn, and were told he was upon the way coming from the south. Asmund and Karl were bedfellows, and excellent friends. One day, 
As Asmund and his people were rowing through a sound, a ship of burden came sailing towards them. The ship was easily known, having high bulwarks, was painted with white and red colors, and colored cloth was woven in the sail. Carl said to Asmund, Thou hast often said thou wast curious to see Askjorn who killed Thorosel, and if I know one ship from another, that is his which is coming sailing along. Asmund replies, Be so good, comrade, and tell me which is he when thou sayest him. When the ships came alongside of each other, that is Askjorn, said Carl, the man sitting at the helm in a blue cloak. Asmund replies, I shall make his blue cloak red, threw a spear at Askjorn, and hit him in the middle of the body, so that it flew through and through him, and stuck fast in the upper part of the stern post. And Askjorn fell down dead from the helm. Then each vessel sailed on its course, and Askjorn's body was carried north to Thrandarns. Then Sigrid sent a message to Bjarki al to Thorahund, who came to her while they were, in the usual way, dressing the corpse of Askjorn. When he returned Sigrid gave presents to all her friends, and followed Thor to his ship. But before they parted she said, It has so fallen out, Thor, that my son has suffered by thy friendly counsel, but he did not retain life to reward thee for it, but although I have not his ability yet will I show my good will. Here is a gift I give thee, which I expect thou wilt use. Here is the spear which went through Askjorn my son, and there is still blood upon it, to remind thee that it fits the wound thou hast seen on the corpse of thy brother's son Askjorn. It would be a manly deed, if thou shouldst throw this spear from thy hand so that it stood in Olaf's breast, and this I can tell thee, that thou wilt be named coward in every man's mouth, if thou dost not avenge Askjorn. Thereupon she turned about, and went her way. Thor was so enraged at her words that he could not speak. He neither thought of casting the spear from him, nor took notice of the gangway. So that he would have fallen into the sea, if his men had not laid hold of him as he was going on board his ship. It was a feathered spear, not large, but the handle was gold-mounted. Now Thor rode away with his people, and went home to Bjarki Isle. Asmund and his companions also proceeded on their way until they came south to Thrandjum, where they waited on King Olaf. And Asmund related to the king all that had happened on the voyage. Karl became one of the king's court men, and the friendship continued between him and Asmund. They did not keep secret the words that had passed between Asmund and Karl before Askjorn was killed, for they even told them to the king. But then it happened, according to the proverb, that everyone has a friend in the midst of his enemies. There were some present who took notice of the words, and they reached Thor Hun's ears. 133, of King Olaf. When spring, A.D. 1024, was advanced King Olaf rigged out his ships, and sailed southwards in summer along the land. He held things with the bonds on the way, settled the law business of the people, put to rights the faith of the country, and collected the king's taxes wherever he came. In autumn he proceeded south to the frontier of the country. And King Olaf had now made the people Christians in all the great districts, and everywhere, by laws, had introduced order into the country. He had also, as before related, brought the Orkney Islands under his power, and by messages had made many friends in Iceland, Greenland, and the Fairy Islands. King Olaf had sent timber for building a church to Iceland, of which a church was built upon the thing field where the general thing is held, and had sent a bell for it, which is still there. This was after the Iceland people had altered their laws, and introduced Christianity, according to the word King Olaf had sent them. After that time, many considerable persons came from Iceland, and entered into King Olaf's service. As Thorkel Ijolfsson, and Thorleif Bollesen, Thord Kolbeinsen, Thord Barkarsen, Thorgir Havarsen, Thormod Kalbrunerskald. King Olaf had sent many friendly presents to chief people in Iceland. And they in return sent him such things as they had which they thought most acceptable. Under this show of friendship which the king gave Iceland were concealed many things which afterwards appeared. 134. King Olaf's Message to Iceland, and the Councils of the Icelanders. King Olaf this summer, A.D. 1024, sent Thorin Nefjolfsson to Iceland on his errands, and Thorin went out of Thrandjum Fjord along with the king, and followed him south to Moor. From thence Thorin went out to sea, 
and got such a favorable breeze that after four days' sail he landed at the Westman Isles, in Iceland. He proceeded immediately to the Althing, and came just as the people were upon the Lahilok, to which he repaired. When the cases of the people before the thing had been determined according to law, Thorin Nefjolfsson took up the word as follows, We parted four days ago from King Olaf Haraldsson. Who sends God Almighty's and his own salutation to all the chiefs and principal men of the land. As also to all the people in general, men and women, young and old, rich and poor. He also lets you know that he will be your sovereign if you will become his subjects, so that he and you will be friends, assisting each other in all that is good. The people replied in a friendly way, that they would gladly be the king's friends, if he would be a friend of the people of their country. Then Thorin again took up the word, this follows in addition to the king's message, that he will in friendship desire of the people of the north district that they give him the island, or outrock, which lies at the mouth of Eifjord. And is called Grimsey, for which he will give you from his country whatever good the people of the district may desire. He sends this message particularly to Gudmund of Madraveller to support this matter, because he understands that Gudmund has most influence in that quarter. Gudmund replies, My inclination is greatly for King Olaf's friendship, and that I consider much more useful than the outrock he desires. But the king has not heard rightly if he think I have more power in this matter than any other, for the island is a common. We, however, who have the most use of the isle, will hold a meeting among ourselves about it. Then the people went to their tent houses, and the Northland people had a meeting among themselves, and talked over the business, and every one spoke according to his judgment. Gudmun supported the matter, and many others formed their opinions by his. Then some asked why his brother Einar did not speak on the subject. We think he has the clearest insight into most things. Einar answers, I have said so little about the matter because nobody has asked me about it. But if I may give my opinion, our countrymen might just as well make themselves at once liable to land scat to King Olaf, and submit to all his exactions as he has them among his people in Norway. And this heavy burden we will lay not only upon ourselves, but on our sons, and their sons, and all our race, and on all the community dwelling and living in this land, which never after will be free from this slavery. Now although this king is a good man, as I well believe him to be, yet it must be hereafter, when kings succeed each other, that some will be good, and some bad. Therefore if the people of this country will preserve the freedom they have enjoyed since the land was first inhabited, it is not advisable to give the king the smallest spot to fasten himself upon the country by and not to give him any kind of scat or service that can have the appearance of a duty. On the other hand, I think it very proper that the people send the king such friendly presents of hawks or horses, tents or sails, or such things which are suitable gifts, and these are well applied if they are repaid with friendship. But as to Grimsey Isle, I have to say, that although nothing is drawn from it that can serve for food, yet it could support a great warforce cruising from thence in longships. And then, I doubt not, there would be distress enough at every poor peasant's door. When Einar had thus explained the proper connection of the matter, the whole community were of one mind that such a thing should not be permitted. And Thorin saw sufficiently well what the result of his errand was to be. 135. The Answer of the Icelanders The day following, Thorin went again to the Law Hill, and brought forward his errand in the following words. King Olaf sends his message to his friends here in the country, among whom he reckons Gudmund Ijolfsson, Snorgod, Thorkel Ijolfsson, Skapti the Lagman, and Thorstein Halsson, and desires them by me to come to him on a friendly visit. And adds, that ye must not excuse yourselves, if you regard his friendship as worth anything. In their answer they thanked the king for his message and added, that they would afterwards give a reply to it by Thorin when they had more closely considered the matter with their friends. The chiefs now weighed the matter among themselves, and each gave his own opinion about the journey. Snor and Skapti dissuaded from such a dangerous proceeding with the people of Norway. Namely, that all the men who had the most to say in the country should at once leave Iceland. They added, that from this message, and from what Einar had said, they had the suspicion that the king intended to use force and strong measures against the Icelanders if he ruled in the country. 
Gudmund and Thorkel I. Jolfson insisted much that they should follow King Olaf's invitation, and called it a journey of honor. But when they had considered the matter on all sides, it was at last resolved that they should not travel themselves, but that each of them should send in his place a man whom they thought best suited for it. After this determination the thing was closed, and there was no journey that summer. Thorin made two voyages that summer, and about harvest was back again at King Olaf's, and reported the result of his mission, and that some of the chiefs, or their sons, would come from Iceland according to his message. 136. Of the people of the Fairy Islands. The same summer, A.D. 1024, there came from the Fairy Islands to Norway, on the king's invitation, Geo the Lagman, Leif Asursen, Thorolf of Diamond, and many other bond sons. Thord of Gata made himself ready for the voyage, but just as he was setting out he got a stroke of palsy, and could not come, so he remained behind. Now when the people from the Fairy Isles arrived at King Olaf's, he called them to him to a conference, and explained the purpose of the journey he had made them take, namely, that he would have scat from the fairy islands. And also that the people there should be subject to the laws which the king should give them. In that meeting it appeared from the king's words that he would make the fairy people who had come answerable, and would bind them by oath to conclude this union. He also offered to the men whom he thought the ablest to take them into his service, and bestow honor and friendship on them. These fairy men understood the king's words so, that they must dread the turn the matter might take if they did not submit to all that the king desired. Although they held several meetings about the business before it ended, the king's desire at last prevailed. Leif, Giel, and Thorolf went into the king's service, and became his court men. And they, with all their traveling companions, swore the oath to King Olaf, that the law and land privilege which he set them should be observed in the fairy islands, and also the scat be levied that he laid upon them. Thereafter the fairy people prepared for their return home, and at their departure the king gave those who had entered into his service presents in testimony of his friendship, and they went their way. Now the king ordered a ship to be rigged, manned it, and sent men to the fairy islands to receive the scat from the inhabitants which they should pay him. It was late before they were ready. But they set off at last, and of their journey all that is to be told is, that they did not come back, and no scat either, the following summer, for nobody had come to the fairy isles, and no man had demanded scat there. 137. Of the marriage of Kettle and of Thord to the king's sisters. King Olaf proceeded about harvest time to Viking, and sent a message before him to the uplands that they should prepare guest quarters for him, as he intended to be there in winter. Afterwards he made ready for his journey, and went to the uplands, and remained the winter there. Going about in guest quarters, and putting things to rights where he saw it needful, advancing also the cause of Christianity wheresoever it was requisite. It happened while King Olaf was in Hedmark that Kettle Calf of Ringanes courted Gunhild, a daughter of Sigurd Seer and of King Olaf's mother Asta. Gunhild was a sister of King Olaf, and therefore it belonged to the king to give consent and determination to the business. He took it in a friendly way. For he know Kettle, that he was of high birth, wealthy, and of good understanding, and a great chief, and also he had long been a great friend of King Olaf, as before related. All these circumstances induced the king to approve of the match, and so it was that Kettle got gunhild. King Olaf was present at the wedding. From thence the king went north to Gudbrandstil, where he was entertained in guest quarters. There dwelt a man, by name Thord Guthrumson, on a farm called Stieg, and he was the most powerful man in the north end of the valley. When Thord and the king met, Thord made proposals for Isred, the daughter of Gudbrand, and the sister of King Olaf's mother, as it belonged to the king to give consent. After the matter was considered, it was determined that the marriage should proceed, and Thord got Isred. Afterwards Thord was the king's faithful friend, and also many of Thord's relations and friends, who followed his footsteps. From thence King Olaf returned south through Tho Ten and Hadeland, from thence to Ringerijk, and so to Viken. In spring, A.D. 1025, he went to Tunsberg, and stayed there while there was the market meeting, and a great resort of people. He then had his vessels rigged out, and had many people about him. 138 of the Icelanders. 
The same summer, A.D. 1025, came Stein, a son of the Lagman Skapti, from Iceland, in compliance with King Olaf's message. And with him Thorod, a son of Snor the Goad, and Geller, a son of Thorkel I. Jolfsson, and Egil, a son of Hal of Sida, brother of Thorstein Hal. Gudmund I. Jolfsson had died the winter before. These Iceland men repaired to King Olaf as soon as they had opportunity, and when they met the king they were well received, and all were in his house. The same summer King Olaf heard that the ship was missing which he had sent the summer before to the fairy islands after the scat, and nobody knew what had become of it. The king fitted out another ship, manned it, and sent it to the fairy islands for the scat. They got under way, and proceeded to sea. But as little was ever heard of this vessel as of the former one, and many conjectures were made about what had become of them. 139, here begins the story of Canute the Great. During this time Canute the Great, called by some Canute the Old, was king of England and Denmark. Canute the Great was a son of Sven Haraldsson Forked Beard, whose forefathers, for a long course of generations, had ruled over Denmark. Harald Gormson, Canute's grandfather, had conquered Norway after the fall of Harald Grafeld, Gunhild's son, had taken scat from it, and had placed Earl Hakon the Great to defend the country. The Danish king, Sven Haraldsson, ruled also over Norway, and placed his son-in-law Earl Eirik, the son of Earl Hakon, to defend the country. The brothers Eirik and Sven, Earl Hakon's sons, ruled the land until Earl Eirik went west to England, on the invitation of his brother-in-law Canute the Great, when he left behind his son Earl Hakon, sister's son of Canute the Great, to govern Norway. But when Olaf the Thick came first to Norway, as before related, he took prisoner Earl Hakon the son of Eirik, and deposed him from the kingdom. Then Hakon proceeded to his mother's brother, Canute the Great, and had been with him constantly until the time to which here in our saga we have now come. Canute the Great had conquered England by blows and weapons, and had a long struggle before the people of the land were subdued. But when he had set himself perfectly firm in the government of the country, he remembered that he also had right to a kingdom which he had not brought under his authority, and that was Norway. He thought he had hereditary right to all Norway. And his sister's son Hakon, who had held a part of it, appeared to him to have lost it with disgrace. The reason why Canute and Hakon had remained quiet with respect to their claims upon Norway was, that when King Olaf Haraldsson landed in Norway the people and commonalty ran together in crowds. And would hear of nothing but that Olaf should be king over all the country, although some afterwards, who thought that the people upon account of his power had no self-government left to them, went out of the country. Many powerful men, or rich bond sons, had therefore gone to Canute the Great, and pretended various errands, and every one who came to Canute and desired his friendship was loaded with presents. With Canute, too, could be seen greater splendor and pomp than elsewhere, both with regard to the multitude of people who were daily in attendance, and also to the other magnificent things about the houses he owned and dwelt in himself. Canute the Great drew scat and revenue from the people who were the richest of all in northern lands, and in the same proportion as he had greater revenues than other kings, he also made greater presents than other kings. In his whole kingdom peace was so well established, that no man dared break it. The people of the country kept the peace towards each other, and had their old country law, and for this he was greatly celebrated in all countries. And many of those who came from Norway represented their hardships to Earl Hakon, and some even to King Canute himself. And that the Norway people were ready to turn back to the government of King Canute, or Earl Hakon, and receive deliverance from them. This conversation suited well the Earl's inclination, and he carried it to the king, and begged of him to try if King Olaf would not surrender the kingdom, or at least come to an agreement to divide it, and many supported the Earl's views. 140. Canute's Message to King Olaf Canute the Great sent men from the west, from England, to Norway, and equipped them magnificently for the journey. They were bearers of the English King Canute's letter and seal. They came about spring, a. d. 1025, to the King of Norway, Olaf Haraldsson, in Tunsberg. Now when it was told the king that ambassadors had arrived from Canute the Great he was ill at ease, and said that Canute had not sent messengers hither with any messages that could be of advantage to him or his people. 
and it was some days before the ambassadors could come before the king. But when they got permission to speak to him they appeared before the king, and made known King Canute's letter, and their errand which accompanied it. Namely, that King Canute considers all Norway as his property, and insists that his forefathers before him have possessed that kingdom. But as King Canute offers peace to all countries, he will also offer peace to all here, if it can be so settled, and will not invade Norway with his army if it can be avoided. Now if King Olaf Haraldsson wishes to remain king of Norway, he will come to King Canute, and receive his kingdom as a fee from him, become his vassal, and pay the scat which the earls before him formerly paid. Thereupon they presented their letters, which contained precisely the same conditions. Then King Olaf replies, I have heard say, by old stories, that the Danish king Gorm was considered but a small king of a few people, for he ruled over Denmark alone, but the kings who succeeded him thought that was too little. It has since come so far that King Canute rules over Denmark and England, and has conquered for himself a great part of Scotland. Now he claims also my paternal heritage, and will then show some moderation in his covetousness. Does he wish to rule over all the countries of the north? Will he eat up all the kale in England? He shall do so, and reduce that country to a desert, before I lay my head in his hands, or show him any other kind of vassalage. Now ye shall tell him these my words, I will defend Norway with battle-axe and sword as long as life is given me, and will pay scat to no man for my kingdom. After this answer King Canute's ambassadors made themselves ready for their journey home, and were by no means rejoiced at the success of their errand. Sigvat the Skald had been with King Canute, who had given him a gold ring that weighed half a mark. The Skald Burst Skalterfazen was also there, and to him King Canute gave two gold rings, each weighing two marks, and besides a sword inlaid with gold. Sigvat made this song about it. When we came o'er the wave, you cub. When we came o'er the wave. To me one ring, to thee two rings. The mighty Canute gave. One mark to me. For marks to thee. A sword too, fine and brave. Now God knows well. And skalds can tell. What justice here would crave. Sigvat the skald was very intimate with King Canute's messengers, and asked them many questions. They answered all his inquiries about their conversation with King Olaf, and the result of their message. They said the king listened unwillingly to their proposals. And we do not know, say they, to what he is trusting when he refuses becoming King Canute's vassal, and going to him, which would be the best thing he could do. For King Canute is so mild that however much a chief may have done against him, he is pardoned if he only show himself obedient. It is but lately that two kings came to him from the north, from Fife in Scotland, and he gave up his wrath against them, and allowed them to retain all the lands they had possessed before, and gave them besides very valuable gifts. Then Sigvat sang. From the north land, the midst of Fife. Two kings came begging peace and life. Craving from Canute life and peace. May Olaf's good luck never cease. May he, our gallant Norse king, never. Be brought, like these, his head to offer. As ransom to a living man. For the broad lands his sword has won. King Canute's ambassadors proceeded on their way back, and had a favorable breeze across the sea. They came to King Canute, and told him the result of their errand, and King Olaf's last words. King Canute replies, King Olaf guesses wrong, if he thinks I shall eat up all the kale in England. For I will let him see that there is something else than kale under my ribs, and cold kale it shall be for him. The same summer, A.D. 1025, Aslak and Skjalg, the sons of Erling of Juddar, came from Norway to King Canute, and were well received. For Aslak was married to Sigrid, a daughter of Earl Sven Hackinson, and she and Earl Hakon Eriksson were brothers' children. King Canute gave these brothers great fiefs over there, and they stood in great favor. 141. King Olaf's Alliance with Onan the King of Svithjad. King Olaf summoned to him all the lendermen, and had a great many people about him this summer, A.D. 1025, for a report was abroad that King Canute would come from England. 
people had heard from merchant vessels that Canute was assembling a great army in England. When summer was advanced, some affirmed and others denied that the army would come. King Olaf was all summer in Viking, and had spies out to learn if Canute was come to Denmark. In autumn, A.D. 1025, he sent messengers eastward to Svithjot to his brother-in-law King Anand, and let him know King Canute's demand upon Norway. Adding, that, in his opinion, if Canute subdued Norway, King Anand would not long enjoy the Swedish dominions in peace. He thought it advisable, therefore, that they should unite for their defence. And then, said he, we will have strength enough to hold out against Canute. King Anand received King Olaf's message favourably, and replied to it, that he for his part would make common cause with King Olaf, so that each of them should stand by the one who first required help with all the strength of his kingdom. In these messages between them it was also determined that they should have a meeting, and consult with each other. The following winter, A.D. 1026, King Anand intended to travel across West Gotland, and King Olaf made preparations for taking his winter abode at Sarpsborg. 142, King Canute's Ambassadors to Anand of Svithjad. In autumn King Canute the Great came to Denmark, and remained there all winter, A.D. 1026, with a numerous army. It was told him that ambassadors with messages had been passing between the Swedish and Norwegian kings, and that some great plans must be concerting between them. In winter King Canute sent messengers to Svithjad, to King Anand, with great gifts and messages of friendship. He also told Anand that he might sit altogether quiet in this strife between him and Olaf the Thick. For thou, Anand, says he, and thy kingdom, shall be in peace as far as I am concerned. When the ambassadors came to King Anand they presented the gifts which King Canute sent him, together with the friendly message. King Anand did not hear their speech very willingly, and the ambassadors could observe that King Anand was most inclined to a friendship with King Olaf. They returned accordingly, and told King Canute the result of their errand, and told him not to depend much upon the friendship of King Anand. 143 The Expedition to Bjarmaland. This winter, A.D. 1026, King Olaf sat in Sarpsborg, and was surrounded by a very great army of people. He sent the Haligalander Karl to the north country upon his business. Karl went first to the uplands, then across the Doverfield, and came down to Nidaros, where he received as much money as he had the king's order for, together with a good ship. Such as he thought suitable for the voyage which the king had ordered him upon. And that was to proceed north to Bjarmaland. It was settled that the king should be in partnership with Karl, and each of them have the half of the profit. Early in spring Karl directed his course to Halagaland, where his brother Gunstein prepared to accompany him, having his own merchant goods with him. There were about twenty-five men in the ship, and in spring they sailed north to Finnmark. When Thor Hund heard this, he sent a man to the brothers with the verbal message that he intended in summer to go to Bjarmaland, and that he would sail with them, and that they should divide what booty they made equally between them. Karl sent him back the message that Thor must have twenty-five men as they had, and they were willing to divide the booty that might be taken equally, but not the merchant goods which each had for himself. When Thor's messenger came back he had put a stout long ship he owned into the water, and rigged it, and he had put eighty men on board of his house servants. Thor alone had the command over this crew, and he alone had all the goods they might acquire on the cruise. When Thor was ready for sea he set out northwards along the coast, and found Karl a little north of Sandver. They then proceeded with good wind. Gunstein said to his brother, as soon as they met Thor, that in his opinion Thor was strongly manned. I think, said he, we had better turn back than sail so entirely in Thor's power, for I do not trust him. Karl replies, I will not turn back, although if I had known when we were at home on Langi Isle that Thor Hund would join us on this voyage with so large a crew as he has, I would have taken more hands with us. The brothers spoke about it to Thor, and asked what was the meaning of his taking more people with him than was agreed upon between them. He replies, We have a large ship which requires many hands, and methinks there cannot be too many brave lads for so dangerous a cruise. They went in summer as fast in general as the vessels could go. 
When the wind was light the ship of the brothers sailed fastest, and they separated, but when the wind freshened Thor overtook them. They were seldom together, but always in sight of each other. When they came to Bjarmaland they went straight to the merchant town, and the market began. All who had money to pay with got filled up with goods. Thor also got a number of furs, and of beaver and sable skins. Karl had a considerable sum of money with him, with which he purchased skins and furs. When the fair was at an end they went out of the Vina River, and then the truce of the country people was also at an end. When they came out of the river they held a seaman's council, and Thor asked the crews if they would like to go on the land and get booty. They replied, that they would like it well enough, if they saw the booty before their eyes. Thor replies, that there was booty to be got, if the voyage proved fortunate, but that in all probability there would be danger in the attempt. All said they would try, if there was any chance of booty. Thor explained, that it was so established in this land, that when a rich man died all his movable goods were divided between the dead man and his heirs. He got the half part, or the third part, or sometimes less, and that part was carried out into the forest and buried, sometimes under a mound, sometimes in the earth, and sometimes even a house was built over it. He tells them at the same time to get ready for this expedition at the fall of day. It was resolved that one should not desert the other, and none should hold back when the commander ordered them to come on board again. They now left people behind to take care of the ships, and went on land, where they found flat fields at first, and then great forests Thor went first, and the brothers Karl and Gunstein in rear. Thor commanded the people to observe the utmost silence. And let us peel the bark off the trees, says he, so that one tree mark can be seen from the other. They came to a large cleared opening, where there was a high fence upon which there was a gate that was locked. Six men of the country people held watch every night at this fence, two at a time keeping guard, each two for a third part of the night, when Thor and his men came to the fence the guard had gone home. And those who should relieve them had not yet come upon guard. Thor went to the fence, stuck his axe up in it above his head, hauled himself up by it, and so came over the fence, and inside the gate. Karl had also come over the fence, and to the inside of the gate. So that both came at once to the port, took the bar away, and opened the port, and then the people got in within the fence. Then said Thor, within this fence there is a mound in which gold, and silver, and earth are all mixed together, seize that. But within here stands the Bjarmaland people's god Jamala, let no one be so presumptuous as to rob him. Thereupon they went to the mound and took as much of the money as they could carry away in their clothes, with which, as might be expected, much earth was mixed. Thereafter Thor said that the people now should retreat. And ye brothers, Karl and Gunstein, says he, do ye lead the way, and I will go last. They all went accordingly out of the gate, but Thor went back to Jamala, and took a silver bowl that stood upon his knee full of silver money. He put the silver in his purse, and put his arm within the handle of the bowl, and so went out of the gate. The whole troop had come without the fence. But when they perceived that Thor had stayed behind, Karl returned to trace him, and when they met upon the path Thor had the silver bowl with him. Thereupon Karl immediately ran to Jamala. And observing he had a thick gold ornament hanging around his neck, he lifted his axe, cut the string with which the ornament was tied behind his neck. And the stroke was so strong that the head of Jamala rang with such a great sound that they were all astonished. Karl seized the ornament, and they all hastened away. But the moment the sound was made the watchmen came forward upon the cleared space, and blew their horns. Immediately the sound of the lower, one, was heard all around from every quarter, calling the people together. They hastened to the forest, and rushed into it, and heard the shouts and cries on the other side of the Bjarmaland people in pursuit. Thor Hund went the last of the whole troop, and before him went two men carrying a great sack between them, in which was something that was like ashes. Thor took this in his hand, and strewed it upon the footpath, and sometimes over the people. They came thus out of the woods, and upon the fields, but heard incessantly the Bjarmaland people pursuing with shouts and dreadful yells. The army of the Bjarmaland people rushed out after them upon the field, and on both sides of them. 
but neither the people nor their weapons came so near as to do them any harm, from which they perceived that the Bjarmalan people did not see them. Now when they reached their ships Karl and his brother went on board. For they were the foremost, and Thor was far behind on the land. As soon as Karl and his men were on board they struck their tents, cast loose their land ropes, hoisted their sails, and their ship in all haste went to sea. Thor and his people, on the other hand, did not get on so quickly, as their vessel was heavier to manage, so that when they got under sail, Karl and his people were far off from land. Both vessels sailed across the White Sea, Ganvik. The nights were clear, so that both ships sailed night and day. Until one day, towards the time the day turns to shorten, Karl and his people took up the land near an island, let down the sail, cast anchor, and waited until the slack tide set in, for there was a strong rust before them. Now Thor came up, and lay at anchor there also. Thor and his people then put out a boat, went into it, and rowed to Karl's ship. Thor came on board, and the brothers saluted him. Thor told Karl to give him the ornament. I think, said he, that I have best earned the ornaments that have been taken, for methinks ye have to thank me for getting away without any loss of men, and also I think thou, Karl, set us in the greatest fright. Karl replies, King Olaf has the half part of all the goods I gather on this voyage, and I intend the ornament for him. Go to him, if you like, and it is possible he will give thee the ornament, although I took it from Jamala. Then Thor insisted that they should go upon the island, and divide the booty. Gunstein says, it is now the turn of the tide, and it is time to sail. Whereupon they began to raise their anchor. When Thor saw that, he returned to his boat and rowed to his own ship. Karl and his men had hoisted sail, and were come a long way before Thor got under way. They now sailed so that the brothers were always in advance, and both vessels made all the haste they could. They sailed thus until they came to Gersfer, which is the first roadstead of the traders to the north. They both came there towards evening, and lay in the harbour near the landing place. Thor's ship lay inside, and the brothers the outside vessel in the port. When Thor had set up his tents he went on shore, and many of his men with him. They went to Karl's ship, which was well provided. Thor hailed the ship, and told the commanders to come on shore, on which the brothers, and some men with them, went on the land. Now Thor began the same discourse, and told them to bring the goods they got in booty to the land to have them divided. The brothers thought that was not necessary, until they had arrived at their own neighborhood. Thor said it was unusual not to divide booty but at their own home, and thus to be left to the honor of other people. They spoke some words about it, but could not agree. Then Thor turned away. But had not gone far before he came back, and tells his comrades to wait there. Thereupon he calls to Karl, and says he wants to speak with him alone. Karl went to meet him. And when he came near, Thor struck at him with a spear, so that it went through him. There, said Thor, now thou hast learnt to know of Jarki Island man. I thought thou shouldst feel as Bjorn's spear. Karl died instantly, and Thor with his people went immediately on board their ship. When Gunstein and his men saw Karl fall they ran instantly to him, took his body and carried it on board their ship, struck their tents, and cast off from the pier, and left the land. When Thor and his men saw this, they took down their tents and made preparations to follow. But as they were hoisting the sail the fastenings to the mast broke in two, and the sail fell down across the ship, which caused a great delay before they could hoist the sail again. Gunstein had already got a long way ahead before Thor's ship fetched way, and now they used both sails and oars. Gunstein did the same. On both sides they made great way day and night. But so that they did not gain much on each other, although when they came to the small sounds among the islands Gunstein's vessel was lighter in turning. But Thor's ship made way upon them, so that when they came up to Langjuvik, Gunstein turned towards the land, and with all his men ran up into the country, and left his ship. A little after Thor came there with his ship, sprang upon the land after them, and pursued them. There was a woman who helped Gunstein to conceal himself, and it is told that she was much acquainted with witchcraft. Thor and his men returned to the vessels, 
and took all the goods out of Gunstein's vessel, and put on board stones in place of the cargo, and then hauled the ship out into the fjord, cut a hole in its bottom, and sank it to the bottom. Thereafter Thor, with his people, returned home to Bjarki Isle. Gunstein and his people proceeded in small boats at first, and lay concealed by day, until they had passed Bjarki, and had got beyond Thor's district. Gunstein went home first to Langi Isle for a short time, and then proceeded south without any halt, until he came south to Thrandjum, and there found King Olaf, to whom he told all that had happened on this Bjarmaland expedition. The king was ill-pleased with the voyage, but told Gunstein to remain with him, promising to assist him when opportunity offered. Gunstein took the invitation with thanks, and stayed with King Olaf. Endnotes, 1, Lug, the lower, is a long tube or roll of birch bark. Used as a horn by the herd boys in the mountains in Norway. L. 144, Meeting of King Olaf and King Anand. King Olaf was, as before related, in Sarpsborg the winter, A.D. 1026, that King Canute was in Denmark. The Swedish King Anand rode across West Gotland the same winter, and had 300, 3,600, men with him. Men and messages passed between them, and they agreed to meet in spring at Kanungahela. The meeting had been postponed, because they wished to know before they met what King Canute intended doing. As it was now approaching towards winter, King Canute made ready to go over to England with his forces, and left his son Hardenat to rule in Denmark, and with him Earl Ulf, a son of Thorgil Spreykeleg. Ulf was married to Astrid, King Sven's daughter, and sister of Canute the Great. Their son Sven was afterwards King of Denmark. Earl Ulf was a very distinguished man. When the kings Olaf and Anand heard that Canute the Great had gone west to England, they hastened to hold their conference, and met at Conungahela, on the Gott River. They had a joyful meeting, and had many friendly conversations, of which something might become known to the public. But they also spake often a great deal between themselves, with none but themselves too present, of which only some things afterwards were carried into effect, and thus became known to every one. At parting the kings presented each other with gifts, and parted the best of friends. King Anand went up into Gotland, and Olaf northwards to Viken, and afterwards to Agder, and thence northwards along the coast, but lay a long time at Egersund waiting a wind. Here he heard that Erling Skjolgsen, and the inhabitants of Juddar with him, had assembled a large force. One day the king's people were talking among themselves whether the wind was south or southwest, and whether with that wind they could sail past Juddar or not. The most said it was impossible to fetch round. Then answers Halder Brynjolfsson, I am of opinion that we would go round Jeddar with this wind fast enough if Erling Skjolgsen had prepared a feast for us at Seoul. Then King Olaf ordered the tents to be struck, and the vessels to be hauled out, which was done. They sailed the same day past Jeddar with the best wind, and in the evening reached Hurtingsea, from whence the king proceeded to Hordaland, and was entertained there in guest quarters. 145, Thorolf's Murder the same summer, A.D. 1026, a ship sailed from Norway to the Fairy Islands, with messengers carrying a verbal message from King Olaf, that one of his court men, Leif Asursen, or Lagman Giel, or Thorolf of Diamond, should come over to him from the Fairy Islands. Now when this message came to the Fairy Islands, and was delivered to those whom it concerned, they held a meeting among themselves, to consider what might lie under this message. And they were all of opinion that the king wanted to inquire into the real state of the event which some said had taken place upon the islands. Namely, the failure and disappearance of the former messengers of the king, and the loss of the two ships, of which not a man had been saved. It was resolved that Thorolf should undertake the journey. He got himself ready, and rigged out a merchant vessel belonging to himself, manned with ten or twelve men. When it was ready, waiting a wind, it happened, at Austri, in the house of Thrand of Gada, that he went one fine day into the room where his brother's two sons, Sigurd and Thord, sons of Thorlak, were lying upon the benches in the room. Got the Red was also there, who was one of their relations and a man of distinction. Sigurd was the oldest, and their leader in all things. Thord had a distinguished name, 
and was called Thor the Low, although in reality he was uncommonly tall, and yet in proportion more strong than large. Then Pran said, How many things are changed in the course of a man's life? When we were young, it was rare for young people who were able to do anything to sit or lie still upon a fine day, and our forefathers would scarcely have believed that Thorolf of Diamond would be bolder and more active than ye are. I believe the vessel I have standing here in the boathouse will be so old that it will rot under its coat of tar. Here are all the houses full of wool, which is neither used nor sold. It should not be so if I were a few winters younger. Sigurd sprang up, called upon God and Thord, and said he would not endure Thran's scoffs. They went out to the house servants, and launched the vessel upon the water, brought down a cargo, and loaded the ship. They had no want of a cargo at home, and the vessel's rigging was in good order, so that in a few days they were ready for sea. There were ten or twelve men in the vessel. Thorolf's ship and theirs had the same wind, and they were generally in sight of each other. They came to the land at Herna in the evening, and Sigurd with his vessel lay outside on the strand, but so that there was not much distance between the two ships. It happened towards evening, when it was dark, that just as Thorolf and his people were preparing to go to bed, Thorolf and another went on shore for a certain purpose. When they were ready, they prepared to return on board. The man who had accompanied Thorolf related afterwards this story, that a cloth was thrown over his head, and that he was lifted up from the ground, and he heard a great bustle. He was taken away, and thrown head foremost down. But there was sea under him, and he sank under the water. When he got to land, he went to the place where he and Thorolf had been parted, and there he found Thorolf with his head cloven down to his shoulders, and dead. When the ship's people heard of it they carried the body out to the ship, and let it remain there all night. King Olaf was at that time in guest quarters at Lygra, and thither they sent a message. Now a thing was called by message token, and the king came to the thing. He had also ordered the fairy people of both vessels to be summoned, and they appeared at the thing. Now when the thing was seated, the king stood up and said, Here an event has happened which, and it is well that it is so, is very seldom heard of. Here has a good man been put to death, without any cause. Is there any man upon the thing who can say who has done it? Nobody could answer. Then, said the king, I cannot conceal my suspicion that this deed has been done by the fairy people themselves. It appears to me that it has been done in this way, that Sigurd Thorlaxen has killed the man, and Thor the Low has cast his comrade into the sea. I think, too, that the motives to this must have been to hinder Thorl from telling about the misdeed of which he had information, namely, the murder which I suspect was committed upon my messengers. When he had ended his speech, Sigurd Thorlaxen stood up, and desired to be heard. I have never before, said he, spoken at a thing, and I do not expect to be looked upon as a man of ready words. But I think there is sufficient necessity before me to reply something to this. I will venture to make a guess that the speech the king has made comes from some man's tongue who is of far less understanding and goodness than he is, and has evidently proceeded from those who are our enemies. It is speaking improbabilities to say that I could be Thorolf's murderer, for he was my foster brother and good friend. Had the case been otherwise, and had there been anything outstanding between me and Thorolf, yet I am surely born with sufficient understanding to have done this deed in the fairy islands, rather than here between your hands, sire. But I am ready to clear myself, and my whole ship's crew, of this act, and to make oath according to what stands in your laws. Or, if ye find it more satisfactory, I offer to clear myself by the ordeal of hot iron. And I wish, sire, that you may be present yourself at the proof. When Sigurd had ceased to speak there were many who supported his case, and begged the king that Sigurd might be allowed to clear himself of this accusation. They thought that Sigurd had spoken well, and that the accusation against him might be untrue. The king replies, it may be with regard to this man very differently, and if he is belied in any respect he must be a good man. And if not, he is the boldest I have ever met with, and I believe this is the case, and that he will bear witness to it himself. At the desire of the people, the king took Sigurd's obligation to take the iron ordeal. He should come the following day to Lygra, where the bishop should preside at the ordeal, 
and so the thing closed. The king went back to Lygra, and Sigurd and his comrades to their ship. As soon as it began to be dark at night Sigurd said to his ship's people. To say the truth, we have come into a great misfortune, for a great lie is got up against us, and this king is a deceitful, crafty man. Our fate is easy to be foreseen where he rules, for first he made Thorolf be slain, and then made us the Mistures, without benefit of redemption by fine. For him it is an easy matter to manage the iron ordeal, so that I fear he will come ill off who tries it against him. Now there is coming a brisk mountain breeze, blowing right out of the sound and off the land. And it is my advice that we hoist our sail, and set out to sea. Let Thrand himself come with his wool to market another summer, but if I get away, it is my opinion I shall never think of coming to Norway again. His comrades thought the advice good, hoisted their sail, and in the night time took to the open sea with all speed. They did not stop until they came to ferry, and home to Gata. Thrand was ill-pleased with their voyage, and they did not answer him in a very friendly way, but they remained at home, however, with Thrand. The morning after, King Olaf heard of Sigurd's departure, and heavy reports went round about this case. And there were many who believed that the accusation against Sigurd was true, although they had denied and opposed it before the king. King Olaf spoke but little about the matter, but seemed to know of a certainty that the suspicion he had taken up was founded in truth. The king afterwards proceeded in his progress, taking up his abode where it was provided for him. 146. Of the Icelanders. King Olaf called before him the men who had come from Iceland, Thorod Snorrison, Geller Thorkelson, Stein Skaptason, and Egil Halson, and spoke to them thus, Ye have spoken to me much in summer about making yourselves ready to return to Iceland. And I have never given you a distinct answer. Now I will tell you what my intention is. Thee, Geller, I propose to allow to return, if thou wilt carry my message there. But none of the other Icelanders who are now here may go to Iceland before I have heard how the message which thou, Geller, shalt bring thither has been received. When the king had made this resolution known, it appeared to those who had a great desire to return, and were thus forbidden, that they were unreasonably and hardly dealt with, and that they were placed in the condition of unfree men. In the meantime Geller got ready for his journey, and sailed in summer, A.D. 1026, to Iceland, taking with him the message he was to bring before the thing the following summer, A.D. 1027. The king's message was, that he required the Icelanders to adopt the laws which he had set in Norway, also to pay him thane tax and nose tax, one, namely, a penny for every nose, and the penny at the rate of ten pennies to the yard of Wadmal, two. At the same time he promised them his friendship if they accepted, and threatened them with all his vengeance if they refused his proposals. The people sat long in deliberation on this business. But at last they were unanimous in refusing all the taxes and burdens which were demanded of them. That summer Geller returned back from Iceland to Norway to King Olaf, and found him in autumn in the east in Viking, just as he had come from Gotland. Of which I shall speak hereafter in this story of King Olaf. Towards the end of autumn King Olaf repaired north to Thrandjum, and went with his people to Nidaros, where he ordered a winter residence to be prepared for him. The winter, A.D. 1027, that he passed here in the merchant town of Nidaros was the thirteenth year of his reign. End notes, 1, Nef Gildi, Nef equals nose, a nose tax or poll tax payable to the king. This ancient nose tax was also imposed by the Norsemen on conquered countries, the penalty for defaulters being the loss of their nose. 2. Wadmal was the coarse woolen cloth made in Iceland, and so generally used for clothing that it was a measure of value. In the north, like money, for other commodities. L. 147, of the Jamtaland people. There was once a man called Kettle Jamt, a son of Earl Onand of Sparby, in the Thrandjum district. He fled over the ridge of mountains from Eistian Il Raid, cleared the forest, and settled the country now called the province of Jantaland. A great many people joined him from the Thrandjum land, on account of the disturbances there, for this King Eistian had laid taxes on the Thrandjum people, and set his dog, called Sor, to be king over them. 
Thorer Helsing was Kettle's grandson, and he colonized the province called Helsingjaland, which is named after him. When Harald Harfager subdued the kingdom by force, many people fled out of the country from him, both Thrangem people and Namudal people, and thus new settlements were added to Jamtaland. And some settlers went even eastwards to Helsingjaland and down to the Baltic coast, and all became subjects of the Swedish king. While Hakon Athelstan's foster son was over Norway there was peace, and merchant traffic from Thrangem to Jamtaland. And, as he was an excellent king, the Jamtalanders came from the east to him, paid him scat, and he gave them laws and administered justice. They would rather submit to his government than to the Swedish kings, because they were of Norwegian race. And all the Helsingjallan people, who had their descent from the north side of the mountain ridge, did the same. This continued long after those times, until Olaf the Thick and the Swedish king Olaf quarreled about the boundaries. Then the Jantaland and Helsingjallan people went back to the Swedish king. And then the forest of Ede was the eastern boundary of the land, and the mountain ridge, or keel of the country, the northern, and the Swedish king took scat of Helsingjalland, and also of Jantaland. Now, thought the king of Norway, Olaf, in consequence of the agreement between him and the Swedish king, the scat of Jantaland should be paid differently than before. Although it had long been established that the Jantaland people paid their scat to the Swedish king, and that he appointed officers over the country. The Swedes would listen to nothing, but that all the land to the east of the keel of the country belonged to the Swedish king. Now this went so, as it often happens, that although the kings were brothers-in-law and relations, each would hold fast the dominions which he thought he had a right to. King Olaf had sent a message round in Jantaland, declaring it to be his will that the Jantaland people should be subject to him, threatening them with violence if they refused, but the Jantaland people preferred being subjects of the Swedish king. 148, Stein's Story The Icelanders, Thorod Snorrison and Stein Skaptason, were ill-pleased at not being allowed to do as they liked. Stein was a remarkably handsome man, dexterous at all feats, a great poet, splendid in his apparel, and very ambitious of distinction. His father, Skapti, had composed a poem on King Olaf, which he had taught Stein, with the intention that he should bring it to King Olaf. Stein could not now restrain himself from making the king reproaches in word and speech, both in verse and prose. Both he and Thorod were imprudent in their conversation, and said the king would be looked upon as a worse man than those who, under faith and law, had sent their sons to him, as he now treated them as men without liberty. The king was angry at this. One day Stein stood before the king, and asked if he would listen to the poem which his father Skapti had composed about him. The king replies, Thou must first repeat that, Stein, which thou hast composed about me. Stein replies, that it was not the case that he had composed any. I am no scald, sire, said he, and if I even could compose anything, it, and all that concerns me, would appear to thee of little value. Stein then went out, but thought he perceived what the king alluded to. Thorgir, one of the king's land bailiffs, who managed one of his farms in Orkadal, happened to be present, and heard the conversation of the king and Stein, and soon afterwards Thorgir returned home. One night Stein left the city, and his footboy with him. They went up Galaras and into Orkadal. One evening they came to one of the king's farms which Thorgir had the management of, and Thorgir invited Stein to pass the night there, and asked where he was travelling to. Stein begged the loan of a horse and sledge, for he saw they were just driving home corn. Thorgir replies, I do not exactly see how it stands with thy journey, and if thou art travelling with the king's leave. The other day, methinks, the words were not very sweet that passed between the king and thee. Stein said, If it be so that I am not my own master for the king, yet I will not submit to such treatment from his slaves. And, drawing his sword, he killed the land bailiff. Then he took the horse, put the boy upon him, and sat himself in the sledge, and so drove the whole night. They travelled until they came to Cernadal in Moor. There they had themselves ferried across the fjord, and proceeded onwards as fast as they could. They told nobody about the murder, but wherever they came called themselves king's men, and met good entertainment everywhere. 
One day at last they came towards evening to Giskeil, to Thorberg Arneson's house. He was not at home himself, but his wife Ragenhild, a daughter of Erling Skjolgsen, was. Their stein was well received, because formerly there had been great friendship between them. It had once happened, namely, that Stein, on his voyage from Iceland with his own vessel, had come to Gisk from sea, and had anchored at the island. At that time Ragenhild was in the pains of childbirth, and very ill, and there was no priest on the island, or in the neighborhood of it. There came a message to the merchant vessel to inquire if, by chance, there was a priest on board. There happened to be a priest in the vessel, who was called Bard, but he was a young man from Westford, who had little learning. The messengers begged the priest to go with them, but he thought it was a difficult matter, for he knew his own ignorance, and would not go. Stein added his word to persuade the priest. The priest replies, I will go if thou wilt go with me. For then I will have confidence, if I should require advice. Stein said he was willing, and they went forthwith to the house, and to where Ragenhild was in labor. Soon after she brought forth a female child, which appeared to be rather weak. Then the priest baptized the infant, and Stein held it at the baptism, at which it got the name of Thora, and Stein gave it a gold ring. Ragenhild promised Stein her perfect friendship, and bade him come to her whenever he thought he required her help. Stein replied that he would hold no other female child at baptism, and then they parted. Now it was come to the time when Stein required this kind promise of Ragenheil to be fulfilled, and he told her what had happened, and that the king's wrath had fallen upon him. She answered, that all the aid she could give should stand at his service, but bade him wait for Thorberg's arrival. She then showed him to a seat beside her son Eistianor, who was then twelve years old. Stein presented gifts to Ragenheil and Eistian. Thorberg had already heard how Stein had conducted himself before he got home, and was rather vexed at it. Ragenhild went to him, and told him how matters stood with Stein, and begged Thorberg to receive him, and take care of him. Thorberg replies, I have heard that the king, after sending out a message token, held a thing concerning the murder of Thorgir, and has condemned Stein as having fled the country. And likewise that the king is highly incensed, and I have too much sense to take the cause of a foreigner in hand, and draw upon myself the king's wrath. Let Stein, therefore, withdraw from hence as quickly as thou canst. Ragenhild replied, that they should either both go or both stay. Thorberg told her to go where she pleased. For I expect, said he, that wherever thou goest thou wilt soon come back, for here is thy importance greatest. Her son Eistian or then stood forward, and said he would not stay behind if Ragenhild goes. Thorberg said that they showed themselves very stiff and obstinate in this matter. And it appears that ye must have your way in it, since ye take it so near to heart. But thou art reckoning too much, Ragenhild, upon thy descent, in paying so little regard to King Olaf's word. Ragenhild replied, If thou art so much afraid to keep Stein with thee here, go with him to my father Erling, or give him attendance, so that he may get there in safety. Thorberg said he would not send Stein there. For there are enough of things besides to enrage the king against Erling. Stein thus remained there all winter, A.D. 1027. After Eula King's messenger came to Thorberg, with the order that Thorberg should come to him before midsummer. And the order was serious and severe. Thorberg laid it before his friends, and asked their advice if he should venture to go to the king after what had taken place. The greater number dissuaded him, and thought it more advisable to let Stein slip out of his hands than to venture within the king's power, but Thorberg himself had rather more inclination not to decline the journey. Soon after Thorberg went to his brother Finn, told him the circumstances, and asked him to accompany him. Finn replied, that he thought it foolish to be so completely under woman's influence that he dared not, on account of his wife, keep the fealty in law of his sovereign. Thou art free, replied Thorberg, to go with me or not. But I believe it is more fear of the king than love to him that keeps thee back. And so they parted in anger. Then Thorberg went to his brother Arn Arneson, and asked him to go with him to the king. Arn says, It appears to me wonderful that such a sensible, prudent man, should fall into such a misfortune, without necessity, 
as to incur the king's indignation. It might be excused if it were thy relation or foster brother whom thou hadst thus sheltered, but not at all that thou shouldst take up an Iceland man, and harbour the king's outlaw, to the injury of thyself and all thy relations. Thorberg replies, It stands good, according to the proverb, a rotten branch will be found in every tree. My father's greatest misfortune evidently was that he had such ill luck in producing sons that at last he produced one incapable of acting, and without any resemblance to our race, and whom in truth I never would have called brother. If it were not that it would have been to my mother's shame to have refused. Thorberg turned away in a gloomy temper, and went home. Thereafter he sent a message to his brother Calf in the Thrangem district, and begged him to meet him at Agdanes. And when the messengers found Calf he promised, without more ado, to make the journey. Ragenhild sent men east to Judder to her father Erling, and begged him to send people. Erling's sons, Sigurd and Thord, came out, each with a ship of twenty benches of rowers and ninety men. When they came north Thorberg received them joyfully, entertained them well, and prepared for the voyage with them. Thorberg had also a vessel with twenty benches, and they steered their course northwards. When they came to the mouth of the Thrangem Fjord Thorberg's two brothers, Finn and Arn, were there already, with two ships each of twenty benches. Thorberg met his brothers with joy, and observed that his whetstone had taken effect, and Finn replied he seldom needed sharpening for such work. Then they proceeded north with all their forces to Thrangem, and Stein was along with them. When they came to Agdanes, Calf Arneson was there before them, and he also had a Wellman ship of twenty benches. With this warforce they sailed up to Nidaros, where they lay all night. The morning after they had a consultation with each other. Calf and Erling's sons were for attacking the town with all their forces, and leaving the event to fate, but Thorberg wished that they should first proceed with moderation, and make an offer, in which opinion Finn and Arn also concurred. It was accordingly resolved that Finn and Arn, with a few men, should first wait upon the king. The king had previously heard that they had come so strong in men, and was therefore very sharp in his speech. Finn offered to pay Mulk for Thorberg, and also for Stein, and bade the king to fix what the penalties should be, however large, stipulating only for Thorberg's safety in his fiefs, and for Stein life and limb. The king replies, It appears to me that ye come from home so equipped that ye can determine half as much as I can myself, or more, but this I expected least of all from you brothers, that ye should come against me with an army. And this counsel, I can observe, has its origin from the people of Jadar, but ye have no occasion to offer me money in Mulkt. Finn replies, We brothers have collected men, not to offer hostility to you, sire, but to offer rather our services. But if you will bear down Thorberg altogether, we must all go to King Canute the Great with such forces as we have. Then the king looked at him, and said, If ye brothers will give your oaths that ye will follow me in the country and out of the country, and not part from me without my leave and permission. And shall not conceal from me any treasonable design that may come to your knowledge against me, then will I agree to a peace with you brothers. Then Finn returned to his forces, and told the conditions which the king had proposed to them. Now they held a council upon it, and Thorberg, for his part, said he would accept the terms offered. I have no wish, says he, to fly from my property, and seek foreign masters, but, on the contrary, will always consider it an honour to follow King Olaf, and be where he is. Then says Calf, I will make no oath to King Olaf, but will be with him always, so long as I retain my fiefs and dignities, and so long as the king will be my friend, and my opinion is that we should all do the same. Finn says, we will venture to let King Olaf himself determine in this matter. Arn Arneson says, I was resolved to follow thee, brother Thorberg, even if thou hadst given battle to King Olaf, and I shall certainly not leave thee for listening to better counsel. So I intend to follow thee and Finn, and accept the conditions ye have taken. Thereupon the brothers Thorberg, Finn, and Arn, went on board a vessel, rowed into the fjord, and waited upon the king. The agreement went accordingly into fulfilment, so that the brothers gave their oaths to the king. Then Thorberg endeavoured to make peace for Stein with the king. But the king replied that Stein might for him depart in safety, and go where he pleased, 
but in my house he can never be again. Then Thorberg and his brothers went back to their men. Calf went to Egja, and Finn to the king. And Thorberg, with the other men, went south to their homes. Stein went with Erling's sons, but early in the spring, A.D. 1027, he went west to England into the service of Canute the Great, and was long with him, and was treated with great distinction. 149, Finn Arneson's Expedition to Halagaland. Now when Finn Arneson had been a short time with King Olaf, the king called him to a conference, along with some other persons he usually held consultation with. And in this conference the king spoke to this effect, the decision remains fixed in my mind that in spring I should raise the whole country to a levy both of men and ships, and then proceed, with all the force I can muster. Against King Canute the Great, for I know for certain that he does not intend to treat as a jest the claim he has awakened upon my kingdom. Now I let thee know my will, Finn Arneson, that thou proceed on my errand to Halagaland, and raise the people there to an expedition, men and ships, and summon that force to meet me at Agdanes. Then the king named other men whom he sent to Thrandjum, and some southwards in the country, and he commanded that this order should be circulated through the whole land. Of Finn's voyage we have to relate that he had with him a ship with about thirty men, and when he was ready for sea he prosecuted his journey until he came to Halagaland. There he summoned the bonds to a thing, laid before them his errand, and craved the levy. The bonds in that district had large vessels, suited to a levy expedition, and they obeyed the king's message, and rigged their ships. Now when Finn came farther north in Halagaland he held a thing again, and sent some of his men from him to crave a levy where he thought it necessary. He sent also men to Bjarki Island to Thorar Hund, and there, as elsewhere, craved the quota to the levy. When the message came to Thor he made himself ready, and manned with his house servants the same vessel he had sailed with on his cruise to Bjarmaland, and which he equipped at his own expense. Finn summoned all the people of Halagaland who were to the north to meet at Vagar. There came a great fleet together in spring, and they waited there until Finn returned from the north. Thor Hund had also come there. When Finn arrived he ordered the signal to sound for all the people of the levy to attend the house thing, and at it all the men produced their weapons, and also the fighting men from each ship district were mustered. When that was all finished Finn said, I have also to bring thee a salutation, Thor Hund, from King Olaf, and to ask thee what thou wilt offer him for the murder of his courtman Karl. Or for the robbery in taking the king's goods north in Langjuvik. I have the king's orders to settle that business, and I wait thy answer to it. Thor looked about him, and saw standing on both sides many fully armed men, among whom were Gunstein and others of Karl's kindred. Then said Thor, My proposal is soon made. I will refer altogether to the king's pleasure the matter he thinks he has against me. Finn replies, Thou must put up with a less honor. For thou must refer the matter altogether to my decision, if any agreement is to take place. Thor replies, And even then I think it will stand well with my case, and therefore I will not decline referring it to thee. Thereupon Thor came forward, and confirmed what he said by giving his hand upon it, and Finn repeated first all the words he should say. Finn now pronounced his decision upon the agreement, that Thor should pay to the king ten marks of gold, and to Gunstein and the other kindred ten marks, and for the robbery and loss of goods ten marks more. And all which should be paid immediately. Thor says, this is a heavy money mulked. Without it, replies Finn, there will be no agreement. Thor says, there must time be allowed to gather so much in loan from his followers. But Finn told him to pay immediately on the spot, and besides, Thor should lay down the great ornament which he took from Karl when he was dead. Thor asserted that he had not got the ornament. Then Gunstein pressed forward, and said that Karl had the ornament around his neck when they parted, but it was gone when they took up his corpse. Thor said he had not observed any ornament. But if there was any such thing, it must be lying at home in Jarki. Then Finn put the point of his spear to Thor's breast, and said that he must instantly produce the ornament, on which Thor took the ornament from his neck and gave it to Finn. Thereafter Thor turned away, and went on board his ship. Finn, with many other men, followed him, went through the whole vessel, and took up the hatches. 
At the mast they saw two very large casks, and Finn asked, What are these puncheons? Thora replies, It is my liquor. Finn says, Why don't you give us something to drink then, comrade, since you have so much liquor? Thora ordered his men to run off a bowlful from the puncheons, from which Finn and his people got liquor of the best quality. Now Finn ordered Thora to pay the mulks. Thora went backwards and forwards through the ship, speaking now to the one, now to the other, and Finn calling out to produce the pence. Thora begged him to go to the shore, and said he would bring the money there, and Finn with his men went on shore. Then Thora came and paid silver, of which, from one purse, there were weighed ten marks. Thereafter Thor brought many knotted nightcaps, and in some was one mark, in others half a mark, and in others some small money. This is money my friends and other good people have lent me, said he, for I think all my traveling money is gone. Then Thor went back again to his ship, and returned, and paid the silver by little and little, and this lasted so long that the day was drawing towards evening. When the thing had closed the people had gone to their vessels, and made ready to depart, and as fast as they were ready they hoisted sail and set out, so that most of them were under sail. When Finn saw that they were most of them under sail, he ordered his men to get ready too, but as yet little more than a third part of the mulct had been paid. Then Finn said, This goes on very slowly, Thor, with the payment. I see it costs thee a great deal to pay money. I shall now let it stand for the present, and what remains thou shalt pay to the king himself. Finn then got up and went away. Thora replies, I am well enough pleased, Finn, to part now. But the goodwill is not wanting to pay this debt, so that both thou and the king shall say it is not unpaid. Then Finn went on board his ship, and followed the rest of his fleet. Thora was late before he was ready to come out of the harbour. When the sails were hoisted he steered out over Westford, and went to sea, keeping south along the land so far off that the hilltops were half sunk, and soon the land altogether was sunk from view by the sea. Thor held this course until he got into the English sea, and landed in England. He betook himself to King Canute forthwith, and was well received by him. It then came out that Thor had with him a great deal of property. And, with other things, all the money he and Karl had taken in Jarmaland. In the great liquor casks there were sides within the outer sides, and the liquor was between them. The rest of the casks were filled with furs, and beaver and sable skins. Thora was then with King Canute. Finn came with his forces to King Olaf, and related to him how all had gone upon his voyage, and told at the same time his suspicion that Thora had left the country, and gone west to England to King Canute. And there I fear he will cause as much trouble. The king replies, I believe that Thor must be our enemy, and it appears to me always better to have him at a distance than near. 150. Dispute between Herek and Asmund. Asmund Grankelson had been this winter, A.D. 1027, in Halagaland in his sheriff Dom, and was at home with his father Grankel. There lies a rock out in the sea, on which there is both seal and bird catching, and a fishing ground, and egg gathering. And from old times it had been an appendage to the farm which Grankel owned, but now Herrick of Thjada laid claim to it. It had gone so far, that some years he had taken by force all the gain of this rock. But Asmund and his father thought that they might expect the king's help in all cases in which the right was upon their side. Both father and son went therefore in spring to Herrick, and brought him a message and tokens from King Olaf that he should drop his claim. Herrick answered Asmund crossly, because he had gone to the king with such insinuations, for the just right is upon my side. Thou shouldst learn moderation, Asmund, although thou hast so much confidence in the king's favour. It has succeeded with thee to kill some chiefs, and leave their slaughter unpaid for by any mulct, and also to plunder us, although we thought ourselves at least equal to all of equal birth, and thou art far from being my equal in family. Asmund replies, Many have experienced from thee, Herrick, that thou art of great connections, and too great power, and many in consequence have suffered loss in their property through thee. But it is likely that now thou must turn thyself elsewhere, and not against us with thy violence, and not go altogether against law, as thou art now doing. Then they separated. 
Herek sent ten or twelve of his house servants with a large rowing boat, with which they rowed to the rock, took all that was to be got upon it, and loaded their boat. But when they were ready to return home, Asmund Grankelson came with thirty men, and ordered them to give up all they had taken. Herek's house servants were not quick in complying, so that Asmund attacked them. Some of Herek's men were cudgeled, some wounded, some thrown into the sea, and all they had caught was taken from on board of their boat, and Asmund and his people took it along with them. Then Herek's servants came home, and told him the event. Herek replies, that is called news indeed that seldom happens, never before has it happened that my people have been beaten. The matter dropped. Herek never spoke about it, but was very cheerful. In spring, however, Herek rigged out a cutter of twenty seats of rowers, and manned it with his house servants, and the ship was remarkably well fitted out both with people and all necessary equipment, and Herek went to the levee. But when he came to King Olaf, Asmund was there before him. The king summoned Herek and Asmund to him, and reconciled them so that they left the matter entirely to him. Asmund then produced witnesses to prove that Grankel had owned the rock, and the king gave judgment accordingly. The case had a one-sided result. No mulct was paid for Herek's house servants, and the rock was declared to be Grankel's. Herek observed it was no disgrace to obey the king's decision, whatever way the case itself was decided. 151. Thorod's Story Thorod Snorrison had remained in Norway, according to King Olaf's commands, when Geller Thorkelsen got leave to go to Iceland, as before related. He remained there, A.D. 1027, with King Olaf, but was ill-pleased that he was not free to travel where he pleased. Early in winter, King Olaf, when he was in Nidaros, made it known that he would send people to Jantaland to collect the scat. But nobody had any great desire to go on this business, after the fate of those whom King Olaf had sent before, namely, Thran White and others, twelve in number, who lost their lives, as before related. And the Jantalanders had ever since been subject to the Swedish king. Thorod Snorrison now offered to undertake this journey, for he cared little what became of him if he could but become his own master again. The king consented, and Thorod set out with eleven men in company. They came east to Jantaland, and went to a man called Thor, who was Lagman, and a person in high estimation. They met with a hospitable reception. And when they had been there a while, they explained their business to Thor. He replied, that other men and chiefs of the country had in all respects as much power and right to give an answer as he had, and for that purpose he would call together a thing. It was so done. The message token was sent out, and a numerous thing assembled. Thor went to the thing, but the messengers in the meantime remained at home. At the thing, Thor laid the business before the people, but all were unanimous that no scat should be paid to the king of Norway, and some were for hanging the messengers, others for sacrificing them to the gods. At last it was resolved to hold them fast until the king of Sweden's sheriffs arrived, and they could treat them as they pleased with consent of the people. And that, in the meantime, this decision should be concealed, and the messengers treated well, and detained under pretext that they must wait until the scat is collected. And that they should be separated, and placed two and two, as if for the convenience of boarding them. Thorod and another remained in Thor's house. There was a great yule feast and ale drinking, to which each brought his own liquor. For there were many peasants in the village, who all drank in company together at Yule. There was another village not far distant, where Thor's brother-in-law dwelt, who was a rich and powerful man, and had a grown-up son. The brothers-in-law intended to pass the Yule in drinking feasts, half of it at the house of the one and half with the other, and the feast began at Thor's house. The brothers-in-law drank together, and Thorod and the sons of the peasants by themselves, and it was a drinking match. In the evening words arose, and comparisons between the men of Sweden and of Norway, and then between their kings both of former times and at the present, and of the manslaughters and robberies that had taken place between the countries. Then said the peasant's sons, If our king has lost most people, his sheriffs will make it even with the lives of twelve men when they come from the south after Yule, and ye little know, ye silly fools, why ye are kept here. Thorod took notice of these words, and many made jest about it, 
and scoffed at them and their king. When the ale began to talk out of the hearts of the Jantalanders, what Thorod had before long suspected became evident. The day after Thorod and his comrade took all their clothes and weapons, and laid them ready, and at night, when the people were all asleep, they fled to the forest. The next morning, when the Jantalanders were aware of their flight, men set out after them with dogs to trace them, and found them in a wood in which they had concealed themselves. They brought them home to a room in which there was a deep cellar, into which they were thrown, and the door locked upon them. They had little meat, and only the clothes they had on them. In the middle of Yule, Thor, with all his freeborn men, went to his brothers-in-law, where he was to be a guest until the last of Yule. Thor's slaves were to keep guard upon the cellar, and they were provided with plenty of liquor. But as they observed no moderation in drinking, they became towards evening confused in the head with the ale. As they were quite drunk, those who had to bring meat to the prisoners in the cellar said among themselves that they should want for nothing. Dorod amused the slaves by singing to them. They said he was a clever man, and gave him a large candle that was lighted, and the slaves who were in went to call the others to come in. But they were all so confused with the ale, that in going out they neither locked the cellar nor the room after them. Now Thorod and his comrades tore up their skin clothes in strips, knotted them together, made a noose at one end, and threw up the rope on the floor of the room. It fastened itself around a chest, by which they tried to haul themselves up. Thorod lifted up his comrade until he stood on his shoulders, and from thence scrambled up through the hatch hole. There was no one of ropes in the chamber, and he threw a rope down to Thorod. But when he tried to draw him up, he could not move him from the spot. Then Thorod told him to cast the rope over a cross beam that was in the house, make a loop in it, and place as much wood and stones in the loop as would outweigh him. And the heavy weight went down into the cellar, and Thorod was drawn up by it. Now they took as much clothes as they required in the room. And among other things they took some reindeer hides, out of which they cut sandals, and bound them under their feet, with the hoofs of the reindeer feet trailing behind. But before they set off they set fire to a large corn barn which was close by, and then ran out into the pitch-dark night. The barn blazed, and set fire to many other houses in the village. Thorod and his comrade travelled the whole night until they came to a lonely wood, where they concealed themselves when it was daylight. In the morning they were missed. There was chase made with dogs to trace the footsteps all round the house. But the hounds always came back to the house, for they had the smell of the reindeer hoofs, and followed the scent back on the road that the hoofs had left, and therefore could not find the right direction. Thorod and his comrade wandered long about in the desert forest, and came one evening to a small house, and went in. A man and a woman were sitting by the fire. The man called himself Thor, and said it was his wife who was sitting there, and the hut belonged to them. The peasant asked them to stop there, at which they were well pleased. He told them that he had come to this place, because he had fled from the inhabited district on account of a murder. Thorod and his comrade were well received, and they all got their supper at the fireside. And then the benches were cleared for them, and they lay down to sleep, but the fire was still burning with a clear light. Thorod saw a man come in from another house, and never had he seen so stout a man. He was dressed in a scarlet cloak beset with gold clasps, and was a very handsome appearance. Thorod heard him scold them for taking guests, when they had scarcely food for themselves. The housewife said, Be not angry, brother. Seldom such a thing happens, and rather do them some good too, for thou hast better opportunity to do so than we. Thorod heard also the stout man named by the name of Arnley at Jelline, and observed that the woman of the house was his sister. Thorod had heard speak of Arnliot as the greatest of robbers and malefactors. Thorod and his companion slept the first part of the night, for they were wearied with walking. But when a third of the night was still to come, Arnliot awoke them, told them to get up, and make ready to depart. They arose immediately, put on their clothes, and some breakfast was given them, and Arnliot gave each of them also a pair of skis. Arnliot made himself ready to accompany them, and got upon his skis, which were both broad and long, 
but scarcely had he swung his ski staff before he was a long way past them. He waited for them, and said they would make no progress in this way, and told them to stand upon the edge of his skis beside him. They did so. Thorod stood nearest to him, and held by Arnliot's belt, and his comrade held by him. Arnliot strode on as quickly with them both, as if he was alone and without any weight. The following day they came, towards night, to a lodge for travellers, struck fire, and prepared some food. But Arnliot told them to throw away nothing of their food, neither bones nor crumbs. Arnliot took a silver plate out of the pocket of his cloak, and ate from it. When they were done eating, Arnliot gathered up the remains of their meal, and they prepared to go to sleep. In the other end of the house there was a loft upon crossbeams, and Arnliot and the others went up, and laid themselves down to sleep. Arnliot had a large halberd, of which the upper part was mounted with gold, and the shaft was so long that with his arm stretched out he could scarcely touch the top of it, and he was girt with a sword. They had both their weapons and their clothes up in the loft beside them. Arnliot, who lay outermost in the loft, told them to be perfectly quiet. Soon after twelve men came to the house, who were merchants going with their wares to Jantaland. And when they came into the house they made a great disturbance, were merry, and made a great fire before them, and when they took their supper they cast away all the bones around them. They then prepared to go to sleep, and laid themselves down upon the benches around the fire. When they had been asleep a short time, a huge witch came into the house. And when she came in, she carefully swept together all the bones and whatever was of food kind into a heap, and threw it into her mouth. Then she gripped the man who was nearest to her, writhing and tearing him asunder, and threw him upon the fire. The others awoke in dreadful fright and sprang up, but she took them, and put them one by one to death, so that only one remained in life. He ran under the loft calling for help, and if there was any one on the loft to help him. Arnliot reached down his hand, seized him by the shoulder, and drew him up into the loft. The witch-wife had turned towards the fire, and began to eat the men who were roasting. Now Arnliot stood up, took his halberd, and struck her between the shoulders, so that the point came out at her breast. She writhed with it, gave a dreadful shriek, and sprang up. The halberd slipped from Arnliot's hands, and she ran out with it. Arnliot then went in, cleared away the dead corpses out of the house, set the door and the doorposts up, for she had torn them down in going out, and they slept the rest of the night. When the day broke they got up. And first they took their breakfast. When they had got food, Arnliot said, Now we must part here. Ye can proceed upon the new traced path the merchants have made in coming here yesterday. In the meantime I will seek after my halberd, and in reward for my labor I will take so much of the goods these men had with them as I find useful to me. Thou, Thorod, must take my salutation to King Olaf. And say to him that he is the man I am most desirous to see, although my salutation may appear to him of little worth. Then he took his silver plate, wiped it dry with a cloth, and said, Give King Olaf this plate. Salute him, and say it is from me. Then they made themselves ready for their journey, and parted. Thorod went on with his comrade and the man of the merchant's company who had escaped. He proceeded until he came to King Olaf in the town, Nidaros. Told the king all that had happened, and presented to him the silver plate. The king said it was wrong that Arnliot himself had not come to him. For it is a pity so brave a hero, and so distinguished a man, should have given himself up to misdeeds. Thorod remained the rest of the winter with the king, and in summer got leave to return to Iceland. And he and King Olaf parted the best of friends. 152, King Olaf's Levy of Men King Olaf made ready in spring, A.D. 1027, to leave Nidaros, and many people were assembled about him, both from Thrandjum and the northern country. And when he was ready he proceeded first with his men to Moor, where he gathered the men of the levy, and did the same at Romsdal. He went from thence to South Moor. He lay a long time at the Hiri Isles waiting for his forces. And he often held house things, as many reports came to his ears about which he thought it necessary to hold councils. 
In one of these things he made a speech, in which he spoke of the loss he suffered from the fairy islanders. The scat which they promised me, he said, is not forthcoming, and I now intend to send men thither after it. Then he proposed to different men to undertake this expedition, but the answer was, that all declined the adventure. Then there stood up a stout and very remarkable looking man in the thing. He was clad in a red kirtle, had a helmet on his head, a sword in his belt, and a large halberd in his hands. He took up the word and said, In truth here is a great want of men. Ye have a good king, but ye are bad servants who say no to this expedition he offers you, although ye have received many gifts of friendship and tokens of honour from him. I have hitherto been no friend of the king, and he has been my enemy, and says, besides, that he has good grounds for being so. Now, I offer, sire, to go upon this expedition, if no better will undertake it. The king answers, Who is this brave man who replies to my offer? Thou showest thyself different from the other men here present, in offering thyself for this expedition from which they excuse themselves, although I expected they would willingly have undertaken it. But I do not know thee in the least, and do not know thy name. He replies, My name, sire, is not difficult to know, and I think thou hast heard my name before. I am Karl Morsk. The king, so this is Karl. I have indeed heard thy name before. And, to say the truth, there was a time when our meeting must have been such, if I had had my will, that thou shouldst not have had to tell it now. But I will not show myself worse than thou, but will join my thanks and my favour to the side of the help thou hast offered me. Now thou shalt come to me, Karl, and be my guest today, and then we shall consult together about this business. Karl said it should be so. 153, Karl Morsk's Story Karl Morsk had been a Viking, and a celebrated robber. Often had the king sent out men against him, and wished to make an end of him. But Karl, who was a man of high connection, was quick in all his doings, and besides a man of great dexterity, an expert in all feats. Now when Karl had undertaken this business the king was reconciled to him, gave him his friendship, and let him be fitted out in the best manner for this expedition. There were about twenty men in the ship. And the king sent messages to his friends in the Fairy Islands, and recommended him also to Lifa Sersen and Lagman Gil, for aid and defence, and for this purpose furnished Karl with tokens of the full powers given him. Karl set out as soon as he was ready, and as he got a favourable breeze soon came to the Fairy Islands, and landed at Thorshavn, in the island Stromi. A thing was called, to which there came a great number of people. Thrand of Gadda came with a great retinue, and Leif and Giel came there also, with many in their following. After they had set up their tents, and put themselves in order, they went to Karl Morsk, and saluted each other on both sides in a friendly way. Then Karl produced King Olaf's words, tokens, and friendly message to Leif and Giel, who received them in a friendly manner, invited Karl to come to them, and promised him to support his errand, and give him all the aid in their power. For which he thanked them. Soon after came Thrand of Gadda, who also received Karl in the most friendly manner, and said he was glad to see so able a man coming to their country on the king's business, which they were all bound to promote. I will insist, Karl, says he, on thy taking up thy winter abode with me, together with all those of thy people who may appear to thee necessary for thy dignity. Karl replies, that he had already settled to lodge with Leif. Otherwise I would with great pleasure have accepted thy invitation. Then fate has given great honour to Leif, says Thrand, but is there any other way in which I can be of service? Karl replies, that he would do him a great service by collecting the scat of the eastern island, and of all the northern islands. Thrand said it was both his duty and interest to assist in the king's business, and thereupon Thrand returned to his tent, and at that thing nothing else worth speaking of occurred. Karl took up his abode with Leif Asursen, and was there all winter, A.D. 1028. Leif collected the scat of Stromi Island, and all the islands south of it. The spring after Thrand of Gadda fell ill, and had sore eyes and other complaints. But he prepared to attend the thing, as was his custom. When he came to the thing he had his tent put up, and within it another black tent, that the light might not penetrate. 
After some days of the thing had passed, Leif and Carl came to Thran's tent, with a great many people, and found some person standing outside. They asked if Thrand was in the tent, and were told he was. Leif told them to bid Thrand come out, as he and Carl had some business with him. They came back, and said that Thrand had sore eyes, and could not come out, but he begs thee, Leif, to come to him within. Leif told his comrades to come carefully into the tent, and not to press forward, and that he who came last and should go out first. Leif went in first, followed by Carl, and then his comrades, and all fully armed as if they were going into battle. Leif went into the black tent and asked if Thrand was there. Thrand answered and saluted Leif. Leif returned his salutation, and asked if he had brought the scat from the northern islands, and if he would pay the scat that had been collected. Thrand replies, that he had not forgotten what had been spoken of between him and Carl, and that he would now pay over the scat. Here is a purse, Leif, full of silver, which thou canst receive. Leif looked around, and saw but few people in the tent, of whom some were lying upon the benches, and a few were sitting up. Then Leif went to Thrand, and took the purse, and carried it into the outer tent, where it was light, turned out the money on his shield, groped about in it with his hand, and told Carl to look at the silver. When they had looked at it a while, Carl asked Leif what he thought of the silver. He replied, I am thinking where the bad money that is in the North Isles can have come from. Thrand heard this, and said, Do you not think, Leif, the silver is good? No, says he. Thrand replies, Our relations, then, are rascals not to be trusted. I sent them in spring to collect the scat in the North Isles, as I could not myself go anywhere, and they have allowed themselves to be bribed by the bonds to take false money, which nobody looks upon as current and good. It is better, therefore, Leif, to look at this silver which has been paid me as land rent. Leif thereupon carried back this silver, and received another bag, which he carried to Carl, and they looked over the money together. Carl asked Leif what he thought of this money. He answered, that it appeared to him so bad that it would not be taken in payment, however little hope there might be of getting a debt paid in any other way, therefore I will not take this money upon the king's account. A man who had been lying on the bench now cast the skin coverlet off which he had drawn over his head, and said, True is the old word, he grows worse who grows older, so it is with thee, Thrand. Who allowest Karl Morsk to handle thy money all the day? This was got the red. Thrand sprang up at God's words, and reprimanded his relation with many angry words. At last he said that Leif should leave this silver, and take a bag which his own peasants had brought him in spring. And although I am weak-sighted, yet my own hand is the truest test. Another man who was lying on the bench raised himself now upon his elbow, and this was Thord the Low. He said, These are no ordinary reproaches we suffer from Karl Morsk and therefore he well deserves a reward for them. Leif in the meantime took the bag, and carried it to Carl. And when they cast their eyes on the money, Leif said, We need not look long at this silver, for here the one piece of money is better than the other, and this is the money we will have. Let a man come to be present at the counting it out. Fran says that he thought Leif was the fittest man to do it upon his account. Leif and Carl thereupon went a short way from the tent, sat down, and counted and weighed the silver. Carl took the helmet off his head, and received in it the weighed silver. They saw a man coming to them who had a stick with an axe head on it in his hand, a hat low upon his head, and a short green cloak. He was bare-legged, and had linen breeches untied at the knee. He laid his stick down in the field, and went to Carl and said, Take care, Carl Morsk, that thou dost not hurt thyself against my axe stick. Immediately a man came running in calls with great haste to Leif Osirson, telling him to come as quickly as possible to Lagmangil's tent. For, says he, Sirid Thorlaxen ran in just now into the mouth of the tent, and gave one of Gilles men a desperate wound. Leif rose up instantly, and went off to Gilles' tent along with his men. Karl remained sitting, and the Norway people stood around in all corners. God immediately sprang up, and struck with a hand axe over the heads of the people, and the stroke came on Karl's head, but the wound was slight. Thord the Low seized the stick axe, which lay in the field at his side, 
and struck the axe blade right into Carl's skull. Many people now streamed out of Fran's tent. Carl was carried away dead. Fran was much grieved at this event, and offered money mulks for his relations, but Leif and Gilles, who had to prosecute the business, would accept no mulked. Sigurd was banished the country for having wounded Gilles' tent comrade, and got and thored for the murder of Carl. The Norway people rigged out the vessel which Carl had with him, and sailed eastward to Olaf, and gave him these tidings. He was in no pleasant humor at it, and threatened a speedy vengeance. But it was not allotted by fate to King Olaf to revenge himself on Thrand and his relations, because of the hostilities which had begun in Norway, and which are now to be related. And there is nothing more to be told of what happened after King Olaf sent men to the fairy islands to take scat of them. But great strife arose after Carl's death in the fairy islands between the family of Thrand of Gata and Leif Asursen, and of which there are great sagas. 154 King Olaf's Expedition with his Levy Now we must proceed with the relation we began before, that King Olaf set out with his men, and raised a levy over the whole country, A.D. 1027. All lendermen in the north followed him excepting Einar Tambaskelfer, who sat quietly at home upon his farm since his return to the country, and did not serve the king. Einar had great estates and wealth, although he held no fiefs from the king, and he lived splendidly. King Olaf sailed with his fleet south around Stad, and many people from the districts around joined him. King Olaf himself had a ship which he had got built the winter before, A.D. 1027, and which was called the Visand, 1. It was a very large ship, with a bison's head gilded all over upon the bow. Sigvat the Skald speaks thus of it. Trigvason's long serpent bore. Grim gaping o'er the waves before. A dragon's head with open throat. When last the hero was afloat. His cruise was closed. As God disposed. Olaf has raised a bison's head. Which proudly seems the waves to tread. While o'er its golden forehead dashing. The waves its glittering horns are washing. May God dispose. A luckier close. The king went on to Hordaland. There he heard the news that Erling Skjalgsen had left the country with a great force, and four or five ships. He himself had a large warship, and his sons had three of twenty rowing banks each. And they had sailed westward to England to Canute the Great. Then King Olaf sailed eastward along the land with a mighty warforce, and he inquired everywhere if anything was known of Canute's proceedings. And all agreed in saying he was in England but added that he was fitting out a levy, and intended coming to Norway. As Olaf had a large fleet, and could not discover with certainty where he should go to meet King Canute, and as his people were dissatisfied with lying quiet in one place with so large an armament. He resolved to sail with his fleet south to Denmark, and took with him all the men who were best appointed and most warlike. And he gave leave to the others to return home. Now the people whom he thought of little use having gone home, King Olaf had many excellent and stout men at arms besides those who, as before related, had fled the country, or sat quietly at home. And most of the chief men and lendermen of Norway were along with him. End notes. 1. Visender is the buffalo. Although the modern bison, or American animal of that name, might have been known through the Greenland colonists, who in this reign had visited some parts of America. L. 155, of King Olaf and King Anand. When King Olaf sailed to Denmark, he set his course for Sealand, and when he came there he made incursions on the land, and began to plunder. The country people were severely treated, some were killed, some bound and dragged to the ships. All who could do so took to flight, and made no opposition. King Olaf committed there the greatest ravages. While Olaf was in Sealand, the news came that King Anand Olafsson of Sweden had raised a levy, and fallen upon Scania, and was ravaging there. And then it became known what the resolution had been that the two kings had taken at the Gott River, where they had concluded a union and friendship, and had bound themselves to oppose King Canute. King Anand continued his march until he met his brother-in-law King Olaf. When they met they made proclamation both to their own people and to the people of the country, 
that they intended to conquer Denmark. And asked the support of the people of the country for this purpose. And it happened, as we find examples of everywhere, that if hostilities are brought upon the people of a country not strong enough to withstand, the greatest number will submit to the conditions by which peace can be purchased at any rate. So it happened here that many men went into the service of the kings, and agreed to submit to them. Wheresoever they went they laid the country all round subjection to them, and otherwise laid waste all with fire and sword. Of this foray Sigvat the Skald speaks, in a ballad he composed concerning King Canute the Great. Canute is on the sea. The news is told. And the Norsemen bold. Repeat it with great glee. And it runs from mouth to mouth. On a lucky day. We came away. From Throngem to the south. Across the cold East Sea. The Swedish king. His host did bring. To gain great victory. King Anand came to fight. In Sealand's plains. Against the Danes. With his steel-clad men so bright. Canute is on the land. Side to side. His long ships ride. Along the yellow strand. Where waves wash the green banks. Mast to mast. All bound fast. His great fleet lies in ranks. 156, of King Canute the Great. King Canute had heard in England that King Olaf of Norway had called out a levy, and had gone with his forces to Denmark, and was making great ravages in his dominions there. Canute began to gather people, and he had speedily collected a great army and a numerous fleet. Earl Hakon was second in command over the whole. Sigvat the Skald came this summer, A.D. 1027, from the west, from Ruda, Rouen, in Valland, and with him was a man called Berg. They had made a merchant voyage there the summer before. Sigvat had made a little poem about this journey, called, The Western Traveler's Song, which begins thus. Berg. Many a merry morn was past. When our vessel was made fast. And we lay on the glittering tide. Or Rouen River's western side. When Sigvat came to England he went directly to King Canute, and asked his leave to proceed to Norway, for King Canute had forbidden all merchant vessels to sail until he himself was ready with his fleet. When Sigvat arrived he went to the house in which the king was lodged, but the doors were locked, and he had to stand a long time outside, but when he got admittance he obtained the permission he desired. He then sang. The way to Jutland's king I sought. A little patience I was taught. The doors were shut, all full within. The Udaller could not get in. But Gorm's great son did condescend. To his own chamber me to send. And grant my prayer, although I'm one. Whose arms the fetters weight have known. When Sigvat became aware that King Canute was equipping an armament against King Olaf, and knew what a mighty force King Canute had, he made these lines. The mighty Canute, and Earl Hakon. Have leagued themselves. And counsel taken. Against King Olaf's life. And are ready for the strife. In spite of King and Earl, I say. I love him well, may he get away. On the fields, wild and dreary. With him I'd live, and ne'er be weary. Sigvat made many other songs concerning this expedition of Canute and Hakon. He made this among others. Twas not the Earl's intention then. Twixt Olaf and the Yudelman. Peace to establish, and the land. Upright to hold with Northman's hand. But ever with deceit and lies. Eirik's descendant, Hakon, tries. To make ill will and discontent. Till all the Yudelman are bent. Against King Olaf's rule to rise. 157 of King Canute's ship the dragon. Canute the Great was at last ready with his fleet, and left the land, and a vast number of men he had, and ships frightfully large. He himself had a dragon ship, so large that it had sixty banks of rowers, and the head was gilt all over. Earl Hakon had another dragon of forty banks, and it also had a gilt figure head. The sails of both were in stripes of blue, red, and green, and the vessels were painted all above the waterstroke. 
and all that belonged to their equipment was most splendid. They had also many other huge ships remarkably well fitted out, and grand. Sigvat the Skald talks of this in his song on Canute. Canute is out beneath the sky. Canute of the clear blue eye. The king is out on the ocean's breast. Leading his grand fleet from the west. On to the east the shipmasts glide. Glancing and bright each long ship's side. The conqueror of great Ethelred. Canute, is there, his foeman's dread. His dragon with her sails of blue. All bright and brilliant to the view. High hoisted on the yard arms wide. Carries great Canute o'er the tide. Brave is the royal progress, fast. The proud ship's keel obeys the mast. Dashes through foam, and gains the land. Raising a surge on Lymphjord strand. It is related that King Canute sailed with this vast force from England, and came with all his force safely to Denmark, where he went into Lymphjord, and there he found gathered besides a large army of the men of the country. 158. Hardenat taken to be king in Denmark. Earl Ulf Sprakelexen had been set as protector over Denmark when King Canute went to England, and the king had entrusted his son Hardenat in the earl's hands. This took place the summer before, A.D. 1026, as we related. But the earl immediately gave it out that King Canute had, at parting, made known to him his will and desire that the Danes should take his son Hardenat as king over the Danish dominions. On that account, says the earl, he gave the matter into our hands. As I, and many other chiefs and leading men here in the country, have often complained to King Canute of the evil consequences to the country of being without a king. And that former kings thought it honor and power enough to rule over the Danish kingdom alone. And in the times that are past many kings have ruled over this kingdom. But now there are greater difficulties than have ever been before. For we have been so fortunate hitherto as to live without disturbance from foreign kings, but now we hear the king of Norway is going to attack us, to which is added the fear of the people that the Swedish king will join him. And now King Canute is in England. The earl then produced King Canute's letter and seal, confirming all that the earl asserted. Many other chiefs supported this business. And in consequence of all these persuasions the people resolved to take Hardenat as king, which was done at the same thing. The Queen Emma had been principal promoter of this determination. For she had got the letter to be written, and provided with the seal, having cunningly got hold of the king's signet, but from him it was all concealed. Now when Hardenat and Earl Ulf heard for certain that King Olaf was come from Norway with a large army, they went to Jutland, where the greatest strength of the Danish kingdom lies, sent out message tokens, and summoned to them a great force. But when they heard the Swedish king was also come with his army, they thought they would not have strength enough to give battle to both, and therefore kept their army together in Jutland, and resolved to defend the country against the kings. The whole of their ships they assembled in Lymphjord, and waited thus for King Canute. Now when they heard that King Canute had come from the west to Lymphjord they sent men to him, and to Queen Emma, and begged her to find out if the king was angry at them or not, and to let them know. The queen talked over the matter with him, and said, Your son Hardenat will pay the full milk the king may demand, if he has done anything which is thought to be against the king. He replies, that Hardenat has not done this of his own judgment. And therefore, says he, it has turned out as might have been expected, that when he, a child, and without understanding, wanted to be called king, the country, when any evil came and an enemy appeared, must be conquered by foreign princes if our might had not come to his aid. If he will have any reconciliation with me let him come to me, and lay down the mock title of king he has given himself. The queen sent these very words to Hardenat, and at the same time she begged him not to decline coming. For, as she truly observed, he had no force to stand against his father. When this message came to Hardenat he asked the advice of the earl and other chief people who were with him. But it was soon found that when the people heard King Canute the Old was arrived they all streamed to him, and seemed to have no confidence but in him alone. Then Earl Ulf and his fellows saw they had but two roads to take. Either to go to the king and leave all to his mercy, or to fly the country. All pressed Hardenat to go to his father, 
which advice he followed. When they met he fell at his father's feet, and laid his seal, which accompanied the kingly title, on his knee. King Canute took Hardenat by the hand, and placed him in as high a seat as he used to sit in before. Earl Ulf sent his son Sven, who was a sister's son of King Canute, and the same age as Hardenat, to the king. He prayed for grace and reconciliation for his father, and offered himself as hostage for the earl. King Canute ordered him to tell the earl to assemble his men and ships, and come to him, and then they would talk of reconciliation. The earl did so. 159, Foray in Scania. When King Olaf and King Anand heard that King Canute was come from the west, and also that he had a vast force, they sailed east to Scania, and allowed themselves to ravage and burn in the districts there. And then proceeded eastward along the land to the frontier of Sweden. As soon as the country people heard that King Canute was come from the west, no one thought of going into the service of the two kings. Now the kings sailed eastward along the coast, and brought up in a river called Helga, and remained there some time. When they heard that King Canute was coming eastward with his forces against them, they held a council. And the result was, that King Olaf with his people went up the country to the forest, and to the lake out of which the river Helga flows. There at the riverhead they made a dam of timber and turf, and dammed in the lake. They also dug a deep ditch, through which they led several waters, so that the lake waxed very high. In the riverbed they laid large logs of timber. They were many days about this work, and King Olaf had the management of this piece of artifice. But King Anand had only to command the fleet and army. When King Canute heard of the proceedings of the two kings, and of the damage they had done to his dominions, he sailed right against them to where they lay in Helga River. He had a war force which was one half greater than that of both the kings together. Sigvat speaks of these things. The king, who shields his Jutland fields from scathe or harm by foeman's arm will not allow wild plundering now the greatest he on land or sea. 160, Battle in Helga River. One day, towards evening, King Anand's spies saw King Canute coming sailing along, and he was not far off. Then King Anand ordered the war horns to sound. On which his people struck their tents, put on their weapons, rode out of the harbor and east round the land, bound their ships together, and prepared for battle. King Anand made his spies run up the country to look for King Olaf, and tell him the news. Then King Olaf broke up the dam, and let the river take its course. King Olaf traveled down in the night to his ships. When King Canute came outside the harbor, he saw the forces of the kings ready for battle. He thought that it would be too late in the day to begin the fight by the time his forces could be ready. For his fleet required a great deal of room at sea, and there was a long distance between the foremost of his ships and the hindmost, and between those outside and those nearest the land, and there was but little wind. Now, as Canute saw that the Swedes and Norwegians had quitted the harbour, he went into it with as many ships as it could hold, but the main strength of the fleet lay without the harbour. In the morning, when it was light, a great part of the men went on shore, some for amusement, some to converse with the people of other ships. They observed nothing until the water came rushing over them like a waterfall, carrying huge trees, which drove in among their ships, damaging all they struck, and the water covered all the fields. The men on shore perished, and many who were in the ships. All who could do it cut their cables, so that the ships were loose, and drove before the stream, and were scattered here and there. The great dragon, which King Canute himself was in, drove before the stream, and as it could not so easily be turned with oars, drove out among Olaf's and Anand's ships. As they knew the ship, they laid her on board on all quarters. But the ship was so high in the hull, as if it were a castle, and had besides such a numerous and chosen crew on board, well armed and exercised, that it was not easy to attack her. After a short time also Earl Ulf came up with his fleet. And then the battle began, and King Canute's fleet gathered together from all quarters. But the kings Olaf and Anand, seeing they had for this time got all the victory that fate permitted them to gain, let their ships retreat, cast themselves loose from King Canute's ship, 
and the fleet separated. But as the attack had not been made as King Canute had determined, he made no further attempt, and the kings on each side arranged their fleets and put their ships in order. When the fleets were parted, and each sailing its course, Olaf and Anand looked over their forces, and found they had suffered no loss of men. In the meantime they saw that if they waited until King Canute got his large fleet in order to attack them, the difference of force was so great that for them there was little chance of victory. It was also evident that if the battle was renewed, they must suffer a great loss of men. They took the resolution, therefore, to row with the whole fleet eastward along the coast. Observing that King Canute did not pursue them, they raised up their masts and set sail. Ottersvart tells thus of it in the poem he composed upon King Canute the Great. The king, in battle fray, drove the Swedish host away. The wolf did not miss prey, nor the raven on that day. Great Canute might deride two kings if he had pride. For at Helga River's side, they would not his sword abide. Thord Sherexen also sang these lines in his death song of King Olaf. King Olaf, Agder's lord, ne'er shunned the Jutland king, but with his blue-edged sword, broke many a panzer ring. King Canute was not slow. King Anand filled the plain. With dead, killed by his bow, the wolf howled o'er the slain. 161, King Olaf and King Anand's Plans King Olaf and King Anand sailed eastward to the Swedish king's dominions. And one day, towards evening, landed at a place called Barvik, where they lay all night. But then it was observed of the Swedes that they were homesick. For the greater part of their forces sailed eastward along the land in the night, and did not stop their course until they came home to their houses. Now when King Anand observed this he ordered, as soon as the day dawned, to sound the signal for a house thing, and the whole people went on shore, and the thing sat down. Then King Anand took up the word, and spake thus, So it is, King Olaf, that, as you know, we have been assembled in summer, and have forayed wide around in Denmark, and have gained much booty, but no land. I had three hundred and fifty vessels, and now have not above one hundred remaining with me. Now it appears to me we can make no greater progress than we have made, although you have still the sixty vessels which have followed you the whole summer. It therefore appears to me best that we come back to my kingdom, for it is always good to drive home with the wagon safe. In this expedition we have won something, and lost nothing. Now I will offer you, King Olaf, to come with me, and we shall remain assembled during the winter. Take as much of my kingdom as you will, so that you and the men who follow you may support yourselves well. And when spring comes let us take such measures as we find serviceable. If you, however, will prefer to travel across our country, and go overland to Norway, it shall be free for you to do so. King Olaf thanked King Anand for his friendly offer. But if I may advise, says he, then we should take another resolution, and keep together the forces we have still remaining. I had in the first of summer, before I left Norway, 350 ships. But when I left the country I chose from among the whole war levy those I thought to be the best, and with them I manned sixty ships, and these I still have. Now it appears to me that the part of your warforce which has now run away is the most worthless, and of least resistance. But now I see here all your chiefs and leaders, and I know well that the people who belong to the court troops, one, are by far the best suited to carry arms. We have here chosen men and superb ships, and we can very well lie all winter in our ships, as Vikings' custom is. But Canute cannot lie long in Helga River, for the harbour will not hold so many vessels as he has. If he steers eastward after us, we can escape from him, and then people will soon gather to us, but if he return to the harbours where his fleet can lie, I know for certain that the desire to return home will not be less in his army than in ours. I think, also, we have ravaged so widely in summer, that the villagers, both in Scania and in Halland, know well whose favour they have to seek. Canute's army will thus be dispersed so widely, that it is uncertain to whom fate may at the last give the victory, but let us first find out what resolution he takes. Thus King Olaf ended his speech, and it found much applause, 
and his advice was followed. Spies were sent into King Canute's army, and both the kings Olaf and Anand remained lying where they were. End notes. 1. The Thing Men, or Hired Bodyguard Attending the Court. L. 162, of King Canute and Earl Ulf. When King Canute saw that the kings of Norway and Sweden steered eastward with their forces along the coast, he sent men to ride night and day on the land to follow their movements. Some spies went forward, others returned. So that King Canute had news every day of their progress. He had also spies always in their army. Now when he heard that a great part of the fleet had sailed away from the kings, he turned back with his forces to Sealand, and lay with his whole fleet in the sound, so that a part lay on the Scania side, and a part on the Sealand side. King Canute himself, the day before Michaelmas, rode with a great retinue to Roskilde. There his brother-in-law, Earl Ulf, had prepared a great feast for him. The Earl was the most agreeable host, but the King was silent and sullen. The Earl talked to him in every way to make him cheerful, and brought forward everything which he thought would amuse him, but the King remained stern, and speaking little. At last the Earl proposed to him a game at chess, which he agreed to. And a chess board was produced, and they played together. Earl Ulf was hasty in temper, stiff, and in nothing yielding, but everything he managed went on well in his hands, and he was a great warrior, about whom there are many stories. He was the most powerful man in Denmark next to the king. Earl Ulf's sister Gaida was married to Earl Guden, Godwin, Ulfnatsen, and their sons were Harold King of England, and Earl Toast, Earl Valthief, Earl Moricare, and Earl Sven. Gaida was the name of their daughter, who was married to the English King Edward the Good. 163, of the Earl's Murder. When they had played a while the king made a false move, at which the Earl took a knight from the king. But the king set the piece again upon the board, and told the Earl to make another move, but the Earl grew angry, threw over the chessboard, stood up, and went away. The king said, Runnest thou away, Ulf the coward? The earl turned round at the door and said, Thou wouldst have run farther at Helga River, if thou hadst come to battle there. Thou didst not call me Ulf the coward, when I hastened to thy help while the Swedes were beating thee like a dog. The earl then went out, and went to bed. A little later the king also went to bed. The following morning while the king was putting on his clothes he said to his footboy, Go thou to Earl Ulf, and kill him. The lad went, was away a while, and then came back. The king said, Hast thou killed the earl? I did not kill him, for he was gone to St. Lucius Church. There was a man called Ivar White, a Norwegian by birth, who was the king's court man and chamberlain. The king said to him, Go thou and kill the earl. Ivar went to the church, and in at the choir, and thrust his sword through the earl, who died on the spot. Then Ivar went to the king, with the bloody sword in his hand. The king said, Hast thou killed the earl? I have killed him, says he. Thou didst well. After the earl was killed the monks closed the church, and locked the doors. When that was told the king he sent a message to the monks, ordering them to open the church and sing high mass. They did as the king ordered. And when the king came to the church he bestowed on it great property, so that it had a large domain, by which that place was raised very high, and these lands have since always belonged to it. King Canute rode down to his ships, and lay there till late in harvest with a very large army. 164, of King Olaf and the Swedes. When King Olaf and King Anand heard that King Canute had sailed to the Sound, and lay there with a great force, the kings held a house thing, and spoke much about what resolution they should adopt. King Olaf wished they should remain there with all the fleet, and see what King Canute would at last resolve to do. But the Swedes held it to be unadvisable to remain until the frost set in, and so it was determined. And King Anand went home with all his army, and King Olaf remained lying after them. 165, of Egil and Tiofi. While King Olaf lay there, he had frequently conferences and consultations with his people. One night Egil Halson and Tof Valgautsen had the watch upon the king's ship. Tof came from West Gotland, and was a man of high birth. 
While they sat on watch they heard much lamentation and crying among the people who had been taken in the war, and who lay bound on the shore at night. Tov said it made him ill to hear such distress, and asked Egil to go with him, and let loose these people. This work they set about, cut the cords, and let the people escape, and they looked upon it as a piece of great friendship. But the king was so enraged at it, that they themselves were in the greatest danger. When Egil afterwards fell sick the king for a long time would not visit him, until many people entreated it of him. It vexed Egil much to have done anything the king was angry at, and he begged his forgiveness. The king now dismissed his wrath against Egil, laid his hands upon the side on which Egil's pain was, and sang a prayer. Upon which the pain ceased instantly, and Egil grew better. Tof came, after entreaty, into reconciliation with the king, on condition that he should exhort his father Valgaut to come to the king. He was a heathen. But after conversation with the king he went over to Christianity, and died instantly when he was baptized. 166. Treachery Towards King Olaf King Olaf had now frequent conferences with his people, and asked advice from them, and from his chiefs, as to what he should determine upon. But there was no unanimity among them, some considering that unadvisable which others considered highly serviceable, and there was much indecision in their counsels. King Canute had always spies in King Olaf's army, who entered into conversation with many of his men, offering them presents and favor on account of King Canute. Many allowed themselves to be seduced, and gave promises of fidelity, and to be King Canute's men, and bring the country into his hands if he came to Norway. This was apparent, afterwards, of many who at first kept it concealed. Some took at once money bribes, and others were promised money afterwards. And a great many there were who had got great presents of money from him before, for it may be said with truth of King Canute, that every man who came to him, and who he thought had the spirit of a man and would like his favor, got his hands full of gifts and money. On this account he was very popular, although his generosity was principally shown to foreigners, and was greatest the greater distance they came from. 167. King Olaf's Consultations King Olaf had often conferences and meetings with his people, and asked their counsel. But as he observed they gave different opinions, he had a suspicion that there must be some who spoke differently from what they really thought advisable for him, and he was thus uncertain if all gave him due fidelity in counsel. Some pressed that with the first fair wind they should sail to the Sound, and so to Norway. They said the Danes would not dare to attack them, although they lay with so great a force right in the way. But the king was a man of too much understanding not to see that this was impracticable. He knew also that Olaf Tryggvason had found it quite otherwise, as to the Danes not daring to fight, when he with a few people went into battle against a great body of them. The king also knew that in King Canute's army there were a great many Norwegians, therefore he entertained the suspicion that those who gave this advice were more favorable to King Canute than to him. King Olaf came at last to the determination, from all these considerations, that the people who would follow him should make themselves ready to proceed by land across Gotland, and so to Norway. But our ships, said he, and all things that we cannot take with us, I will send eastward to the Swedish king's dominions, and let them be taken care of for us there. 168. Herek of Thjada's Voyage Herek of Thjada replied thus to the king's speech, It is evident that I cannot travel on foot to Norway. I am old and heavy, and little accustomed to walking. Besides, I am unwilling to part with my ship. For on that ship and its apparel I have bestowed so much labor, that it would go much against my inclination to put her into the hands of my enemies. The king said, Come along with us, Herek, and we shall carry thee when thou art tired of walking. Then Herek sang these lines. I, eleven mount my ocean steed. And o'er the sea I'll speed. Forests and hills are not for me. I love the moving sea. Though Canute block the sound. Rather than walk the ground. And leave my ship, I'll see. What my ship will do for me. Then King Olaf let everything be put in order for the journey. The people had their walking clothing and weapons, but their other clothes and effects they packed upon such horses as they could get. Then he sent off people to take his ships east to Kalmar. 
There he had the vessels laid up, and the ship's apparel and other goods taken care of. Herek did as he had said, and waited for a wind, and then sailed west to Scania, until, about the decline of the day, he came with a fresh and fair wind to the eastward of Holer. There he let the sail and the vane, and flag and mast be taken down, and let the upper works of the ship be covered over with some grey till canvas, and let a few men sit at the oars in the forepart and aft. But the most were sitting low down in the vessel. When Canute's watchmen saw the ship, they talked with each other about what ship it might be, and made the guess that it must be one loaded with herrings or salt, as they only saw a few men at the oars. And the ship, besides, appeared to them grey, and wanting tar, as if burnt up by the sun, and they saw also that it was deeply loaded. Now when Herek came farther through the sound, and passed the fleet, he raised the mast, hoisted sail, and set up his gilded vane. The sail was white as snow, and in it were red and blue stripes of cloth interwoven. When the king's men saw the ship sailing in this state, they told the king that probably King Olaf had sailed through them. But King Canute replies, that King Olaf was too prudent a man to sail with a single ship through King Canute's fleet, and thought it more likely to be Herek of Thjada, or the like of him. Many believed the truth to be that King Canute knew of this expedition of Herek, and that it would not have succeeded so if they had not concluded a friendship beforehand with each other. Which seemed likely, after King Canute's and Herek's friendly understanding became generally known. Herek made this song as he sailed northward round the Isle of Vedri. The widows of Lund may smile through their tears. The Danish girls may have their jeers. They may laugh or smile. But outside their isle. Old Herek still on to his Northland steers. Herek went on his way, and never stopped till he came north to Halagaland, to his own house in Thjada. 169 King Olaf's course from Svithjad. When King Olaf began his journey, he came first into Smaland, and then into West Gotland. He marched quietly and peaceably, and the country people gave him all assistance on his journey. Thus he proceeded until he came into Viking, and north through Viking to Sarpsborg, where he remained, and ordered a winter abode to be prepared, A.D. 1028. Then he gave most of the chiefs leave to return home, but kept the lender men by him whom he thought the most serviceable. There were with him also all the sons of Arn Arnmodsen, and they stood in great favour with the king. Geller Thorkelsen, who the summer before had come from Iceland, also came there to the king, as before related. 170. Of Sigvat the Skald. Sigvat the Skald had long been in King Olaf's household, as before related, and the king made him his marshal. Sigvat had no talent for speaking in prose. But in skaldcraft he was so practised, that the verses came as readily from his tongue as if he were speaking in usual language. He had made a mercantile journey to Normandy, and in the course of it had come to England, where he met King Canute, and obtained permission from him to sail to Norway, as before related. When he came to Norway he proceeded straight to King Olaf, and found him at Sarpsborg. He presented himself before the king just as he was sitting down to table. Sigvat saluted him. The king looked at Sigvat and was silent. Then Sigvat sang. Great king. Thy marshal is come home. No more by land or sea to roam. But by thy side. Still to abide. Great king. What seat here shall he take? For the king's honor, not his sake. For all seats here. To me are dear. Then was verified the old saying, that, many are the ears of a king, for King Olaf had heard all about Sigvat's journey, and that he had spoken with Canute. He says to Sigvat, I do not know if thou art my marshal, or hast become one of Canute's men. Sigvat said. Canute, whose golden gifts display. A generous heart, would have me stay. Service in his great court to take. And my own Norway king forsake. Two masters at a time, I said. Were one too many for men bred. Where truth and virtue, shown to all. Make all men true in Olaf's hall. Then King Olaf told Sigvat to take his seat where he before used to sit. 
and in a short time Sigvat was in as high favor with the king as ever. 171, of Erling Skjolgsen and his sons. Erling Skjolgsen and all his sons had been all summer in King Canute's army, in the retinue of Earl Hakon. Thor Hund was also there, and was in high esteem. Now when King Canute heard that King Olaf had gone overland to Norway, he discharged his army, and gave all men leave to go to their winter abodes. There was then in Denmark a great army of foreigners, both English, Norwegians, and men of other countries, who had joined the expedition in summer. In autumn, A.D. 1027, Berling Skjolgsen went to Norway with his men, and received great presents from King Canute at parting, but Thor Hund remained behind in King Canute's court. With Erling went messengers from King Canute well provided with money. And in winter they traveled through all the country, paying the money which King Canute had promised to many in autumn for their assistance. They gave presents in money, besides, to many whose friendship could be purchased for King Canute. They received much assistance in their travels from Erling. In this way it came to pass that many turned their support to King Canute, promised him their services, and agreed to oppose King Olaf. Some did this openly, but many more concealed it from the public. King Olaf heard this news, for many had something to tell him about it, and the conversation in the court often turned upon it. Sigvat the Skald made a song upon it. The base traders ply. With purses of gold. Wanting to buy. What is not to be sold. The king's life and throne. Wanting to buy. But our souls are our own. And to hell will not hie. No pleasure in heaven as we know full well. To the traitor is given. His soul is his hell. Often also the conversation turned upon how ill it beseemed Earl Hakon to raise his hand in arms against King Olaf, who had given him his life when he fell into the king's power. But Sigvat was a particular friend of Earl Hakon, and when he heard the earl spoken against he sang. Our own court people we may blame. If they take gold to their own shame. Their king and country to betray. With those who give it's not the same. From them we have no faith to claim. Tis we are wrong, if we give way. 172, of King Olaf's presence at Yule. King Olaf gave a great feast at Yule, and many great people had come to him. It was the seventh day of Yule, that the king, with a few persons, among whom was Sigvat, who attended him day and night, went to a house in which the king's most precious valuables were kept. He had, according to his custom, collected there with great care the valuable presents he was to make on New Year's Eve. There was in the house no small number of gold-mounted swords. And Sigvat sang. The swords stand there. All bright and fair. Those oars that dip in blood. If I in favor stood. I too might have a share a sword the scald would gladly take, and use it for his master's sake. In favor once he stood, and a sword has stained in blood. The king took a sword of which the handle was twisted round with gold, and the guard was gold-mounted, and gave it to him. It was a valuable article, but the gift was not seen without envy, as will appear hereafter. Immediately after Yule, 1028, the king began his journey to the uplands for he had a great many people about him, but had received no income that autumn from the north country, for there had been an armament in summer, and the king had laid out all the revenues he could command. And also he had no vessels with which he and his people could go to the north. At the same time he had news from the north, from which he could see that there would be no safety for him in that quarter, unless he went with a great force. For these reasons he determined to proceed through the uplands, although it was not so long a time since he had been there in guest quarters as the law prescribes, and as the kings usually had the custom of observing in their visits. When he came to the uplands the lender men and the richest bonds invited him to be their guest, and thus lightened his expenses. 173, of Bjorn the Bailiff. There was a man called Bjorn who was of Gotland family, and a friend and acquaintance of Queen Astrid, and in some way related to her. She had given him farm management and other offices in the upper part of Hedmark. He had also the management of Osturtal district. 
Bjorn was not in esteem with the king, nor liked by the bonds. It happened in a hamlet which Bjorn ruled over, that many swine and cattle were missing, therefore Bjorn ordered a thing to be called to examine the matter. Such pillage he attributed chiefly to the people settled in forest farms far from other men. By which he referred particularly to those who dwelt in Osturtal, for that district was very thinly inhabited, and full of lakes and forest cleanings, and but in few places was any great neighborhood together. 174. Of Raud's Sons There was a man called Raud who dwelt in Osturtal. His wife was called Ragenhild, and his sons, Dag and Sigurd, were men of great talent. They were present at the thing, made a reply in defense of the Osturtal people, and removed the accusation from them. Bjorn thought they were too pert in their answer, and too fine in their clothes and weapons. And therefore turned his speech against these brothers, and said it was not unlikely they may have committed these thefts. They denied it, and the thing closed. Soon after King Olaf, with his retinue, came to guest quarters in the house of Bailiff Bjorn. The matter which had been before the thing was then complained of to the king. And Bjorn said that Raud's sons appeared to him to have committed these thefts. A messenger was sent for Raud's sons, and when they appeared before the king he said they had not at all the appearance of thieves, and acquitted them. Thereupon they invited the king, with all his retinue, to a three days entertainment at their father's, and although Bjorn dissuaded him from it, the king went. At Raud's there was a very excellent feast. The king asked Raud what people he and his wife were. Raud answered that he was originally a Swedish man, rich and of high birth, but I ran away with the wife I have ever since had, and she is a sister of King Ring Dagson. The king then remembered both their families. He found that father and sons were men of understanding, and asked them what they could do. Sigurd said he could interpret dreams, and determine the time of the day although no heavenly bodies could be seen. The king made trial of his art, and found it was as Sigurd had said. Dag stated, as his accomplishment, that he could see the misdeeds and vices of every man who came under his eye, when he chose to observe him closely. The king told him to declare what faults of disposition he saw in the king himself. Dag mentioned a fault which the king was sensible he really had. Then the king asked what fault the bailiff Bjorn had. Dag said Bjorn was a thief. And told also where Bjorn had concealed on his farm the bones, horns, and hides of the cattle he had stolen in autumn, for he committed, said Dag, all the thefts in autumn which he accuses other people of. Dag also told the king the places where the king should go after leaving them. When the king departed from Raud's house he was accompanied on the way, and presented with friendly gifts, and Raud's sons remained with the king. The king went first to Bjorn's, and found there that all Dag had told him was true. Upon which he drove Bjorn out of the country and he had to thank the queen that he preserved life and limbs. 175. Thor's Death Thor, a son of Olver of Egja, a stepson of Calf Arneson, and a sister's son of Thor Hund, was a remarkably handsome man, stout and strong. He was at this time eighteen years old. Had made a good marriage in Hedmark, by which he got great wealth, and was besides one of the most popular of men, and formed to be a chief. He invited the king and his retinue home to him to a feast. The king accepted the invitation, went to Thor's, and was well received. The entertainment was very splendid, they were excellently treated, and all that was set before the guests was of the best that could be got. The king and his people talked among themselves of the excellence of everything, and knew not what they should admire the most, whether Thor's house outside, or the inside furniture, the table service, or the liquors or the host who gave them such a feast. But Dag said little about it. The king used often to speak to Dag, and ask him about various things. And he had proved the truth of all that Dag had said, both of things that had happened or were to happen, and therefore the king had much confidence in what he said. The king called Dag to him to have a private conversation together, and spoke to him about many things. Afterwards the king turned the conversation on Thor, what an excellent man Thor was, and what a superb feast he had made for them. Dag answered but little to this, but agreed it was true what the king said. 
The king then asked Dag what disposition or faith he found in Thor. Dag replied that he must certainly consider Thor of a good disposition, if he be really what most people believe him to be. The king told him to answer direct what he was asked, and said that it was his duty to do so. Dag replies, Then thou must allow me to determine the punishment if I disclose his faith. The king replied that he would not submit his decision to another man, but again ordered Dag to reply to what he asked. Dag replies, The sovereign's order goes before all. I find this disposition in Thor, as in so many others, that he is too greedy of money. The king, is he then a thief, or a robber? He is neither. What is he then? To win money he is a traitor to his sovereign. He has taken money from King Canute the Great for thy head. The king asks, What proof hast thou of the truth of this? Dag, he has upon his right arm, above the elbow, a thick gold ring, which King Canute gave him, and which he lets no man see. This ended their conference, and the king was very wroth. Now as the king sat at table, and the guests had drunk a while with great mirth, and Thor went round to see the guests well served, the king ordered Thor to be called to him. He went up before the table, and laid his hands upon it. The king asked, How old a man art thou, Thor? He answered, I am eighteen years old. A stout man thou art for those years, and thou hast been fortunate also. Then the king took his right hand, and felt it towards the elbow. Thor said, Take care, for I have a boil upon my arm. The king held his hand there, and felt there was something hard under it. Hast thou not heard, said he, that I am a physician? Let me see the boil. As Thor saw it was of no use to conceal it longer, he took off the ring and laid it on the table. The king asked if that was the gift of King Canute. Thor replied that he could not deny it was. The king ordered him to be seized and laid in irons. Calf came up and entreated for mercy, and offered money for him, which also was seconded by many, but the king was so wroth that nobody could get in a word. He said Thor should suffer the doom he had prepared for himself. Thereupon he ordered Thor to be killed. This deed was much detested in the uplands, and not less in the Thrandjum country, where many of Thor's connections were. Calf took the death of this man much to heart, for he had been his foster son in childhood. 176 The Fall of Grijotgard Grijotgard Olverson, Thor's brother, and the eldest of the brothers, was a very wealthy man, and had a great troop of people about him. He lived also at this time in Hedmark. When he heard that Thor had been killed, he made an attack upon the places where the king's goods and men were, but, between whiles, he kept himself in the forest and other secret places. When the king heard of this disturbance, he had inquiry made about Grijotgard's haunts, and found out that he had taken up night quarters not far from where the king was. King Olaf set out in the night time, came there about day dawn, and placed a circle of men round the house in which Grijotgard was sleeping. Grijotgard and his men, roused by the stir of people and clash of arms, ran to their weapons, and Grijotgard himself sprang to the front room. He asked who commanded the troop, and it was answered him, King Olaf was come there. Grijotgard asked if the king would hear his words. The king, who stood at the door, said that Grijotgard might speak what he pleased, and he would hear his words. Grijotgard said, I do not beg for mercy. And at the same moment he rushed out, having his shield over his head, and his drawn sword in his hand. It was not so much light that he could see clearly. He struck his sword at the king. But Armjorn ran in, and the thrust pierced him under his armor into his stomach, and Armjorn got his death wound. Grijotgard was killed immediately, and most of his people with him. After this event the king turned back to the south to Viking. 177, King Olaf sends for his ships and goods. Now when the king came to Tunsberg he sent men out to all the districts, and ordered the people out upon a levy. He had but a small provision of shipping, and there were only bonds vessels to be got. From the districts in the near neighborhood many people came to him, but few from any distance. And it was soon found that the people had turned away from the king. 
King Olaf sent people to Gotland for his ships, and other goods and wares which had been left there in autumn. But the progress of these men was very slow, for it was no better now than in autumn to sail through the Sound, as King Canute had in spring fitted out an army throughout the whole of the Danish dominions, and had no fewer than 1,200 vessels. 178. King Olaf's Councils The news came to Norway that King Canute had assembled an immense armament through all Denmark, with which he intended to conquer Norway. When this became known the people were less willing to join King Olaf, and he got but little aid from the bonds. The king's men often spoke about this among themselves. Sigvat tells of it thus. Our men are few, our ships are small. While England's king is strong in all. But yet our king is not afraid. Oh! Never be such king betrayed. Tis evil counsel to deprive. Our king of countrymen to strive. To save their country, sword in hand. Tis money that betrays our land. The king held meetings with the men of the court, and sometimes housed things with all his people, and consulted with them what they should, in their opinion, undertake. We must not conceal from ourselves, said he, that Canute will come here this summer, and that he has, as ye all know, a large force, and we have at present but few men to oppose to him. And, as matters now stand, we cannot depend much on the fidelity of the country people. The king's men replied to his speech in various ways. But it is said that Sigvat the Skald replied thus, advising flight, as treachery, not cowardice, was the cause of it. We may well fly, when even our foe offers us money if we go. I may be blamed, accused of fear. But treachery, not faith, rules here. Men may retire who long have shown their faith and love, and now alone retire because they cannot save. This is no treachery in the brave. 179. Herek of Thjada burns Grankel and his men. The same spring, A.D. 1028, it happened in Halagaland that Herek of Thjada remembered how Asmund Grankelson had plundered and beaten his house servants. A cutter with twenty rowing benches, which belonged to Herek, was afloat in front of the house, with tent and deck, and he spread the report that he intended to go south to Thrandjum. One evening Herek went on board with his house servants, about eighty men, who rowed the whole night, and he came towards morning to Grankel's house, and surrounded it with his men. They then made an attack on the house, and set fire to it. And Grankel with his people were burnt, and some were killed outside, and in all about thirty men lost their lives. After this deed Herek returned home, and sat quietly in his farm. Asmund was with King Olaf when he heard of it. Therefore there was nobody in Halagaland to sue Herek for mulk for this deed, nor did he offer any satisfaction. 180. King Canute's Expedition to Norway Canute the Great collected his forces, and went to Lymphjord. When he was ready with his equipment he sailed from thence with his whole fleet to Norway, made all possible speed, and did not land to the eastward of the fjords, but crossed Folden, and landed in Agder, where he summoned a thing. The bonds came down from the upper country to hold a thing with Canute, who was everywhere in that country accepted as king. Then he placed men over the districts, and took hostages from the bonds, and no man opposed him. King Olaf was in Tunsberg when Canute's fleet sailed across the mouth of the fjord. Canute sailed northwards along the coast, and people came to him from all the districts, and promised him fealty. He lay a while in Egersund, where Erling Skjolgsen came to him with many people, and King Canute and Erling renewed their league of friendship. Among other things, Canute promised Erling the whole country between Stad and Rigiarbid to rule over. Then King Canute proceeded, and, to be short in our tale, did not stop until he came to Thrandjum, and landed at Nidaros. In Thrandjum he called together a thing for the eight districts, at which King Canute was chosen king of all Norway. Thor Hund, who had come with King Canute from Denmark, was there, and also Herek of Thjada, and both were made sheriffs of the king, and took the oath of fealty to him. King Canute gave them great fiefs, and also right to the Lapland trade, and presented them besides with great gifts. He enriched all men who were inclined to enter into friendly accord with him both with fiefs and money, 
and gave them greater power than they had before. 181, of King Canute. When King Canute had laid the whole of Norway traitor his authority, he called together a numerous thing, both of his own people and of the people of the country. And that it he made proclamation, that he made his relation Earl Hakon the governor-in-chief of all the land in Norway that he had conquered in this expedition. In like manner he led his son Hardenat to the high seat at his side, gave him the title of king, and therewith the whole Danish dominion. King Canute took as hostages from all lendermen and great bonds in Norway either their sons, brothers, or other near connections, or the men who were dearest to them and appeared to him most suitable. By which he, as before observed, secured their fidelity to him. As soon as Earl Hakon had attained this power in Norway his brother-in-law, Einar Tambeskelfer, made an agreement with him, and received back all the fiefs he formerly had possessed while the earls ruled the country. King Canute gave Einar great gifts, and bound him by great kindness to his interests. And promised that Einar should be the greatest and most important man in Norway, among those who did not hold the highest dignity, as long as he had power over the country. He added to this, that Einar appeared to him the most suitable man to hold the highest title of honor in Norway if no earls remained, and his son Eindride also, on account of his high birth. Einar placed a great value on these promises, and, in return, promised the greatest fidelity. Einar's chiefship began anew with this. 182, of Thorin Loftunga. There was a man by name Thorin Loftunga, an Icelander by birth, and a great skald, who had been much with the kings and other great chiefs. He was now with King Canute the Great, and had composed a flock, or short poem, in his praise. When the king heard of this he was very angry, and ordered him to bring the next day a drapa, or long poem, by the time he went to table. And if he failed to do so, said the king, he shall be hanged for his impudence in composing such a small poem about King Canute. Thorin then composed a stave as a refrain, which he inserted in the poem, and also augmented it with several other strophes or verses. This was the refrain. Canute protects his realm, as Jove. Guardian of Greece, his realm above. King Canute rewarded him for the poem with fifty marks of silver. The poem was called the Head Ransom, Hofedlazen. Thorin composed another poem about King Canute, which was called the Campaign Poem, Tagdrapa. And therein he tells King Canute's expedition when he sailed from Denmark to Norway. And the following are strophes from one of the parts of this poem. Canute with all his men is out. Under the heavens in warship stout. Out on the sea, from Lymphjord's green. My good, my brave friend's fleet is seen. The men of Adgar on the coast. Tremble to see this mighty host. The guilty tremble as they spy. The victor's fleet beneath the sky. The sight surpasses far the tale. As glossing in the sun they sail. The king's ship glittering all with gold. And splendor they're not to be told. Round lister many a coal-black mast. Of Canute's fleet is gliding past. And now through Agar sound they ride. Upon the gently heaving tide. And all the sound is covered o'er. With ships and sails, from shore to shore. A mighty king, a mighty host. Hiding the sea on Agar coast. And peaceful men in haste now high. Up Hyornagla hill the fleet to spy. As round the ness where Stad now lies. Each high stem ship in splendor flies. Nor seemed the voyage long, I trow. To warrior on the high built bow. As o'er the ocean mountains riding. The land and hill seem past him gliding. With whistling breeze and flashing spray. Past Stein the gay ships dashed away. In open sea, the southern gale. Filled every wide out bellying sail. Still on they fly, still northward go. Till he who conquers every foe. The mighty Canute, came to land. Far in the north on Throngem's strand. There this great king of Jutland race. Whose deeds and gifts surpass in grace. All other kings, bestowed the throne. Of Norway on his sister's son. To his own son he gave the crown. 
this I must add to his renown. Of Denmark, land of shadowy valets. In which the white swan trims her sails. Here it is told that King Canute's expedition was grander than Saga can tell. But Thorin sang thus because he would pride himself upon being one of King Canute's retinue when he came to Norway. 183, of the messengers sent by King Olaf for his ships. The men whom King Olaf had sent eastwards to Gotland after his ships took with them the vessels they thought the best, and burnt the rest. The ship apparel and other goods belonging to the king and his men they also took with them. And when they heard that King Canute had gone to Norway they sailed west through the Sound, and then north to Viken to King Olaf, to whom they delivered his ships. He was then at Tunsberg. When King Olaf learnt that King Canute was sailing north along the coast, King Olaf steered with his fleet into Oslo Fjord, and into a branch of it called Drafn, where he lay quiet until King Canute's fleet had sailed southwards again. On this expedition which King Canute made from the north along the coast, he held a thing in each district, and in everything the country was bound by oath in fealty to him, and hostages were given him. He went eastward across the mouths of the fjords to Sarpsborg, and held a thing there, and, as elsewhere, the country was surrendered to him under oath of fidelity. King Canute then returned south to Denmark, after having conquered Norway without stroke of sword, and he ruled now over three kingdoms. So says Halvard Herexbles when he sang of King Canute. The warrior king, whose blood-stained shield has shone on many a hard-fought field. England and Denmark now has won. And o'er three kingdoms rules alone. Peace now he gives us fast and sure. Since Norway too is made secure. By him who oft, in days of yore. Glutted the hawk and wolf with gore. 184 of King Olaf in his proceedings. King Olaf sailed with his ships out to Tunsberg, as soon as he heard that King Canute had turned back, and was gone south to Denmark. He then made himself ready with the men who liked to follow him, and had then thirteen ships. Afterwards he sailed out along Viking, but got little money, and few men, as those only followed him who dwelt in islands, or on outlying points of land. The king landed in such places, but got only the money in men that fell in his way. And he soon perceived that the country had abandoned him. He proceeded on according to the winds. This was in the beginning of winter, A.D. 1029. The wind turned very late in the season in their favor, so that they lay long in the Seely Islands, where they heard the news from the north, through merchants, who told the king that Erling Skjalgsen had collected a great force in Judder and that his ship lay fully rigged outside of the land, together with many other vessels belonging to the bonds. Namely, skiffs, fisher yachts, and great rowboats. Then the king sailed with his fleet from the east, and lay a while in Egersund. Both parties heard of each other now, and Erling assembled all the men he could. 185, of King Olaf's Voyage. On Thomas Moss, before Yule, December 21st, the king left the harbour as soon as day appeared. With a good but rather strong gale he sailed northwards past Judder. The weather was rainy, with dark flying clouds in the sky. The spies went immediately in through the Judder country when the king sailed past it. And as soon as Erling heard that the king was sailing past from the east, he let the warhorn call all the people on board, and the whole force hastened to the ships, and prepared for battle. The king's ship passed by Judder at a great rate. But thereafter turned in towards the land, intending to run up the fjords to gather men and money. Erling Skjogson perceived this, and sailed after him with a great force and many ships. Swiftly their vessels flew, for they had nothing on board but men and arms, but Erling's ship went much faster than the others, therefore he took in a reef in the sails, and waited for the other vessels. Then the king saw that Erling with his fleet gained upon him fast, for the king's ships were heavily laden, and were besides water-soaked, having been in the sea the whole summer, autumn, and winter, up to this time. He saw also that there would be a great want of men, if he should go against the whole of Erling's fleet when it was assembled. He hailed from ship to ship the orders to let the sails gently sink, and to unship the booms and outriggers, which was done. When Erling saw this he calls out to his people, 
and orders them to get on more sail. Ye see, says he, that their sails are diminishing, and they are getting fast away from our sight. He took the reef out of the sails of his ship, and outsailed all the others immediately, for Erling was very eager in his pursuit of King Olaf. 186, of Erling Skjogsen's Fall King Olaf then steered in towards the Bakkenfjord, by which the ships came out of sight of each other. Thereafter the king ordered his men to strike the sails, and row forwards through a narrow sound that was there, and all the ships lay collected within a rocky point. Then all the king's men put on their weapons. Erling sailed in through the sound, and observed nothing until the whole fleet was before him, and he saw the king's men rowing towards him with all their ships at once. Erling and his crew let fall the sails, and seized their weapons. But the king's fleet surrounded his ship on all sides. Then the fight began, and it was of the sharpest, but soon the greatest loss was among Erling's men. Erling stood on the quarterdeck of his ship. He had a helmet on his head, a shield before him, and a sword in his hand. Sigvat the Skald had remained behind in Viking, and heard the tidings. He was a great friend of Erling, had received presents from him, and had been at his house. Sigvat composed a poem upon Erling's fall, in which there is the following verse. Erling has set his ship on sea. Against the king away is he. He who oft lets the eagle stain. Her yellow feet in blood of slain. His little warship side by side. With the king's fleet, the fray will bide. Now sword to sword the fight is raging. Which Erling with the king is waging. Then Erling's men began to fall, and at the same moment his ship was carried by boarding, and every man of his died in his place. The king himself was amongst the foremost in the fray. So says Sigvat. The king's men hewed with hasty sword. The king urged on the ship to board. All o'er the decks the wounded lay. Right fierce and bloody was that fray. In tundra sound, on Juddar shore. The decks were slippery with red gore. Warm blood was dropping in the sound. Where the king's sword was gleaming round. So entirely had Erling's men fallen, that not a man remained standing in his ship but himself alone. For there was none who asked for quarter, or none who got it if he did ask. There was no opening for flight, for there lay ships all around Erling's ship on every side, and it is told for certain that no man attempted to fly. And Sigvat says. All Erling's men fell in the fray. Off Bakken Fjord, this hard-fought day. The brave king boarded, onward cheered. And north of Tunger the deck was cleared. Erling alone, the brave, the stout. Cut off from all, yet still held out. High on the stern, a sight to see. In his lone ship alone stood he. Then Erling was attacked both from the forecastle and from the other ships. There was a large space upon the poop which stood high above the other ships, and which nobody could reach but by arrow shot, or partly with the thrust of spear, but which he always struck from him by parrying. Erling defended himself so manfully, that no example is known of one man having sustained the attack of so many men so long. Yet he never tried to get away, nor ask for quarter. So says Sigvat. Skjalg's brave son no mercy craves. The battle's fury still he braves. The spear storm, through the air sharp singing. Against his shield was ever ringing. So Erling stood. But fate had willed. His life off Bakken should be spilled. No braver man has, since his day. Past Bakken Fjord tain his way. When Olaf went back a little upon the foredeck he saw Erling's behavior. And the king accosted him thus, Thou hast turned against me today, Erling. He replies, The eagle turns his claws in defense when torn asunder. Sigvat the Skald tells thus of these words of Erling. Erling, our best defense of old. Erling the brave, the brisk, the bold. Stood to his arms, gaily crying. Eagles should show their claws. Though dying. The very words which once before. To Olaf he had said on shore. At Atstein when they both prepared. To meet the foe, and danger shared. 
Then said the king, Wilt thou enter into my service, Erling? That I will, said he, took the helmet off his head, laid down his sword and shield, and went forward to the forecastle deck. The king struck him in the chin with the sharp point of his battle-axe, and said, I shall mark thee as a traitor to thy sovereign. Then a slack Fidiascal rose up, and struck Erling in the head with an axe, so that it stood fast in his brain, and was instantly his death wound. Thus Erling lost his life. The king said to a slack, May all ill luck attend thee for that stroke. For thou hast struck Norway out of my hands. A slack replied, It is bad enough if that stroke displeased thee, for I thought it was striking Norway into thy hands. And if I have given thee offence, sire, by this stroke, and have thy ill will for it, it will go badly with me, for I will get so many men's ill will and enmity for this deed that I would need all your protection and favour. The king replied that he should have it. Thereafter the king ordered every man to return to his ship, and to get ready to depart as fast as he could. We will not plunder the slain, says he, and each man may keep what he has taken. The men returned to the ships and prepared themselves for the departure as quickly as possible, and scarcely was this done before the vessels of the bonds ran in from the south into the sound. It went with the bond army as is often seen, that the men, although many in numbers, know not what to do when they have experienced a check, have lost their chief, and are without leaders. None of Erling's sons were there, and the bonds therefore made no attack, and the king sailed on his way northwards. But the bonds took Erling's corpse, adorned it, and carried it with them home to Seoul, and also the bodies of all who had fallen. There was great lamentation over Erling, and it has been a common observation among people, that Erling Skjolgsen was the greatest and worthiest man in Norway of those who had no high title. Sigvat made these verses upon the occasion. Thus Erling fell, and such a gain. To buy with such a loss was vain. For better man than he ne'er died. And the king's gain was small beside. In truth no man I ever knew. Was, in all ways, so firm and true. Free from servility and pride. Honoured by all, yet thus he died. Sigvat also says that a slack had very unthinkingly committed this murder of his own kinsman. Norway's brave defenders dead. A slack has heaped on his own head. The guilt of murdering his own kin. May few be guilty of such sin. His kinsman's murder on him lies. Our forefathers, in sayings wise, have said, what is unknown to few. Kinsman to kinsman should be true. 187, of the insurrection of Agder district. Of Erling's sons some at that time were north in Thrandjum, some in Hordaland, and some in the Fjord district, for the purpose of collecting men. When Erling's death was reported, the news came also that there was a levy raising in Agder, Hordaland, and Rogaland. Forces were raised and a great army assembled, under Erling's sons, to pursue King Olaf. When King Olaf retired from the battle with Erling he went northward through the sounds, and it was late in the day. It is related that the king then made the following verses. This night, with battle sounds wild ringing. Small joy to the fair youth is bringing. Who sits in Juddar, little dreaming. Oh or what this night the raven screaming. The far descended Erling's life. Too soon has fallen, but, in the strife. He met the luck they well deserve. Who from their faith and fealty swerve. Afterwards the king sailed with his fleet along the land northwards, and got certain tidings of the bonds assembling an army. There were many chiefs and lendermen at this time with King Olaf, and all the sons of Arn. Of this Bjarn Gulbarskald speaks in the poem he composed about Calf Arneson. Calf! Thou hast fought at Bakken well. Of thy brave doings all men tell. When Harold's son his men urged on. To the hard strife, thy courage shone. Thou soon hadst made a good you'll feast. For greedy wolf there in the east. Where stone and spear were flying round. There thou wast still the foremost found. The people suffered in the strife. When noble Erling lost his life. And north of Utstein many a speck. Of blood lay black upon the deck. 
The king, tis clear, has been deceived. By treason of his land bereaved. And Agda now, whose force is great, will rule o'er all parts of the state. King Olaf continued his voyage until he came north of Stad, and brought up at the Hiri Isles. Here he heard the news that Earl Hakon had a great war force in Thrandjum, and thereupon the king held a council with his people. Calf Arneson urged much to advance to Thrandjum, and fight Earl Hakon, notwithstanding the difference of numbers. Many others supported this advice, but others dissuaded from it, and the matter was left to the king's judgment. 188 Death of a Slack Fidiusgal. Afterwards the king went into Steinavag, and remained there all night. But a slack Fidiusgal ran into Borgund, where he remained the night, and where Vig like Arneson was before him. In the morning, when a slack was about returning on board, Vig like assaulted him, and sought to avenge Erling's murder. A slack fell there. Some of the king's court men, who had been home all summer, joined the king here. They came from Freakisund, and brought the king tidings that Earl Hakon, and many lender men with him, had come in the morning to Freakisund with a large force. And they will end thy days, sire, if they have strength enough. Now the king sent his men up to a hill that was near. And when they came to the top, and looked northwards to Bjarni Island, they perceived that a great armament of many ships was coming from the north, and they hastened back to the king with this intelligence. The king, who was lying there with only twelve ships, ordered the warhorn to sound, the tents to be taken down on his ships, and they took to their oars. When they were quite ready, and were leaving the harbour, the bond army sailed north around Thyatand with twenty-five ships. The king then steered inside of Nerf Island, and inside of Hunsver. Now when King Olaf came right abreast of Borgund, the ship which a slack had steered came out to meet him, and when they found the king they told him the tidings, that Viglike Arneson had killed a slack Fidiusgal. Because he had killed Erling Skjolgsen. The king took this news very angrily, but could not delay his voyage on account of the enemy and he sailed in by Vegsund and Skor. There some of his people left him. Among others, Calf Arneson, with many other lendermen and ship commanders, who all went to meet Earl Hakon. King Olaf, however, proceeded on his way without stopping until he came to Todar Fjord, where he brought up at Valdau, and landed from his ship. He had then five ships with him, which he drew up upon the shore, and took care of their sails and materials. Then he set up his land tent upon a point of land called Salt, where there are pretty flat fields, and set up a cross near to the point of land. A bond, by name Bruce, who dwelt there and more, and was chief over the valley, came down to King Olaf, together with many other bonds, and received him well, and according to his dignity. And he was friendly, and pleased with their reception of him. Then the king asked if there was a passable road up in the country from the valley to Lesjar. And Bruce replied, that there was an ord in the valley called Skurfsurd not passable for man or beast. King Olaf answers, that we must try, bond, and it will go as God pleases. Come here in the morning with your yoke, and come yourself with it, and let us then see. When we come to the sloping precipice, what chance there may be, and if we cannot devise some means of coming over it with horses and people. 189. Clearing of the Urd. Now when day broke the bonds drove down with their yokes, as the king had told them. The clothes and weapons were packed upon horses, but the king and all the people went on foot. He went thus until he came to a place called Crossbreca, and when he came up upon the hill he rested himself, sat down there a while, looked down over the fjord, and said, A difficult expedition ye have thrown upon my hands, ye lendermen. Who have now changed your fealty, although but a little while ago ye were my friends and faithful to me. There are now two crosses erected upon the bank on which the king sat. Then the king mounted a horse, and rode without stopping up the valley, until he came to the precipice. Then the king asked Bruce if there was no summer hut of cattle herds in the neighborhood, where they could remain. He said there was. The king ordered his land tent to be set up, and remained there all night. In the morning the king ordered them to drive to the Urd, and try if they could get across it with the wagons. They drove there, and the king remained in the meantime in his tent. 
Towards evening the king's courtmen and the bonds came back, and told how they had had a very fatiguing labor, without making any progress. And that there never could be a road made that they could get across, so they continued there the second night, during which, for the whole night, the king was occupied in prayer. As soon as he observed day dawning he ordered his men to drive again to the Ord, and try once more if they could get across it with the wagons, but they went very unwillingly, saying nothing could be gained by it. When they were gone the man who had charge of the king's kitchen came, and said there were only two carcasses of young cattle remaining of provision, although you, sire, have four hundred men, and there are one hundred bonds besides. Then the king ordered that he should set all the kettles on the fire, and put a little bit of meat in each kettle, which was done. Then the king went there, and made the sign of the cross over each kettle, and told them to make ready the meat. The king then went to the ord called Skirfsurd, where a road should be cleared. When the king came all his people were sitting down, quite worn out with the hard labor. Bruce said, I told you, sire, but you would not believe me, that we could make nothing of this ord. The king laid aside his cloak, and told them to go to work once more at the ord. They did so, and now twenty men could handle stones which before one hundred men could not move from the place, and thus before midday the road was cleared so well that it was as passable for men, and for horses with packs, as a road in the plain fields. The king, after this, went down again to where the meat was, which place is called Olaf's Rock. Near the rock is a spring, at which Olaf washed himself. And therefore at the present day, when the cattle in the valley are sick, their illness is made better by their drinking at this well. Thereafter the king sat down to table with all the others. And when he was satisfied he asked if there was any other shieling on the other side of the Ord, and near the mountains, where they could pass the night. Bruce said there was such a shieling, called Groninger. But that nobody could pass the night there on account of witchcraft, and evil beings who were in the shieling. Then the king said they must get ready for their journey, as he wanted to be at the shieling for the night. Then came the kitchen master to the king, and tells that there was come an extraordinary supply of provisions, and he did not know where it had come from, or how. The king thanked God for this blessing, and gave the bonds who drove down again to their valley some rations of food, but remained himself all night in the shieling. In the middle of the night, while the people were asleep, there was heard in the cattle fold a dreadful cry, and these words, Now Olaf's prayers are burning me, says the spirit, so that I can no longer be in my habitation. Now must I fly, and never more come to this fold. When the king's people awoke in the morning the king proceeded to the mountains, and said to Bruce, Here shall now a farm be settled, and the bond who dwells here shall never want what is needful for the support of life. And never shall his crop be destroyed by frost, although the crops be frozen on the farms both above it and below it. Then the king proceeded over the mountains, and came to a farm called Einbi, where he remained for the night. King Olaf had then been fifteen years king of Norway, AD 1015 to 1029, including the year both he and Sven were in the country, and this year we have now been telling about. It was, namely, a little past Yule when the king left his ships and took to the land, as before related. Of this portion of his reign the priest Arthorgelson the Wise was the first who wrote. And he was both faithful in his story, of a good memory, and so old a man that he could remember the men, and had heard their accounts. Who were so old that through their age they could remember these circumstances as he himself wrote them in his books, and he named the men from whom he received his information. Otherwise it is generally said that King Olaf had been fifteen years king of Norway when he fell, but they who say so reckon to Earl Sven's government, the last year he was in the country, for King Olaf lived fifteen years afterwards as king. 190. Olaf's Prophecies When the king had been one night at Lesjar he proceeded on his journey with his men, day by day, first into Gudbrandstel, and from thence out to Redemark. Now it was seen who had been his friends, for they followed him, but those who had served him with less fidelity separated from him, and some showed him even indifference, or even full hostility, which afterwards was apparent. And also it could be seen clearly in many upland people that they took very ill his putting Thor to death, as before related. King Olaf gave leave to return home to many of his men who had farms and children to take care of. 
for it seemed to them uncertain what safety there might be for the families and property of those who left the country with him. Then the king explained to his friends his intention of leaving the country, and going first east into Spithjot, and there taking his determination as to where he should go. But he let his friends know his intention to return to the country, and regain his kingdoms, if God should grant him longer life, and he did not conceal his expectation that the people of Norway would again return to their fealty to him. I think, says he, that Earl Hakon will have Norway but a short time under his power, which many will not think an extraordinary expectation, as Earl Hakon has had but little luck against me. But probably few people will trust to my prophecy, that Canute the Great will in the course of a few years die, and his kingdoms vanish, and there will he no risings in favor of his race. When the king had ended his speech, his men prepared themselves for their departure. The king, with the troop that followed him, turned east to Ede Forest. And there were along with him the Queen Astrid, their daughter Ulfhild. Magnus, King Olaf's son, Ragnvald Brusesson, the three sons of Arn, Thorberg, Finn, and Arn, with many lendermen, and the king's attendants consisted of many chosen men. Bjorn the marshal got leave to go home, and he went to his farm, and many others of the king's friends returned home with his permission to their farms. The king begged them to let him know the events which might happen in the country, and which it might be important for him to know, and now the king proceeded on his way. 191. King Olaf proceeds to Russia. It is to be related of King Olaf's journey, that he went first from Norway eastward through Ede Forest to Vermeland, then to Vandensby, and through the forests in which there are roads, until he came out in Nereik district. There dwelt a rich and powerful man in that part called Sigtrig, who had a son, Ivar, who afterwards became a distinguished person. Olaf stayed with Sigtrig all spring, A.D. 1029. And when summer came he made ready for a journey, procured a ship for himself, and without stopping went on to Russia to King Jerisleif and his queen Ingigerd. But his own queen Astrid, and their daughter Ulfhild, remained behind in Svithjad, and the king took his son Magnus eastward with him. King Jerisleif received King Olaf in the kindest manner, and made him the offer to remain with him, and to have so much land as was necessary for defraying the expense of the entertainment of his followers. King Olaf accepted this offer thankfully, and remained there. It is related that King Olaf was distinguished all his life for pious habits, and zeal in his prayers to God. But afterwards, when he saw his own power diminished, and that of his adversaries augmented, he turned all his mind to God's service. For he was not distracted by other thoughts, or by the labor he formerly had upon his hands. For during all the time he sat upon the throne he was endeavoring to promote what was most useful, and first to free and protect the country from foreign chiefs' oppressions, then to convert the people to the right faith. And also to establish law and the rights of the country, which he did by letting justice have its way, and punishing evildoers. 192. Causes of the Revolt Against King Olaf It had been an old custom in Norway that the sons of lendermen, or other great men, went out in warships to gather property, and they marauded both in the country and out of the country. But after King Olaf came to the sovereignty he protected the country, so that he abolished all plundering there. And even if they were the sons of powerful men who committed any depredation, or did what the king considered against law, he did not spare them at all, but they must suffer in life or limbs. And no man's entreaties, and no offer of money penalties, could help them. So says Sigvat. They who on Viking cruises drove. With gifts of red gold often strove. To buy their safety, but our chief. Had no compassion for the thief. He made the bravest lose his head. Who robbed at sea, and pirates led. And his just sword gave peace to all. Sparing no robber, great or small. And he also says. Great king. Whose sword on many a field. Food to the wandering wolf did yield. And then the thief and pirate band. Swept wholly off by sea and land. Good king. Who for the people's sake. Set hands and feet upon a stake. When plunderers of great name and bold. Harried the country as of old. The country's guardian showed his might. 
when oft he made his just sword bite through many a viking's neck and hair and never would the guilty spare king magnus father i must say did many a good deed in his day olaf the thick was stern and stout much good his victories brought out he punished great and small with equal severity which appeared to the chief people of the country too severe and animosity rose to the highest when they lost relatives by the king's just sentence although they were in reality guilty this was the origin of the hostility of the great men of the country to king olaf that they could not bear his just judgments he again would rather renounce his dignity than omit righteous judgment the accusation against him of being stingy with his money was not just for he was a most generous man towards his friends but that alone was the cause of the discontent raised against him that he appeared hard and severe in his retributions besides king canute offered great sums of money and the great chiefs were corrupted by this and by his offering them greater dignities than they had possessed before the inclinations of the people also were all in favor of earl hakon who was much beloved by the country folks when he ruled the country before. 193, of Jokul Bardson. Earl Hakon had sailed with his fleet from Thrandjum, and gone south to moor against King Olaf, as before related. Now when the king bore away, and ran into the fjord, the earl followed him thither. And then Calf Arneson came to meet him, with many of the men who had deserted King Olaf. Calf was well received. The earl steered in through Todar Fjord to Valdau, where the king had laid up his ships on the strand. He took the ships which belonged to the king, had them put upon the water and rigged, and cast lots, and put commanders in charge of them according to the lots. There was a man called Jokul, who was an Icelander, a son of Bard Jokulsen of Vadensdal. The lot fell upon Jokul to command the bison, which King Olaf himself had commanded. Jokul made these verses upon it. Mine is the lot to take the helm. Which Olaf owned, who owned the realm. From salt King Olaf's ship to steer. Ill luck I dread on his reindeer. My girl will never hear the tidings. Till o'er the wild wave I come riding. In Olaf's ship, who loved his gold. And lost his ships with wealth untold. We may here shortly tell what happened a long time after that that this Jokul fell in with King Olaf's men in the island of Gotland, and the king ordered him to be taken out to be beheaded. A willow twig accordingly was plaited in with his hair, and a man held him fast by it. Jokul sat down upon a bank, and a man swung the axe to execute him. But Jokul hearing the sound, raised his head, and the blow struck him in the head, and made a dreadful wound. As the king saw it would be his death wound, he ordered them to let him lie with it. Jokul raised himself up, and he sang. My hard fate I mourn. Alas! My wounds burn. My red wounds are gaping. My life blood escaping. My wounds burn sore. But I suffer still more. From the king's angry word. Then his sharp biting sword. 194, of Kalf Arneson. Calf Arneson went with Earl Hakon North to Thrandjum, and the Earl invited him to enter into his service. Calf said he would first go home to his farm at Egja, and afterwards make his determination, and Calf did so. When he came home he found his wife Sigrid much irritated, and she reckoned up all the sorrow inflicted on her, as she insisted, by King Olaf. First, he had ordered her first husband over to be killed. And now since, says she, my two sons. And thou thyself, Calf, wert present when they were cut off, and which I little expected from thee. Calf says, it was much against his will that Thor was killed. I offered money penalty for him, says he. And when Grijotgard was killed I lost my brother Arnjorn at the same time. She replies, it is well thou hast suffered this from the king, for thou mayest perhaps avenge him, although thou wilt not avenge my injuries. Thou sawest how thy foster son Thor was killed, with all the regard of the king for thee. She frequently brought out such vexatious speeches to Calf, to which he often answered angrily. But yet he allowed himself to be persuaded by her to enter into the earl's service, on condition of renewing his fiefs to him. 
Sigrid sent word to the Earl how far she had brought the matter with Calf. As soon as the Earl heard of it, he sent a message to Calf that he should come to the town to him. Calf did not decline the invitation, but came directly to Nidaros, and waited on the Earl, who received him kindly. In their conversation it was fully agreed upon that Calf should go into the Earl's service, and should receive great fiefs. After this Calf returned home, and had the greater part of the interior of the Throngem country under him. As soon as it was spring Calf rigged out a ship that belonged to him, and when she was ready he put to sea, and sailed west to England. For he had heard that in spring King Canute was to sail from Denmark to England, and that King Canute had given Harold, a son of Thorkel the High, an earldom in Denmark. Calf Arneson went to King Canute as soon as he arrived in England. John Gulbarskald tells of this. King Olaf eastward o'er the sea. To Russia's monarch had to flee. Our herald's brother ploughed the main. And furrowed white its dark blue plain. Whilst thou, the truth I still will say. Nor fear nor favour can me sway. Thou to King Canute hasten fast. As soon as Olaf's luck was past. Now when Calf came to King Canute the king received him particularly well, and had many conversations with him. Among other things, King Canute, in a conference, asked Calf to bind himself to raise a warfare against King Olaf, if ever he should return to the country. And for which, says the king, I will give thee the earldom, and place thee to rule over Norway. And my relation Hakon shall come to me, which will suit him better, for he is so honourable and trustworthy that I believe he would not even throw a spear against the person of King Olaf if he came back to the country. Calf lent his ear to what the king proposed, for he had a great desire to attain this high dignity, and this conclusion was settled upon between King Canute and Calf. Calf then prepared to return home, and on his departure he received splendid presents from King Canute. Jarn the Skald tells of these circumstances. Sprung from old earls. To England's lord. Thou owest many a thankful word. For many a gift, if all be true. Thy interest has been kept in view. For when thy course was bent for home. Although that luck is not yet come. That Norway should be thine, tis said. The London king a promise made. Calf thereafter returned to Norway, and came to his farm. 195. Of the death of Earl Hakon. Earl Hakon left the country this summer, A.D. 1029, and went to England, and when he came there was well received by the king. The earl had a bride in England, and he travelled to conclude this marriage, and as he intended holding his wedding in Norway, he came to procure those things for it in England which it was difficult to get in Norway. In autumn he made ready for his return, but it was somewhat late before he was clear for sea, but at last he set out. Of his voyage all that can be told is, that the vessel was lost, and not a man escaped. Some relate that the vessel was seen north of Caithness in the evening in a heavy storm, and the wind blowing out of Pentland Firth. They who believe this report say the vessel drove out among the breakers of the ocean. But with certainty people knew only that Earl Hacken was missing in the ocean, and nothing belonging to the ship ever came to land. The same autumn some merchants came to Norway, who told the tidings that were going through the country of Earl Hacken being missing. And all men knew that he neither came to Norway nor to England that autumn, so that Norway that winter was without a head. 196 of Bjorn the Marshal. Bjorn the Marshal sat at home on his farm after his parting from King Olaf. Bjorn was a celebrated man, therefore it was soon reported far and wide that he had set himself down in quietness. Earl Hakon and the other chiefs of the country heard this also, and sent persons with a verbal message to Bjorn. When the messengers arrived Bjorn received them well, and afterwards Bjorn called them to him to a conference, and asked their business. He who was their foreman presented to Bjorn the salutations of King Canute, Earl Hakon, and of several chiefs. King Canute, says he, has heard much of thee, and that thou hast been long a follower of King Olaf the Thick, and hast been a great enemy of King Canute. And this he thinks not right, for he will be thy friend, and the friend of all worthy men, if thou wilt turn from thy friendship to King Olaf and become his enemy. 
and the only thing now thou canst do is to seek friendship and protection there where it is most readily to be found, and which all men in this northern world think it most honourable to be favoured with. Ye who have followed Olaf the Thick should consider how he is now separated from you, and that now ye have no aid against King Canute and his men, whose lands ye plundered last summer, and whose friends ye murdered. Therefore ye ought to accept, with thanks, the friendship which the king offers you, and it would become you better if you offered money even in mulct to obtain it. When he had ended his speech Bjorn replies, I wish now to sit quietly at home, and not to enter into the service of any chief. The messenger answers, Such men as thou art are just the right men to serve the king. And now I can tell thee there are just two things for thee to choose, either to depart in peace from thy property, and wander about as thy comrade Olaf is doing. Or, which is evidently better, to accept King Canute's and Earl Hakon's friendship, become their man, and take the oaths of fealty to them. Receive now thy reward. And he displayed to him a large bag full of English money. Bjorn was a man fond of money, and self-interested, and when he saw the silver he was silent, and reflected with himself what resolution he should take. It seemed to him much to abandon his property, as he did not think it probable that King Olaf would ever have a rising in his favour in Norway. Now when the messenger saw that Bjorn's inclinations were turned towards the money, he threw down two thick gold rings, and said, Take the money at once, Bjorn, and swear the oaths to King Canute. For I can promise thee that this money is but a trifle, compared to what thou wilt receive if thou followest King Canute. By the heap of money, the fine promises, and the great presents, he was led by covetousness, took the money, went into King Canute's service, and gave the oaths of fealty to King Canute and Earl Hakon, and then the messengers departed. 197. Bjorn the Marshal's Journey When Bjorn heard the tidings that Earl Hakon was missing he soon altered his mind, and was much vexed with himself for having been a traitor in his fidelity to King Olaf. He thought, now, that he was freed from the oath by which he had bound himself to Earl Hakon. It seemed to Bjorn that now there was some hope that King Olaf might again come to the throne of Norway if he came back, as the country was without a head. Bjorn therefore immediately made himself ready to travel, and took some men with him. He then set out on his journey, travelling night and day, on horseback when he could, and by ship when he found occasion and never halted until he came, after Yule, east to Russia to King Olaf, who was very glad to see Bjorn. Then the king inquired much about the news from Norway. Bjorn tells him that Earl Hakon was missing, and the kingdom left without a head. At this news the men who had followed King Olaf were very glad, all who had left property, connections, and friends in Norway, and the longing for home was awakened in them. Bjorn told King Olaf much news from Norway, and very anxious the king was to know, and asked much how his friends had kept their fidelity towards him. Bjorn answered, it had gone differently with different people. Then Bjorn stood up, fell at the king's feet, held his foot, and said, all is in your power, sire, and in God's. I have taken money from King Canute's men, and sworn them the oaths of fealty. But now will I follow thee, and not part from thee so long as we both live. The king replies, Stand up, Bjorn, thou shalt be reconciled with me, but reconcile thy perjury with God. I can see that but few men in Norway have held fast by their fealty, when such men as thou art could be false to me. But true it is also that people sit in great danger when I am distant, and they are exposed to the wrath of my enemies. Bjorn then reckoned up those who had principally bound themselves to rise in hostility against the king and his men. And named, among others, Erling's son in Juddar and their connections, Einar Tambaskelfer, Kaf Arneson, Thor Hund, and Herek of Thjada. 198. Of King Olaf. After King Olaf came to Russia he was very thoughtful, and weighed what counsel he now should follow. King Jerislief and Queen Ingegerd offered him to remain with them, and receive a kingdom called Bulgaria, which is a part of Russia, and in which land the people were still heathen. King Olaf thought over this offer. But when he proposed it to his men they dissuaded him from settling himself there, and urged the king to betake himself to Norway to his own kingdom, but the king himself had resolved almost in his own mind to lay down his royal dignity. 
to go out into the world to Jerusalem, or other holy places, and to enter into some order of monks. But yet the thought lay deep in his soul to recover again, if there should be any opportunity for him, his kingdom in Norway. When he thought over this, it recurred to his mind how all things had gone prosperously with him during the first ten years of his reign, and how afterwards everything he undertook became heavy, difficult, and hard. And that he had been unlucky, on all occasions in which he had tried his luck. On this account he doubted if it would be prudent to depend so much upon his luck, as to go with so little strength into the hands of his enemies, seeing that all the people of the country had taken part with them to oppose King Olaf. Such cares he had often on his mind, and he left his cause to God, praying that he would do what to him seemed best. These thoughts he turned over in his mind, and knew not what to resolve upon. For he saw how evidently dangerous that was which his inclination was most bent upon. 199, of King Olaf's Dream. One night the king lay awake in his bed, thinking with great anxiety about his determination, and at last, being tired of thinking, sleep came over him towards morning. But his sleep was so light that he thought he was awake, and could see all that was doing in the house. Then he saw a great and superb man, in splendid clothes, standing by his bed. And it came into the king's mind that this was King Olaf Tryggvason who had come to him. This man said to him, Thou art very sick of thinking about thy future resolutions. And it appears to me wonderful that these thoughts should be so tumultuous in thy soul that thou shouldst even think of laying down the kingly dignity which God hath given thee. And of remaining here and accepting of a kingdom from foreign and unknown kings. Go back rather to that kingdom which thou hast received in heritage, and rule over it with the strength which God hath given thee, and let not thy inferiors take it from thee. It is the glory of a king to be victorious over his enemies, and it is a glorious death to die in battle. Or art thou doubtful if thou hast right on thy side in the strife with thine enemies? Thou must have no doubts, and must not conceal the truth from thyself. Thou must go back to thy country, and God will give open testimony that the kingdom is thine by property. When the king awoke he thought he saw the man's shoulders going out. From this time the king's courage rose, and he fixed firmly his resolution to return to Norway, to which his inclination also tended most, and which he also found was the desire of all his men. He bethought himself also that the country being without a chief could be easily attacked, from what he had heard, and that after he came himself many would turn back towards him. When the king told his determination to his people they all gave it their approbation joyfully. 200 of King Olaf's healing powers. It is related that once upon a time, while King Olaf was in Russia, it happened that the son of an honest widow had a sore boil upon his neck, of which the lad lay very ill, and as he could not swallow any food, there was little hope of his life. The boy's mother went to Queen Ingigerd, with whom she was acquainted, and showed her the lad. The queen said she knew no remedy for it. Go, said she, to King Olaf, he is the best physician here. And beg him to lay his hands on thy lad, and bring him my words if he will not otherwise do it. She did as the queen told her. And when she found the king she says to him that her son is dangerously ill of a boil in his neck, and begs him to lay his hand on the boil. The king tells her he is not a physician, and bids her go to where there were physicians. She replies, that the queen had told her to come to him, and told me to add the request from her, that you would would use the remedy you understood, and she said that thou art the best physician here in the town. Then the king took the lad, laid his hands upon his neck, and felt the boil for a long time, until the boy made a very wry face. Then the king took a piece of bread, laid it in the figure of the cross upon the palm of his hand, and put it into the boy's mouth. He swallowed it down, and from that time all the soreness left his neck, and in a few days he was quite well, to the great joy of his mother and all his relations. Then first came Olaf into the repute of having as much healing power in his hands as is ascribed to men who have been gifted by nature with healing by the touch. And afterwards when his miracles were universally acknowledged, this also was considered one of his miracles. 201, King Olaf burns the wood shavings on his hand for his Sabbath breach. It happened one Sunday that the king sat in his high seat at the dinner table, 
and had fallen into such deep thought that he did not observe how time went. In one hand he had a knife, and in the other a piece of fir wood from which he cut splinters from time to time. The table servant stood before him with a bowl in his hands. And seeing what the king was about, and that he was involved in thought, he said, It is Monday, sire, tomorrow. The king looked at him when he heard this, and then it came into his mind what he was doing on the Sunday. Then the king ordered a lighted candle to be brought him, swept together all the shavings he had made, set them on fire, and let them burn upon his naked hand. Showing thereby that he would hold fast by God's law and commandment, and not trespass without punishment on what he knew to be right. 202, Of King Olaf When King Olaf had resolved on his return home, he made known his intention to King Jerisleaf and Queen Ingigerd. They dissuaded him from this expedition, and said he should receive as much power in their dominions as he thought desirable. But begged him not to put himself within the reach of his enemies with so few men as he had. Then King Olaf told them of his dream, adding, that he believed it to be God's will and providence that it should be so. Now when they found he was determined on traveling to Norway, they offered him all the assistance to his journey that he would accept from them. The king thanked them in many fine words for their good will. And said that he accepted from them, with no ordinary pleasure, what might be necessary for his undertaking. 203, Of King Olaf's Journey from Russia Immediately after Yule, A.D. 1080, King Olaf made himself ready. And had about two hundred of his men with him. King Jerisleaf gave him all the horses, and whatever else he required, and when he was ready he set off. King Jerisleaf and Queen Ingigerd parted from him with all honor. And he left his son Magnus behind with the king. The first part of his journey, down to the sea coast, King Olaf and his men made on the ice. But as spring approached, and the ice broke up, they rigged their vessels, and when they were ready and got a wind they set out to sea, and had a good voyage. When Olaf came to the island of Gotland with his ships he heard the news, which was told as truth, both in Svithjad, Denmark, and over all Norway, that Earl Hakon was missing, and Norway without a head. This gave the king and his men good hope of the issue of their journey. From thence they sailed, when the wind suited, to Svithjad, and went into the Malar Lake, to Aros, and sent men to the Swedish king Anand appointing a meeting. King Anand received his brother-in-law's message in the kindest manner, and went to him according to his invitation. Astrid also came to King Olaf, with the men who had attended her, and great was the joy on all sides at this meeting. The Swedish king also received his brother-in-law King Olaf with great joy when they met. 204. Of the Lenderman in Norway Now we must relate what, in the meantime, was going on in Norway. Thor Hund, in these two winters, A.D. 1029-1030, had made a Lapland journey, and each winter had been a long time on the mountains, and had gathered to himself great wealth by trading in various wares with the Laplanders. He had twelve large coats of reindeer skin made for him, with so much Lapland witchcraft that no weapon could cut or pierce them any more than if they were armor of ringmail, nor so much. The spring thereafter Thor rigged a long ship which belonged to him, and manned it with his house servants. He summoned the bonds, demanded a levy from the most northern Thing district, collected in this way a great many people, and proceeded with this force southwards. Herek of Thjada had also collected a great number of people. And in this expedition many people of consequence took a part, although these two were the most distinguished. They made it known publicly that with this war force they were going against King Olaf, to defend the country against him, in case he should come from the eastward. 205, of Einar Tambaskelfer. Einar Tambaskelfer had most influence in the outer part of the Thrandjum country after Earl Hakon's death was no longer doubtful, for he and his son Eindride appeared to be the nearest heirs to the movable property the Earl had possessed. Then Einar remembered the promises and offers of friendship which King Canute had made him at parting. And he ordered a good vessel which belonged to him to be got ready, and embarked with a great retinue, and when he was ready sailed southwards along the coast, then set out to sea westwards, and sailed without stopping until he came to England. He immediately waited on King Canute, who received him well and joyfully. 
Then Einar opened his business to the king, and said he was come there to see the fulfillment of the promises the king had made him. Namely, that he, Einar, should have the highest title of honor in Norway if Earl Hakon were no more. King Canute replies, that now the circumstances were altered. I have now, said he, sent men and tokens to my son Sven in Denmark, and promised him the kingdom of Norway, but thou shalt retain my friendship, and get the dignity and title which thou art entitled by birth to hold. Thou shalt be lenderman with great fiefs, and be so much more raised above other lendermen as thou art more able than they. Einar saw sufficiently how matters stood with regard to his business, and got ready to return home. But as he now knew the king's intentions, and thought it probable if King Olaf came from the east the country would not be very peaceable, it came into his mind that it would be better to proceed slowly, and not to be hastening his voyage. In order to fight against King Olaf, without his being advanced by it to any higher dignity than he had before. Einar accordingly went to sea when he was ready, but only came to Norway after the events were ended which took place there during that summer. 206 Of the Chief People in Norway The chiefs in Norway had their spies east in Svithjad, and south in Denmark, to find out if King Olaf had come from Russia. As soon as these men could get across the country, they heard the news that King Olaf was arrived in Svithjad. And as soon as full certainty of this was obtained, the war message token went round the land. The whole people were called out to a levy, and a great army was collected. The lender men who were from Agder, Rogaland, and Hordaland, divided themselves, so that some went towards the north, and some towards the east, for they thought they required people on both sides. Erling's sons from Jeddah went eastward, with all the men who lived east of them, and over whom they were chiefs, a slack of Finney, and Erland of Gerd, with the lendermen north of them, went towards the north. All those now named had sworn an oath to King Canute to deprive Olaf of life, if opportunity should offer. 207. Of Harald Sigurdsson's Proceedings Now when it was reported in Norway that King Olaf was come from the east to Svithjad, his friends gathered together to give him aid. The most distinguished man in this flock was Harald Sigurdsson, a brother of King Olaf, who then was fifteen years of age, very stout, and manly of growth as if he were full-grown. Many other brave men were there also. And there were in all six hundred men when they proceeded from the uplands, and went eastward with their force through Ede Forest to Vermeland. From thence they went eastward through the forests to Svithjad and made inquiry about King Olaf's proceedings. 208 of King Olaf's proceedings in Svithjad. King Olaf was in Svithjad in spring, A.D. 1030, and had sent spies from thence to Norway. All accounts from that quarter agreed that there was no safety for him if he went there, and the people who came from the north dissuaded him much from penetrating into the country. But he had firmly resolved within himself, as before stated, to go into Norway, and he asked King Anand what strength King Anand would give him to conquer his kingdom. King Anand replied, that the Swedes were little inclined to make an expedition against Norway. We know, says he, that the Northmen are rough and warlike, and it is dangerous to carry hostility to their doors, but I will not be slow in telling thee what aid I can give. I will give thee four hundred chosen men from my court men, active and warlike, and well equipped for battle, and moreover will give thee leave to go through my country, and gather to thyself as many men as thou canst get to follow thee. King Olaf accepted this offer, and got ready for his march. Queen Astrid, and Ulfhild the king's daughter, remained behind in Svithjad. 209 King Olaf advances to Jarnberland. Just as King Olaf began his journey the men came to him whom the Swedish king had given, in all four hundred men, and the king took the road the Swedes showed him. He advanced upwards in the country to the forests, and came to a district called Jarnberland. Here the people joined him who had come out of Norway to meet him, as before related, and he met here his brother Harold, and many other of his relations, and it was a joyful meeting. They made out together one thousand two hundred men. 210. Of Dag Ringson. There was a man called Dag, who is said to have been a son of King Ring, who fled the country from King Olaf. This Ring, it is said further, had been a son of Dag, and grandson of Ring, Harald Harfager's son. 
Thus was Dag King Olaf's relative. Both Ring the father, and Dag the son, had settled themselves in Svithjad, and got land to rule over. In spring, when Olaf came from the east to Svithjad, he sent a message to his relation Dag, that he should join him in this expedition with all the force he could collect. And if they gained the country of Norway again, Dag should have no smaller part of the kingdom under him than his forefathers had enjoyed. When this message came to Dag it suited his inclination well, for he had a great desire to go to Norway and get the dominion his family had ruled over. He was not slow, therefore, to reply, and promised to come. Dag was a quick-speaking, quick-resolving man, mixing himself up in everything, eager, but of little understanding. He collected a force of almost twelve hundred men, with which he joined King Olaf. 2.11 Of King Olaf's Journey King Olaf sent a message before him to all the inhabited places he passed through, that the men who wished to get goods and money, and share of booty, and the lands besides which now were in the hands of his enemies, should come to him. And follow him. Thereafter King Olaf led his army through forests, often over desert moors, and often over large lakes, and they dragged, or carried the boats, from lake to lake. On the way a great many followers joined the king, partly forest settlers, partly vagabonds. The places at which he halted for the night are since called Olaf's booths. He proceeded without any break upon his journey until he came to Jantaland, from which he marched north over the keel or ridge of the land. The men spread themselves over the hamlets and proceeded, much scattered, so long as no enemy was expected. But always, when so dispersed, the Northmen accompanied the king. Dag proceeded with his men on another line of march, and the Swedes on a third with their troop. 212. Of Vagabond Men. There were two men, the one called Gaukathor, the other Afrafast, who were vagabonds and great robbers, and had a company of thirty men such as themselves. These two men were larger and stronger than other men, and they wanted neither courage nor impudence. These men heard speak of the army that was crossing the country, and said among themselves it would be a clever counsel to go to the king, follow him to his country, and go with him into a regular battle, and try themselves in this work. For they had never been in any battle in which people were regularly drawn up in line, and they were curious to see the king's order of battle. This counsel was approved of by their comrades, and accordingly they went to the road on which King Olaf was to pass. When they came there they presented themselves to the king, with their followers, fully armed. They saluted him, and he asked what people they were. They told their names, and said they were natives of the place, and told their errand, and that they wished to go with the king. The king said, it appeared to him there was good help in such folks. And I have a great inclination, said he, to take such, but are ye Christian men? Galkathora replies, that he is neither Christian nor heathen. I and my comrades have no faith but on ourselves, our strength, and the luck of victory, and with this faith we slip through sufficiently well. The king replies, a great pity it is that such brave slaughtering fellows did not believe in Christ their Creator. Thora replies, is there any Christian man, king, in thy following, who stands so high in the air as we two brothers? The king told them to let themselves be baptized, and to accept the true faith. Follow me then, and I will advance you to great dignities, but if ye will not do so, return to your former vocation. Aphrafast said he would not take on Christianity, and he turned away. Then said Galkathor, It is a great shame that the king drives us thus away from his army, and I never before came where I was not received into the company of other people, and I shall never return back on this account. They joined accordingly the rear with other forest men, and followed the troops. Thereafter the king proceeded west up to the keel ridge of the country. 213 Of King Olaf's Vision now when King Olaf, coming from the east, went over the keel ridge and descended on the west side of the mountain, where it declines towards the sea, he could see from thence far over the country. Many people rode before the king and many after, and he himself rode so that there was a free space around him. He was silent, and nobody spoke to him, and thus he rode a great part of the day without looking much about him. Then the bishop rode up to him, asked him why he was so silent, and what he was thinking of, for, in general, he was very cheerful, 
and very talkative on a journey to his men, so that all who were near him were merry. The king replied, full of thought, wonderful things have come into my mind a while ago. As I just now looked over Norway, out to the west from the mountains, it came into my mind how many happy days I have had in that land. It appeared to me at first as if I saw over all the Thrandjum country, and then over all Norway, and the longer this vision was before my eyes the farther, methought, I saw, until I looked over the whole wide world, both land and sea. Well I know the places at which I have been in former days, some even which I have only heard speak of, and some I saw of which I had never heard, both inhabited and uninhabited, in this wide world. The bishop replied that this was a holy vision, and very remarkable. 2.14 Of the Miracle on the Corn Land When the king had come lower down on the mountain, there lay a farm before him called Sula, on the highest part of Veradal district. And as they came nearer to the house the corn land appeared on both sides of the path. The king told his people to proceed carefully, and not destroy the corn to the bonds. The people observed this when the king was near. But the crowd behind paid no attention to it, and the people ran over the corn, so that it was trodden flat to the earth. There dwelt a bond there called Thorgir Fleck, who had two sons nearly grown up. Thorgir received the king and his people well, and offered all the assistance in his power. The king was pleased with his offer, and asked Thorgir what was the news of the country, and if any forces were assembled against him. Thorgir says that a great army was drawn together in the Thrandjum country, and that there were some lendermen both from the south of the country, and from Halagaland in the north, but I do not know, says he. If they are intended against you, or going elsewhere. Then he complained to the king of the damage and waste done him by the people breaking and treading down all his corn fields. The king said it was ill done to bring upon him any loss. Then the king rode to where the corn had stood, and saw it was laid flat on the earth, and he rode round the field, and said, I expect, bond, that God will repair thy loss, so that the field, within a week, will be better. And it proved the best of the corn, as the king had said. The king remained all night there, and in the morning he made himself ready, and told Thorgir the bond to accompany him and Thorgir offered his two sons also for the journey. And although the king said that he did not want them with him, the lads would go. As they would not stay behind, the king's court men were about binding them, but the king seeing it said, Let them come with us, the lads will come safe back again. And it was with the lads as the king foretold. 2.15 of the baptism of the vagabond forest men. Thereafter the army advanced to Staff, and when the king reached Staff's moor he halted. There he got the certain information that the bonds were advancing with an army against him, and that he might soon expect to have a battle with them. He mustered his force here, and, after reckoning them up, found there were in the army nine hundred heathen men, and when he came to know it he ordered them to allow themselves to be baptized, saying that he would have no heathens with him in battle. We must not, says he, put our confidence in numbers, but in God alone must we trust, for through his power and favor we must be victorious, and I will not mix heathen people with my own. When the heathens heard this, they held a council among themselves, and at last four hundred men agreed to be baptized, but five hundred men refused to adopt Christianity, and that body returned home to their land. Then the brothers Gaukathor and Aphrafast presented themselves to the king, and offered again to follow him. The king asked if they had now taken baptism. Gaukathor replied that they had not. Then the king ordered them to accept baptism and the true faith, or otherwise to go away. They stepped aside to talk with each other on what resolution they should take. Aphrafast said, To give my opinion, I will not turn back, but go into the battle, and take a part on the one side or the other, and I don't care much in which army I am. Galkathor replies, If I go into battle I will give my help to the king, for he has most need of help. And if I must believe in a god, why not in the white Christ as well as in any other? Now it is my advice, therefore, that we let ourselves be baptized, since the king insists so much upon it, and then go into the battle with him. They all agreed to this, and went to the king, and said they would receive baptism. Then they were baptized by a priest, and the baptism was confirmed by the bishop. The king then took them into the troop of his court men, 
and said they should fight under his banner in the battle. 216 King Olaf's Speech King Olaf got certain intelligence now that it would be but a short time until he had a battle with the bonds, and after he had mustered his men, and reckoned up the force, he had more than three thousand men, which appears to be a great army in one field. Then the king made the following speech to the people, We have a great army, and excellent troops, and now I will tell you, my men, how I will have our force drawn up. I will let my banner go forward in the middle of the army, and my court men, and perseverance shall follow it, together with the war forces that joined us from the uplands, and also those who may come to us here in the Throngem land. On the right hand of my banner shall be Dag Ringson, with all the men he brought to our aid, and he shall have the second banner. And on the left hand of our line shall the men be whom the Swedish king gave us, together with all the people who came to us in Sweden, and they shall have the third banner. I will also have the people divide themselves into distinct flocks or parcels, so that relations and acquaintances should be together, for thus they defend each other best, and know each other. We will have all our men distinguished by a mark, so as to be a field token upon their helmets and shields, by painting the holy cross thereupon with white color. When we come into battle we shall all have one countersign and field cry, Forward, forward, Christian men! Cross men! King's men! We must draw up our meal in thinner ranks, because we have fewer people, and I do not wish to let them surround us with their men. Now let the men divide themselves into separate flocks, and then each flock into ranks. Then let each man observe well his proper place, and take notice what banner he is drawn up under. And now we shall remain drawn up in array. And our men shall be fully armed, night and day, until we know where the meeting shall be between us and the bonds. When the king had finished speaking, the army arrayed, and arranged itself according to the king's orders. 217. King Olaf's Council. Thereafter the king had a meeting with the chiefs of the different divisions, and then the men had returned whom the king had sent out into the neighboring districts to demand men from the bonds. They brought the tidings from the inhabited places they had gone through, that all around the country was stripped of all men able to carry arms, as all the people had joined the bonds army. And where they did find any they got but few to follow them, for the most of them answered that they stayed at home because they would not follow either party, they would not go out against the king, nor yet against their own relations. Thus they had got but few people. Now the king asked his men their counsel, and what they now should do. Finn Arneson answered thus to the king's question, I will say what should be done, if I may advise. We should go with armed hand over all the inhabited places, plunder all the goods, and burn all the habitations, and leave not a hut standing, and thus punish the bonds for their treason against their sovereign. I think many a man will then cast himself loose from the bonds army, when he sees smoke and flame at home on his farm, and does not know how it is going with children, wives, or old men, fathers, mothers, and other connections. I expect also, he added, that if we succeed in breaking the assembled host, their ranks will soon be thinned, for so it is with the bonds, that the council which is the newest is always the dearest to them all, and most followed. When Finn had ended his speech it met with general applause, for many thought well of such a good occasion to make booty, and all thought the bonds well deserved to suffer damage. And they also thought it probable, what Finn said, that many would in this way be brought to forsake the assembled army of the bonds. Now when the king heard the warm expressions of his people he told them to listen to him, and said, The bonds have well deserved that it should be done to them as ye desire. They also know that I have formerly done so, burning their habitations, and punishing them severely in many ways. But then I proceeded against them with fire and sword because they rejected the true faith, betook themselves to sacrifices, and would not obey my commands. We had then God's honor to defend. But this treason against their sovereign is a much less grievous crime, although it does not become men who have any manhood in them to break the faith and vows they have sworn to me. Now, however, it is more in my power to spare those who have dealt ill with me, than those whom God hated. I will, therefore, that my people proceed gently, and commit no ravage. First, I will proceed to meet the bonds. If we can then come to a reconciliation, it is well, but if they will fight with us, 
then there are two things before us, either we fail in the battle, and then it will be well advised not to have to retire encumbered with spoil and cattle. Or we gain the victory, and then ye will be the heirs of all who fight now against us. For some will fall, and others will fly, but both will have forfeited their goods and properties, and then it will be good to enter into full houses and well-stocked farms. But what is burnt is of use to no man, and with pillage and force more is wasted than what turns to use. Now we will spread out far through the inhabited places, and take with us all the men we can find able to carry arms. Then men will also capture cattle for slaughter, or whatever else of provision that can serve for food, but not do any other ravage. But I will see willingly that ye kill any spies of the bond army ye may fall in with. Dag and his people shall go by the north side down along the valley, and I will go on along the country road, and so we shall meet in the evening, and all have one night quarter. 218 Of King Olaf's Skalds It is related that when King Olaf drew up his men in battle order, he made a shield rampart with his troop that should defend him in battle, for which he selected the strongest and boldest. Thereafter he called his skalds, and ordered them to go in within the shield defense. Ye shall. Says the king, remain here, and see the circumstances which may take place, and then ye will not have to follow the reports of others in what ye afterwards tell or sing concerning it. There were Thormod Kalbrnarskald, Gisur Gulberskald, a foster son of Hofgerdereth, and Thorfinn Munn. Then said Thormod to Gisur, Let us not stand so close together, brother, that Sigvat the Skald should not find room when he comes. He must stand before the king, and the king will not have it otherwise. The king heard this, and said, Ye need not sneer at Sigvat, because he is not here. Often has he followed me well, and now he is praying for us, and that we greatly need. Thormod replies, It may be, sire, that ye now require prayers most, but it would be thin around the banner staff if all thy court men were now on the way to Rome. True it was what we spoke about, that no man who would speak with you could find room for Sigvat. Thereafter the skalds talked among themselves that it would be well to compose a few songs of remembrance about the events which would soon be taking place. Then Gieser sang. From me shall bend girl never hear. A thought of sorrow, care, or fear. I wish my girl knew how gay. We arm us for our Viking fray. Many and brave they are, we know. Who come against us there below? But, life or death, we, one and all. By Norway's king will stand or fall. And Thorfinn Mund made another song, viz. Dark is the cloud of men and shields. Slow moving up through Vertel's fields. These Verdal folks presume to bring their armed force against their king. On. Let us feed the carrion crow. Give her a feast in every blow. And, above all, let Throngem's hordes feel the sharp edge of true men's swords. And Thorod sang. The whistling arrows pipe to battle. Sword and shield their war call rattle. Up. Brave men, up. The faint heart here. Finds courage when the danger's near. Up. Brave men, up. With Olaf on. With heart and hand a field is won. One Viking cheer, then, stead of words. We'll speak with our death-dealing swords. These songs were immediately got by heart by the army. 219, of King Olaf's gifts for the souls of those who should be slain. Thereafter the king made himself ready and marched down through the valley. His whole forces took up their night quarter in one place, and lay down all night under their shields, but as soon as day broke the king again put his army in order, and that being done they proceeded down through the valley. Many bonds then came to the king, of whom the most joined his army, and all, as one man, told the same tale, that the lender men had collected an enormous army, with which they intended to give battle to the king. The king took many marks of silver, and delivered them into the hands of a bond, and said, This money thou shalt conceal, and afterwards lay out, some to churches, some to priests, some to alms men. As gifts for the life and souls of those who fight against us, and may fall in battle. The bond replies, 
should you not rather give this money for the soul mulct of your own men? The king says, This money shall be given for the souls of those who stand against us in the ranks of the bonds army, and fall by the weapons of our own men. The men who follow us to battle, and fall therein, will all be saved together with ourself. 220, of Thormod Kalbrenarskald. This night the king lay with his army around him on the field, as before related, and lay long awake in prayer to God, and slept but little. Towards morning a slumber fell on him, and when he awoke daylight was shooting up. The king thought it too early to awaken the army, and asked where Thormod the Skald was. Thormod was at hand, and asked what was the king's pleasure. Sing us a song, said the king. Thormod raised himself up, and sang so loud that the whole army could hear him. He began to sing the old Hvjarkamal, of which these are the first verses. The day is breaking. The house cock, shaking. His rustling wings. While priest bell rings. Crows up the morn. And touting horn. Wakes thralls to work and weep. Ye sons of Adil, cast off sleep. Wake up. Wake up. Nor wassail cup. Nor maidens jeer. Awaits you here. Rolf of the bow. Har of the blow. Up in your might. The day is breaking. Tis Hild's game, one, that bides your waking. Then the troops awoke, and when the song was ended the people thanked him for it, and it pleased many, as it was suitable to the time and occasion, and they called it the house garls wet. The king thanked him for the pleasure, and took a gold ring that weighed half a mark and gave it him. Thormod thanked the king for the gift, and said, We have a good king, but it is not easy to say how long the king's life may be. It is my prayer, sire, that thou shouldst never part from me either in life or death. The king replies, We shall all go together so long as I rule, and as ye will follow me. Thormod says, I hope, sire, that whether in safety or danger I may stand near you as long as I can stand, whatever we may hear of Sigvat travelling with his gold-hilted sword. Then Thormod made these lines. To thee, my king, I'll still be true. Until another scald I view. Here in the field with golden sword. As in thy hall, with flattering word. Thy scald shall never be a craven. Though he may feast the croaking raven. The warrior's fate unmoved I view. To thee, my king, I'll still be true. End notes. 1. Hild's game is the battle, from the name of the war goddess Hild. L. 221. King Olaf comes to Stikelstad. King Olaf led his army farther down through the valley, and Dag and his men went another way, and the king did not halt until he came to Stikelstad. There he saw the bond army spread out all around. And there were so great numbers that people were going on every footpath, and great crowds were collected far and near. They also saw there a troop which came down from Veridal, and had been out to spy. They came so close to the king's people that they knew each other. It was Hrut of Vigia, with thirty men. The king ordered his perseverance to go out against Hrut, and make an end of him, to which his men were instantly ready. The king said to the Icelanders, It is told me that in Iceland it is the custom that the bonds give their house servants a sheep to slaughter, now I give you a ram to slaughter. 1. The Icelanders were easily invited to this, and went out immediately with a few men against Hrut, and killed him and the troop that followed him. When the king came to Stikelstad he made a halt, and made the army stop, and told his people to alight from their horses and get ready for battle, and the people did as the king ordered. Then he placed his army in battle array, and raised his banner. Dag was not yet arrived with his men, so that his wing of the battle array was wanting. Then the king said the upland men should go forward in their place, and raise their banner there. It appears to me advisable, says the king, that Harold my brother should not be in the battle, for he is still in the years of childhood only. Harold replies, Certainly I shall be in the battle, for I am not so weak that I cannot handle the sword, and as to that, I have a notion of tying the sword handle to my hand. None is more willing than I am to give the bonds a blow. So I shall go with my comrades. It is said that Harold made these lines. 
our army's wing, where I shall stand. I will hold good with heart and hand. My mother's eyes shall joy to see. A battered, blood-stained shield from me. The brisk young scald should gaily go. Into the fray, give blow for blow. Cheer on his men, gain inch by inch. And from the spear point never flinch. Harold got his will, and was allowed to be in the battle. End notes. 1. Hrut means a young ram. L. 222, of Thorgils Halmason. A bond, by name Thorgils Halmason, father to Grim the Good, dwelt in Stikelstead Farm. Thorgils offered the king his assistance, and was ready to go into battle with him. The king thanked him for the offer. I would rather, says the king, thou shouldst not be in the fight. Do us rather the service to take care of the people who are wounded, and to bury those who may fall, when the battle is over. Should it happen, Bond, that I fall in this battle, bestow the care on my body that may be necessary, if that be not forbidden thee. Thorgils promised the king what he desired. 2.23, Olaf's Speech now when King Olaf had drawn up his army in battle array he made a speech, in which he told the people to raise their spirit, and go boldly forward, if it came to a battle. We have, says he, many men, and good. And although the bonds may have a somewhat larger force than we, it is fate that rules over victory. This I will make known to you solemnly, that I shall not fly from this battle, but shall either be victorious over the bonds, or fall in the fight. I will pray to God that the lot of the two may befall me which will be most to my advantage. With this we may encourage ourselves, that we have a more just cause than the bonds. And likewise that God must either protect us in our cause in this battle, or give us a far higher recompense for what we may lose here in the world than what we ourselves could ask. Should it be my lot to have anything to say after the battle, then shall I reward each of you according to his service, and to the bravery he displays in the battle. And if we gain the victory, there must be land and movables enough to divide among you, and which are now in the hands of your enemies. Let us at the first make the hardest onset, for then the consequences are soon seen. There being a great difference in the numbers, we have to expect victory from a sharp assault only, and, on the other hand, it will be heavy work for us to fight until we are tired, and unable to fight longer. For we have fewer people to relieve with than they, who can come forward at one time and retreat and rest at another. But if we advance so hard at the first attack that those who are foremost in their ranks must turn round, then the one will fall over the other, and their destruction will be the greater the greater numbers there are together. When the king had ended his speech it was received with loud applause, and the one encouraged the other. 224, of Thord Follison. Thord Follison carried King Olaf's banner. So says Sigvat the Skald, in the death song which he composed about King Olaf, and put together according to Resurrection Saga. Thord. I have heard, by Olaf's side. Where raged the battle's wildest tide. Moved on, and, as by one accord. Moved with them every heart and sword. The banner of the king on high. Floating all splendid in the sky. From golden shaft, aloft he bore. The Norsemen's Rallying Point of Yore. 225, of King Olaf's Armor. King Olaf was armed thus, he had a gold-mounted helmet on his head. And had in one hand a white shield, on which the holy cross was inlaid in gold. In his other hand he had a lance, which to the present day stands beside the altar in Christ Church. In his belt he had a sword, which was called Neter, which was remarkably sharp, and of which the handle was worked with gold. He had also a strong coat of ring mail. Sigvat the Skald, speaks of this. A greater victory to gain. Olaf the Stout strode o'er the plain. In strong chain armor, aid to bring. To his brave men on either wing. High rose the fight and battle heat. The clear blood ran beneath the feet. Of Swedes, who from the east came there. In Olaf's gain or loss to share. 226. King Olaf's Dream. Now, when King Olaf had drawn up his men, the army of the bonds had not yet come near upon any quarter, so the king said the people should sit down and rest themselves. He sat down himself, 
and the people sat around him in a widespread crowd. He leaned down, and laid his head upon Finn Arneson's knee. There a slumber came upon him, and he slept a little while. But at the same time the Bond's army was seen advancing with raised banners, and the multitude of these was very great. Then Finn awakened the king, and said that the Bond army advanced against them. The king awoke, and said, Why did you waken me, Finn, and did not allow me to enjoy my dream? Finn, thou must not be dreaming. But rather thou shouldst be awake, and preparing thyself against the host which is coming down upon us, or, dost thou not see that the whole Bond crowd is coming? The king replies, They are not yet so near to us, and it would have been better to have let me sleep. Then said Finn, What was the dream, sire, of which the loss appears to thee so great that thou wouldst rather have been left to waken of thyself? Now the king told his dream, that he seemed to see a high ladder, upon which he went so high in the air that heaven was open, for so high reached the ladder. And when you awoke me, I was come to the highest step towards heaven. Finn replies, This dream does not appear to me so good as it does to thee. I think it means that thou art fay, one, unless it be the mere want of sleep that has worked upon thee. End notes, 1, fay means doomed to die. 227. Of Arnoljot Jeline's Baptism. When King Olaf was arrived at Steichelstad, it happened, among other circumstances, that a man came to him. And although it was nowise wonderful that there came many men from the districts, yet this must be regarded as unusual that this man did not appear like the other men who came to him. He was so tall that none stood higher than up to his shoulders, very handsome he was in countenance, and had beautiful fair hair. He was well armed, had a fine helmet, and ring armor, a red shield, a superb sword in his belt. And in his hand a gold-mounted spear, the shaft of it so thick that it was a handful to grasp. The man went before the king, saluted him, and asked if the king would accept his services. The king asked his name and family, also what countryman he was. He replies, My family is in Jantaland and Helsingjaland, and my name is Arnold Jot Jelline. But this I must not forget to tell you, that I came to the assistance of those men you sent to Jantaland to collect scat, and I gave into their hands a silver dish, which I sent you as a token that I would be your friend. Then the king asked Arnoljot if he was a Christian or not. He replied, My faith has been this, to rely upon my power and strength, and which faith hath hitherto given me satisfaction, but now I intend rather to put my faith, sire, in thee. The king replies, If thou wilt put faith in me thou must also put faith in what I will teach thee. Thou must believe that Jesus Christ has made heaven and earth, and all mankind, and to him shall all those who are good and rightly believing go after death. Arnoljot answers, I have indeed heard of the white Christ, but neither know what he proposes, nor what he rules over, but now I will believe all that thou sayest to me, and lay down my lot in your hands. Thereupon Arnoljot was baptized. The king taught him so much of the holy faith as appeared to him needful, and placed him in the front rank of the order of battle, in advance of his banner, where also Gaukathor and Aphrafast, with their men, were. 228. Concerning the army collected in Norway. Now shall we relate what we have left behind in our tale, that the lendermen and bonds had collected a vast host as soon as it was reported that King Olaf was come from Russia, and had arrived in Svithjot. But when they heard that he had come to Jantaland, and intended to proceed westwards over the Kiel Ridge to Veridal, they brought their forces into the Thrandjum country, where they gathered together the whole people, free and unfree, and proceeded towards Veridal with so great a body of men that there was nobody in Norway at that time who had seen so large a force assembled. But the force, as it usually happens in so great a multitude, consisted of many different sorts of people. There were many lender men, and a great many powerful bonds, but the great mass consisted of laborers and cotters. The chief strength of this army lay in the Thrandjum land, and it was the most warm in enmity and opposition to the king. 2.29, of Bishop Sigurd. When King Canute had, as before related, laid all Norway under his power, he set Earl Hakon to manage it, and gave the Earl a court bishop, by name Sigurd, who was of Danish descent, and had been long with King Canute. 
This bishop was of a very hot temper, and particularly obstinate, and haughty in his speech, but supported King Canute all he could in conversation, and was a great enemy of King Olaf. He was now also in the Bond's army, spoke often before the people, and urged them much to insurrection against King Olaf. 230, Bishop Sigurd's Speech At a house thing, at which a great many people were assembled, the bishop desired to be heard, and made the following speech, Here are now assembled a great many men. So that probably there will never be opportunity in this poor country of seeing so great a native army. But it would be desirable if this strength and multitude could be a protection, for it will all be needed, if this Olaf does not give over bringing war and strife upon you. From his very earliest youth he has been accustomed to plunder and kill, for which purposes he drove widely around through all countries, until he turned at last against this. Where he began to show hostilities against the men who were the best and most powerful. And even against King Canute, whom all are bound to serve according to their ability, and in whose scatlands he set himself down. He did the same to Olaf the Swedish king. He drove the earls Sven and Hakon away from their heritages. And was even most tyrannical towards his own connections, as he drove all the kings out of the uplands, although, indeed, it was but just reward for having been false to their oaths of fealty to King Canute. And having followed this King Olaf in all the folly he could invent. So their friendship ended according to their deserts, by this king mutilating some of them, taking their kingdoms himself, and ruining every man in the country who had an honorable name. Ye know yourselves how he has treated the lender men, of whom many of the worthless have been murdered, and many obliged to fly from their country. And how he has roamed far and wide through the land with robber bands, burning and plundering houses, and killing people. Who is the man among us here of any consideration who has not some great injury from him to avenge? Now he has come hither with a foreign troop, consisting mostly of forest men, vagabonds, and such marauders. Do ye think he will now be more merciful to you, when he is roaming about with such a bad crew, after committing devastations which all who followed him dissuaded him from? Therefore it is now my advice, that ye remember King Canute's words when he told you, if King Olaf attempted to return to the country ye should defend the liberty King Canute had promised you, and should oppose and drive away such a vile pack. Now the only thing to be done is to advance against them, and cast forth these malefactors to the wolves and eagles, leaving their corpses on the spot they cover, unless ye drag them aside to out-of-the-way corners in the woods or rocks. No man would be so imprudent as to remove them to churches, for they are all robbers and evil-doers. When he had ended his speech it was hailed with the loudest applause, and all unanimously agreed to act according to his recommendation. 231 of the Lendermen. The Lendermen who had come together appointed meetings with each other, and consulted together how they should draw up their troops, and who should be their leader. Kath Arneson said that Herek of Thjada was best fitted to be the chief of this army, for he was descended from Harald Harfager's race. The king also is particularly enraged against him on account of the murder of Grankel, and therefore he would be exposed to the severest fate if Olaf recovered the kingdom. And Herek withal is a man experienced in battles, and a man who does much for honor alone. Herek replies, that the men are best suited for this who are in the flower of their age. I am now, says he, an old and decaying man, not able to do much in battle, besides, there is near relationship between me and King Olaf. And although he seems not to put great value upon that tie, it would not beseem me to go as leader of the hostilities against him, before any other in this meeting. On the other hand, thou, Thor, art well suited to be our chief in this battle against King Olaf. And thou hast distinct grounds for being so, both because thou hast to avenge the death of thy relation, and also hast been driven by him as an outlaw from thy property. Thou hast also promised King Canute, as well as thy connections, to avenge the murder of thy relative Eskjorn, and dost thou suppose there ever will be a better opportunity than this of taking vengeance on Olaf for all these insults and injuries? Thora replies thus to his speech, I do not confide in myself so much as to raise the banner against King Olaf, or, as chief, to lead on this army. For the people of Thrandjum have the greatest part in this armament, and I know well their haughty spirit, and that they would not obey me, or any other Hologaland man. 
although I need not be reminded of my injuries to be roused to vengeance on King Olaf. I remember well my heavy loss when King Olaf slew four men, all distinguished both by birth and personal qualities, namely, my brother's son Asbjorn, my sister's sons Thorer and Grijotgard, and their father Olver. And it is my duty to take vengeance for each man of them. I will not conceal that I have selected eleven of my house servants for that purpose, and of those who are the most daring. And I do not think we shall be behind others in exchanging blows with King Olaf, should opportunity be given. 232, KLF Arneson's speech. Then Kaf Arneson desired to speak. It is highly necessary, says he, that this business we have on hand do not turn out a mockery in child work, now that an army is collected. Something else is needful, if we are to stand battle with King Olaf, than that each should shove the danger from himself. For we must recollect that although King Olaf has not many people compared to this army of ours, the leader of them is intrepid, and the whole body of them will be true to him, and obedient in the battle. But if we who should be the leaders of this army show any fear, and will not encourage the army and go at the head of it, it must happen that with the great body of our people the spirit will leave their hearts. And the next thing will be that each will seek his own safety. Although we have now a great force assembled, we shall find our destruction certain, when we meet King Olaf and his troops, if we, the chiefs of the people, are not confident in our cause. And have not the whole army confidently and bravely going along with us. If it cannot be so, we had better not risk a battle. And then it is easy to see that nothing would be left us but to shelter ourselves under King Olaf's mercy, however hard it might be, as then we would be less guilty than we now may appear to him to be. Yet I know there are men in his ranks who would secure my life and peace if I would seek it. Will ye now adopt my proposal, then shalt thou, friend Thor, and thou, Herrick, go under the banner which we will all of us raise up, and then follow. Let us all be speedy and determined in the resolution we have taken, and put ourselves so at the head of the Bond's army that they see no distrust in us. For then will the common man advance with spirit when we go merrily to work in placing the army in battle order, and in encouraging the people to the strife. When Kath had ended they all concurred in what he proposed, and all would do what Kath thought of advantage. All desired Kath to be the leader of the army, and to give each what place in it he chose. 233. How the Lendermen set up their banners. Kath Arneson then raised his banner, and drew up his house servants along with Herek of Thjada and his men. Thor Hund, with his troop, was at the head of the order of battle in front of the banner. And on both sides of Thor was a chosen body of bonds, all of them the most active and best armed in the forces. This part of the array was long and thick, and in it were drawn up the Throngem people and the Haligalanders. On the right wing was another array, and on the left of the main array were drawn up the men from Rogaland, Hordaland, the Fjord districts, and SCGN, and they had the third banner. 234, of Thorstein Nerarsmid. There was a man called Thorstein Nerarsmid, who was a merchant and master ship carpenter, stout and strong, very passionate, and a great manslayer. He had been in enmity against King Olaf, who had taken from him a new and large merchant vessel he had built, on account of some manslaughter mulct, incurred in the course of his misdeeds, which he owed to the king. Thorstein, who was with the Bond's army, went forward in front of the line in which Thor Hun stood, and said, Here I will be, Thor, in your ranks. For I think, if I and King Olaf meet, to be the first to strive a weapon at him, if I can get so near, to repay him for the robbery of the ship he took from me, which was the best that ever went on merchant voyage. Thor and his men received Thorstein, and he went into their ranks. 235 of the preparations of the bonds. When the bonds men and array were drawn up the lender men addressed the men, and ordered them to take notice of the place to which each man belonged, under which banner each should be, who there were in front of the banner, who were his side men. And that they should be brisk and quick in taking up their places in the array. For the army had still to go a long way, and the array might be broken in the course of march. Then they encouraged the people, and Kath invited all the men who had any injury to avenge on King Olaf to place themselves under the banner which was advancing against King Olaf's own banner. 
they should remember the distress he had brought upon them. And, he said, never was there a better opportunity to avenge their grievances, and to free themselves from the yoke and slavery he had imposed on them. Let him, says he, be held a useless coward who does not fight this day boldly. And they are not innocents who are opposed to you, but people who will not spare you if ye spare them. Calf's speech was received with loud applause, and shouts of encouragement were heard through the whole army. 236. Of the kings and the bonds armies. Thereafter the bonds army advanced to Steichelstad, where King Olaf was already with his people. Calf and Herrick went in front, at the head of the army under their banners. But the battle did not begin immediately on their meeting, for the bonds delayed the assault, because all their men were not come upon the plain, and they waited for those who came after them. Thorer Hund had come up with his troop the last, for he had to take care that the men did not go off behind when the battle cry was raised, or the armies were closing with each other, and therefore Calf and Herrick waited for Thorer. For the encouragement of their men in the battle the bonds had the field cry, Forward, forward, bondman. King Olaf also made no attack, for he waited for Dag and the people who followed him. At last the king saw Dag and his men approaching. It is said that the army of the bonds was not less on this day than a hundred times a hundred men. Sigvat the Skald speaks thus of the numbers. I grieve to think the king had brought too small a force for what he sought. He held his gold too fast to bring the numbers that could make him king. The foe men, more than two to one. The victory by numbers won. And this alone, as I've heard say. Against King Olaf turned the day. 237, Meeting of the King and the Bonds. As the armies on both sides stood so near that people knew each other, the king said, Why art thou here, calf, for we parted good friends south in more. It beseems thee ill to fight against us, or to throw a spear into our army. For here are four of thy brothers. Calf replied, Many things come to pass differently from what may appear seemly. You parted from us so that it was necessary to seek peace with those who were behind in the country. Now each must remain where he stands, but if I might advise, we should be reconciled. Then Finn, his brother, answered, This is to be observed of Calf, that when he speaks fairly he has it in his mind to do ill. The king answered, It may be, Calf, that thou art inclined to reconciliation, but, methinks, the bonds do not appear so peaceful. Then Thorgir of Kvistad said, You shall now have such peace as many formerly have received at your hands, and which you shall now pay for. The king replies, Thou hast no occasion to hasten so much to meet us. For fate has not decreed to thee today a victory over me, who raised thee to power and dignity from a mean station. 238 Beginning of the Battle of Steichelstad Now came Thorer Hund, went forward in front of the banner with his troop, and called out, Forward, forward, bondman. Thereupon the bondman raised the war cry, and shot their arrows and spears. The king's men raised also a war shout. And that done, encouraged each other to advance, crying out, Forward, forward, Christ men. Cross men. King's men. When the bonds who stood outermost on the wings heard it, they repeated the same cry. But when the other bonds heard them they thought these were king's men, turned their arms against them, and they fought together, and many were slain before they knew each other. The weather was beautiful, and the sun shone clear. But when the battle began the heaven and the sun became red, and before the battle ended it became as dark as at night. King Olaf had drawn up his army upon a rising ground, and it rushed down from thence upon the bond army with such a fierce assault, that the bond's array went before it. So that the breast of the king's array came to stand upon the ground on which the rear of the bond's array had stood, and many of the bond's army were on the way to fly, but the lendermen and their housemen stood fast. And the battle became very severe. So says Sigvat. Thundered the ground beneath their tread. As, iron-clad, thick tramping, sped. The men at arms, in row and rank. Past Steichelstad's sweet grassy bank. The clank of steel, the bowstrings twang. The sounds of battle, loudly rang. 
and bowmen hurried on advancing. Their bright helms in the sunshine glancing. The lendermen urged their men, and forced them to advance. Sigvat speaks of this. Midst in their line their banner flies. Thither the stoutest bond hies. But many a bond thinks of home. And many wish they ne'er had come. Then the bond army pushed on from all quarters. They who stood in front hewed down with their swords, they who stood next thrust with their spears, and they who stood hindmost shot arrows, cast spears, or threw stones, hand axes, or sharp stakes. Soon there was a great fall of men in the battle. Many were down on both sides. In the first onset fell Arnoljot Jelline, Galkathor, and Aphrafast, with all their men, after each had killed a man or two, and some indeed more. Now the ranks in front of the king's banner began to be thinned, and the king ordered Thor to carry the banner forward, and the king himself followed it with the troop he had chosen to stand nearest to him in battle. And these were the best armed men in the field, and the most expert in the use of their weapons. Sigvat the Skald tells of this. Loud was the battle storm there. Where the king's banner flamed in air. The king beneath his banner stands. And there the battle he commands. Olaf came forth from behind the shield bulwark, and put himself at the head of the army. And when the bonds looked him in the face they were frightened, and let their hands drop. So says Sigvat. I think I saw them shrink with fear. Who would not shrink from foeman's spear? When Olaf's lion eye was cast. On them, and called up all the past. Clear as the serpent's eye, his look. No Thranja man could stand, but shook. Beneath its glance, and skulked away. Knowing his king, and cursed the day. The combat became fierce, and the king went forward in the fray. So says Sigvat. When on they came in fierce array. And round the king arose the fray. With shield on arm brave Olaf stood. Dying his sword in their best blood. For vengeance on his Thrangem foes. On their best men he dealt his blows. He who knew well death's iron play. To his deep vengeance gave full sway. 239, Thorgir of Kvistad's fall. King Olaf fought most desperately. He struck the lenderman before mentioned, Thorgir of Kvistad, across the face, cut off the nose piece of his helmet, and clove his head down below the eyes so that they almost fell out. When he fell the king said, Was it not true, Thorgir, what I told thee, that thou shouldst not be victor in our meeting? At the same instant Thord stuck the banner pole so fast in the earth that it remained standing. Thord had got his death wound, and fell beneath the banner. There also fell Thorfinn Munn, and also Gies Sir Gulbarskald, who was attacked by two men, of whom he killed one, but only wounded the other before he fell. So says Hofgaderef. Bold in the iron storm was he. Firm and stout as forest tree. The hero who, gainst two at once. Made Odin's fire from sword edge glance. Dealing a death blow to the one. Known as a brave and generous man. Wounding the other, ere he fell. His bloody sword his deeds showed well. It happened then, as before related, that the sun, although the air was clear, withdrew from the sight, and it became dark. Of this Sigvat the Skald speaks. No common wonder in the sky. Fell out that day, the sun on high. And not a cloud to see around. Shone not, nor warmed Norway's ground. The day on which fell out this fight. Was marked by dismal dusky light. This from the east I heard, the end. Of our great king it did portend. At the same time Dag Ringson came up with his people, and began to put his men in array, and to set up his banner, but on account of the darkness the onset could not go on so briskly, for they could not see exactly whom they had before them. They turned, however, to that quarter where the men of Hordaland and Rogaland stood. Many of these circumstances took place at the same time, and some happened a little earlier, and some a little later. 240, King Olaf's Fall on the one side of Calf Arneson stood his two relations, Olaf and Calf, with many other brave and stout men. 
Kaf was a son of Arnfin Arnmatsen, and a brother son of Arn Arnmatsen. On the other side of Kaf Arnason stood Thorhund. King Olaf hewed at Thorhund, and struck him across the shoulders, but the sword would not cut, and it was as if dust flew from his reindeer skin coat. So says Sigvat. The king himself now proved the power of Finfolk's craft in magic hour. With magic song. For stroke of steel. Thor's reindeer coat would never feel. Bewitched by them it turned a stroke. Of the king's sword, a dust-like smoke. Rose from Thor's shoulders from the blow. Which the king though would end his foe. Thor struck at the king, and they exchanged some blows, but the king's sword would not cut where it met the reindeer skin, although Thor was wounded in the hands. Sigvat sang thus of it. Some say that Thor is not right bold. Why never yet have I been told. Of one who did a bolder thing. Than to change blows with his true king. Against his king his sword to wield. Leaping across the shield on shield. Which fenced the king round in the fight. Shows the dogs, one, courage, brave, not bright. The king said to Bjorn the marshal, do thou kill the dog on whom steel will not bite. Bjorn turned round the axe in his hands, and gave Thor a blow with the hammer of it on the shoulder so hard that he tottered. The king at the same moment turned against Calf and his relations, and gave Olaf his death wound. Thor Hunt struck his spear right through the body of Marshal Bjorn, and killed him outright, and Thor said, It is thus we hunt the bear. 2. Thorstein Nararsmith struck at King Olaf with his axe, and the blow hit his left leg above the knee. Finn Arneson instantly killed Thorstein. The king after the wound staggered towards a stone, threw down his sword, and prayed God to help him. Then Thor Hund struck at him with his spear, and the stroke went in under his mail coat and into his belly. Then Calf struck at him on the left side of the neck. But all are not agreed upon Calf having been the man who gave him the wound in the neck. These three wounds were King Olaf's death, and after the king's death the greater part of the forces which had advanced with him fell with the king. Jarn Gulbarskald sang these verses about Calf Arneson. Warrior. Who Olaf dared withstand. Who against Olaf held the land. Thou hast withstood the bravest, best. Who e'er has gone to his long rest. At Stikelstad thou wast the head. With flying banners onwards led. Thy bond troops, and still fought on. Until he fell, the much mourned one. Sigvat also made these verses on Bjorn. The Marshal Bjorn, too, I find. A great example leaves behind. How steady courage should stand proof. Though other servants stand aloof. To Russia first his steps he bent. To serve his master still intent. And now besides his king he fell. A noble death for scalds to tell. End notes. 1. Thor's name was Hund, the dog. And a play upon Thor. Hund's name was intended by the skald. Dot, L. 2. Bjorn, the marshal's name, signifies a bear. Dot, L. 241. Beginning of Dag Ringson's attack. Dag Ringson still kept up the battle, and made in the beginning so fierce an assault that the bonds gave way, and some betook themselves to flight. There a great number of the bonds fell, and these lender men, Erland of Gerd and a slack of Finney. And the banner also which they had stood under was cut down. This onset was particularly hot, and was called Dag's Storm. But now Calf Arneson, Herak of Thjada, and Thor Hund turned against Dag, with the array which had followed them, and then Dag was overwhelmed with numbers, so he betook himself to flight with the men still left him. There was a valley through which the main body of the fugitives fled, and men lay scattered in heaps on both sides, and many were severely wounded, and many so fatigued that they were fit for nothing. The bonds pursued only a short way. For their leaders soon returned back to the field of battle, where they had their friends and relations to look after. 242, King Olaf's Miracle Shown to Thor Hund Thor Hund went to where King Olaf's body lay, took care of it, laid it straight out on the ground, and spread a cloak over it. 
he told since that when he wiped the blood from the face it was very beautiful. And there was red in the cheeks, as if he only slept, and even much clearer than when he was in life. The king's blood came on Thor's hand, and ran up between his fingers to where he had been wounded, and the wound grew up so speedily that it did not require to be bound up. This circumstance was testified by Thor himself when King Olaf's holiness came to be generally known among the people, and Thor Hund was among the first of the king's powerful opponents who endeavored to spread abroad the king's sanctity. 243, of Kalf Arneson's brothers. Kalf Arneson searched for his brothers who had fallen, and found Thorberg and Finn. It is related that Finn threw his dagger at him, and wanted to kill him, giving him hard words, and calling him a faithless villain, and a traitor to his king. Kalf did not regard it, but ordered Finn and Thorberg to be carried away from the field. When their wounds were examined they were found not to be deadly, and they had fallen from fatigue, and under the weight of their weapons. Thereafter Kalf tried to bring his brothers down to a ship, and went himself with them. As soon as he was gone the whole Bond army, having their homes in the neighborhood, went off also, excepting those who had friends or relations to look after, or the bodies of the slain to take care of. The wounded were taken home to the farms, so that every house was full of them, and tents were erected over some. But wonderful as was the number collected in the Bond army, no less wonderful was the haste with which this vast body was dispersed when it was once free. And the cause of this was, that the most of the people gathered together from the country places were longing for their homes. 244, Of the Bonds of Varadal the bonds who had their homes in Veridal went to the chiefs Herek and Thor, and complained of their distress, saying, The fugitives who have escaped from the battle have proceeded up over the valley of Veridal. And are destroying our habitations, and there is no safety for us to travel home so long as they are in the valley. Go after them with war force, and let no mother's son of them escape with life, for that is what they intended for us if they had got the upper hand in the battle, and the same they would do now if they met us hereafter and had better luck than we. It may also be that they will linger in the valley if they have nothing to be frightened for, and then they would not proceed very gently in the inhabited country. The bonds made many words about this, urging the chiefs to advance directly, and kill those who had escaped. Now when the chiefs talked over this matter among themselves, they thought there was much truth in what the bonds said. They resolved, therefore, that Thor Hund should undertake this expedition through Veridau, with six hundred men of his own troops. Then, towards evening, he set out with his men. And Thor continued his march without halt until he came in the night to Sula, where he heard the news that Dag Ringson had come there in the evening, with many other flocks of the king's men, and had halted there until they took supper. But were afterwards gone up to the mountains. Then Thor said he did not care to pursue them up through the mountains, and he returned down the valley again, and they did not kill many of them this time. The bonds then returned to their homes, and the following day Thor, with his people, went to their ships. The part of the king's men who were still on their legs concealed themselves in the forests, and some got help from the people. 245. Of the king's brother, Harold Sigurdsson. Harold Sigurdsson was severely wounded. But Ragnvald Brusesson brought him to a bonds the night after the battle, and the bond took in Harold, and healed his wound in secret, and afterwards gave him his son to attend him. They went secretly over the mountains, and through the waste forests, and came out in Jantaland. Harold Sigurdsson was fifteen years old when King Olaf fell. In Jantaland Harold found Ragnvald Brusesson. And they went both east to King Jerisleaf in Russia, as is related in the saga of Harold Sigurdsson. 246 of Thormod Kalbrunarskald. Thormod Kalbrunarskald was under King Olaf's banner in the battle. But when the king had fallen, the battle was raging so that of the king's men the one fell by the side of the other, and the most of those who stood on their legs were wounded. Thormod was also severely wounded, and retired, as all the others did, back from where there was most danger of life, and some even fled. Now when the onset began which is called Dag's Storm, all of the king's men who were able to combat went there. But Thormod did not come into that combat, being unable to fight, both from his wound and from weariness, but he stood by the side of his comrade in the ranks, although he could do nothing. 
There he was struck by an arrow in the left side. But he broke off the shaft of the arrow, went out of the battle, and up towards the houses, where he came to a barn which was a large building. Thormod had his drawn sword in his hand. And as he went in a man met him, coming out, and said, It is very bad there with howling and screaming. And a great shame it is that brisk young fellows cannot bear their wounds, it may be that the king's men have done bravely today, but they certainly bear their wounds very ill. Thormod asks. What is thy name? He called himself Kim. Thormod, wast thou in the battle, too? I was with the bonds, which was the best side, says he. And art thou wounded any way, says Thormod. A little, said Kim. And hast thou been in the battle too? Thormod replied, I was with them who had the best. Art thou wounded, says Kim. Not much to signify, replies Thormod. As Kim saw that Thormod had a gold ring on his arm, he said, Thou art certainly a king's man. Give me thy gold ring, and I will hide thee. The bonds will kill thee if thou fallest in their way. Thormod says, Take the ring if thou canst get it, I have lost that which is more worth. Kim stretched out his hand, and wanted to take the ring, but Thormod, swinging his sword, cut off his hand, and it is related that Kim behaved himself no better under his wound than those he had been blaming just before. Kim went off, and Thormod sat down in the barn, and listened to what people were saying. The conversation was mostly about what each had seen in the battle, and about the valor of the combatants. Some praised most King Olaf's courage, and some named others who stood nowise behind him in bravery. Then Thormod sang these verses. Olaf was brave beyond all doubt. At Stikelstad was none so stout. Spattered with blood, the king, unsparing. Cheered on his men with deed and daring. But I have heard that some were there. Who in the fight themselves would spare. Though, in the arrow storm, the most. Had perils quite enough to boast. 247, Thormod's death. Thormod went out, and entered into a chamber apart, in which there were many wounded men, and with them a woman binding their wounds. There was fire upon the floor, at which she warmed water to wash and clean their wounds. Thormod sat himself down beside the door, and one came in, and another went out, of those who were busy about the wounded men. One of them turned to Thormod, looked at him, and said, Why art thou so dead pale? Art thou wounded? Why dost thou not call for the help of the wound healers? Thormod then sang these verses. I am not blooming, and the fair. And slender girl loves to care. For blooming youths, few care for me. With Fenge's meal I cannot fee. This is the reason why I feel. The slash and thrust of Danish steel. And pale and faint, and bent with pain. Return from yonder battle plain. Then Thormod stood up and went in towards the fire, and stood there a while. The young woman said to him, Go out, man, and bring in some of the split firewood which lies close beside the door. He went out and brought in an armful of wood, which he threw down upon the floor. Then the nurse girl looked him in the face, and said, Dreadfully pale is this man, why art thou so? Then Thormod sang. Thou wonderest, sweet sprig, at me. A man so hideous to see. Deep wounds but rarely mend the face. The crippling blow gives little grace. The arrow drift o'er took me, girl. A fine ground arrow in the whirl. Went through me, and I feel the dart. Sits, lovely girl, too near my heart. The girl said, Let me see thy wound, and I will bind it. Thereupon Thormod sat down, cast off his clothes, and the girl saw his wounds, and examined that which was in his side, and felt that a piece of iron was in it, but could not find where the iron had gone in. In a stone pot she had stirred together leeks and other herbs, and boiled them, and gave the wounded men of it to eat, by which she discovered if the wounds had penetrated into the belly, for if the wound had gone so deep, it would smell of leek. She brought some of this now to Thormod, and told him to eat of it. He replied, Take it away, I have no appetite for my broth. 
Then she took a large pair of tongs, and tried to pull out the iron. But it sat too fast, and would in no way come, and as the wound was swelled, little of it stood out to lay hold of. Now said Thormod, cut so deep in that thou canst get at the iron with the tongs, and give me the tongs and let me pull. She did as he said. Then Thormod took a gold ring from his hand, gave it to the nursewoman, and told her to do with it what she liked. It is a good man's gift, said he, King Olaf gave me the ring this morning. Then Thormod took the tongs, and pulled the iron out, but on the iron there was a hook, at which there hung some morsels of flesh from the heart, some white, some red. When he saw that, he said, The king has fed us well. I am fat, even at the heart roots, and so saying he leant back, and was dead. And with this ends what we have to say about Thormod. 248, Of Some Circumstances of the Battle King Olaf fell on Wednesday, the 29th of July, A.D. 1030. It was near midday when the two armies met, and the battle began before half-past one, and before three the king fell. The darkness continued from about half-past one to three also. Sigvat the Skald speaks thus of the result of the battle. The loss was great to England's foes. When their chief fell beneath the blows. By his own thoughtless people given. When the king's shield in two was riven. The people's sovereign took the field. The people clove the sovereign's shield. Of all the chiefs that bloody day. Dag only came out of the fray. And he composed these. Such mighty bond power, I ween. With chiefs or rulers ne'er was seen. It was the people's mighty power. That struck the king that fatal hour. When such a king, in such a strife. By his own people lost his life. Full many a gallant man must feel. The death wound from the people's steel. The bonds did not spoil the slain upon the field of battle, for immediately after the battle there came upon many of them who had been against the king a kind of dread as it were. Yet they held by their evil inclination, for they resolved among themselves that all who had fallen with the king should not receive the interment which belongs to good men, but reckoned them all robbers and outlaws. But the men who had power, and had relations on the field, cared little for this, but removed their remains to the churches, and took care of their burial. 2.49 A Miracle on a Blind Man Thorgils Halmason and his son Grim went to the field of battle towards evening when it was dusk, took King Olaf's corpse up, and bore it to a little empty houseman's hut which stood on the other side of their farm. They had light and water with them. Then they took the clothes off the body, swathed it in a linen cloth, laid it down in the house, and concealed it under some firewood so that nobody could see it, even if people came into the hut. Thereafter they went home again to the farmhouse. A great many beggars and poor people had followed both armies, who begged for meat. And the evening after the battle many remained there, and sought lodging round about in all the houses, great or small. It is told of a blind man who was poor, that a boy attended him and led him. They went out around the farm to seek a lodging, and came to the same empty house, of which the door was so low that they had almost to creep in. Now when the blind man had come in, he fumbled about the floor seeking a place where he could lay himself down. He had a hat on his head, which fell down over his face when he stooped down. He felt with his hands that there was moisture on the floor, and he put up his wet hand to raise his hat, and in doing so put his fingers on his eyes. There came immediately such an itching in his eyelids, that he wiped the water with his fingers from his eyes, and went out of the hut, saying nobody could lie there, it was so wet. When he came out of the hut he could distinguish his hands, and all that was near him, as far as things can be distinguished by sight in the darkness of light. And he went immediately to the farmhouse into the room, and told all the people he had got his sight again, and could see everything, although many knew he had been blind for a long time, for he had been there, before. Going about among the houses of the neighborhood. He said he first got his sight when he was coming out of a little ruinous hut which was all wet inside. I groped in the water, said he, and rubbed my eyes with my wet hands. He told where the hut stood. The people who heard him wondered much at this event, and spoke among themselves of what it could be that produced it, 
but Thorgils the peasant and his son Grim thought they knew how this came to pass. And as they were much afraid the king's enemies might go there and search the hut, they went and took the body out of it, and removed it to a garden, where they concealed it, and then returned to the farm, and slept there all night. 250. Of Thor Hund. The fifth day, Thursday, Thor Hund came down the valley of Veridal to Stikelstad, and many people, both chiefs and bonds, accompanied him. The field of battle was still being cleared, and people were carrying away the bodies of their friends and relations, and were giving the necessary help to such of the wounded as they wished to save, but many had died since the battle. Thorahund went to where the king had fallen, and searched for his body, but not finding it, he inquired if anyone could tell him what had become of the corpse, but nobody could tell him where it was. Then he asked the bond Thorgils, who said, I was not in the battle, and knew little of what took place there. But many reports are abroad, and among others that King Olaf has been seen in the night up at Staff, and a troop of people with him, but if he fell in the battle, your men must have concealed him in some hole, or under some stone heap. Now although Thor Hun knew for certain that the king had fallen, many allowed themselves to believe, and to spread abroad the report, that the king had escaped from the battle, and would in a short time come again upon them with an army. Then Thor went to his ships, and sailed down the fjord and the bond army dispersed, carrying with them all the wounded men who could bear to be removed. 251. Of King Olaf's Body Thorgils Halmason and his son Grim had King Olaf's body, and were anxious about preserving it from falling into the hands of the king's enemies, and being ill-treated, for they heard the bond speaking about burning it, or sinking it in the sea. The father and son had seen a clear light burning at night over the spot on the battlefield where King Olaf's body lay, and since, while they concealed it, they had always seen at night a light burning over the corpse. Therefore they were afraid the king's enemies might seek the body where this signal was visible. They hastened, therefore, to take the body to a place where it would be safe. Thorgils and his son accordingly made a coffin, which they adorned as well as they could, and laid the king's body in it. And afterwards made another coffin in which they laid stones and straw, about as much as the weight of a man, and carefully closed the coffins. As soon as the whole bond army had left Stikelstad, Thorgils and his son made themselves ready, got a large rowing boat, and took with them seven or eight men, who were all Thorgils' relations or friends. And privately took the coffin with the king's body down to the boat, and set it under the footboards. They had also with them the coffin containing the stones, and placed it in the boat where all could see it and then went down the fjord with a good opportunity of wind and weather, and arrived in the dusk of the evening at Nidaros, where they brought up at the king's pier. Then Thorgils sent some of his men up to the town to Bishop Sigurd, to say that they were come with the king's body. As soon as the bishop heard this news, he sent his men down to the pier, and they took a small rowing boat, came alongside of Thorgils' ship, and demanded the king's body. Thorgils and his people then took the coffin which stood in view, and bore it into the boat, and the bishop's men rowed out into the fjord, and sank the coffin in the sea. It was now quite dark. Thorgils and his people now rowed up into the river past the town, and landed at a place called Sorlid, above the town. Then they carried the king's body to an empty house standing at a distance from other houses, and watched over it for the night, while Thorgils went down to the town, where he spoke with some of the best friends of King Olaf and asked them if they would take charge of the king's body. But none of them dared to do so. Then Thorgils and his men went with the body higher up the river, buried it in a sandhill on the banks, and leveled all around it so that no one could observe that people had been at work there. They were ready with all this before break of day, when they returned to their vessel, went immediately out of the river, and proceeded on their way home to Stikelstad. 252 of the beginning of King Sven Alfifason's government. Sven, a son of King Canute, and of Alfifa, a daughter of Earl Alfred, had been appointed to govern Jomsborg in Vindland. There came a message to him from his father King Canute, that he should come to Denmark. And likewise that afterwards he should proceed to Norway, and take that kingdom under his charge, and assume, at the same time, the title of King of Norway. Sven repaired to Denmark, and took many people with him from thence, and also Earl Harold and many other people of consequence attended him. 
Thorin Lofthunga speaks of this in the song he composed about King Sven, called the Tglelon Song. Tis told by fame. How grandly came. The Danes to tend. Their young King Sven. Grandest was he. That all could see. Then, one by one. Each following man. More splendor wore. Than him before. Then Sven proceeded to Norway, and his mother Alfifa was with him, and he was taken to be king at every law thing in the country. He had already come as far as Viking at the time the battle was fought at Stikelstad, and King Olaf fell. Sven continued his journey until he came north, in autumn, to the Thrandjum country, and there, as elsewhere, he was received as king. 253, Of King Sven's Laws King Sven introduced new laws in many respects into the country, partly after those which were in Denmark, and in part much more severe. No man must leave the country without the king's permission. Or if he did, his property fell to the king. Whoever killed a man outright, should forfeit all his land and movables. If any one was banished the country, and all heritage fell to him, the king took his inheritance. At Yule every man should pay the king a meal of malt from every harvest steading, and a leg of a three-year-old ox, which was called a friendly gift, together with a span of butter. And every housewife a rock full of unspun lint, as thick as one could span with the longest fingers of the hand. The bonds were bound to build all the houses the king required upon his farms. Of every seven males one should be taken for the service of war, and reckoning from the fifth year of age, and the outfit of ships should be reckoned in the same proportion. Every man who rode upon the sea to fish should pay the king five fish as a tax, for the land defense, wherever he might come from. Every ship that went out of the country should have stowage reserved open for the king in the middle of the ship. Every man, foreigner or native, who went to Iceland, should pay a tax to the king. And to all this was added, that Danes should enjoy so much consideration in Norway, that one witness of them should invalidate ten of Northmen, one. When these laws were promulgated the minds of the people were instantly raised against them, and murmurs were heard among them. They who had not taken part against King Olaf said, Now take your reward and friendship from the Canute race, ye men of the interior Thrandjum who fought against King Olaf, and deprived him of his kingdom. Ye were promised peace and justice, and now ye have got oppression and slavery for your great treachery and crime. Nor was it very easy to contradict them, as all men saw how miserable the change had been. But people had not the boldness to make an insurrection against King Sven, principally because many had given King Canute their sons or other near relations as hostages, and also because no one appeared as leader of an insurrection. They very soon, however, complained of King Sven, and his mother Alfifa got much of the blame of all that was against their desire. Then the truth, with regard to Olaf, became evident to many. End notes. 1. This may probably have referred not to witnesses of an act, but to the class of witnesses in the jurisprudence of the Middle Ages called compurgators, who testified not the fact, but their confidence in the statements of the accused. And from which, possibly, our English bail for offenders arose. L. 254, of King Olaf's Sanctity. This winter, A.D. 1031, many in the Thrandjum land began to declare that Olaf was in reality a holy man, and his sanctity was confirmed by many miracles. Many began to make promises and prayers to King Olaf in the matters in which they thought they required help, and many found great benefit from these invocations. Some in respect of health, others of a journey, or other circumstances in which such help seemed needful. 255, of Einar Tambuskelfer. Einar Tambuskelfer was come home from England to his farm, and had the fiefs which King Canute had given him when they met in Thrandjum, and which were almost an earldom. Einar had not been in the strife against King Olaf, and congratulated himself upon it. He remembered that King Canute had promised him the earldom over Norway, and at the same time remembered that King Canute had not kept his promise. He was accordingly the first great person who looked upon King Olaf as a saint. 256, Of the Sons of Arn. 
Finn Arneson remained but a short time at Egja with his brother Calf. For he was in the highest degree ill-pleased that Calf had been in the battle against King Olaf, and always made his brother the bitterest reproaches on this account. Thorberg Arneson was much more temperate in his discourse than Finn. But yet he hastened away, and went home to his farm. Calf gave the two brothers a good long ship, with full rigging and other necessaries, and a good retinue. Therefore they went home to their farms, and sat quietly at home. Arn Arneson lay long ill of his wounds, but got well at last without injury of any limb, and in winter he proceeded south to his farm. All the brothers made their peace with King Sven, and sat themselves quietly down in their homes. 257. Bishop Sigurd's Flight. The summer after, A.D. 1031, there was much talk about King Olaf's sanctity, and there was a great alteration in the expressions of all people concerning him. There were many who now believed that King Olaf must be a saint, even among those who had persecuted him with the greatest animosity, and would never in their conversation allow truth or justice in his favor. People began then to turn their reproaches against the men who had principally excited opposition to the king, and on this account Bishop Sigurd in particular was accused. He got so many enemies, that he found it most advisable to go over to England to King Canute. Then the Thrandjum people sent men with a verbal message to the uplands, to Bishop Grimkel, desiring him to come north to Thrandjum. King Olaf had sent Bishop Grimkel back to Norway when he went east into Russia, and since that time Grimkel had been in the uplands. When the message came to the bishop he made ready to go, and it contributed much to this journey that the bishop considered it as true what was told of King Olaf's miracles and sanctity. 258 King Olaf the saints remains disinterred. Bishop Grimkel went to Einar Tambaskelfer, who received him joyfully. They talked over many things, and, among others, of the important events which had taken place in the country, and concerning these they were perfectly agreed. Then the bishop proceeded to the town, Nidaros, and was well received by all the community. He inquired particularly concerning the miracles of King Olaf that were reported, and received satisfactory accounts of them. Thereupon the bishop sent a verbal message to Stikelstad to Thorgils and his son Grim, inviting them to come to the town to him. They did not decline the invitation, but set out on the road immediately, and came to the town and to the bishop. They related to him all the signs that had presented themselves to them, and also where they had deposited the king's body. The bishop sent a message to Einar Tambaskelfer, who came to the town. Then the bishop and Einar had an audience of the king and Elfifa, in which they asked the king's leave to have King Olaf's body taken up out of the earth. The king gave his permission, and told the bishop to do as he pleased in the matter. At that time there were a great many people in the town. The bishop, Einar, and some men with them, went to the place where the king's body was buried, and had the place dug. But the coffin had already raised itself almost to the surface of the earth. It was then the opinion of many that the bishop should proceed to have the king buried in the earth at Clement's church, and it was so done. Twelve months and five days, August 3, A.D. 1031, after King Olaf's death his holy remains were dug up, and the coffin had raised itself almost entirely to the surface of the earth. And the coffin appeared quite new, as if it had but lately been made. When Bishop Grimkel came to King Olaf's open coffin, there was a delightful and fresh smell. Thereupon the bishop uncovered the king's face, and his appearance was in no respect altered, and his cheeks were as red as if he had but just fallen asleep. The men who had seen King Olaf when he fell remarked, also, that his hair and nails had grown as much as if he had lived on the earth all the time that had passed since his fall. Thereupon King Sven, and all the chiefs who were at the place, went out to see King Olaf's body. Then said Alfifa, people buried in sand rot very slowly, and it would not have been so if he had been buried in earth. Afterwards the bishop took scissors, clipped the king's hair, and arranged his beard, for he had had a long beard, according to the fashion of that time. Then said the bishop to the king in Alfifa, now the king's hair and beard are such as when he gave up the ghost, and it has grown as much as ye see has been cut off. Alfifa answers, I will believe in the sanctity of his hair, if it will not burn in the fire, but I have often seen men's hair whole and undamaged after lying longer in the earth than this man's. 
Then the bishop had live coals put into a pan, blessed it, cast incense upon it, and then laid King Olaf's hair on the fire. When all the incense was burnt the bishop took the hair out of the fire, and showed the king and the other chiefs that it was not consumed. Now Alfifa asked that the hair should be laid upon unconsecrated fire. But Einar Tamaskelfer told her to be silent, and gave her many severe reproaches for her unbelief. After the bishop's recognition, with the king's approbation and the decision of the thing, it was determined that King Olaf should be considered a man truly holy. Whereupon his body was transported into Clement's church, and a place was prepared for it near the high altar. The coffin was covered with costly cloth, and stood under a gold-embroidered tent. Many kinds of miracles were soon wrought by King Olaf's holy remains. 259, Of King Olaf's Miracles In the sand hill where King Olaf's body had lain on the ground a beautiful spring of water came up and many human ailments and infirmities were cured by its waters. Things were put in order around it, and the water ever since has been carefully preserved. There was first a chapel built and an altar consecrated, where the king's body had lain, but now Christ's church stands upon the spot. Archbishop Eistian had a high altar raised upon the spot where the king's grave had been, when he erected the great temple which now stands there, and it is the same spot on which the altar of the old Christ church had stood. It is said that Olaf's church stands on the spot on which the empty house had stood in which King Olaf's body had been laid for the night. The place over which the holy remains of King Olaf were carried up from the vessel is now called Olaf's Road, and is now in the middle of the town. The bishop adorned King Olaf's holy remains, and cut his nails and hair. For both grew as if he had still been alive. So says Sigvat the Skald. I lie not, when I say the king seemed as alive in everything. His nails, his yellow hair still growing. And round his ruddy cheeks still flowing. As when, to please the Russian queen. His yellow locks adorned were seen. Or to the blind he cured he gave. A tress, their precious sight to save. Thor and Loftunga also composed a song upon Sven Alfifison, called the Gglelon Song, in which are these verses. Sven, king of all, in Olaf's hall, now sits on high, and Olaf's eye, looks down from heaven, where it is given, to him to dwell, or here in cell, as heavenly saint, to heal men's plaint, may our gold giver, live here forever, king Olaf there, to hold a share, on earth prepared, nor labor spared. A seat to win. From heaven's great king. Which he has won. Next God's own son. His holy form. Untouched by worm. Lies at this day. Where good men pray. And nails and hair. Grow fresh and fair. His cheek is red. His flesh not dead. Around his beer. Good people here. The small bells ring. Over the king. Or great bell toll. And living soul. Not one can tell. Who tolls the bell. Tapers up there. Which Christ holds dear. By day and night. The altar light. Olaf did so. And all men know. In heaven he. From sin sits free. And crowds do come. The deaf and dumb. Cripple and blind. Sick of all kind. Cured to be. On bended knee. And off the ground. Rise whole and sound. To Olaf pray. To eke thy day. To save thy land. From spoiler's hand. God's man is he. To deal to thee. Good crops and peace. Let not prayer cease. Book prayers prevail. If, nail for nail, one. Thou tellest on. Forgetting none. Thorin Loftunga was himself with King Sven, and heard these great testimonials of King Olaf's holiness, that people, by the heavenly power, could hear a sound over his holy remains as if bells were ringing. 
and that candles were lighted of themselves upon the altar as by a heavenly fire. But when Thorin says that a multitude of lame, and blind, and other sick, who came to the holy Olaf, went back cured. He means nothing more than that there were a vast number of persons who at the beginning of King Olaf's miraculous working regained their health. King Olaf's greatest miracles are clearly written down, although they occurred somewhat later. Endnotes, 1, before the entrance of the temples or churches were posts. Called on Vajasular, with nails called Rijanagler. The god's nails, either for ornament, or, as shoning. Suggests, to assist the people in reckoning weeks, months. Festivals, and in reckoning or keeping tale of prayers. Repeated, and to recall them to memory, in the same way as. Beads are used still by the common people in Catholic. Countries for the same purpose. L. 260, of King Olaf's age and reign. It is reckoned by those who have kept an exact account, that Olaf the Saint was king of Norway for fifteen years from the time Earl Sven left the country. But he had received the title of king from the people of the uplands the winter before. Sigvat the Skald tells this. For fifteen winters o'er the land. King Olaf held the chief command. Before he fell up in the north. His fall made known to us his worth. No worthier prince before his day. In our north land air held the sway. Too short he held it for our good. All men wish now that he had stood. Saint Olaf was thirty-five years old when he fell, according to what our Frode the priest says, and he had been in twenty pitched battles. So says Sigvat the Skald. Some leaders trust in God, some not. Even so their men. But well I what? God-fearing Olaf fought and won. Twenty pitched battles, one by one. And always placed upon his right. His Christian men in a hard fight. May God be merciful, I pray. To him, for he ne'er shunned his fray. We have now related a part of King Olaf's story, namely, the events which took place while he ruled over Norway, also his death, and how his holiness was manifested. Now shall we not neglect to mention what it was that most advanced his honor. This was his miracles, but these will come to be treated of afterwards in this book. 261, Of the Throngem People King Sven, the son of Canute the Great, ruled over Norway for some years, but was a child both in age and understanding. His mother Alfifa had most sway in the country, and the people of the country were her great enemies, both then and ever since. Danish people had a great superiority given them within the country, to the great dissatisfaction of the people. And when conversation turned that way, the people of the rest of Norway accused the Throngem people of having principally occasioned King Olaf the Holy's fall, and also that the men of Norway were subject, through them, to the ill government by which oppression and slavery had come upon all the people, both great and small. Indeed upon the whole community. They insisted that it was the duty of the Throngem people to attempt opposition and insurrection, and thus relieve the country from such tyranny. And, in the opinion of the common people, Throngem was also the chief seat of the strength of Norway at that time, both on account of the chiefs and of the population of that quarter. When the Throngem people heard these remarks of their countrymen, they could not deny that there was much truth in them, and that in depriving King Olaf of life and land they had committed a great crime and at the same time the misdeed had been ill-paid. The chiefs began to hold consultations and conferences with each other, and the leader of these was Einar Tambaskelfer. It was likewise the case with Kaf Arneson, who began to find into what errors he had been drawn by King Canute's persuasion. All the promises which King Canute had made to Kaf had been broken. For he had promised him the earldom and the highest authority in Norway, and although Kaf had been the leader in the battle against King Olaf, and had deprived him of his life and kingdom, Kaf had not got any higher dignity than he had before. He felt that he had been deceived, and therefore messages passed between the brothers Kaf, Finn, Thorberg, and Arn, and they renewed their family friendship. 262, Of King Sven's Levy When King Sven had been three years in Norway, A.D. 1031-33, 
the news was received that a force was assembled in the western countries, under a chief who called himself Trigov, and gave out that he was a son of Olaf Trigvison and Queen Gaida of England. Now when King Sven heard that foreign troops had come to the country, he ordered out the people on a levy in the north, and the most of the lendermen hastened to him, but Einar Tambuskelfer remained at home, and would not go out with King Sven. When King Sven's order came to Kaf Arneson at Egja, that he should go out on a levy with King Sven, he took a twenty-benched ship which he owned, went on board with his house servants, and in all haste proceeded out of the fjord. Without waiting for King Sven, sailed southwards to Moor, and continued his voyage south until he came to Gisk to his brother Thorberg. Then all the brothers, the sons of Arn, held a meeting, and consulted with each other. After this calf returned to the north again, but when he came to Freakisund, King Sven was lying in the sound before him. When Calf came rowing from the south into the sound they hailed each other, and the king's men ordered Calf to bring up with his vessel, and follow the king for the defense of the country. Calf replies, I have done enough, if not too much, when I fought against my own countrymen to increase the power of the Canute family. Thereupon Calf rode away to the north until he came home to Edja. None of these Arnesons appeared at this levy to accompany the king. He steered with his fleet southwards along the land. But as he could not hear the least news of any fleet having come from the west, he steered south to Rogaland, and all the way to Agder. For many guessed that Trigov would first make his attempt on Viking, because his forefathers had been there, and had most of their strength from that quarter, and he had himself great strength by family connection there. 263. King Trigov Olofsson's Fall When Trigov came from the west he landed first on the coast of Hordaland, and when he heard King Sven had gone south he went the same way to Rogaland. As soon as Sven got the intelligence that Trigov had come from the west he returned, and steered north with his fleet, and both fleets met within Bakken in Soknersund, not far from the place where Erling Sjogsen fell. The battle, which took place on a Sunday, was great and severe. People tell that Trigov threw spears with both hands at once. So my father, said he, taught me to celebrate Mass. His enemies had said that he was the son of a priest. But the praise must be allowed him that he showed himself more like a son of King Olaf Trigvason, for this Trigov was a slaughtering man. In this battle King Trigov fell, and many of his men with him. But some fled, and some received quarter and their lives. It is thus related in the Ballad of Trigov. Trigov comes from the northern coast. King Sven turns round with all his host. To meet and fight, they both prepare. And where they met grim death was there. From the sharp strife I was not far. I heard the din and the clang of war. And the Hordaland men at last gave way. And their leader fell, and they lost the day. This battle is also told of in the ballad about King Sven, thus. My girl. It was a Sunday morn. And many a man ne'er saw its eve. Though ale and leeks by old wives born. The bruised and wounded did relieve. Twas Sunday morn, when Sven calls out. Stem to stem your vessels bind. The raven a midday feast smells out. And he comes croaking up the wind. After this battle King Sven ruled the country for some time, and there was peace in the land. The winter after it, A.D. 1034, he passed in the south parts of the country. 264, of the councils of Einar Tambuskelfer and Kalf Arneson. Einar Tambuskelfer and Kaf Arneson had this winter meetings and consultations between themselves in the merchant town, 1. Then there came a messenger from King Canute to Kaf Arneson, with a message to send him three dozen axes, which must be chosen in good. Calf replies, I will send no axes to King Canute. Tell him I will bring his son Sven so many, that he shall not think he is in want of any. End notes, one, Nidaros, or Thrangem, is usually called merely the Merchant Town. L. 265, of Einar Tambuskelfer and Kalf Arneson's Journey. Early in spring, A.D. 1034, Einar Tambuskelfer and Kaf Arneson made themselves ready for a journey, with a great retinue of the best and most select men that could be found in the Thrangem country. 
They went in spring eastward over the ridge of the country to Jamtaland, from thence to Helsingjaland, and came to Svithjad, where they procured ships, with which in summer they proceeded east to Russia, and came in autumn to Ladiga. They sent men up to Novgorod to King Jerisleif, with the errand that they offered Magnus, the son of King Olaf the Saint, to take him with them, follow him to Norway. And give him assistance to attain his father's heritage and be made king over the country. When this message came to King Jerisleif he held a consultation with the queen and some chiefs, and they all resolved unanimously to send a message to the Northmen, and ask them to come to King Jerisleif and Magnus. For which journey safe conduct was given them. When they came to Novgorod it was settled among them that the Northmen who had come there should become Magnus' men, and be his subjects. And to this calf and the other men who had been against King Olaf at Steichelstad were solemnly bound by oath. On the other hand, King Magnus promised them, under oath, secure peace and full reconciliation. And that he would be true and faithful to them all when he got the dominions and kingdom of Norway. He was to become Calf Arneson's foster son. And Calf should be bound to do all that Magnus might think necessary for extending his dominion, and making it more independent than formerly. Saga of Magnus the Good Preliminary Remarks Magnus reigned from A.D. 1035 to 1047, when he died. During the last year of his reign his half-brother Harold Sigurdsson was his co-regent. The history of Magnus is treated in A Grip, ch. 28-32, in Fagerskina, ch. 119-146, in Four Manisogar, Part 6, and in Nitlinga Saga. The skalds quoted in this saga are, Arnor the Earl's skald, Arnor Jarla skald, Sigvat, Thjodolf, Jarn Gulbrar skald, Thorgir Fleck, O.D. Kikina skald. 1. Magnus Olofsson's Journey from the West after Yul Magnus Olofsson began his journey from the east from Novgorod to Ladiga, where he rigged out his ships as soon as the ice was loosened in spring, A.D. 1035. Arnor, the Earl Skald, tells of this in the poem on Magnus. It is no loose report that he who will command on land and sea in blood will make his foemen feel Olaf's sword neater's sharp blue steel. This generous youth, who scatters gold Norway's brave son, but ten years old, is rigging ships in Russia's lake. His crown, with friend's support, to take. In spring Magnus sailed from the east to Svithjad. So says Arnor. The young sword stainer called a thing. Where all his men should meet their king. Heroes who find the eagle food. Before their lord in arms stood. And now the curved plank of the bow. Cleaves the blue sea. The ocean plough. By grey winds driven across the main. Reaches Sigtuna's grassy plain. Here it is related that when King Magnus and his fellow travellers sailed from the east to Svithjad, they brought up at Sigtuna. Imund Olofsson was then king in Svithjad. Queen Astrid, who had been married to King Olaf the Saint, was also there. She received very gladly and well her stepson King Magnus, and summoned immediately a numerous thing of Swedes at a place called Hengtar. At the thing Queen Astrid spoke these words, Here is come to us a son of Olaf the Saint, called Magnus, who intends to make an expedition to Norway to seek his father's heritage. It is my great duty to give him aid towards this expedition. For he is my stepson, as is well known to all, both Swedes and Norwegians. Neither shall he want men or money, in so far as I can procure them or have influence, in order that his strength may be as great as possible. And all the men who will support this cause of his shall have my fullest friendship, and I would have it known that I intend myself to go with him on this attempt, that all may see I will spare nothing that is in my power to help him. She spoke long and cleverly in this strain. But when she had ended many replied thus, the Swedes made no honourable progress in Norway when they followed King Olaf his father, and now no better success is to be expected, as this man is but in years of boyhood. And therefore we have little inclination for this expedition. Astrid replies, All men who wish to be thought of true courage must not be deterred by such considerations. If any have lost connections at the side of King Olaf, or been themselves wounded, 
now is the time to show a man's heart and courage, and go to Norway to take vengeance. Astrid succeeded so far with words and encouragement that many men determined to go with her, and follow King Magnus to Norway. Sigvat the Skald speaks of this. Now Astrid, Olaf's widowed queen, she who so many a change had seen, took all the gifts of happier days, jewels and rings, all she could raise, and at a thing at Hengr, where the Swedes were numerous, did declare what Olaf's son proposed to do, and brought her gifts, their pay, in view, and with the Swedes no wiser plan, to bring out every brave bold man, could have been found, had Magnus been, the son himself of the good queen, with help of Christ, she hoped to bring, Magnus to be the land's sole king, as Harold was, who in his day, obtained o'er all the upper sway, and glad are we so well she sped. The people's friend is now their head. And good King Magnus always shows. How much be to Queen Astrid owes. Such stepmothers as this good queen. In truth are very rarely seen. And to this noble woman's praise. The scald with joy his psalm will raise. Theodolf the scald also says in his song of Magnus. When thy brave ship left the land, the bending yard could scarce withstand the fury of the whistling gale that split thy many colored sail, and many a stout ship, tempest tossed, was in that howling storm lost that brought them safe to Sigtuna's shore, far from the sound of ocean's roar. 2. Magnus' Expedition from Svithjad King Magnus set out on his journey from Sigtuna with a great force, which he had gathered in Svithjad. They proceeded through Svithjad on foot to Helsingjaland. So says Arnor, the Earl's Skald. And many a dark red Swedish shield. Marched with thee from the Swedish field. The country people crowded in. To help St. Olaf's son to win. And chosen men by thee were led. Men who have stained the wolf's tongue red. Each milk-white shield and polished spear came to a splendid gathering there. Magnus Olafsson went from the east through Jantaland over the keel ridge of the country and came down upon the Thrandjum district, where all men welcomed the king with joy. But no sooner did the men of King Sven, the son of Alfifa, hear that King Magnus Olafsson was come to the country, than they fled on all sides and concealed themselves, so that no opposition was made to King Magnus. For King Sven was in the south part of the country. So says Arnor, the Earl's Skald. He who the eagle's talon stains. Rushed from the east on Thrandjum's plains. The terror of his plumed helm. Drove his pale foemen from the realm. The lightning of thy eyes so near. Great king. Thy foemen could not bear. Scattered they fled, their only care. If thou their wretched lives wilt spare. 3. Magnus made king. Magnus Olafsson advanced to the town, Nidaros, where he was joyfully received. He then summoned the people to the era thing, 1. And when the bonds met at the thing, Magnus was taken to be king over the whole land, as far as his father Olaf had possessed it. Then the king selected a court, and named Lendermen, and placed bailiffs and officers in all domains and offices. Immediately after harvest King Magnus ordered a levy through all Thrandjum land, and he collected men readily, and thereafter he proceeded southwards along the coast. End notes, 1, era thing, held on the air of the river Nid, that is, on. The spit of sand, still called an air in the north of. Scotland, dividing a lake, pond, or river mouth from the C. At the thing held here the kings of Norway were chosen. And proclaimed. It was held to be the proper thing for. Settling disputes between kings in Norway. L. 4. King Sven's flight. King Sven Alfifison was staying in South Hordaland when he heard this news of war. He immediately sent out war tokens to four different quarters, summoned the bonds to him and made it known to all that they should join him with men and ships to defend the country. 
all the men who were in the neighborhood of the king presented themselves. And the king formed a thing, at which in a speech he set forth his business, and said he would advance against Magnus Olofsson and have a battle with him, if the bonds would aid his cause. The king's speech was not very long, and was not received with much approbation by the bonds. Afterwards the Danish chiefs who were about the king made long and clever speeches, but the bonds then took up the word, and answered them. And although many said they would follow Sven, and fight on his side, some refused to do so bluntly, some were altogether silent, and some declared they would join King Magnus as soon as they had an opportunity. Then King Sven says, Methinks very few of the bonds to whom we sent a message have appeared here. And of those who have come, and tell us to our face that they will join King Magnus as soon as they can, we shall have as little benefit as of those who say they will sit at home quietly. It is the same with those who say nothing at all. But as to those who promise to help us, there are not more than every other man, and that force will avail us little against King Magnus. It is my counsel, therefore, that we do not trust to these bonds. But let us rather go to the land where all the people are sure and true to us, and where we will obtain forces to conquer this country again. As soon as the king had made known this resolution all his men followed it, turned their ship's bows, and hoisted sail. King Sven sailed eastward along the land, and then set right over to Denmark without delay, and Hardenat received his brother Sven very kindly. At their first meeting Hardenat offered King Sven to divide the kingdom of Denmark with him, which offer King Sven accepted. 5. King Magnus' Journey to Norway In autumn, A.D. 1035, King Magnus proceeded eastward to the end of the country, and was received as king throughout the whole land, and the country people were rejoiced at his arrival. 6. Death of King Canute the Great and his son Sven King Sven, Canute's son, went to Denmark, as before related, and took part in the government with his brother Hardenat. In the same autumn King Canute the Great died in England, the November 13, 40 years old, and was buried at Winchester. He had been king of Denmark for 27 years, and over Denmark and England together 24 years, and also over Norway for 7 years. King Canute's son Harold was then made king in England. The same winter, A.D. 1036, King Sven, Alfifa's son, died in Denmark. Theodolf the Skald made these lines concerning King Magnus. Through Sweden's dirty roads the throng followed the king in spearmen strong. Sven doth fly, in truth afraid. And partly by his men betrayed. Flying to Denmark o'er the sea. He leaves the land quite clear to thee. Jarn Gulbarskald composed the following lines concerning Calf Arneson. By thee the kings got each his own. Magnus by thee got Norway's throne. And Sven in Denmark got a seat. When out of Norway he was beat. Calf. It was you who showed the way. To our young king, the battle lover. From Russia to his father's sway. You showed the way, and brought him over. King Magnus ruled over Norway this winter, A.D. 1036, and Hardenat over Denmark. 7. Reconciliation between Hardenat and King Magnus. The following spring, A.D. 1036, the kings on both sides ordered out a levy, and the news was that they would have a battle at the Gott River. But when the two armies approached each other, the lendermen in the one army sent messengers to their connections and friends in the other. And it came to a proposal for a reconciliation between the two kings, especially as, from both kings being but young and childish, some powerful men, who had been chosen in each of the countries for that purpose had the rule of the country on their account. It thus was brought about that there was a friendly meeting between the kings, and in this meeting a peace was proposed, and the peace was to be a brotherly union under oath to keep the peace towards each other to the end of their lives. And if one of them should die without leaving a son, the longest liver should succeed to the whole land and people. Twelve of the principal men in each kingdom swore to the kings that this treaty should be observed, so long as any one of them was in life. Then the king separated, and each returned home to his kingdom. And the treaty was kept as long as both lived. 8. Of Queen Astrid 
Queen Astrid, who had been married to King Olaf the Saint, came to Norway with King Magnus her stepson, as before related, and was held by him deservedly in great honour and esteem. Then came also Alfhild, King Magnus' mother, to the court, and the king received her with the greatest affection, and showed her great respect. But it went with Alfhild, as it does with many who come to power and honour, that pride keeps pace with promotion. She was ill-pleased that Queen Astrid was treated with more respect, had a higher seat, and more attention. Alfhild wanted to have a seat next to the king, but Astrid called Alfhild her slave woman, as indeed she had formerly been when Astrid was queen of Norway and King Olaf ruled the land. And therefore would on no account let her have a seat beside her, and they could not lodge in the same house. 9. Of Sigvat the Skald Sigvat the Skald had gone to Rome, where he was at the time of the Battle of Stikelstad. He was on his way back from the south when he heard tidings of King Olaf's fall, which gave him great grief. He then sang these lines. One morning early on a hill. The misty town asleep and still. Wandering I thought upon the fields. Strewed o'er with broken mail and shields. Where our king fell, our kind good king. Where now his happy youthful spring. My father too, for Thord was then. One of the good king's chosen men. One day Sigvat went through a village, and heard a husband lamenting grievously over the loss of his wife, striking his breast, tearing his clothes, weeping bitterly, and saying he wanted to die. And Sigvat sang these lines. This poor man mourns a much-loved wife. Gladly would he be quit of life. Must love be paid for by our grief? The price seems great for joy so brief. But the brave man who knows no fear. Drops for his king a silent tear. And feels, perhaps, his loss as deep. As those who clamor when they weep. Sigvat came home to Norway to the Throngem country, where he had a farm and children. He came from the south along the coast in a merchant vessel, and as they lay in Hillersund they saw a great many ravens flying about. Then Sigvat said. I see here many a croaking raven. Flying about the well-known haven. When Olaf's ship was floating here. They knew that food for them was near. When Olaf's ship lay here windbound. Oft screamed the urn o'er hill a sound. Impatient for the expected prey. And won't to follow to the fray. When Sigvat came north to the town of Thrandjum King Sven was there before him. He invited Sigvat to stay with him, as Sigvat had formerly been with his father King Canute the Great, but Sigvat said he would first go home to his farm. One day, as Sigvat was walking in the street, he saw the king's men at play, and he sang. One day before I passed this way. When the king's guards were at their play. Something there was, I need not tell. That made me pale, and feel unwell. Perhaps it was I thought, just then. How noble Olaf with his men. In former days, I oft have seen. In manly games upon this green. Sigvat then went to his farm. And as he heard that many men upbraided him with having deserted King Olaf, he made these verses. May Christ condemn me still to burn. In quenchless fire, if I did turn. And leave King Olaf in his need. My soul is free from such base deed. I was at Rome, as men know well. Who saw me there, and who can tell? That there in danger I was then. The truth I need not hide from men. Sigvat was ill at ease in his home. One day he went out and sang. While Olaf lived, how smiled the land. Mountain and cliff, and pebbly strand. All Norway then, so fresh, so gay. On land or sea, where oft I lay. But now to me all seems so dready. All black and dull, of life I'm weary. Cheerless today, cheerless tomorrow. Here in the north we have great sorrow. Early in winter Sigvat went westward over the ridge of the country to Jamtaland, and onwards to Helsingjaland, and came to Svithjad. He went immediately to Queen Astrid, and was with her a long time, and was a welcome guest. He was also with her brother King Imund, and received from him ten marks of proved silver, 
as is related in the Song of Canute. Sigvat always inquired of the merchants who traded to Novgorod if they could tell him any news of Magnus Olofsson. Sigvat composed these lines at that time. I ask the merchant oft who drives. His trade to Russia, how he thrives. Our noble prince. How lives he there? And still good news, his praise, I hear. To little birds, which wing their way. Between the lands, I fain would say. How much we long our prince to see. They seem to hear a wish from me. 10. Of King Magnus' first arrival in Svithjad. Immediately after Magnus Olofsson came to Svithjad from Russia, Sigvat met him at Queen Astrid's house, and glad they all were at meeting. Sigvat then sang. Thou art come here, prince, young and bold. Thou art come home. With joy behold. Thy land and people. From this hour. I join myself to thy young power. I could not owe her to Russi High. Thy mother's guardian here was I. It was my punishment for giving. Magnus his name, while scarcely living. Afterward Sigvat traveled with Queen Astrid, and followed Magnus to Norway. Sigvat sang thus. To the crowd streaming to the thing. To see and hear Magnus their king. Loudly, young king, I'll speak my mind. God to his people has been kind. If he, to whom be all the praise. Give us a son in all his ways. Like to his sire, no folk on earth. Will bless so much a royal birth. Now when Magnus became king of Norway Sigvat attended him, and was his dearest friend. Once it happened that Queen Astrid and Alfhild the king's mother had exchanged some sharp words with each other, and Sigvat said. Alfhild. Though it was God's will. To raise thee, yet remember still. The queen-born Astrid should not be. Kept out of due respect by thee. 11. King Olaf's Shrine. King Magnus had a shrine made and mounted with gold and silver, and studded with jewels. This shrine was made so that in shape and size it was like a coffin. Under it was an arched way, and above was a raised roof, with a head and a roof ridge. Behind were plated hangings, and before were gratings with padlocks, which could be locked with a key. In this shrine King Magnus had the holy remains of King Olaf deposited, and many were the miracles there wrought. Of this Sigvat speaks. For him a golden shrine is made. For him whose heart was ne'er afraid. Of mortal man, the holy king. Whom the Lord God to heaven did bring. Here many a man shall feel his way. Stone blind, unconscious of the day. And at the shrine where Olaf lies. Give songs of praise for opened eyes. It was also appointed by law that King Olaf's holy day should be held sacred over all Norway, and that day has been kept ever afterwards as the greatest of church days. Sigvat speaks of it. To Olaf, Magnus' father, raise. Within my house, the song of praise. With joy, yet grief, will keep the day. Olaf to heaven was called away. Well may I keep within my breast. A day for him in holy rest. My upraised hands a golden ring. On every branch, one, bear from that king. End notes, one, the fingers, the branches of the hand, bore golden fruits. From the generosity of the king. L. 12, of Thor Hund. Thor Hund left the country immediately after King Olaf's fall. He went all the way to Jerusalem and many people say he never came back. Thorhund had a son called Sigurd, father of Ranvig who was married to Joan, a son of Arn Arneson. Their children were Vidkin of Jarki, Sigurd Hund, Erling, and Jardthrud. 13. Of the murder of Herek of Thjada. Herek of Thjada sat at home on his farm, till King Magnus Olofsson came to the country and was made king. Then Herek went south to Thrandjum to King Magnus. At that time Asmund Grankelson was in the king's house. When Herek came to Nidaros, and landed out of the ship, Asmund was standing with the king in the gallery outside the loft, and both the king and Asmund knew Herek when they saw him. 
Now, says Asmund to the king, I will pay Herrick for my father's murder. He had in his hand a little thin hatchet. The king looked at him, and said, Rather take this axe of mine. It was thick, and made like a club. Thou must know, Asmund, added he, that there are hard bones in the old fellow. Asmund took the axe, went down, and through the house, and when he came down to the crossroad Herrick and his men coming up met him. Asmund struck Herrick on the head, so that the axe penetrated to the brains, and that was Herrick's death wound. Asmund turned back directly to the king's house, and the whole edge of the axe was turned with the blow. Then said the king, What would thy axe have done, for even this one, I think, is spoilt? King Magnus afterwards gave him a fief and office in Halagaland, and many are the tales about the strife between Asmund and Herrick's sons. 14. Of Thorgir Flek. Calf Arneson had at first, for some time, the greatest share of the government of the country under King Magnus. But afterwards there were people who reminded the king of the part Calf had taken at Stikelstad, and then it became difficult for Calf to give the king satisfaction in anything. Once it happened there were many men with the king bringing their affairs before him, and Thorgir Fleck from Sula in Veridau, of whom mention is made before in the history of King Olaf the Saint, came to him about some needful business. The king paid no attention to his words, but was listening to people who stood near him. Then Thorgir said to the king, so loud that all who were around him could hear. Listen, my lord, to my plain word. I too was there, and had to bear. A bloody head from Stikelstad. For I was then with Olaf's men. Listen to me, well did I see. The men you're trusting the dead corpse thrusting. Out of their way, as dead it lay. And striking o'er your father's gore. There was instantly a great uproar, and some told Thorgir to go out, but the king called him, and not only dispatched his business to his satisfaction, but promised him favor and friendship. 15. K.L.F. Arneson flies the country. Soon after this the king was at a feast at the farm of Haug in Veridel, and at the dinner table Calf Arneson sat upon one side of him, and Einar Tambuskelfer on the other. It was already come so far that the king took little notice of Calf, but paid most attention to Einar. The king said to Einar, Let us ride today to Stikelstad. I should like to see the memorials of the things which took place there. Einar replies, I can tell thee nothing about it, but take thy foster father Calf with thee, he can give thee information about all that took place. When the tables were removed, the king made himself ready, and said to Calf, Thou must go with me to Stikelstad. Calf replied, That is really not my duty. Then the king stood up in a passion, and said, Go thou shalt, Calf. And thereupon he went out. Calf put on his riding clothes in all haste, and said to his footboy, Thou must ride directly to Egja, and order my house servants to ship all my property on board my ship before sunset. King Magnus now rides to Stikelstad, and Calf with him. They alighted from horseback, and went to the place where the battle had been. Then said the king to Calf, Where is the spot at which the king fell? Calf stretched out his spear shaft, and said, There he lay when he fell. The king, and where wast thou, Calf? Calf, here where I am now standing. The king turned red as blood in the face, and said, Then thy axe could well have reached him. Calf replied, My axe did not come near him, and immediately went to his horse, sprang on horseback, and rode away with all his men, and the king rode back to Haug. Calf did not stop until he got home in the evening to Egja. There his ship lay ready at the shore side, and all his effects were on board, and the vessel manned with his house servants. They set off immediately by night down the fjord, and afterwards proceeded day and night, when the wind suited. He sailed out into the West Sea, and was there a long time plundering in Ireland, Scotland, and the Hibuids. John Gulbarskald tells of this in the song about Calf. Brother of Thorberg, who still stood. Well with the king. In angry mood. He is the first to break with thee. Who well deserves esteem to be. He is the first who friendship broke. For envious men the falsehood spoke. And he will he the first to rue. 
The breach of friendship, twixt you two. 16. Of the threats of the bonds. King Magnus added to his property Vegia, which Hrut had been owner of, and Kvistad, which had belonged to Thorgir, and also Egja, with all the goods which Kaf had left behind him. And thus he confiscated to the king's estate many great farms, which had belonged to those of the bond army who had fallen at Stikelstad. In like manner, he laid heavy fine upon many of those who made the greatest opposition to King Olaf. He drove some out of the country, took large sums of money from others, and had the cattle of others slaughtered for his use. Then the bonds began to murmur, and to say among themselves, Will he go on in the same way as his father and other chiefs, whom we made an end of when their pride and lawless proceedings became insupportable? This discontent spread widely through the country. The people of San gathered men, and, it was said, were determined to give battle to King Magnus, if he came into the fjord district. King Magnus was then in Hordaland, where he had remained a long time with a numerous retinue, and was now come to the resolution to proceed north to San. When the king's friends observed this, twelve men had a meeting, and resolved to determine by casting lots which of them should inform the king of the discontent of the people, and it so happened that the lot fell upon Sigvat. 17. Of the free speaking song, Bursoglisvizier. Sigvat accordingly composed a poem, which he called the Free Speaking Song, which begins with saying the king had delayed too long to pacify the people, who were threatening to rise in tumult against him. He said, Here in the south, from San is spread. The news that strife draws to a head. The bonds will the king oppose. Kings and their folk should ne'er be foes. Let us take arms, and briskly go. To battle, if it must be so. Defend our king, but still deplore. His land plunged in such strife once more. In this song are also these verses. Hakon, who at Fisher died. Hakon the good, could not abide. The Viking rule, or robber train. And all men's love he thus did gain. The people since have still in mind. The laws of Hakon, just and kind. And men will never see the day. When Hakon's laws have passed away. The bonds ask but what is fair. The Olafs and the Earls, when there. Where Magnus sits, confirm to all. Their lands and gear, to great and small. Bold of son, and Harold's heir. The Olafs, while on earth they were. Observed the laws themselves had made. And none was for his own afraid. Let not thy counsellors stir thy wrath. Against the man who speaks the truth. Thy honour lies in thy good sword. But still more in thy royal word. And, if the people do not lie. The new laws turn out not nigh. So just and mild, as the laws given. At Ulfasund in face of heaven. Dread king. Who urges thee to break. Thy pledged word, and back to take. Thy promise given. Thou warrior bold. With thy own people word to hold. Thy promise fully to maintain. Is to thyself the greatest gain. The battle storm razor he. Must by his own men trusted be. Who urges thee, who seeks renown? The bonds cattle to cut down. No king before e'er took in hand. Such Viking work in his own land. Such rapine men will not long bear. And the king's counsellors will but share. In their ill will, when once inflamed. The king himself for all is blamed. Do cautious, with this news of treason. Flying about, give them no reason. We hang the thief, but then we use. Consideration of the excuse. I think, great king, who wilt rejoice. Eagle and wolf with battle voice. It would be wise not to oppose. Thy bonds, and make them thy foes. A dangerous sign it is, I fear. That old grey-bearded men appear. In corners whispering at the thing. As if they had bad news to bring. The young sit still, no laugh, or shout. More looks than words passing shout. And groups of whispering heads are seen. 
on buttoned breasts with lowering mien. Among the yudelmen, they say. The king, if he could have his way, would seize the bonds Yudal land. And freeborn men must this withstand. In truth the man whose Yudal field. By any doom that law can yield. From him a judge the king would take. Could the king's throne and power shake. This verse is the last. A holy bond between us still. Makes me wish speedy end to ill. The sluggard waits till afternoon. At once great Magnus. Grant our boon. Then we will serve with heart and hand. With thee we'll fight by sea or land. With Olaf's sword take Olaf's mind. And to thy bonds be more kind. In this song the king was exhorted to observe the laws which his father had established. This exhortation had a good effect on the king, for many others held the same language to him. So at last the king consulted the most prudent men, who ordered all affairs according to law. Thereafter King Magnus had the law book composed in writing which is still in use in Thrandjum district, and is called, the Grey Goose, 1. King Magnus afterwards became very popular, and was beloved by all the country people, and therefore he was called Magnus the Good. End notes, 1, the Grey Goose, so called probably from the color of. The parchment on which it is written, is one of the most curious. Relics of the Middle Ages and give us an unexpected view of the social condition of the Northmen in the 11th century. Law appears to have been so far advanced among them that the forms were not merely established, but the slightest breach of the legal forms of proceeding involved. The loss of the case. The Grey Goose embraces subjects not dealt with probably by any other code in Europe at that period. The provision for the poor, the equality of weights and measures, police of markets and of sea havens. Provision for illegitimate children of the poor, inns for travelers, wages of servants and support of them in sickness. Protection of pregnant women and even of domestic animals from injury, roads, bridges, vagrants, beggars, are Subjects treated of in this code. Schlegel. L. 18, of the English kings. The king of the English, King Harold, died, A.D. 1040, five years after his father King Canute, and was buried beside his father at Winchester. After his death his brother Hardenat, the second son of the old King Canute, was king of England, and was thus king both of Denmark and England. He ruled these kingdoms two years, and then died of sickness in England, leaving no children. He was buried at Winchester beside his father. After his death Edward the Good, a son of the English King Ethelred, and Emma, a daughter of Richard Earl of Rouen, was chosen king in England. King Edward the Good was, on his mother's side, a brother of Harold and Hardenut, the sons of Canute the Great, and the daughter of Canute and Queen Emma was Gunhild who was married to the Emperor Henry of Germany, who was called Henry the Mild. Gunhild had been three years in Germany when she fell sick, and she died five years after the death of her father King Canute the Great. 19. Of King Magnus Olofsson When King Magnus Olofsson heard of Hardenat's death, he immediately sent people south to Denmark, with a message to the men who had bound themselves by oath to the peace and agreement which was made between King Magnus and Hardenat and reminded them of their pledge. He added, as a conclusion, that in summer, A.D. 1042, he would come with his army to Denmark to take possession of his Danish dominions, in terms of the agreement, or to fall in the field with his army. So says Arner, the Earl's scald. Wise were the words, exceeding wise. Of him who stills the hungriest cries. Of beasts of prey, the Earl's lord and soon fulfilled will be his word. With his good sword he'll Denmark gain. Or fall upon a bloody plain. And rather than give up his cause. Will leave his corpse to raven's claws. 20. King Magnus Armament Thereafter King Magnus gathered together a great army, and summoned to him all lendermen and powerful bonds, and collected warships. 
When the army was assembled it was very handsome, and well fitted out. He had seventy large vessels when he sailed from Norway. So says Theodolf the Skald. Brave king! The terror of the foe! With thee will many a long ship go. Full seventy sail are gathered here. Eastward with their great king to steer. And southward now the bright keel glides. O'er the white waves the bison rides. Sails swell, yards crack, the highest mast. O'er the wide sea scarce seen at last. Here it related that King Magnus had the great bison, which his father King Olaf had built. It had more than thirty banks of rowers, and forward on the bow was a great buffalo head, and aft on the sternpost was its tail. Both the head and the tail, and both sides of the ship, were gilded over. Of this speaks Arnor, the Earl Skald. The white foam lashing o'er the deck. Oft made the glided head to shake. The helm down, the vessel's heel. Oft showed her stem's bright glossaying steel. Around Stavanger Point careering. Through the wild sea's white flame steering. Tackle loud singing to the strain. The storm horse flies to Denmark's plain. King Magnus set out to sea from Agder, and sailed over to Jutland. So says Arnor. I can relate how through the gale. The gallant bison carried sail. With her lee gunwale in the wave. The king on board, Magnus the brave. The ironclad thingman's chief to see. On Jutland's coast right glad were we. Right glad are men to see a king. Who in the fight his sword could swing. 21. King Magnus comes to Denmark. When King Magnus came to Denmark he was joyfully received. He appointed a thing without delay, to which he summoned the people of the country, and desired they would take him as king, according to the agreement which had been entered into. As the highest of the chiefs of the country were bound by oath to King Magnus, and were desirous of keeping their word and oath, they endeavoured zealously to promote the cause with the people. It contributed also that King Canute the Great, and all his descendants, were dead, and a third assistance was, that his father King Olaf's sanctity and miracles were become celebrated in all countries. 22. King Magnus chosen King of Denmark. King Magnus afterwards ordered the people to be summoned to Viborg to a thing. Both in older and later times, the Danes elected their kings at the Viborg thing. At this thing the Danes chose Magnus Olafsson to be king of all the Danish Dorninians. King Magnus remained long in Denmark during the summer, A.D. 1042, and wherever he came the people received him joyfully, and obeyed him willingly. He divided the country into baronies and districts, and gave fiefs to men of power in the land. Late in autumn he returned with his fleet to Norway, but lay for some time at the Gott River. 23. Of Sven Ulfsson. There was a man, by name Sven, a son of Earl Ulf, and grandson of Thorgil Sprekeleg. Sven's mother was Astrid, a daughter of King Sven Forkbeard. She was a sister of Canute the Great by the father's side, and of the Swedish King Olaf Eriksson by the mother's side, for her mother was Queen Sigrid the Haughty, a daughter of Skogler Toast. Sven Ulf's son had been a long time living with his relation the Swedish king, ever since King Canute had ordered his father Ulf to be killed, as is related in the saga of old King Canute, that he had his brother-in-law, Earl Ulf. Murdered in Roskildu. And on which account Sven had not since been in Denmark. Sven Ulf's son was one of the handsomest men that could be seen, he was very stout and strong, and very expert in all exercises, and a well-spoken man withal. Everyone who knew him said he had every quality which became a good chief. Sven Ulf's son waited upon King Magnus while he lay in the Gott River, as before mentioned, and the king received him kindly, as he was by many advised to do. For Sven was a particularly popular man. He could also speak for himself to the king well and cleverly, so that it came at last to Sven's entering into King Magnus' service, and becoming his man. They often talked together afterwards in private concerning many affairs. 24. Sven Ulfsson created an earl. One day, as King Magnus sat in his high seat and many people were around him, Sven Ulfsson sat upon a footstool before the king. The king then made a speech, be it known to you, 
chiefs, and the people in general, that I have taken the following resolution. Here is a distinguished man, both for family and for his own merits, Sven Ulf's son, who has entered into my service, and given me promise of fidelity. Now, as ye know, the Danes have this summer become my men, so that when I am absent from the country it is without a head. And it is not unknown to you how it is ravaged by the people of Vindland, Kurland, and others from the Baltic, as well as by Saxons. Therefore I promised them a chief who could defend and rule their land. And I know no man better fitted, in all respects, for this than Sven Ulf's son, who is of birth to be chief of the country. I will therefore make him my earl, and give him the government of my Danish dominions while I am in Norway. Just as King Canute the Great set his father, Earl Ulf, over Denmark while he was in England. Then Einar Tambaskelfer said, Too great an earl, too great an earl, my foster son. The king replied in a passion, Ye have a poor opinion of my judgment, I think. Some consider that ye are two great earls, and others that ye are fit for nothing. Then the king stood up, took a sword, and girded on the earl's loins, and took a shield and fastened it on his shoulders, put a helmet upon his head, and gave him the title of earl. With the same fiefs in Denmark which his father Earl Ulf had formerly held. Afterwards a shrine was brought forth containing holy relics, and Sven laid his hand hereon, and swore the oath of fidelity to King Magnus, upon which the king led the earl to the high seat by his side. So says Theodolf. Twas at the Got River's shore. With hand on shrine Sven Ulf's son swore. King Magnus first said o'er the oath. With which Sven Ulf's son pledged his troth. The vows by Sven solemnly given. On holy bones of saints in heaven. To Magnus seemed both fair and fast. He found they were too fair to last. Earl Sven went thereafter to Denmark, and the whole nation received him well. He established a court about him, and soon became a great man. In winter, A.D. 1043, he went much about the country, and made friends among the powerful chiefs, and, indeed, he was beloved by all the people of the land. 25. King Magnus Foray. King Magnus proceeded northward to Norway with his fleet, and wintered there, but when the spring set in, A.D. 1048, he gathered a large force, with which he sailed south to Denmark, having heard the news from Vinland that the Vinland people in Jomsborg had withdrawn from their submission to him. The Danish kings had formerly had a very large earldom there, and they first founded Jomsborg, and now the place was become a very strong fortress. When King Magnus heard of this, he ordered a large fleet and army to be levied in Denmark, and sailed in summer to Vinland with all his forces, which made a very large army altogether. Arnor, the Earl's Skald, tells of it thus. Now in this strophe, royal youth. I tell no more than the plain truth. Thy armed outfit from the strand. Left many a keel trace on the sand. And never did a king before. So many ships to any shore. Lead on, as thou to Vindland's isle. The Vindland men in fright recoil. Now when King Magnus came to Vindland he attacked Jomsborg, and soon took the fortress, killing many people, burning and destroying both in the town and in the court try all around, and making the greatest havoc. So says Arnor, the Earl's scald. The robbers, hemmed twixt death and fire. Knew not how to escape thy ire. O'er Jomsborg Castle's highest towers. Thy wrath the whirlwind fire pours. The heathen on his false gods calls. And trembles even in their halls. And by the light from its own flame. The king this Viking hold overcame. Many people in Vinland submitted to King Magnus, but many more got out of the way and fled. King Magnus returned to Denmark, and prepared to take his winter abode there, and sent away the Danish, and also a great many of the Norwegian people he had brought with him. 26. Sven receives the title of king. The same winter, A.D. 1043 in which Sven Ulf's son was raised to the government of the whole Danish dominions, and had made friends of a great number of the principal chiefs in Denmark, and obtained the affections of the people. He assumed by the advice of many of the chiefs the title of king. 
But when in the spring thereafter he heard that King Magnus had come from the north with a great army, Sven went over to Scania, from thence up to Gotland, and so on to Spithjad to his relation, King Imund, where he remained all summer. And sent spies out to Denmark, to inquire about the king's proceedings and the number of his men. Now when Sven heard that King Magnus had let a great part of his army go away, and also that he was south in Jutland, he rode from Spithjad with a great body of pipi which the Swedish king had given him. When Sven came to Scania the people of that country received him well, treated him as their king, and men joined him in crowds. He then went on to Sealand, where he was also well received, and the whole country joined him. He then went to Fion, and laid all the islands under his power, and as the people also joined him, he collected a great army and many ships of war. 27. Of King Magnus' Military Force King Magnus heard this news, and at the same time that the people of Vinland had a large force on foot. He summoned people therefore to come to him, and drew together a great army in Jutland. Otto, also, the Duke of Brunswick, who had married Ulfhild, King Olaf the Saint's daughter, and the sister of King Magnus, came to him with a great troop. The Danish chiefs pressed King Magnus to advance against the Vinland army, and not allow pagans to march over and lay waste the country, so it was resolved that the king with his army should proceed south to Hydeby. While King Magnus lay at Scottborg River, on Hlerskog Heath, he got intelligence concerning the Vinland army, and that it was so numerous it could not be counted, whereas King Magnus had so few, that there seemed no chance for him but to fly. The king, however, determined on fighting, if there was any possibility of gaining the victory, but the most dissuaded him from venturing on an engagement, and all, as one man, said that the Vinland people had undoubtedly a prodigious force. Duke Otto, however, pressed much to go to battle. Then the king ordered the whole army to be gathered by the war trumpets into battle array, and ordered all the men to arm, and to lie down for the night under their shields. For he was told the enemy's army had come to the neighborhood. The king was very thoughtful, for he was vexed that he should be obliged to fly, which fate he had never experienced before. He slept but little all night, and chanted his prayers. 28. Of King Olaf's Miracle The following day was Michaelmas Eve. Towards dawn the king slumbered, and dreamt that his father, King Olaf the Saint, appeared to him, and said, Art thou so melancholy and afraid, because the Vinland people come against thee with a great army? Be not afraid of heathens, although they be many, for I shall be with thee in the battle. Prepare, therefore, to give battle to the Vinlanders, when thou hearest my trumpet. When the king awoke he told his dream to his men, and the day was then dawning. At that moment all the people heard a ringing of bells in the air. And those among King Magnus' men who had been in Nidaros thought that it was the ringing of the bell called Glad, which King Olaf had presented to the church of St. Clement in the town of Nidaros. 29. Battle of Hlerskog Heath Then King Magnus stood up, and ordered the war trumpets to sound, and at that moment the Vinland army advanced from the south across the river against him, on which the whole of the king's army stood up, and advanced against the heathens. King Magnus threw off from him his coat of ring mail, and had a red silk shirt outside over his clothes, and had in his hands the battle axe called Hell, one, which had belonged to King Olaf. King Magnus ran on before all his men to the enemy's army, and instantly hewed down with both hands every man who came against him. So says Arnor, the earl's scald. His armor on the ground he flung. His broad axe round his head he swung. And Norway's king strode on in might. Through ringing swords, to the wild fight. His broad axe hell with both hands wielding. Shields, helms, and skulls before it yielding. He seemed with fate the world to share. And life or death to deal out there. This battle was not very long. For the king's men were very fiery, and where they came the Vinland men fell as thick as tangles heaped up by the waves on the strand. They who stood behind betook themselves to flight, and were hewed down like cattle at a slaughter. The king himself drove the fugitives eastward over the heath, and people fell all over the moor. So says Theodolf. And foremost he pursued. And the flying foe down hewed. 
An eagle's feast each stroke. As the Vinland helms he broke. He drove them o'er the hearth. And they fly from bloody death. But the more, a mile or more. With the dead was studded o'er. It is a common saying, that there never was so great a slaughter of men in the northern lands, since the time of Christianity, as took place among the Vinland people on Hlerskog's heath. On the other side, not many of King Magnus' people were killed, although many were wounded. After the battle the king ordered the wounds of his men to be bound. But there were not so many doctors in the army as were necessary, so the king himself went round, and felt the hands of those he thought best suited for the business. And when he had thus stroked their palms, he named twelve men, who, he thought, had the softest hands, and told them to bind the wounds of the people. And although none of them had ever tried it before, they all became afterwards the best of doctors. There were two Iceland men among them, the one was Thorkil, a son of Gare, from Lingar. The other was Adel, father of Bardsvart of Salardal, from whom many good doctors are descended. After this battle, the report of the miracle which King Olaf the Saint had worked was spread widely through the country. And it was the common saying of the people, that no man could venture to fight against King Magnus Olafsson, for his father Saint Olaf stood so near to him that his enemies, on that account, never could do him harm. End notes, 1, Hell, Death, the Goddess of Death. L. 30, Battle at Re. King Magnus immediately turned round with his army against Sven, whom he called his earl, although the Danes called him their king. And he collected ships, and a great force, and on both sides a great strength was assembled. In Sven's army were many chiefs from Scania, Halland, Sealand, and Fyen. While King Magnus, on the other hand, had mostly Norway and Jutland men, and with that war force he hastened to meet Sven. They met at Re, near Vestland. And there was a great battle, which ended in King Magnus gaining the victory, and Sven taking flight. After losing many people, Sven fled back to Scania, and from thence to Gotland, which was a safe refuge if he needed it, and stood open to him. King Magnus returned to Jutland, where he remained all winter, AD 1044, with many people, and had a guard to watch his ships. Arnor, the Earl's Skald, speaks of this. At Re our battle-loving lord. In bloody meeting stained his sword. At Re upon the western shore. In Vestland warriors blood once more. 31. Battle at Aros. Sven Ulfsson went directly to his ships as soon as he heard that King Magnus had left his fleet. He drew to him all the men he could, and went round in winter among the islands, Sealand, Fyen, and others. Toward Jul he sailed to Jutland, and went into Lymphjord, where many people submitted to him. He imposed scat upon some, but some joined King Magnus. Now when King Magnus heard what Sven was doing, he betook himself to his ships with all the Northmen then in Denmark, and a part of the Danish troops, and steered south along the land. Sven was then in Aros with a great force. And when he heard of King Magnus he laid his vessels without the town, and prepared for battle. When King Magnus heard for certain where Sven was, and that the distance between them was but short, he held a house thing, and addressed his people thus, it is reported to me that the Earl and his fleet are lying not far from us. And that he has many people. Now I would let you know that I intend to go out against the Earl and fight for it, although, we have fewer people. We will, as formerly, put our trust in God, and Saint Olaf, my father, who has given us victory sometimes when we fought, even though we had fewer men than the enemy. Now I would have you get ready to seek out the enemy, and give battle the moment we find him by rowing all to attack, and being all ready for battle. Thereupon the men put on their weapons, each man making himself and his place ready. And then they stretched themselves to their oars. When they saw the Earl's ships they rowed towards them, and made ready to attack. When Sven's men saw the forces they armed themselves, bound their ships together, and then began one of the sharpest of battles. So says Theodolf, the Skald. Shield against shield, the Earl and King. Made shields and swords together ring. The gold-decked heroes made a play. Which hilds iron-shirt men say. 
they never saw before or since. On battle deck, the brave might wince. As spear and arrow whistling flew. Point blank, death bringing, quick and true. They fought at the bows, so that the men only on the bows could strike, the men on the forecastle thrust with spears, and all who were farther off shot with light spears or javelins, or war arrows. Some fought with stones or short stakes. And those who were after the mast shot with the bow. So says Theodolf. Steel pointed spear, and sharpened stake. Made the broad shield on arm shake. The eagle, hovering in the air. Screamed o'er the prey preparing there. And stones and arrows quickly flew. And many a warrior bold they slew. The bowman never twanged his bow and drew his shaft so oft as now. And Throngem's bowmen on that day were not the first tired of this play. Arrows and darts so quickly fly. You could not follow with the eye. Here it appears how hot the battle was with casting weapons. King Magnus stood in the beginning of the battle within a shield rampart. But as it appeared to him that matters were going on too slowly, he leaped over the shields, and rushed forward in the ship, encouraging his men with a loud cheer, and springing to the bows, where the battle was going on hand to hand. When his men saw this they urged each other on with mutual cheering, and there was one great hurrah through all the ships. So says Theodolf. On with our ships. On to the foe. Cry Magnus men, on, on they go. Spears against shields in fury rattle. Was never seen so fierce a battle. And now the battle was exceedingly sharp, and in the assault Sven's ship was cleared of all her forecastle men, upon and on both sides of the forecastle. Then Magnus boarded Sven's ship, followed by his men, and one after the other came up, and made so stout an assault that Sven's men gave way, and King Magnus first cleared that ship, and then the rest, one after the other. Sven fled, with a great part of his people, but many fell, and many got life and peace. Theodolf tells of this. Brave Magnus, from the stern springing. Onto the stem, where swords were ringing. From his sea raven's beak of gold. Deals death around, the brave. The bold. The earl's housemen now begin. To shrink and fall, their ranks grow thin. The king's luck thrives, their decks are cleared. Of fighting men no more appeared. The earl's ships are driven to flight. Before the king would stop the fight. The gold distributor first then. Gave quarters to the vanquished men. This battle was fought on the last Sunday before Yule. So says Theodolf. Twas on a Sunday morning bright. Fell out this great and bloody fight. When men were arming, fighting, dying. Or on the red decks wounded lying. And many a man, for doomed to die. To save his life overboard did fly. But sank, for swimming could not save. And dead men rolled in every wave. Magnus took seven ships from Sven's people. So says Theodolf. Thick Olaf's son seven vessels cleared. And with his fleet the prizes steered. The Norway girls will not be sad. To hear such news, each from her lad. He also sings. The captured men will grieve the most. Sven and their comrades to have lost. For it went ill with those who fled. Their wounded had no easy bed. A heavy storm that very night. Bertuk them flying from the fight. And skulls and bones are tumbling round. Under the sea, on sandy ground. Sven fled immediately by night to Sealand with the men who had escaped and were inclined to follow him. But King Magnus brought his ships to the shore, and sent his men up the country in the night time, and early in the morning they came flown to the strand with a great booty in cattle. Theodolf tells about it. But yesterday with heavy stones. We crushed their skulls, and broke their bones. And thinned their ranks. And now today. Up through their land we've ta'en our way and driven their cattle to the shore, and filled out ships with food in store, to save his land from our quick swords. 
Sven will need something more than words. 32. Sven's Flight King Magnus sailed with his fleet from the south after Sven to Sealand. But as soon as the king came there Sven fled up the country with his men, and Magnus followed them, and pursued the fugitives, killing all that were laid hold of. So says Theodolf. The Sealand girl asks with fear. Whose blood bespattered shield and spear? The earls or kings, up from the shore. Moved on with many a warrior more. We scoured through all their muddy lanes. Woodlands, and fields, and miry plains. Their hasty footmarks in the clay. Showed that to Ringstead led their way. Spattered with mud from heel to head. Our gallant lord his true men led. Will Lund's earl halt his hasty flight? And try on land another fight? His banner yesterday was seen. The sand bills and green trees between. Through moss and mire to the strand. In arrow flight, leaving the land. Then Sven fled over to Fian Island, and King Magnus carried fire and sword through Sealand, and burnt all round, because their men had joined Sven's troop in harvest. So says Theodolf. As Sven in winter had destroyed. The royal house, the king employed. No little force to guard the land. And the earl's forays to withstand. An armed band one morn he found. And so beset them round and round. That Canute's nephew quickly fled. Or he would have been captive led. Our Throngem king in his just ire. Laid waste the land with sword and fire. Burst every house, and over all. Struck terror into great and small. To the earl's friends he well repaid. Their deadly hate, such wild work made. On them and theirs, that from his fury. Flying for life, away they hurry. 33. Burning in Fyn. As soon as King Magnus heard that Sven with his troops had gone across to Fyn, he sailed after them, and when Sven heard this news he went on board ship and sailed to Scania, and from thence to Gotland, and at last to the Swedish king. King Magnus landed in Fyn, and plundered and burned over all, and all of Sven's men who came there fled far enough. Theodolf speaks of it thus. Fiona Isle, once green and fair, lies black and reeking through the air. The red fog rises, thick and hot. From burning farm and smoldering cot. The gaping thralls in terror gaze. On the broad upward spiring blaze. From thatched roofs and oak-built walls. Their murdered master's stately halls. Sven's men, my girl, will not forget. That thrice they have the Norsemen met. By sea, by land, with steel, with fire. Thrice have they felt the Norse king's ire. Fiona's maids are slim and fair. The lovely prizes, lads, will share. Some stand to arms in rank and row. Some seize, bring off, and fend with blow. After this the people of Denmark submitted to King Magnus, and during the rest of the winter, there was peace. King Magnus then appointed some of his men to govern Denmark. And when spring was advanced he sailed northwards with his fleet to Norway, where he remained a great part of the summer. 34. Battle at Helganes. Now, when Sven heard that King Magnus had gone to Norway he rode straight down, and had many people out of Svithjad with him. The people of Scania received him well, and he again collected an army, with which he first crossed over into Sealand and seized upon it and Fion, and all the other isles. When King Magnus heard of this he gathered together men and ships, and sailed to Denmark, and as soon as he knew where Sven was lying with his ships King Magnus sailed to meet him. They met at a place called Helganes, and the battle began about the fall of day. King Magnus had fewer men, but larger and better equipped vessels. So says Arnor, the Earl Skald. At Helganes, so goes the tale. The brave wolf feeder, under sail. Made many an ocean elk, one, his prey. Seized many a ship ere break of day. When twilight fell he urged the fight. Close combat, man to man all night. Through a long harvest night's dark hours. 
down poured the battle's iron showers. The battle was very hot, and as night advanced the fall of men was great. King Magnus, during the whole night, threw hand spears. Fyodolf speaks of this. And there at Helgain sunk down. Sore wounded, men of great renown. And Sven's retainers lost all heart. Ducking before the flying dart. The Norseman's king let fly his spears. His death wounds adding to their fears. For each spear blade was wet all o'er. Up to the shaft in their life gore. To make a short tale, King Magnus won the victory in this battle, and Sven fled. His ship was cleared of men from stem to stern, and it went so on board many others of his ships. So says Theodolf. Earl Sven fled from the empty deck. His lonely ship an unmanned wreck. Magnus the good, the people's friend. Pressed to the death on the false Sven. Neither, too, the sword his father bore. Was edge and point, stained red with gore. Sword sprinkle blood o'er armor bright. When kings for land and power fight. And Arnor says. The cutters of Bjorn's own brother. Soon changed their owner for another. The king took them and all their gear. The crews, however, got off clear. A great number of Sven's men fell, and King Magnus and his men had a vast booty to divide. So says Theodolf. Where the Norsemen the Danish slew. A Gotland shield and breastplate true. Fell to my share of spoil by lot. And something more I, the south I got. There all the summer swords were ringing. A helm, gay arms, and gear worth bringing. Home to my quiet lovely one. I sent, with news how we had one. Sven fled up to Scania with all the men who escaped with him, and King Magnus and his people drove the fugitives up through the country without meeting any opposition either from Sven's men or the bonds. So says Theodolf. Olaf's brave son then gave command. All his ship's crews should quickly land. King Magnus, marching at their head. A noble band of warriors led. A foray through the land he makes. Denmark in every quarter shakes. Uphill and down the horses scour. Carrying the Danes from Norsemen's power. King Magnus drove with fire and sword through the land. So says Theodolf. And now the Norsemen storm along. Following their banner in a throng. King Magnus' banner flames on high. A star to guide our roaming by. To Lund, o'er Scania's peaceful field. My shoulder bore my useless shield. A fairer land, a better road. As friend or foe, I never trod. They began to burn the habitations all around, and the people fled on every side. So says Theodolf. Our ice-cold iron in great store. Our arms, beside the king we bore. The Scanian rogues fly at the view. Of men and steel all sharp and true. Their timbered houses flame on high. Red flashing over half the sky. The blazing town flings forth its light. Lighting the cowards on their flight. And he also sang. The king o'er all the Danish land. Rome's, with his fire-bringing band. The house, the hut, the farm, the town. All where men dwelt is burned down. O'er Denmark's plains and cornfields. Meadows and moors, are seen our shields. Victorious over all, we chase. Sven's wounded men from place to place. Across Fiona's moor again. The paths late trodden by our men. We tread once more, until quite near. Through morning mist, the foes appear. Then up our numerous banners flare. In the cold early morning air. And they from Magnus' power who fly. Cannot this quick war work deny? Then Sven fled eastwards along Scania, and King Magnus returned to his ships, and steered eastwards also along the Scanian coast, having got ready with the greatest haste to sail. Theodolf sings thus about it No drink but the salt sea. On board our ships had we. When, following our king, on board our ships we spring. 
hard work on the salt sea. Off Scania's coast, had we. But we labored for the king. To his foemen death to bring. Sven fled to Gotland, and then sought refuge with the Swedish king, with whom he remained all winter, A.D. 1046, and was treated with great respect. Endnotes, 1, ship. L. 2, this was the name of St. Olaf's sword. Which Magnus had recovered. L. 35, of King Magnus' campaign. When King Magnus had subdued Scania he turned about, and first went to Falster, where he landed, plundered, and killed many people who had before submitted to Sven. Arner speaks of this. A bloody vengeance for their guile. King Magnus takes on Falster Isle. The treacherous Danes his fury feel. And fall before his purpled steel. The battlefield is covered o'er. With eagles prey from shore to shore. And the king's court men were the first. To quench with blood the raven's thirst. Thereafter Magnus with his fleet proceeded to the Isle of Fion, went on land, plundered, and made great devastation. So says Arner, the earl scald. To fair Fiona's grassy shore. His banner now again he bore. He who the mail shirts linked chains. Severs, and all its luster stains. He will be long remembered there. The warrior in his twentieth year. Whom their black ravens from afar. Saluted as he went to war. 36. Of King Magnus' Battles. King Magnus remained in Denmark all that winter, A.D. 1046, and sat in peace. He had held many battles, and had gained the victory in all. So says O.D. Kikiniskald. For Michaelmas was struck the blow. That laid the Vinland Vikings low. And people learned with joy to hear. The clang of arms, and leaders cheer. Short before you'll fell out the day. Southward of Aros, where the fray. Though not enough the foe to quell. Was of the bloodiest men can tell. And Arner says. Olaf's avenger who can sing. The scald cannot overtake the king. Who makes the warbird daily drain. The corpse blood of his foemen slain. For battles won within a year. Breaker of shields. With swords and spear. And hand to hand, exalt thy fame. Above the kings of greatest name. King Magnus had three battles with Sven Ulfson. So says Theodolf. To our brave Throngem sovereign's praise. The scald may all his scaldcraft raise. For fortune, and for daring deed. His song will not the truth exceed. After three battles to regain. What was his own, unjustly tame. Unjustly kept, and dues denied. He levied dues and red blood died. 37. Of King Magnus, and Thorfinn and Ragnvald, Earls of Orkney. While King Magnus the Good, a son of King Olaf the Saint, ruled over Norway, as before related, the Earl Ragnvald Brusesson lived with him. Earl Thorfinn Sigurdsson, the uncle of Ragnvald, ruled then over Orkney. King Magnus sent Ragnvald west to Orkney, and ordered that Thorfinn should let him have his father's heritage. Thorfinn let Ragnvald have a third part of the land along with him. For so had Erase, the father of Ragnvald, had it at his dying day. Earl Thorfinn was married to Ingebjorg, the Earl Mother, who was a daughter of Finn Arneson. Earl Ragnvald thought he should have two-thirds of the land, as Olaf the Saint had promised to his father Bruce, and as Bruce had enjoyed as long as Olaf lived. This was the origin of a great strife between these relations, concerning which we have a long saga. They had a great battle in Pentland Firth, in which Calf Arneson was with Earl Thorfinn. So says Bjarn Gulbarskald. Thy cutters, dashing through the tide, brought aid to Earl Thorfinn's side. Finn's son-in-law, and people say. Thy aid made Bruce's son give way. Calf, thou art fond of warlike toil. Gay in the strife and bloody broil. But here, twas hate made thee contend. Against Earl Ragnvald, the king's friend. 38, of King Magnus' letter to England. 
King Magnus ruled then both over Denmark and Norway, and when he had got possession of the Danish dominions he sent ambassadors over to England to King Edward, who brought to him King Magnus' letter and seal. And in this letter there stood, along with a salutation from King Magnus, these words, Ye must have heard of the agreement which I and Hardenap made. That he of us two who survived the other should have all the land and people which the deceased had possessed. Now it has so turned out, as ye have no doubt heard, that I have taken the Danish dominions as my heritage after Hardenut. But before he departed this life he had England as well as Denmark. Therefore I consider myself now, in consequence of my rights by this agreement, to own England also. Now I will therefore that thou deliver to me the kingdom, otherwise I will seek to take it by arms, both from Denmark and Norway. And let him rule the land to whom fate gives the victory. 39. King Edward's Answer to King Magnus' Letter Now when King Edward had read this letter, he replied thus, It is known to all men in this country that King Ethelred, my father, was Udall born to this kingdom, both after the old and new law of inheritance. We were four sons after him. And when he by death left the throne my brother Edmund took the government and kingdom, for he was the oldest of us brothers, and I was well satisfied that it was so. And after him my stepfather, Canute the Great, took the kingdom, and as long as he lived there was no access to it. After him my brother Harold was king as long as he lived. And after him my brother Hardenat took the kingdoms both of Denmark and England, for he thought that a just brotherly division that he should have both England and Denmark, and that I should have no kingdom at all. Now he died, and then it was the resolution of all the people of the country to take me for king here in England. So long as I had no kingly title I served only superiors in all respects, like those who had no claims by birth to land or kingdom. Now, however, I have received the kingly title, and am consecrated king. I have established my royal dignity and authority, as my father before me, and while I live I will not renounce my title. If King Magnus come here with an army, I will gather no army against him but he shall only get the opportunity of taking England when he has taken my life. Tell him these words of mine. The ambassadors went back to King Magnus, and told him the answer to their message. King Magnus reflected a while, and answered thus, I think it wisest, and will succeed best, to let King Edward have his kingdom in peace for me, and that I keep the kingdoms God has put into my hands. Saga of Harold Hardraid Preliminary Remarks Harold, son of Sigurd Seer, was born in the year A.D. 1015, and left Norway A.D. 1030. He was called Hardraid, that is, the severe counselor, the tyrant, though the Icelanders never applied this epithet to him. Harold helped the Icelanders in the famine of A.D. 1056, and sent them timber for a church at Thingval. It was the Norwegians who gave him the name Tyrant in contrast to the Debonerit of Magnus. He came to Norway in A.D. 1046, and became sole king in A.D. 1047. He died in A.D. 1066, and his son and successor Magnus died in A.D. 1069. His saga is to be compared with Agrip, Fagerskinna, and Morkinskinna. The skalds quoted are, Theodolf, Balverk, Eluj Brindelaskald, Stuff the Skald, Thorin Skegjason, Valgard O. Haval, Odi Kikiniskald, Grain Skald, Thorlike the Fair, Stein Herdison, Ulf the Marshal, Arnor the Earl Skald, Thorkel Skallison. And King Harold Hardrade himself. 1. Harold escapes from the Battle of Stikelstad. Harold, son of Sigurd Seer, brother of Olaf the Saint, by the same mother, was at the Battle of Stikelstad, and was fifteen years old when King Olaf the Saint fell, as was before related. Harold was wounded, and escaped with other fugitives. So says Theodolf. At Haug the fire sparks from his shield. Flew round the king's head on the field. As blow for blow, for Olaf's sake. His sword and shield would give and take. Bulgaria's conqueror, I ween. Had scarcely fifteen winters seen. When from his murdered brother's side. His unhelmed head he had to hide. Ragnvald Brusesson led Harold from the battle, and the knight after the fray took him to a bond who dwelt in a forest far from other people. 
the peasant received Harold, and kept him concealed. And Harold was waited upon until he was quite cured of his wounds. Then the bond's son attended him on the way east over the ridge of the land, and they went by all the forest paths they could, avoiding the common road. The bond's son did not know who it was he was attending, and as they were riding together between two uninhabited forests, Harold made these verses. My wounds were bleeding as I rode. And down below the bond strode. Killing the wounded with the sword. The followers of their rightful lord. From wood to wood I crept along. Unnoticed by the bond throng. Who knows, I thought, a day may come. My name will yet be great at home. He went eastward over the ridge through Jantaland and Helsingjaland, and came to Spithjad, where he found Ragnvald Brusesen, and many others of King Olaf's men who had fled from the battle at Steichelstad. And they remained there till winter was over. 2. Harold's Journey to Constantinople the spring after, A.D. 1031, Harold and Ragnvald got ships, and went east in summer to Russia to King Jerisleif, and were with him all the following winter. So says the scald Balverk. The king's sharp sword lies clean and bright. Prepared in foreign lands to fight. Our ravens croak to have their fill. The wolf howls from the distant hill. Our brave king is to Russia gone. Braver than he on earth there's none. His sharp sword will carve many feast. To wolf and raven in the east. King Jerisleif gave Harold and Ragnvald a kind reception, and made Harold and Elif, the son of Earl Ragnvald, chiefs over the land defense men of the king. So says Theodolf. Where Elif was, one heart and hand. The two chiefs had in their command. In wedge or line their battle order was ranged by both without disorder. The eastern Vinland men they drove into a corner, and they move the lesions, although ill at ease, to take the laws their conquerors please. Harold remained several years in Russia, and travelled far and wide in the eastern land. Then he began his expedition out to Greece, and had a great suite of men with him, and on he went to Constantinople. So says Balverk. Before the cold sea curling blast, the cutter from the land flew past, her black yards swinging to and fro, her shield hung gunnel dipping low. The king saw glancing o'er the bow, Constantinople's metal glow, from tower and roof and painted sails, gliding past towns and wooded valleys. Three of Harold. At that time the Greek Empire was ruled by the Empress Zoe the Great, and with her Michael Catalactus. Now when Harold came to Constantinople he presented himself to the Empress, and went into her pay. And immediately, in autumn, went on board the galleys manned with troops which went out to the Greek Sea. Harold had his own men along with him. Now Harold had been but a short time in the army before all the Varings flocked to him, and they all joined together when there was a battle. It thus came to pass that Harold was made chief of the Varings. There was a chief over all the troops who was called Jurger, and who was a relation of the Empress. Jurger and Harold went round among all the Greek islands, and fought much against the Corsairs. 4. Of Harold and Jurger Casting Lots It happened once that Jurger and the Varings were going through the country, and they resolved to take their night quarters in a wood. And as the Varings came first to the ground, they chose the place which was best for pitching their tents upon, which was the highest ground. For it is the nature of the land there to be soft when rain falls, and therefore it is bad to choose a low situation for your tents. Now when Jurger, the chief of the army, came up, and saw where the Varings had set up their tents, he told them to remove, and pitch their tents elsewhere, saying he would himself pitch his tents on their ground. Harold replies, If ye come first to the night quarter, ye take up your ground, and we must go pitch our tents at some other place where we best can. Now do ye so, in the same way, and find a place where ye will. It is, I think, the privilege of us varings here in the dominions of the Greek emperor to be free, and independent of all but their own commanders, and bound only to serve the emperor and empress. They disputed long and hotly about this, and both sides armed themselves, 
and were on the way to fight for it, but men of understanding came between and separated them. They said it would be better to come to an agreement about such questions, so that in future no dispute could arise. It came thus to an arbitration between them, at which the best and most sagacious men should give their judgment in the case. At this arbitration it was determined, with the consent of all parties, that lots should be thrown into a box, and the Greeks and Varings should draw which was first to ride, or to row, or to take place in a harbour, or to choose tent ground. And each side should be satisfied with what the drawing of the lots gave them. Accordingly the lots were made and marked. Harold said to Gerger, Let me see what mark thou hast put upon thy lot, that we may not both mark our lots in the same way. He did so. Then Harold marked his lot, and put it into the box along with the other. The man who was to draw out the lots then took up one of the lots between his fingers, held it up in the air, and said, This lot shall be the first to ride, and to row, and to take place in harbour and on the tent field. Harold seized his band, snatched the die, and threw it into the sea, and called out, That was our lot. Jurger said, Why did you not let other people see it? Harold replies, Look at the one remaining in the box, there you see your own mark upon it. Accordingly the lot which was left behind was examined, and all men saw that Jurger's mark was upon it, and accordingly the judgment was given that the Varings had gained the first choice in all they had been quarreling about. There were many things they quarreled about, but the end always was that Harold got his own way. 5. Harold's Expedition in the Land of the Saracens, Circland. They went out all on a campaign in summer. When the whole army was thus assembled Harold kept his men out of the battle, or wherever he saw the least danger, under pretext of saving his men. But where he was alone with his own men only, he fought so desperately that they must either come off victorious or die. It thus happened often that when he commanded the army he gained victories, while Jurger could do nothing. The troops observed this, and insisted they would be more successful if Harold alone was chief of the whole army, and upbraided the general with never affecting anything, neither himself, nor his people. Jurger again said that the Varings would give him no assistance, and ordered Harold to go with his men somewhere else, and he, with the rest of his army, would win what they could. Harold accordingly left the army with the Varings and the Latin men, and Jurger on his side went off with the Greek troops. Then it was seen what each could do. Harold always gained victories and booty. But the Greeks went home to Constantinople with their army, all except a few brave men, who, to gain booty and money, joined themselves to Harold, and took him for their leader. He then went with his troops westward to Africa, which the Varings call Circland, where he was strengthened with many men. In Circland he took eighty castles, some of which surrendered, and others were stormed. He then went to Sicily. So says Theodolf. The serpent's bed of glowing gold. He hates, the generous king, the bold. He who four score towers laid low. Came from the Saracenic foe. Before upon Sicilian plains. Shield joined to shield, the fight he gains. The victory at Hild's war game. And now the heathens dread his name. So says also Eluge Brindeliskald. For Michael's empire Harold fought. And southern lands to Michael brought. So Buttle's son his friendship showed. When he brought friends to his abode. Here it is said that Michael was king of the Greeks at that time. Harold remained many years in Africa, where he gathered great wealth in gold, jewels, and all sorts of precious things. And all the wealth he gathered there which he did not need for his expenses, he sent with trusty men of his own north to Novgorod to King Jerusleaf's care and keeping. He gathered together their extraordinary treasure, as is reasonable to suppose. For he had the plundering of the part of the world richest in gold and valuable things, and he had done such great deeds as with truth are related, such as taking eighty strongholds by his valour. 6. Battle in Sicily Now when Harold came to Sicily he plundered there also, and sat down with his army before a strong and populous castle. He surrounded the castle. But the walls were so thick there was no possibility of breaking into it, and the people of the castle had enough of provisions, and all that was necessary for defence. Then Harold hit upon an expedient. 
He made his bird catchers catch the small birds which had their nests within the castle, but flew into the woods by day to get food for their young. He had small splinters of tarred wood bound upon the backs of the birds, smeared these over with wax and sulfur, and set fire to them. As soon as the birds were let loose they all flew at once to the castle to their young, and to their nests, which they had under the house roofs that were covered with reeds or straw. The fire from the birds seized upon the house roofs. And although each bird could only carry a small burden of fire, yet all at once there was a mighty flame, caused by so many birds carrying fire with them and spreading it widely among the house roofs. Thus one house after the other was set on fire, until the castle itself was in flames. Then the people came out of the castle and begged for mercy, the same men who for many days had set at defiance the Greek army and its leader. Harold granted life and safety to all who asked quarter, and made himself master of the place. 7. Battle at another castle. There was another castle before which Harold had come with his army. This castle was both full of people and so strong, that there was no hope of breaking into it. The castle stood upon a flat hard plain. Then Harold undertook to dig a passage from a place where a stream ran in a bed so deep that it could not be seen from the castle. They threw out all the earth into the stream, to be carried away by the water. At this work they labored day and night, and relieved each other in gangs, while the rest of the army went the whole day against the castle, where the castle people shot through their loopholes. They shot at each other all day in this way, and at night they slept on both sides. Now when Harold perceived that his underground passage was so long that it must be within the castle walls, he ordered his people to arm themselves. It was towards daybreak that they went into the passage. When they got to the end of it they dug over their heads until they came upon stones laid in line which was the floor of a stone hall. They broke open the floor and rose into the hall. There sat many of the castlemen eating and drinking, and not in the least expecting such uninvited wolves, for the Varings instantly attacked them sword in hand, and killed some, and those who could get away fled. The Varings pursued them. And some seized the castle gate, and opened it, so that the whole body of the army got in. The people of the castle fled, but many asked quarter from the troops, which was granted to all who surrendered. In this way Harold got possession of the place, and found an immense booty in it. 8. Battle at a Third Castle They came to a third castle, the greatest and strongest of them all, and also the richest in property and the fullest of people. Around this castle there were great ditches, so that it evidently could not be taken by the same device as the former, and they lay a long time before it without doing anything. When the castlemen saw this they became bolder, drew up their array on the castle walls, threw open the castle gates, and shouted to the Varings, urging them, and jeering at them, and telling them to come into the castle. And that they were no more fit for battle than so many poultry. Harold told his men to make as if they did not know what to do, or did not understand what was said. For, says he, if we do make an assault we can effect nothing, as they can throw their weapons under their feet among us. And if we get in the castle with a party of our people, they have it in their power to shut them in. And shut out the others, for they have all the castle gates beset with men. We shall therefore show them the same scorn they show us, and let them see we do not fear them. Our men shall go out upon the plain nearest to the castle, taking care, however, to keep out of bowshot. All our men shall go unarmed, and be playing with each other, so that the castlemen may see we do not regard them or their array. Thus it went on for some days, without anything being done. 9. A Wolf and Halder Two Iceland men were then with Harold, the one was Halder, one, a son of the goad Snor, who brought this account to Iceland, the other was Ulfus Baxen, a grandson of Usvifer Spake. Both were very strong men, bold under arms, and Harold's best friends, and both were in this play. Now when some days were past the castle people showed more courage, and would go without weapons upon the castle wall, while the castle gates were standing open. The Varings observing this, went one day to their sports with the sword under their cloaks, and the helmet under their hats. After playing a while they observed that the castle people were off their guard. And instantly seizing their weapons, they made at the castle gate. 
When the men of the castle saw this they went against them armed completely, and a battle began in the castle gate. The Varings had no shields, but wrapped their cloaks round their left arms. Some of them were wounded, some killed, and all stood in great danger. Now came Harold with the men who had remained in the camp, to the assistance of his people. And the castleman had now got out upon the walls, from which they shot and threw stones down upon them, so that there was a severe battle, and those who were in the castle gates thought that help was brought them slower than they could have wished. When Harold came to the castle gate his standard bearer fell, and Harold said to Hulder, Do thou take up the banner now. Hulder took up the banner, and said foolishly, Who will carry the banner before thee, if thou followest it so timidly as thou hast done for a while. But these were words more of anger than of truth. For Harold was one of the boldest of men under arms. Then they pressed in, and had a hard battle in the castle, and the end was that Harold gained the victory and took the castle. Halder was much wounded in the face, and it gave him great pain as long as he lived. End notes. 1. One of the descendants of this Halder was Snor. Sturluson, the author of Heimskringla. 10. Battle at a fourth castle. The fourth castle which Harold came to was the greatest of all we have been speaking about. It was so strong that there was no possibility of breaking into it. They surrounded the castle, so that no supplies could get into it. When they had remained here a short time Harold fell sick, and he betook himself to his bed. He had his tent put up a little from the camp, for he found quietness and rest out of the clamor and clang of armed men. His men went usually in companies to or from him to hear his orders, and the castle people observing there was something new among the Varings, sent out spies to discover what this might mean. When the spies came back to the castle they had to tell of the illness of the commander of the Varings, and that no assault on that account had been made on the castle. A while after Harold's strength began to fail, at which his men were very melancholy and cast down, all which was news to the castlemen. At last Harold's sickness increased so rapidly that his death was expected through all the army. Thereafter the Varings went to the castlemen, told them, in a parley, of the death of their commander, and begged of the priests to grant him burial in the castle. When the castle people heard this news, there were many among them who ruled over cloisters or other great establishments within the place, and who were very eager to get the corpse for their church. Knowing that upon that there would follow very rich presents. A great many priests, therefore, clothed themselves in all their robes, and went out of the castle with cross and shrine and relics and formed a beautiful procession. The Varings also made a great burial. The coffin was borne high in the air, and over it was a tent of costly linen and before it were carried many banners. Now when the corpse was brought within the castle gate the Varings set down the coffin right across the entry, fixed a bar to keep the gates open, and sounded to battle with all their trumpets, and drew their swords. The whole army of the Varings, fully armed, rushed from the camp to the assault of the castle with shout and cry. And the monks and other priests who had gone to meet the corpse and had striven with each other who should be the first to come out and take the offering at the burial, were now striving much more who should first get away from the Varings. For they killed before their feet every one who was nearest, whether clerk or unconsecrated. The Varings rummaged so well this castle that they killed all the men, pillaged everything and made an enormous booty. 11. Of Harold. Harold was many years in these campaigns, both in Circland and in Sicily. Then he came back to Constantinople with his troops and stayed there but a little time before he began his expedition to Jerusalem. There he left the pay he had received from the Greek emperor and all the Varings who accompanied him did the same. It is said that on all these expeditions Harold had fought eighteen regular battles. So says Theodolf. Harold the stern ne'er allowed. Peace to his foemen, false and proud. In eighteen battles, fought and won. The valor of the Norsemen shone. The king, before his home return. Oft died the bald head of the urn. With bloody specks, and o'er the waist. The sharp-clawed wolf his footsteps traced. 12. Harold's Expedition to Palestine Harold went with his men to the land of Jerusalem and then up to the city of Jerusalem, and wheresoever he came in the land all the towns and strongholds were given up to him. So says the scald stuff, 
who had heard the king himself relate these tidings. He went, the warrior bold and brave. Jerusalem, the holy grave. And the interior of the land. To bring under the Greeks' command. And by the terror of his name. Under his power the country came. Nor needed wasting fire and sword. To yield obedience to his word. Here it is told that this land came without fire and sword under Harold's command. He then went out to Jordan and bathed therein, according to the custom of other pilgrims. Harold gave great gifts to our Lord's grave, to the Holy Cross, and other holy relics in the land of Jerusalem. He also cleared the whole road all the way out to Jordan, by killing the robbers and other disturbers of the peace. So says the scald stuff. The Agder king cleared far and wide. Jordan's fair banks on either side. The robber bands before him fled. And his great name was widely spread. The wicked people of the land. Were punished here by his dread hand. And they hereafter will not miss. Much worse from Jesus Christ than this. 13. Harold put in prison. Thereafter he went back to Constantinople. When Harold returned to Constantinople from Jerusalem he longed to return to the north to his native land. And when he heard that Magnus Olofsson, his brother's son, had become king both of Norway and Denmark, he gave up his command in the Greek service. And when the Empress Zoe heard of this she became angry and raised an accusation against Harold that he had misapplied the property of the Greek emperor which he had received in the campaigns in which he was commander of the army. There was a young and beautiful girl called Maria, a brother's daughter of the Empress Zoe, and Harold had paid his addresses to her, but the Empress had given him a refusal. The Varynx, who were then in pay in Constantinople, have told here in the north that there went a report among well-informed people that the Empress Zoe herself wanted Harold for her husband. And that she chiefly blamed Harold for his determination to leave Constantinople, although another reason was given out to the public. Constantinus Monomachus was at that time emperor of the Greeks and ruled along with Zoe. On this account the Greek emperor had Harold made prisoner and carried to prison. 14. King Olaf's Miracle and Blinding the Greek Emperor When Harold drew near to the prison King Olaf the saint stood before him and said he would assist him. On that spot of the street a chapel has since been built and consecrated to Saint Olaf and which chapel has stood there ever since. The prison was so constructed that there was a high tower open above, but a door below to go into it from the street. Through it Harold was thrust in, along with Halder and Ulf. Next night a lady of distinction with two servants came, by the help of ladders, to the top of the tower, let down a rope into the prison and hauled them up. Saint Olaf had formerly cured this lady of a sickness and he had appeared to her in a vision and told her to deliver his brother. Harold went immediately to the Veyrings, who all rose from their seats when he came in and received him with joy. The men armed themselves forthwith and went to where the emperor slept. They took the emperor prisoner and put out both the eyes of him. So says Thorin Skegjason in his poem. Of glowing gold that decks the hand. The king got plenty in this land. But its great emperor in the strife. Was made stone blind for all his life. So says Theodolf, the scald, also. He who the hungry wolf's wild yell. Quiets with prey, the stern, the fell. Midst the uproar of shriek and shout. Stun though Greek emperor's eyes both out. The Norse king's mark will not adorn. The Norse king's mark gives cause to mourn. His mark the eastern king must bear. Groping his sightless way in fear. In these two songs, and many others, it is told that Harold himself blinded the Greek emperor. And they would surely have named some duke, count, or other great man, if they had not known this to be the true account, and King Harold himself and other men who were with him spread the account. 15. Harold's Journey from Constantinople The same night King Harold and his men went to the house where Maria slept and carried her away by force. Then they went down to where the galleys of the Varings lay, took two of them and rode out into Shavit Sound. When they came to the place where the iron chain is drawn across the sound, Harold told his men to stretch out at their oars in both galleys, 
but the men who were not rowing to run all to the stern of the galley, each with his luggage in his hand. The galleys thus ran up and lay on the iron chain. As soon as they stood fast on it, and would advance no farther, Harold ordered all the men to run forward into the bow. Then the galley, in which Harold was, balanced forwards and swung down over the chain, but the other, which remained fast athwart the chain, split in two, by which many men were lost, but some were taken up out of the sound. Thus Harold escaped out of Constantinople and sailed thence into the Black Sea. But before he left the land he put the lady ashore and sent her back with a good escort to Constantinople and bade her tell her relation, the Empress Zoe, how little power she had over Harold. And how little the Empress could have hindered him from taking the lady. Harold then sailed northwards in the Elipalta and then all round the Eastern Empire. On this voyage Harold composed sixteen songs for amusement and all ending with the same words. This is one of them. Past Sicily's wide plains we flew. A dauntless, never wearied crew. Our Viking steed rushed through the sea. As Viking-like fast, fast sailed we. Never, I think, along this shore. Did Norsemen ever sail before? Yet to the Russian queen, I fear. My gold adorned, I am not dear. With this he meant Elisif, daughter of King Jerisleif in Novgorod. 16. Of King Harold. When Harold came to Novgorod King Jerisleif received him in the most friendly way and he remained there all winter, A.D. 1045. Then he took into his own keeping all the gold and the many kinds of precious things which he had sent there from Constantinople and which together made up so vast a treasure that no man in the northern lands ever saw the like of it in one man's possession. Harold had been three times in the Polutusvarf while he was in Constantinople. It is the custom, namely, there, that every time one of the Greek emperors dies, the Varings are allowed Polutusvarf. That is, they may go through all the emperor's palaces where his treasures are and each may take and keep what he can lay hold of while he is going through them. 17. King Harold's Marriage This winter King Jerisleif gave Harold his daughter Elizabeth in marriage. She is called by the Northman Elisif. This is related by Stuff the Blind, thus. Agder's chief now got the queen. Who long his secret love had been. Of gold, no doubt, a mighty store. The princess to her husband bore. In spring he began his journey from Novgorod and came to Aldijaborg, where he took shipping and sailed from the east in summer. He turned first to Svithjad and came to Sigtuna. So says Valgird O. Val. The fairest cargo ship e'er bore. From Russia's distant eastern shore. The gallant herald homeward brings. Gold, and a fame that scald still sings. The ship through dashing foam he steers. Through the sea rain to Svithjad veers. And at Sigtuna's grassy shores. His gallant vessel safely moors. 18. The League Between King Harold and Sven Ulfsson Harold found there before him Sven Ulfsson, who the autumn before, A.D. 1045, had fled from King Magnus at Helgains, and when they met they were very friendly on both sides. The Swedish king, Olaf the Swede, was brother of the mother of Elisif, Harold's wife, and Astrid, the mother of Sven, was King Olaf's sister. Harold and Sven entered into friendship with each other and confirmed it by oath. All the Swedes were friendly to Sven, because he belonged to the greatest family in the country, and thus all the Swedes were Harold's friends and helpers also, for many great men were connected with him by relationship. So says Theodolf. Cross the East Sea the vessel flew. Her oak keel a white furrow drew. From Russia's coast to Swedish land. Where Harold can great help command. The heavy vessel's leeward side was hid beneath the rushing tide, while the broad sail and gold-tipped mast swung to and fro in the hard blast. 19. King Harold's Foray Then Harold and Sven fitted out ships and gathered together a great force. And when the troops were ready they sailed from the east towards Denmark. So says Valgard. Brave Ingvi. To the land decreed. To thee by fate, with tempest speed. The winds fly with thee o'er the sea. 
to thy own Udal land with thee. As past the Scanlan plains they fly. The gay ships glances, twixt sea and sky. And Scanian brides look out, and fear. Some ill to those they hold most dear. They landed first in Sealand with their men and harried and burned in the land far and wide. Then they went to Fion, where they also landed and wasted. So says Valgard. Harold. Thou hast the isle laid waste. The Sealand men away hast chased. And the wild wolf by daylight roams. Through their deserted silent homes. Fiona too could not withstand. The fury of thy wasting hand. Helms burst, shields broke, Fiona's bounds. Were filled with death's terrific sounds. Red flashing in the southern sky. The clear flame sweeping broad and high. From fair Roskild's lofty towers. On lowly huts its fire rain pours. And shows the housemate's silent train. In terror scouring o'er the plain. Seeking the forest's deepest glen. To house with wolves, and, scape from men. Few were they of escape to tell. For, sorrow-worn, the people fell. The only captives formed the fray. Were lovely maidens led away. And in wild terror to the strand. Down to the ships, the linked band. Of fair-haired girls is roughly driven. Their soft skins by the irons riven. 20. King Magnus Levy King Magnus Olofsson sailed north to Norway in the autumn after the battle at Helgains, A.D. 1045. There he hears the news that Harald Sigurdsson, his relation, was come to Svithjad. And moreover that Sven Ulfsson and Harald had entered into a friendly bond with each other and gathered together a great force, intending first to subdue Denmark and then Norway. King Magnus then ordered a general levy over all Norway and he soon collected a great army. He hears then that Harald and Sven were come to Denmark and were burning and laying waste the land and that the country people were everywhere submitting to them. It was also told that King Harald was stronger and stouter than other men, and so wise withal that nothing was impossible to him, and he had always the victory when he fought a battle. And he was also so rich in gold that no man could compare with him in wealth. Fyodolf speaks thus of it. Norsemen, who stand the sword of foe. Like forest stems unmoved by blow. My hopes are fled, no peace is near. People fly here and there in fear. On either side of Sealand's coast. A fleet appears, a white-winged host. Magnus form Norway takes his course. Harold from Sweden leads his force. 21. Treaty between Harold and Magnus. Those of Harold's men who were in his council said that it would be a great misfortune if relations like Harold and Magnus should fight and throw a death spear against each other. And therefore many offered to attempt bringing about some agreement between them, and the kings, by their persuasion, agreed to it. Thereupon some men were sent off in a light boat, in which they sailed south in all haste to Denmark, and got some Danish men, who were proven friends of King Magnus, to propose this matter to Harold. This affair was conducted very secretly. Now when Harold heard that his relation, King Magnus, would offer him a league and partition, so that Harold should have half of Norway with King Magnus, and that they should divide all their movable property into two equal parts. He accepted the proposal, and the people went back to King Magnus with this answer. 22. Treaty between Harold and Sven Broken a little after this it happened that Harold and Sven one evening were sitting at table drinking and talking together, and Sven asked Harold what valuable piece of all his property he esteemed the most. He answered, it was his banner land waster. Sven asked what was there remarkable about it, that he valued it so highly. Harold replied, it was a common saying that he must gain the victory before whom that banner is born, and it had turned out so ever since he had owned it. Sven replies, I will begin to believe there is such virtue in the banner when thou hast held three battles with thy relation Magnus, and hast gained them all. Then answered Harold with an angry voice, I know my relationship to King Magnus, without thy reminding me of it, and although we are now going in arms against him, our meeting may be of a better sort. Sven changed color, and said, There are people, Harold, 
who say that thou hast done as much before as only to hold that part of an agreement which appears to suit thy own interest best. Harold answers, It becomes thee ill to say that I have not stood by an agreement, when I know what King Magnus could tell of thy proceedings with him. Thereupon each went his own way. At night, when Harold went to sleep within the bulwarks of his vessel, he said to his footboy, I will not sleep in my bed tonight, for I suspect there may be treachery abroad. I observed this evening that my friend Sven was very angry at my free discourse. Thou shalt keep watch, therefore, in case anything happen in the night. Harold then went away to sleep somewhere else, and laid a billet of wood in his place. At midnight a boat rowed alongside to the ship's bulwark, a man went on board, lifted up the cloth of the tent of the bulwarks, went up, and struck in Harold's bed with a great axe, so that it stood fast in the lump of wood. The man instantly ran back to his boat again, and rowed away in the dark night, for the moon was set, but the axe remained sticking in the piece of wood as an evidence. Thereupon Harold waked his men and let them know the treachery intended. We can now see sufficiently, said he, that we could never match Sven if he practices such deliberate treachery against us, so it will be best for us to get away from this place while we can. Let us cast loose our vessel and row away as quietly as possible. They did so, and rowed during the night northwards along the land, and then proceeded night and day until they came to King Magnus, where he lay with his army. Harold went to his relation Magnus, and there was a joyful meeting betwixt them. So says Theodolf. The far-known king the order gave. In silence o'er the swelling wave. With noiseless oars, his vessels gay. From Denmark west to row away. And Olaf's son, with justice rare. Offers with him the realm to share. People, no doubt, rejoiced to find. The kings had met in peaceful mind. Afterwards the two relatives conversed with each other and all was settled by peaceful agreement. 23. King Magnus gives Harold half of Norway. King Magnus lay at the shore and had set up tents upon the land. There he invited his relation, King Harold, to be his guest at table. And Harold went to the entertainment with sixty of his men and was feasted excellently. Towards the end of the day King Magnus went into the tent where Harold sat and with him went men carrying parcels consisting of clothes and arms. Then the king went to the man who sat lowest and gave him a good sword, to the next a shield, to the next a kirtle, and so on, clothes, or weapons, or gold. To all he gave one or the other valuable gift, and the more costly to the more distinguished men among them. Then he placed himself before his relation Harold, holding two sticks in his hand, and said, Which of these two sticks wilt thou have, my friend? Harold replies, The one nearest me. Then, said King Magnus, with this stick I give thee half of the Norwegian power, with all the scat and duties, and all the domains thereunto belonging, with the condition that everywhere thou shalt be as lawful king in Norway as I am myself. But when we are both together in one place, I shall be the first man in seat, service and salutation. And if there be three of us together of equal dignity, that I shall sit in the middle, and shall have the royal tent ground and the royal landing place. Thou shalt strengthen and advance our kingdom, in return for making thee that man in Norway whom we never expected any man should be so long as our head was above ground. Then Harold stood up, and thanked him for the high title and dignity. Thereupon they both sat down, and were very merry together. The same evening Harold and his men returned to their ships. 24. Harold gives Magnus the half of his treasures. The following morning King Magnus ordered the trumpets to sound to a general thing of the people, and when it was seated, he made known to the whole army the gift he had given to his relation Harold. Thorer of Stieg gave Harold the title of king there at the thing, and the same day King Harold invited King Magnus to table with him, and he went with sixty men to King Harold's land tent, where he had prepared a feast. The two kings sat together on a high seat, and the feast was splendid, everything went on with magnificence, and the kings were merry and glad. Towards the close of the day King Harold ordered many caskets to be brought into the tent, and in like manner people bore in weapons, clothes and other sorts of valuables. And all these King Harold divided among King Magnus' men who were at the feast. 
Then he had the caskets opened and said to King Magnus, Yesterday you gave us a large kingdom, which your hand won from your and our enemies, and took us in partnership with you, which was well done, and this has cost you much. Now we on our side have been in foreign parts, and oft in peril of life, to gather together the gold which you here see. Now, King Magnus, I will divide this with you. We shall both own this movable property, and each have his equal share of it, as each has his equal half share of Norway. I know that our dispositions are different, as thou art more liberal than I am. Therefore let us divide this property equally between us, so that each may have his share free to do with as he will. Then Harold had a large ox hide spread out, and turned the gold out of the caskets upon it. Then scales and weights were taken and the gold separated and divided by weight into equal parts, and all people wondered exceedingly that so much gold should have come together in one place in the northern countries. But it was understood that it was the Greek emperor's property and wealth, for, as all people say, there are whole houses there full of red gold. The kings were now very merry. Then there appeared an ingot among the rest as big as a man's hand. Harold took it in his hands and said, Where is the gold, friend Magnus, that thou canst show against this piece? King Magnus replied, So many disturbances and levies have been in the country that almost all the gold and silver I could lay up is gone. I have no more gold in my possession than this ring. And he took the ring off his hand and gave it to Harold. Harold looked at it and said, That is but little gold, friend, for the king who owns two kingdoms and yet some may doubt whether thou art rightful owner of even this ring. Then King Magnus replied, after a little reflection, If I be not rightful owner of this ring, then I know not what I have got right to, for my father, King Olaf the Saint, gave me this ring at our last parting. Then said King Harold, laughing, It is true, King Magnus, what thou sayest. Thy father gave thee this ring, but he took the ring from my father for some trifling cause. And in truth it was not a good time for small kings in Norway when thy father was in full power. King Harold gave Thor of Stieg at that feast a bowl of mountain birch, that was encircled with a silver ring and had a silver handle, both which parts were gilt, and the bowl was filled with money of pure silver. With that came also two gold rings, which together stood for a mark. He gave him also his cloak of dark purple lined with white skins within, and promised him besides his friendship and great dignity. Thorgil Snorrison, an intelligent man, says he has seen an altar cloth that was made of this cloak. And Gudrid, a daughter of Guthorm, the son of Thor of Stieg, said, according to Thorgil's account, that she had seen this bowl in her father Guthorm's possession. Balverk also tells of these matters. Thou, generous king, I have been told. For the green land hast given gold. And Magnus got a mighty treasure. That thou one half mightst rule at pleasure. The people gained a blessed peace. Which, twixt the kings did never cease. While Sven, disturbed with war's alarms. Had his folk always under arms. 25. Of King Magnus. The kings Magnus and Harold both ruled in Norway the winter after their agreement, A.D. 1047, and each had his court. In winter they went around the upland country in guest quarters. And sometimes they were both together, sometimes each was for himself. They went all the way north to Thrandjum, to the town of Nidaros. King Magnus had taken special care of the holy remains of King Olaf after he came to the country. Had the hair and nails clipped every twelve month, and kept himself the keys that opened the shrine. Many miracles were worked by King Olaf's holy remains. It was not long before there was a breach in the good understanding between the two kings, as many were so mischievous as to promote discord between them. 26. Of Sven Ulfsson Sven Ulfsson remained behind in the harbour after Harold had gone away, and inquired about his proceedings. When he heard at last of Magnus and Harold having agreed and joined their forces, he steered with his forces eastward along Scania, and remained there until towards winter. When he heard that King Magnus and King Harold had gone northwards to Norway. Then Sven, with his troops, came south to Denmark and took all the royal income that winter, A.D. 1047. 27. Of the Levy of the Two Kings. 
Toward spring, A.D. 1047, King Magnus and his relation, King Harald, ordered a levy in Norway. It happened once that the kings lay all night in the same harbour and next day, King Harald, being first ready, made sail. Towards evening he brought up in the harbour in which Magnus and his retinue had intended to pass the night. Harald laid his vessel in the royal ground, and there set up his tents. King Magnus got under sail later in the day and came into the harbour just as King Harald had done pitching his tents. They saw then that King Harald had taken up the king's ground and intended to lie there. After King Magnus had ordered the sails to be taken in, he said, The men will now get ready along both sides of the vessel to lay out their oars, and some will open the hatches and bring up the arms and arm themselves. For, if they will not make way for us, we will fight them. Now when King Harald sees that King Magnus will give him battle, he says to his men, Cut our land fastenings and back the ship out of the ground, for friend Magnus is in a passion. They did so and laid the vessel out of the ground and King Magnus laid his vessel in it. When they were now ready on both sides with their business, King Harald went with a few men on board of King Magnus' ship. King Magnus received him in a friendly way, and bade him welcome. King Harald answered, I thought we were come among friends, but just now I was in doubt if ye would have it so. But it is a truth that childhood is hasty, and I will only consider it as a childish freak. Then said King Magnus, It is no childish whim, but a trait of my family, that I never forget what I have given, or what I have not given. If this trifle had been settled against my will, there would soon have followed some other discord like it. In all particulars I will hold the agreement between us, but in the same way we will have all that belongs to us by that right. King Harold coolly replied, that it is an old custom for the wisest to give way, and return to his ship. From such circumstances it was found difficult to preserve good understanding between the kings. King Magnus' men said he was in the right. But others, less wise, thought there was some slight put upon Harold in the business. King Harold's men, besides, insisted that the agreement was only that King Magnus should have the preference of the harbour ground when they arrived together, but that King Harold was not bound to draw out of his place when he came first. They observed, also, that King Harold had conducted himself well and wisely in the matter. Those who viewed the business in the worst light insisted that King Magnus wanted to break the agreement, and that he had done King Harold injustice, and put an affront on him. Such disputes were talked over so long among foolish people, that the spirit of disagreeing affected the kings themselves. Many other things also occurred, in which the kings appeared determined to have each his own way. But of these little will be set down here. 28. King Magnus the Good's Death The kings, Magnus and Harold, sailed with their fleet south to Denmark, and when Sven heard of their approach, he fled away east to Scania. Magnus and Harold remained in Denmark late in summer, and subdued the whole country. In autumn they were in Jutland. One night, as King Magnus lay in his bed, it appeared to him in a dream that he was in the same place as his father, Saint Olaf, and that he spoke to him thus, Wilt thou choose, my son, to follow me, or to become a mighty king, and have long life? But to commit a crime which thou wilt never be able to expiate? He thought he made the answer, Do thou, father, choose for me. Then the king thought the answer was, Thou shalt follow me. King Magnus told his men this dream. Soon after he fell sick and lay at a place called Sudathorp. When he was near his death he sent his brother, Thor, with tokens to Sven Ulf's son, with the request to give Thor the aid he might require. In this message King Magnus also gave the Danish dominions to Sven after his death, and said it was just that Harald should rule over Norway and Sven over Denmark. Then King Magnus the Good died, A.D. 1047, and great was the sorrow of all the people at his death. So says O. D. Kikiniskald. The tears o'er good King Magnus beer. The people's tears were all sincere. Even they to whom he riches gave. Carried him heavily to the grave. All hearts were struck at the king's end. His house thralls wept as for a friend. His court men oft alone would muse as pondering o'er unthought of news. 29. King Magnus' Funeral 
After this event King Harold held a thing of his men-at-arms, and told them his intention to go with the army to Viberg thing, and make himself be proclaimed king over the whole Danish dominions, to which, he said. He had hereditary right after his relation Magnus, as well as to Norway. He therefore asked his men for their aid, and said he thought the Norway man should show himself always superior to the Dane. Then Einar Tamaskelfer replies that he considered it a greater duty to bring his foster son King Magnus' corpse to the grave, and lay it beside his father, King Olaf's, north in Thrandjum town. Then to be fighting abroad and taking another king's dominions and property. He ended his speech with saying that he would rather follow King Magnus dead than any other king alive. Thereupon he had the body adorned in the most careful way, so that most magnificent preparations were made in the king's ship. Then all the Thrandjum people and all the Northmen made themselves ready to return home with the king's body, and so the army was broken up. King Harald saw then that it was better for him to return to Norway to secure that kingdom first, and to assemble men anew, and so King Harald returned to Norway with all his army. As soon as he came to Norway he held a thing with the people of the country, and had himself proclaimed king everywhere. He proceeded thus from the east through Viking, and in every district in Norway he was named king. Einar Tamaskelfer, and with him all the Thrandjum troops, went with King Magnus' body and transported it to the town of Nidaros, where it was buried in St. Clement's Church, where also was the shrine of King Olaf the Saint. King Magnus was of middle size, of long and clear complexioned countenance, and light hair, spoke well and hastily, was brisk in his actions, and extremely generous. He was a great warrior, and remarkably bold in arms. He was the most popular of kings, prized even by enemies as well as friends. 30. Of Sven Ulfsson Sven Ulfsson remained at autumn in Scania, A.D. 1047, and was making ready to travel eastward to Sweden, with the intention of renouncing the title of king he had assumed in Denmark. But just as he was mounting his horse some men came riding to him with the first news that King Magnus was dead, and all the Northmen had left Denmark. Sven answered in haste, I call God to witness that I shall never again fly from the Danish dominions as long as I live. Then he got on his horse and rode south into Scania, where immediately many people crowded to him. That winter he brought under his power all the Danish dominions, and all the Danes took him for their king. Thorer, King Magnus' brother, came to Sven in autumn with the message of King Magnus, as before related, and was well received. And Thorer remained long with Sven and was well taken care of. 31. Of King Harald Sigurdsson King Harald Sigurdsson took the royal power over all Norway after the death of King Magnus Olofsson. And when he had reigned over Norway one winter and spring was come, A.D. 1048, he ordered a levy through all the land of one half of all men and ships and went south to Jutland. He harried and burned all summer wide around in the land and came into Godnerfjord, where King Harald made these verses. While wives of husbands fondly dream. Here let us anchor in the stream. In Godnerfjord. We'll safely moor. Our sea homes, and sleep quite secure. Then he spoke to Thyadolf, the skald, and asked him to add to it what it wanted, and he sang. In the next summer, I foresee. Our anchorage in the south will be. To hold our sea homes on the ground. More cold-tongued anchors will be found. To this Balverk alludes in his song also, that Harold went to Denmark the summer after King Magnus' death. Balverk sings thus. Next summer thou the levy raised. And seawards all the people gazed. Where thy sea steeds in sunshine glancing. Over the waves were gaily prancing. While the deep ships that plunder bore. Seemed black specks from the distant shore. The Danes, from banks or hillocks green, looked with dismay upon the scene. 32. Of Thorkel Geisa's Daughters Then they burned the house of Thorkel Geisa, who was a great lord, and his daughters they carried off bound to their ships. They had made a great mockery the winter before of King Harald's coming with warships against Denmark. And they cut their cheese into the shape of anchors, and said such anchors might hold all the ships of the Norway king. Then this was composed. 
The island girls, we were told. Made anchors all our fleet to hold. Their Danish jest cut out in cheese. Did not our stern king's fancy please. Now many a maiden fair, may be. Seas iron anchors splash the sea. Who will not wake a maid next morn? To laugh at Norway's ships in scorn. It is said that a spy who had seen the fleet of King Harald said to Thorkel Geis's daughters, Ye said, Geis's daughters, that King Harald dared not come to Denmark. Dada, Thorkel's daughter, replied, That was yesterday. Thorkel had to ransom his daughters with a great sum. So says Grain. The gold adorned girl's eye. Through horn's keg wood was never dry. As down towards the sandy shore. The men their lovely prizes bore. The Norway leader kept at bay. The foe who would contest the way. And Dada's father had to bring. Treasure to satisfy the king. King Harald plundered in Denmark all that summer, and made immense booty. But he had not any footing in the land that summer in Denmark. He went to Norway again in autumn and remained there all winter, A.D. 1049. 33. Marriages and Children of Harald Hardrade The winter after King Magnus the Good died, King Harald took Thora, daughter of Thorberg Arneson, and they had two sons, the oldest called Magnus, and the other Olaf. King Harald and Queen Elisif had two daughters. The one Maria, the other Ingigerd. The spring after the foray which has just been related King Harald ordered the people out and went with them to Denmark, A.D. 1049, and harried there, and did so summer after summer thereafter. So says Stuff, the Skald. Falster lay waste, as people tell. The raven in other isles fared well. The Danes were everywhere in fear. For the dread foray every year. 34. Of the armaments of Sven Ulfsson and Harald. King Sven ruled over all the Danish dominions after King Magnus' death. He sat quiet all the winter. But in summer he lay out in his ships with all his people and it was said he would go north to Norway with the Danish army and make not less havoc there than King Harald had made in Denmark. King Sven proposed to King Harald in winter, A.D. 1049, to meet him the following summer at the Gott River and fight until in the battlefield their differences were ended, or they were settled peacefully. They made ready on both sides all winter with their ships, and called out in summer one half of all the fighting men. The same summer came Thorlike the Fair out of Iceland, and composed a poem about King Sven Ulfsson. He heard, when he arrived in Norway, that King Harald had sailed south to the Gott River against King Sven. Then Thorlike sang this. The wily Sven, I think, will meet. These inland Norsemen fleet to fleet. The arrow storm, and heaving sea. His vantage fight and field will be. God only knows the end of strife. Or which shall have his land and life. This strife must come to such an end. For terms will never bind King Sven. He also sang these verses. Harold, whose red shield oft has shone. O'er harried coasts, and fields hard won. Rides in hot wrath, and eager speeds. O'er the blue waves his ocean steeds. Sven, who in blood his arrows stains. Brings o'er the ocean's heaving plains. His gold-beaked ships, which come in view. Out from the sound with many a hue. King Harold came with his forces to the appointed meeting place. But there he heard that King Sven was lying with his fleet at the south side of Sealand. Then King Harald divided his forces, let the greater part of the bond troops return home. And took with him his court men, his lender men, the best men at arms, and all the bond troops who lived nearest to the Danish land. They sailed over to Jutland to the south of Vendelskage, and so south to Thyada. And over all they carried fire and sword. So says Stuff, the Skald. In haste the men of thy land fly. From the great monarch's threatening eye. At the stern herald's angry look. The boldest hearts in Denmark shook. They went forward all the way south to Hydeby, took the merchant town and burnt it. Then one of Harold's men made the following verses. All Hydeby is burned down. 
strangers will ask where stood the town. In our wild humor up it blazed. And Sven looks round him all amazed. All Hydeby is burned down. From a far corner of the town. I saw, before the peep of morning. Roofs, walls, and all in flame high burning. To this also Thorlike alludes in his verses, when he heard there had been no battle at the Got River. The stranger warrior may inquire. Of Harold's men, why in his ire? On high to be his wrath he turns. And the fair town to ashes burns. Would that the day had never come. When Harold's ships returned home. From the East Sea, since now the town. Without his gain, is burned down. 35. Harold's escape into the Jutland Sea. Then King Harold sailed north and had sixty ships and the most of them large and heavily laden with the booty taken in summer. And as they sailed north past Thyatta King Sven came down from the land with a great force and he challenged King Harold to land and fight. King Harold had little more than half the force of King Sven and therefore he challenged Sven to fight at sea. So says Thorlike the fair. Sven, who of all men under heaven has had the luckiest birth hour given. Invites his foemen to the field. There to contest with blood-stained shield. The king, impatient of delay. Harold, will with his seahawks stay. On board will fight, and fate decide. If Sven shall by his land abide. After that King Harold sailed north along Vendelskage. And the wind then came against them, and they brought up under Hleasy, where they lay all night. A thick fog lay upon the sea, and when the morning came and the sun rose they saw upon the other side of the sea as if many lights were burning. This was told to King Harold. And he looked at it, and said immediately, Strike the tilts down on the ships and take to the oars. The Danish forces are coming upon us, and the fog there where they are must have cleared off, and the sun shines upon the dragon heads of their ships, which are gilded, and that is what we see. It was so as he had said. Sven had come there with a prodigious armed force. They rowed now on both sides all they could. The Danish ships flew lighter before the oars. For the Northmen's ships were both soaked with water and heavily laden, so that the Danes approached nearer and nearer. Then Harold, whose own dragon ship was the last of the fleet, saw that he could not get away. So he ordered his men to throw overboard some wood, and lay upon it clothes and other good and valuable articles and it was so perfectly calm that these drove about with the tide. Now when the Danes saw their own goods driving about on the sea, they who were in advance turned about to save them, for they thought it was easier to take what was floating freely about, than to go on board the Northmen to take it. They dropped rowing and lost ground. Now when King Sven came up to them with his ship, he urged them on, saying it would be a great shame if they, with so great a force, could not overtake and master so small a number. The Danes then began again to stretch out lustily at their oars. When King Harold saw that the Danish ships went faster he ordered his men to lighten their ships, and cast overboard malt, wheat, bacon, and to let their liquor run out, which helped a little. Then Harold ordered the bulwark screens, the empty casks and puncheons and the prisoners to be thrown overboard, and when all these were driving about on the sea, Sven ordered help to be given to save the men. This was done. But so much time was lost that they separated from each other. The Danes turned back and the Northmen proceeded on their way. So says Thorlike the Fair. Sven drove his foes from Jutland's coast. The Norsemen's ships would have been lost. But Harold all his vessels saves. Throwing his booty on the waves. The Jutlanders saw, as he threw. Their own goods floating in their view. His lightened ships fly o'er the main. While they pick up their own again. King Sven returned southwards with his ships to Hleasy, where he found seven ships of the Northmen, with bonds, and men of the levy. When King Sven came to them they begged for mercy, and offered ransom for themselves. So says Thorlike the Fair. The stern king's men good offers make. If Sven will ransom for them take. Too few to fight, they boldly say. Unequal force makes them give way. The hasty bonds for a word. 
would have beta ken them to the sword. And have prolonged the bloody strife. Such men can give no price for life. 36. Of Harold. King Harold was a great man, who ruled his kingdom well in home concerns. Very prudent was he, of good understanding, and it is the universal opinion that no chief ever was in northern lands of such deep judgment and ready counsel as Harold. He was a great warrior, bold in arms. Strong and expert in the use of his weapons beyond any others, as has been before related, although many of the feats of his manhood are not here written down. This is owing partly to our uncertainty about them, partly to our wish not to put stories into this book for which there is no testimony. Although we have heard, many things talked about, and even circumstantially related, yet we think it better that something may be added to, than that it should be necessary to take something away from our narrative. A great part of his history is put in verse by Iceland men, which poems they presented to him or his sons, and for which reason he was their great friend. He was, indeed, a great friend to all the people of that country. And once, when a very dear time set in, he allowed four ships to transport meal to Iceland, and fixed that the shippen should not be dearer than one hundred ells of Wadmau. He permitted also all poor people, who could find provisions to keep them on the voyage across the sea, to emigrate from Iceland to Norway, and from that time there was better subsistence in the country, and the seasons also turned out better. King Harold also sent from Norway a bell for the church of which Olaf the saint had sent the timbers to Iceland, and which was erected on the thing plain. Such remembrances of King Harold are found here in the country, besides many great gifts which he presented to those who visited him. 37 of Halder Snorrison. Halder Snorrison and Ulfa Spaxen, as before related, came to Norway with King Harold. They were, in many respects, of different dispositions. Halder was very stout and strong, and remarkably handsome in appearance. King Harold gave him this testimony, that he, among all his men, cared least about doubtful circumstances, whether they betokened danger or pleasure. For, whatever turned up, he was never in higher nor in lower spirits, never slept less nor more on account of them, nor ate or drank but according to his custom. Hulda was not a man of many words, but short in conversation, told his opinion bluntly and was obstinate and hard, and this could not please the king, who had many clever people about him zealous in his service. Hulda remained a short time with the king, and then came to Iceland, where he took up his abode in Jarderholt and dwelt in that farm to a very advanced age. 38. Of Ulfa Spaxen. Ulfa Spaxen stood in great esteem with King Harold. For he was a man of great understanding, clever in conversation, active and brave, and withal true and sincere. King Harold made Ulf his marshal, and married him to Joran, Thorberg's daughter, a sister of Harold's wife, Thora. Ulf and Joran's children were Joan the Strong of Rasval, and Brigida, mother of Saudolf, who was father of Peter Burdars Ven, father of Ulf Fly and Sigrid. Joan the Strong's son was Erland Himald, father of Archbishop Eistian and his brothers. King Harold gave Ulf the marshal the rights of a lenderman and a fief of twelve marks income, besides a half-district in the Throngem land. Of this Stein Herdeisen speaks in his song about Ulf. 39. Of the building of churches and houses. King Magnus Olofsson built Olaf's church in the town, Nidaros, on the spot where Olaf's body was set down for the night, and which, at that time, was above the town. He also had the king's house built there. The church was not quite finished when the king died, but King Harold had what was wanting completed. There, beside the house, he began to construct a stone hall, but it was not finished when he died. King Harold had the church called Mary Church built from the foundations up, at the sandhill close to the spot where the king's holy remains were concealed in the earth the first winter after his fall. It was a large temple, and so strongly built with lime that it was difficult to break it when the Archbishop Eistian had it pulled down. Olaf's holy remains were kept in Olaf's church while Mary Church was building. King Harold had the king's house erected below Mary Kirk, at the side of the river, where it now is, and he had the house in which he had made the great hall consecrated and called Gregorius Church. 40. Beginning of Hakon Ivarsson's Story There was a man called Ivar the White, 
who was a brave lenderman dwelling in the uplands, and was a daughter's son of Earl Hakon the Great. Ivar was the handsomest man that could be seen. Ivar's son was called Hakon. And of him it was said that he was distinguished above all men then in Norway for beauty, strength and perfection of figure. In his very youth he had been sent out on war expeditions, where he acquired great honour and consideration, and became afterwards one of the most celebrated men. 41. Of Einar Tambaskelfer Einar Tambaskelfer was the most powerful lenderman in the Thrandjum land. There was but little friendship between him and King Harald, although Einar retained all the fiefs he had held while Magnus the Good lived. Einar had many large estates, and was married to Bergliot, a daughter of Earl Hakon, as related above. Their son Eindride was grown up, and married to Sigrid, a daughter of Kettle Calf and Gunhild, King Harald's sister's daughter. Eindride had inherited the beauty of his mother's father, Earl Hakon, and his sons, and in size and strength he took after his father, Einar, and also in all bodily perfections by which Einar had been distinguished above other men. He was, also, as well as his father, the most popular of men, which the sagas, indeed, show sufficiently. 42. Of Earl Orm. Orm was at that time Earl in the Uplands. His mother was Ragenhild, a daughter of Earl Hakon the Great, and Orm was a remarkably clever man. A slack Erlingson was then in Judder at Seoul, and was married to Sigrid, a daughter of Earl Sven Hakonson. Gunhild, Earl Sven's other daughter, was married to the Danish king, Sven Ulfsson. These were the descendants of Earl Hakon at that time in Norway, besides many other distinguished people. And the whole race was remarkable for their very beautiful appearance, and the most of them were gifted with great bodily perfection, and were all distinguished and important men. 43. Harold's Pride King Harold was very proud, and his pride increased after he was established in the country, and it came so far that at last it was not good to speak against him, or to propose anything different from what he desired. So says Theodolf, the skald. In arms, tis right the common man. Should follow orders, one by one. Should stoop or rise, or run or stand. As his war leader may command. But now to the king who feeds the ravens. The people bend like heartless cravens. Nothing is left them, but consent. To what the king calls his intent. 44. Of the quarrel of King Harold and Einar Tambaskelfer. Einar Tambaskelfer was the principal man among the bonds all about Thrandjum, and answered for them at the things even against the king's men. Einar knew well the law, and did not want boldness to bring forward his opinion at things, even if the king was present, and all the bonds stood by him. The king was very angry at this, and it came so far that they disputed eagerly against each other. Einar said that the bonds would not put up with any unlawful proceedings from him if he broke through the law of the land. And this occurred several times between them. Einar then began to keep people about him at home, and he had many more when he came into the town if the king was there. It once happened that Einar came to the town with a great many men and ships. He had with him eight or nine great warships and nearly five hundred men. When he came to the town he went up from the strand with his attendants. King Harold was then in his house, standing out in the gallery of the loft. And when he saw Einar's people going on shore, it is said Harold composed these verses. I see great Tambaskelfer go. With mighty pomp, and pride, and show. Across the ebb shore up the land. Before, behind, an armed band. This bond leader thinks to rule. And fill himself the royal stool. A goodly earl I have known. With fewer followers of his own. He who strikes fire from the shield. Einar, may some day make us yield. Unless our axe edge quickly ends. With sudden kiss, what he intends. Einar remained several days in the town. 45. The Fall of Einar and Eindride One day there was a meeting held in the town, at which the king himself was present. A thief had been taken in the town, and he was brought before the thing. The man had before been in the service of Einar, who had been very well satisfied with him. This was told to Einar, 
and he well knew the king would not let the man off, and more because he took an interest in the matter. Einar, therefore, let his men get under arms, went to the thing, and took the man by force. The friends on both sides then came between and endeavored to effect a reconciliation, and they succeeded so far that a meeting place was appointed, to which both should come. There was a thing room in the king's house at the river Nid, and the king went into it with a few men, while the most of his people were out in the yard. The king ordered the shutters of the loft opening to be turned, so that there was but a little space left clear. When Einar came into the yard with his people, he told his son Eindride to remain outside with the men, for there is no danger here for me. Eindride remained standing outside at the room door. When Einar came into the thing room, he said, It is dark in the king's thing room. At that moment some men ran against him and assaulted him, some with spears, some with swords. When Eindride heard this he drew his sword and rushed into the room. But he was instantly killed along with his father. The king's men then ran up and placed themselves before the door, and the bonds lost courage, having no leader. They urged each other on, indeed, and said it was a shame they should not avenge their chief, but it came to nothing with their attack. The king went out to his men, arrayed them in battle order, and set up his standard, but the bonds did not venture to assault. Then the king went with all his men on board of his ships, rode down the river, and then took his way out of the fjord. When Einar's wife Bergliot, who was in the house which Einar had possessed in the town, heard of Einar's fall, she went immediately to the king's house where the bonds' army was and urged them to the attack. But at the same moment the king was rowing out of the river. Then said Bergliot, Now we want here my relation, Hakan Ivar's son, Einar's murderer would not be rowing out of the river if Ivar stood here on the riverbank. Then Bergliot adorned Einar's and Eindride's corpses and buried them in Olaf's church, beside King Magnus Olafsson's burial place. After Einar's murder the king was so much disliked for that deed that there was nothing that prevented the lendermen and bonds from attacking the king, and giving him battle, but the want of some leader to raise the banner in the bond army. 46. Of King Harold and Finn Arneson Finn Arneson dwelt at Ostrad in Erger, and was King Harold's lenderman there. Finn was married to Bergliot, a daughter of Halfden, who was a son of Sigurd Seer, and brother of Olaf the Saint and of King Harold. Thora, King Harold's wife, was Finn Arneson's brother's daughter, and Finn and all his brothers were the king's dearest friends. Finn Arneson had been for some summers on a Viking cruise in the West Sea. And Finn, Guthorm Gunhildsen and Hakan Ivarsson had all been together on that cruise. King Harold now proceeded out of Thrandjum Fjord to Ostrat, where he was well received. Afterwards the king and Finn conversed with each other about this new event of Einar's and his son's death, and of the murmuring and threatening which the bonds made against the king. Finn took up the conversation briskly, and said, Thou art managing ill in two ways, first, in doing all manner of mischief, and next, in being so afraid that thou knowest not what to do. The king replied, laughing, I will send thee, friend, into the town to bring about a reconciliation with the bonds. And if that will not do, thou must go to the uplands and bring matters to such an understanding with Hakan Ivar's son that he shall not be my opponent. Finn replies, And how wilt thou reward me if I undertake this dangerous errand? For both the people of Thrandjum and the people of Upland are so great enemies to thee that it would not be safe for any of thy messengers to come among them, unless he were one who would be spared for his own sake. The king replies, Go thou on this embassy, for I know thou wilt succeed in it if any man can, and bring about a reconciliation, and then choose whatever favour from us thou wilt. Finn says, Hold thou thy word, king, and I will choose my petition. I will desire to have peace and safe residence in the country for my brother Calf, and all his estates restored, and also that he receive all the dignity and power he had when he left the country. The king assented to all that Finn laid down, and it was confirmed by witnesses and shake of hand. Then said Finn, What shall I offer Hakon, who rules most among his relations in the land, to induce him to agree to a treaty in reconciliation with thee? The king replies, Thou shalt first hear what Hakon on his part requires for making an agreement, then promote my interest as thou art best able, and deny him nothing in the end short of the kingdom. 
Then King Harold proceeded southwards to Moor, and drew together men in considerable numbers. 47. Of Finn Arneson's Journey Finn Arneson proceeded to the town and had with him his house servants, nearly eighty men. When he came into the town he held a thing with the town's people. Finn spoke long and ably at the thing, and told the town's people, and bonds, above all things not to have a hatred against their king, or to drive him away. He reminded them of how much evil they had suffered by acting thus against King Olaf the Saint, and added, that the king was willing to pay penalty for this murder, according to the judgment of understanding in good men. The effect of Finn's speech was that the bonds promised to wait quietly until the messengers came back whom Bergliot had sent to the uplands to her relative, Hakan Ivar's son. Finn then went out to Orcadal with the men who had accompanied him to the town. From thence he went up to Doverfield, and eastwards over the mountains. He went first to his son-in-law, Earl Orm, who was married to Sigrid, Finn's daughter, and told him his business. 48. Of Finn and Hakan Ivarsson Then Finn and Earl Orm appointed a meeting with Hakan Ivarsson. And when they met Finn explained his errand to Hakan, and the offer which King Harold made him. It was soon seen, from Hakan's speech, that he considered it to be his great duty to avenge the death of his relative, Eindride. And added, that word was come to him from Thrandjum, from which he might expect help in making head against the king. Then Finn represented to Hakan how much better it would be for him to accept of as high a dignity from the king as he himself could desire, rather than to attempt raising a strife against the king to whom he was owing service and duty. He said if he came out of the conflict without victory, he forfeited life and property, and even if thou hast the victory, thou wilt still be called a traitor to thy sovereign. Earl Orm also supported Finn's speech. After Hakan had reflected upon this he disclosed what lay on his mind, and said, I will be reconciled with King Harold if he will give me in marriage his relation Ragenhild, King Magnus Olofsson's daughter. With such dower as is suitable to her and she will be content with. Finn said he would agree to this on the king's part, and thus it was settled among them. Finn then returned to Thrandjum, and the disturbance and enmity was quashed, so that the king could retain his kingdom in peace at home. And the league was broken which Eindride's relations had made among themselves for opposing King Harold. 49. Of the Courtship of Hakan Ivarsson When the day arrived for the meeting at which this agreement with Harold should be finally concluded, Hakan went to King Harold, and in their conference the king said that he, for his part, would adhere to all that was settled in their agreement. Thou Hakan, says he, must thyself settle that which concerns Ragenhild, as to her accepting thee in marriage. For it would not be advisable for thee, or for any one, to marry Ragenhild without her consent. Then Hakan went to Ragenhild, and paid his addresses to her. She answered him thus, I have often to feel that my father, King Magnus, is dead and gone from me, since I must marry a bond. Although I acknowledge thou art a handsome man, expert in all exercises. But if King Magnus had lived he would not have married me to any man less than a king, so it is not to be expected that I will take a man who has no dignity or title. Then Hakan went to King Harold and told him his conversation with Ragenhild, and also repeated the agreement which was made between him and Finn, who was with him. Together with many others of the persons who had been present at the conversation between him and Finn. Hakan takes them all to witness that such was the agreement that the king should give Ragenhild the dower she might desire. And now since she will have no man who has not a high dignity, thou must give me such a title of honour. And, according to the opinion of the people, I am of birth, family and other qualifications to be called Earl. The king replies, when my brother, King Olaf, and his son, King Magnus, ruled the kingdom, they allowed only one Earl at a time to be in the country, and I have done the same since I came to the kingly title. And I will not take away from Orm the title of honour I had before given him. Hakan saw now that his business had not advanced, and was very ill-pleased, and Finn was outrageously angry. They said the king had broken his word. And thus they all separated. 50. Hakan's Journey to Denmark Hakan then went out of the country with a well-manned ship. When he came to Denmark he went immediately to his relative, King Sven, who received him honorably and gave him great fiefs. 
Hakon became King Sven's commander of the coast defense against the Vikings, the Vinland people, Kurland people, and others from the east countries, who infested the Danish dominions, and he lay out with his ships of war both winter and summer. 51. Murder of Asmund There was a man called Asmund, who is said to have been King Sven's sister's son, and his foster son. This Asmund was distinguished among all by his boldness and was much disliked by the king. When Asmund came to years, and to age of discretion, he became an ungovernable person given to murder and manslaughter. The king was ill-pleased at this, and sent him away, giving him a good fief, which might keep him and his followers well. As soon as Asmund had got this property from the king he drew together a large troop of people, and as the estate he had got from the king was not sufficient for his expenses he took as his own much more which belonged to the king. When the king heard this he summoned Asmund to him, and when they met the king said that Asmund should remain with the court without keeping any retinue of his own, and this took place as the king desired. But when Asmund had been a little time in the king's court he grew weary of being there, and escaped in the night, returned to his former companions and did more mischief than ever. Now when the king was riding through the country he came to the neighborhood where Asmund was, and he sent out men-at-arms to seize him. The king then had him laid in irons, and kept him so for some time in hope he would reform. But no sooner did Asmund get rid of his chains than he absconded again, gathered together people and men-at-arms and betook himself to plunder, both abroad and at home. Thus he made great forays, killing and plundering all around. When the people who suffered under these disturbances came to the king and complained to him of their losses, he replied, Why do ye tell me of this? Why don't you go to Hakan Ivar's son, who is my officer for the land defense, placed on purpose to keep the peace for you peasants, and to hold the Vikings in check? I was told that Hakan was a gallant and brave man, but I think he is rather shy when any danger of life is in the way. These words of the king were brought to Hakan, with many additions. Then Hakon went with his men in search of Asmund, and when their ships met Hakon gave battle immediately, and the conflict was sharp, and many men were killed. Hakon boarded Asmund's ship and cut down the men before his feet. At last he and Asmund met and exchanged blows until Asmund fell. Hakon cut off his head, went in all haste to King Sven and found him just sitting down to the dinner table. Hakon presented himself before the table, laid Asmund's head upon the table before the king, and asked if he knew it. The king made no reply, but became as red as blood in the face. Soon after the king sent him a message, ordering him to leave his service immediately. Tell him I will do him no harm, but I cannot keep watch over all our relations. 1. End notes. 1. This incident shows how strong, in those ages, was the tie of relationship, and the point of honor of avenging its injuries, the clanship spirit. L. 52. Hakon Ivarsson's marriage. Hakon then left Denmark, and came north to his estates in Norway. His relation Earl Orm was dead. Hakon's relations and friends were glad to see Hakon, and many gallant men gave themselves much trouble to bring about a reconciliation between King Harold and Hakon. It was at last settled in this way, that Hakon got Ragenhild, the king's daughter, and that King Harold gave Hakon the earldom, with the same power Earl Orm had possessed. Hakon swore to King Harold an oath of fidelity to all the services he was liable to fulfill. 53. Reconciliation of King Harold and Kalf. Kaf Arneson had been on a Viking cruise to the western countries ever since he had left Norway. But in winter he was often in the Orkney Islands with his relative, Earl Thorfinn. Finn Arneson sent a message to his brother Calf, and told him the agreement which he had made with King Harold, that Calf should enjoy safety in Norway, and his estates, and all the fiefs he had held from King Magnus. When this message came to Calf he immediately got ready for his voyage, and went east to Norway to his brother Finn. Then Finn obtained the king's peace for Calf, and when Calf and the king met they went into the agreement which Finn and the king had settled upon before. Calf bound himself to the king in the same way as he had bound himself to serve King Magnus, according to which Calf should do all that the king desired and considered of advantage to his realm. Thereupon Calf received all the estates and fiefs he had before. 54. 
Fall of Kalf Arneson. The summer following, AD 1050, King Harold ordered out a levy, and went to Denmark, where he plundered during the summer. But when he came south to Fion he found a great force assembled against him. Then the king prepared to land his men from the ships and to engage in a land fight. He drew up his men on board in order of battle. Set Calf Arneson at the head of one division, ordered him to make the first attack, and told him where they should direct their assault, promising that he would soon make a landing with the others, and come to their assistance. When Calf came to the land with his men a force came down immediately to oppose them, and Calf without delay engaged in battle, which, however, did not last long. For Calf was immediately overpowered by numbers, and betook himself to flight with his men. The Danes pursued them vigorously, and many of the Northmen fell, and among them Calf Arneson. Now King Harold landed with his array. And they soon came on their way to the field of battle, where they found Calf's body, and bore it down to the ships. But the king penetrated into the country, killing many people and destroying much. So says Arner. His shining sword with blood he stains. Upon Fiona's grassy plains. And in the midst of fire and smoke. The king Fiona's forces broke. 55. Finn Arneson's expedition out of the country. After this Finn Arneson thought he had caused to be an enemy of the king upon account of his brother Calf's death. And said the king had betrayed Calf to his fall, and had also deceived him by making him entice his brother Calf to come over from the west and trust to King Harold's faith. When these speeches came out among people, many said that it was very foolish in Finn to have ever supposed that Calf could obtain the king's sincere friendship and favor. For they thought the king was the man to seek revenge for smaller offenses than Calf had committed against the king. The king let every one say what he chose, and he himself neither said yes or no about the affair. But people perceived that the king was very well pleased with what had happened. King Harold once made these verses. I have, in all, the deathstroke given. To foes of mine at least eleven. Two more, perhaps, if I remember. May yet be added to this number. I prize myself upon these deeds. My people such examples needs. Bright gold itself they would despise. Or healing leak herb under prize. If not still brought before their eyes. Finn Arneson took the business so much to heart that he left the country and went to Denmark to King Sven, where he met a friendly reception. They spoke together in private for a long time. And the end of the business was that Finn went into King Sven's service, and became his man. King Sven then gave Finn an earldom, and placed him in Halland, where he was long earl and defended the country against the Northmen. 56. Of Guthorm Gunhildsen. Kettle Calf and Gunhild of Ringanes had a son called Guthorm, and he was a sister's son to King Olaf and Harald Sigurdsson. Guthorm was a gallant man, early advanced to manhood. He was often with King Harald, who loved him much, and asked his advice, for he was of good understanding, and very popular. Guthorm had also been engaged early in forays, and had marauded much in the western countries with a large force. Ireland was for him a land of peace, and he had his winter quarters often in Dublin, and was in great friendship with King Margit. 57. Guthorm's Junction with the Irish King Margit The summer after King Margit, and Guthorm with him, went out on an expedition against Bretland, where they made immense booty. But when the king saw the quantity of silver which was gathered he wanted to have the whole booty, and regarded little his friendship for Guthorm. Guthorm was ill-pleased that he and his men should be robbed of their share. But the king said, Thou must choose one of two things, either to be content with what we determine, or to fight, and they shall have the booty who gain the victory, and likewise thou must give up thy ships, for them I will have. Guthorm thought there were great difficulties on both sides, for it was disgraceful to give up ships and goods without a stroke, and yet it was highly dangerous to fight the king and his force, the king having sixteen ships and Guthorm only five. Then Guthorm desired three days' time to consider the matter with his people, thinking in that time to pacify the king, and come to a better understanding with him through the mediation of others. But he could not obtain from the king what he desired. This was the day before St. Olaf's Day. 
Guthorm chose the condition that they would rather die or conquer like men, than suffer disgrace, contempt and scorn, by submitting to so great a loss. He called upon God, and his uncle Saint Olaf, and entreated their help and aid, promising to give to the holy man's house the tenth of all the booty that fell to their share, if they gained the victory. Then he arranged his men, placed them in battle order against the great force, prepared for battle, and gave the assault. By the help of God, and the holy Saint Olaf, Guthorm won the battle. King Margit fell, and every man, old and young, who followed him, and after that great victor, Guthorm and all his people returned home joyfully with all the booty they had gained by the battle. Every tenth penny of the booty they had made was taken, according to the vow, to King Olaf the saint's shrine. And there was so much silver that Guthorm had an image made of it, with rays round the head, which was the size of his own, or of his folksalman's head, and the image was seven feet high. The image thus produced was given by Guthorm to King Olaf of the Saint's Temple, where it has since remained as a memorial of Guthorm's victory and King Olaf the Saint's miracle. 58. Miracle of King Olaf in Denmark There was a wicked, evil-minded count in Denmark who had a Norwegian servant girl whose family belonged to Thrandjum district. She worshipped King Olaf the Saint, and believed firmly in his sanctity. But the above-mentioned count doubted all that was told of the holy man's miracles, insisted that it was nothing but nonsense and idle talk, and made a joke and scorn of the esteem and honor which all the country people showed the good king. Now when his holy day came, on which the mild monarch ended his life, and which all Northmen kept sacred, this unreasonable count would not observe it, but ordered his servant girl to bake and put fire in the oven that day. She knew well the count's mad passion, and that he would revenge himself severely on her if she refused doing as he ordered. She went, therefore, of necessity, and baked in the oven, but wept much at her work. And she threatened King Olaf that she never would believe in him, if he did not avenge this misdeed by some mischance or other. And now shall ye come to hear a well-deserved vengeance, and a true miracle. It happened, namely, in the same hour that the Count became blind of both eyes, and the bread which she had shoved into the oven was turned into stone. Of these stones some are now in St. Olaf's temple, and in other places. And since that time Olafsmas has been always held holy in Denmark. 59. King Olaf's Miracle on a Cripple West in Valland, a man had such bad health that he became a cripple, and went on his knees and elbows. One day he was upon the road, and had fallen asleep. He dreamt that a gallant man came up to him and asked him where he was going. When he named the neighboring town, the man said to him, Go to St. Olaf's church that stands in London, and there thou shalt be cured. Thereupon he awoke, and went straightway to inquire the road to Olaf's church in London. At last he came to London Bridge, and asked the men of the castle if they could tell him where Olaf's church was, but they replied, there were so many churches that they could not tell to whom each of them was consecrated. Soon after a man came up and asked him where he wanted to go, and he answered to Olaf's church. Then said the man, We shall both go together to Olaf's church, for I know the way to it. Thereupon they went over the bridge to the shrine where Olaf's church was. And when they came to the gates of the churchyard the man mounted over the half-door that was in the gate, but the cripple rolled himself in, and rose up immediately sound and strong, when he looked about him his conductor had vanished. 60. King Harald's Foray in Denmark King Harald had built a merchant town in the east at Oslo, where he often resided, for there was good supply from the extensive cultivated district wide around. There also he had a convenient station to defend the country against the Danes, or to make an attack upon Denmark, which he was in the custom of doing often, although he kept no great force on foot. One summer King Harald went from thence with a few light ships and a few men. He steered southwards out from Viken, and, when the wind served, stood over to Jutland, and marauded, but the country people collected and defended the country. Then King Harald steered to Lymphjord, and went into the fjord. Lymphjord is so formed that its entrance is like a narrow river, but when one gets farther into the fjord it spreads out into a wide sea. King Harald marauded on both sides of the land. And when the Danes gathered together on every side to oppose him, 
he lay at a small island which was uncultivated. They wanted drink on board his ships, and went up into the island to seek water, but finding none, they reported it to the king. He ordered them to look for some long earthworms on the island, and when they found one they brought it to the king. He ordered the people to bring the worm to a fire, and bake it before it, so that it should be thirsty. Then he ordered a thread to be tied round the tail of the worm, and to let it loose. The worm crept away immediately, while thread wound off from the clue as the worm took it away. And the people followed the worm until it sought downwards in the earth. There the king ordered them to dig for water, which they did, and found so much water that they had no want of it. King Harold now heard from his spies that King Sven was come with a large armament to the mouth of the fjord, but that it was too late for him to come into it, as only one ship at a time can come in. King Harold then steered with his fleet in through the fjord to where it was broadest to a place called Lusbraid. In the inmost bight, there is but a narrow neck of land dividing the fjord from the West Sea. Thither King Harold rode with his men towards evening, and at night when it was dark he unloaded his ships, drew them over the neck of land into the West Sea, loaded them again, and was ready with all this before day. He then steered northwards along the Jutland coast. People then said that Harold had escaped from the hands of the Danes. Harold said that he would come to Denmark next time with more people and larger vessels. King Harold then proceeded north to Thrandjum. 61. King Harold had a ship built. King Harold remained all winter at Nidaros, AD 1062, and had a vessel built out upon the strand, and it was a bus. The ship was built of the same size as the Long Serpent, and every part of her was finished with the greatest care. On the stem was a dragon head, and on the stern a dragon tail, and the sides of the bows of the ship were gilt. The vessel was of thirty-five rowers' benches, and was large for that size, and was remarkably handsome, for the king had everything belonging to the ship's equipment of the best, both sails and rigging, anchors and cables. King Harold sent a message in winter south to Denmark to King Sven, that he should come northwards in spring. That they should meet at the Gott River and fight, and so settle the division of the countries that the one who gained the victory should have both kingdoms. 62. King Harold's Challenge King Harold during this winter called out a general levy of all the people of Norway, and assembled a great force toward spring. Then Harold had his great ship drawn down and put into the river Nid, and set up the dragon's head on her. Theodolf, the scald, sang about it thus. My lovely girl. The sight was grand. When the great warships down the strand. Into the river gently slid. And all below her sides was hid. Come, lovely girl, and see the show. Her sides that on the water glow. Her serpent head with golden mane. All shining back from the NID again. Then King Harold rigged out his ship, got ready for sea, and when he had all in order went out of the river. His men rowed very skillfully and beautifully. So says Theodolf. It was upon a Saturday. Ship tilts were struck and stowed away. And past the town our dragon glides. That girls might see our glancing sides. Out from the NID brave Harold steers. Westward at first the dragon veers. Our lads together down with oars. The splash is echoed round the shores. Their oars our king's men handle well. One stroke is all the eye can tell. All level o'er the water rise. The girls look on in sweet surprise. Such things, they think, can ne'er give way. The little know the battle day. The Danish girls, who dread our shout. Might wish our ship gear not so stout. Tis in the fight, not on the wave. That oars may break and fail the brave. At sea, beneath the ice-cold sky. Safely our oars o'er ocean ply. And when at Thrandjum's holy stream. Our seventy cars in distance gleam. We seem, while rowing from the sea. An urn with iron wings to be. King Harold sailed south along the land, and called out the levy everywhere of men and ships. When they came east to Viking they got a strong wind against them and the forces lay dispersed about in the harbour, some in the isles outside, and some in the fjords. 
so says Thiodolf. The cutter's sea bleached bows scarce find. A shelter from the furious wind. Under the inland forest's side. Where the fjord runs its farthest tide. In all the isles and creeks around. The bond's ships lie on the ground. And ships with gunnels hung with shields. Seek the lee side of the green fields. In the heavy storm that raged for some time the great ship had need of good ground tackle. So says Thiodolf. With lofty bow above the seas. Which curl and fly before the breeze. The gallant vessel rides and reels. And every plunge her cable feels. The storm that tries the spar and mast. Tries the main anchor at the last. The storm above, below the rock. Chafed the thick cable with each shock. When the weather became favorable King Harold sailed eastwards to the Gott River with his fleet and arrived there in the evening. So says Thiodolf. The gallant Harold now has come. To Gott, full halfway from his home. And on the river frontier stands. To fight with Sven for life and lands. The night passed o'er, the gallant king. Next day at Thumia calls a thing. Where Sven is challenged to appear. A day which ravens wish were near. 63, of King Harold's fleet. When the Danes heard that the Northmen's army was come to the Gott River they all fled who had opportunity to get away. The Northmen heard that the Danish king had also called out his forces and lay in the south, partly at Fyen and partly about Sealand. When King Harold found that King Sven would not hold a meeting with him, or a fight, according to what had been agreed upon between them, he took the same course as before, letting the bond troops return home, but manning 150 ships. With which he sailed southwards along Halland, where he harried all round, and then brought up with his fleet in Lofofjord, and laid waste the country. A little afterwards King Sven came upon them with all the Danish fleet, consisting of 300 ships. When the Northmen saw them King Harold ordered a general meeting of the fleet to be called by sound of trumpet. And many there said it was better to fly, as it was not now advisable to fight. The king replied, Sooner shall all lie dead one upon another than fly. So says Stein Herdison. With falcon eye, and courage bright. Our king saw glory in the fight. To fly, he saw, would ruin bring. On them and him, the folk and king. Hands up the arms to one and all. Cries out the king, will win or fall. Sooner than fly, heaped on each other. Each man shall fall across his brother. Then King Harold drew up his ships to attack, and brought forward his great dragon in the middle of his fleet. So says Thiodolf. The brave king through his vessels throng. His dragon warship moves along. He runs her gaily to the front. To meet the coming battle's brunt. The ship was remarkably well equipped, and fully manned. So says Thiodolf. The king had got a chosen crew. He told his brave lads to stand true. The ring of shields seemed to enclose. The ship's deck from the boarding foes. The dragon, on the NIS river flood. Beset with men, who thickly stood. Shield touching shield, was something rare. That seemed all force of man to dare. Ulf, the marshal, laid his ship by the side of the king's and ordered his men to bring her well forward. Stein heard Eisen, who was himself in Ulf's ship, sings of it thus. Our oars were stowed, our lances high. As the ship moved swung in the sky. The marshal Ulf went through our ranks. Drawn up beside the rower's banks. The brave friend of our gallant king. Told us our ship well on to bring. And fight like Norsemen in the cause. Our Norsemen answered with huzzas. Hakon Ivarsson lay outside on the other wing, and had many ships with him, all well equipment. At the extremity of the other side lay the Throngem chiefs, who had also a great and strong force. 64. Of King Sven's Armament. Sven, the Danish king, also drew up his fleet, and laid his ship forward in the center against King Harald's ship, and Finn Arneson laid his ship next, and then the Danes laid their ships, according as they were bold or well equipped. 
Then, on both sides, they bound the ships together all through the middle of the fleets, but as the fleets were so large, very many ships remained loose, and each laid his ship forward according to his courage, and that was very unequal. Although the difference among the men was great, altogether there was a very great force on both sides. King Sven had six earls among the people following him. So says Stein Herdeisen. Danger our chief would never shun. With eight score ships he would not run. The Danish fleet he would abide. And give close battle side by side. From Lair's coast the Danish king. Three hundred ocean steeds could bring. And o'er the seaweed plain in haste. Thought Harold's vessels would be chased. 65. Beginning of the Battle of Nis River. As soon as King Harold was ready with his fleet, he orders the war blast to sound, and the men to row forward to the attack. So says Stein Herdeisen. Harold and Sven first met as foes. Where the Nis in the ocean flows. For Sven would not for peace entreat. But, strong in ships, would Harold meet. The Norsemen prove, with sword in hand. That numbers cannot skill withstand. Off Halland's coast the blood of Danes. The blue sea's calm smooth surface stains. Soon the battle began, and became very sharp, both kings urging on their men. So says Stein Herdeisen. Our king, his broad shield disregarding. More keen for striking than for warding. Now tells his lads their spears to throw. Now shows them where to strike a blow. From fleet to fleet so short the way. That stones and arrows have full play. And from the keen sword dropped the blood. Of short-lived seamen in the flood. It was late in the day when the battle began, and it continued the whole night. King Harold shot for a long time with his bow. So says Theodolf. The upland king was all the night. Speeding the arrow's deadly flight. All in the dark his bowstrings twang. Was answered. For some white shield rang. Or yelling shriek gave certain note. The shaft had pierced some ringmail coat. The foeman's shields and bulwarks bore. A Lapland arrow scat, one, or more. Earl Hacken, and the people who followed him, did not make fast their ships in the fleet, but rode against the Danish ships that were loose, and slew the men of all the ships they came up with. When the Danes observed this each drew his ship out of the way of the Earl, but he set upon those who were trying to escape, and they were nearly driven to flight. Then a boat came rowing to the Earl's ship and hailed him and said that the other wing of King Harold's fleet was giving way and many of their people had fallen. Then the Earl rode thither and gave so severe an assault that the Danes had to retreat before him. The Earl went on in this way all the night, coming forward where he was most wanted, and wheresoever he came none could stand against him. Hacken rode outside around the battle. Towards the end of the night the greatest part of the Danish fleet broke into flight, for then King Harold with his men boarded the vessel of King Sven. And it was so completely clear that all the crew fell in the ship, except those who sprang overboard. So says Arner, the Earl scald. Brave Sven did not his vessel leave. Without good cause, as I believe. Oft on his cask the sword blade rang. Before into the sea he sprang. Upon the wave his vessel drives. All his brave crew had lost their lives. O'er dead court men into the sea. The Jutland king had now to flee. And when King Sven's banner was cut down, and his ship cleared of its crew, all his forces took to flight, and some were killed. The ships which were bound together could not be cast loose, so the people who were in them sprang overboard, and some got to the other ships that were loose. And all King Sven's men who could get off rode away, but a great many of them were slain. Where the king himself fought the ships were mostly bound together, and there were more than seventy left behind of King Sven's vessels. So says Theodolf. Sven's ships rode proudly o'er the deep. When, by a single sudden sweep. Full seventy sail, as we are told. Were seized by Norway's monarch bold. King Harold rode after the Danes and pursued them. 
But that was not easy, for the ships lay so thick together that they scarcely could move. Earl Finn Arneson would not flee, and being also short-sighted, was taken prisoner. So says Theodolf. To the six Danish earls who came. To aid his force, and raise his name. No mighty thanks King Sven is owing. For mighty actions of their doing. Finn Arneson, in battle known. With a stout Norse heart of his own. Would not take flight his life to gain. And in the foremost ranks was Tain. End notes. 1. The Laplanders paid their seat, or yearly tax, in bows and arrows. And the meaning of the scald appears to be, that as many as were paid in a year were shot at the foe. L. 66. King Sven's Flight. Earl Hakon lay behind with his ships, while the king and the rest of the forces were pursuing the fugitives. For the earl's ships could not get forward on account of the ships which lay in the way before him. Then a man came rowing in a boat to the earl's ship and lay at the bulwarks. The man was stout and had on a white hat. He hailed the ship, where is the earl, said he. The earl was in the forehold, stopping a man's blood. The earl cast a look at the man in the hat and asked what his name was. He answered, Here is Vandrad, speak to me, earl. The earl leant over the ship's side to him. Then the man in the boat said, Earl, I will accept of my life from thee, if thou wilt give it. Then the earl raised himself up, called two men who were friends dear to him, and said to them, Go into the boat, bring Vandrad to the land, attend him to my friends Carl the Bond. And tell Carl, as a token that these words come from me, that he let Vandrad have the horse which I gave to him yesterday, and also his saddle, and his son to attend him. Thereupon they went into the boat and took the oars in hand, while Vandrad steered. This took place just about daybreak, while the vessels were in movement, some rowing towards the land, some towards the sea, both small and great. Vandrad steered where he thought there was most room between the vessels, and when they came near to Norway's ships the earl's men gave their names and then they all allowed them to go where they pleased. Vandrad steered along the shore, and only set in towards the land when they had come past the crowd of ships. They then went up to Carl the Bond's farm, and it was then beginning to be light. They went into the room where Carl had just put on his clothes. The Earl's men told him their message and Carl said they must first take some food, and he set a table before them and gave them water to wash with. Then came the housewife into the room and said, I wonder why we could get no peace or rest all night with the shouting and screaming. Carl replies, Dost thou not know that the kings were fighting all night? She asked which had the better of it. Carl answered, The Northmen gained. Then, said she, Our king will have taken flight. Nobody knows, says Carl, whether he has fled or is fallen. She says, What a useless sort of king we have. He is both slow and frightened. Then said Vandrad, Frightened he is not, but he is not lucky. Then Vandrad washed his hands, but he took the towel and dried them right in the middle of the cloth. The housewife snatched the towel from him, and said, Thou hast been taught little good, it is wasteful to wet the whole cloth at one time. Vandrad replies, I may yet come so far forward in the world as to be able to dry myself with the middle of the towel. Thereupon Carl set a table before them and Vandrad sat down between them. They ate for a while and then went out. The horse was saddled and Carl's son ready to follow him with another horse. They rode away to the forest, and the earl's men returned to the boat, rode to the earl's ship and told the success of their expedition. 67 of King Harold. King Harold and his men followed the fugitives only a short way, and rode back to the place where the deserted ships lay. Then the battle place was ransacked, and in King Sven's ship was found a heap of dead men. But the king's body was not found, although people believed for certain that he had fallen. Then King Harold had the greatest attention paid to the dead of his men, and had the wounds of the living bound up. The dead bodies of Sven's men were brought to the land, and he sent a message to the peasants to come and bury them. Then he let the booty be divided, and this took up some time. The news came now that King Sven had come to Sealand, and that all who had escaped from the battle had joined him, 
along with many more, and that he had a great force. 68. Finn Arneson gets quarter. Earl Finn Arneson was taken prisoner in the battle, as before related, and when he was led before King Harold the king was very merry, and said, Finn, we meet here now, and we met last in Norway. The Danish court has not stood very firmly by thee. And it will be a troublesome business for Northmen to drag thee, a blind old man, with them, and preserve thy life. The earl replies, the Northmen find it very difficult now to conquer, and it is all the worse that thou hast the command of them. Then said King Harold, Wilt thou accept of life and safety, although thou hast not deserved it? The earl replies, Not from thee, thou dog. The king, Wilt thou, then, if thy relation Magnus gives thee quarter? Magnus, King Harold's son, was then steering the ship. The earl replies, Can the whelp rule over life and quarter? The king laughed, as if he found amusement in vexing him. Wilt thou accept thy life, then, from thy sheer relation Thorer? The earl, is she here? She is here, said the king. Then Earl Finn broke out with the ugly expressions which since have been preserved, as a proof that he was so mad with rage that he could not govern his tongue. No wonder thou hast bit so strongly, if the mare was with thee. Earl Finn got life and quarter and the king kept him a while about him. But Finn was rather melancholy and obstinate in conversation, and King Harold said, I see, Finn, that thou dost not live willingly in company with me and thy relations. Now I will give thee leave to go to thy friend King Sven. The earl said, I accept of the offer willingly, and the more gratefully the sooner I get away from hence. The king afterwards let Earl Finn be landed and the traders going to Halland received him well. King Harald sailed from thence to Norway with his fleet, and went first to Oslo, where he gave all his people leave to go home who wished to do so. 69. Of King Sven King Sven, it is told, sat in Denmark all that winter, and had his kingdom as formerly. In winter he sent men north to Halland for Karl the Bond and his wife. When Karl came the king called him to him and asked him if he knew him, or thought he had ever seen him before. Karl replies, I know thee, sire, and knew thee before, the moment I saw thee. And God be praised if the small help I could give was of any use to thee. The king replies, I have to reward thee for all the days I have to live. And now, in the first place, I will give thee any farm in Sealand thou wouldst desire to have. And, in the next place, will make thee a great man, if thou knowest how to conduct thyself. Karl thanked the king for his promise, and said he had now but one thing to ask. The king asked what that was. Karl said that he would ask to take his wife with him. The king said, I will not let thee do that, but I will provide thee a far better and more sensible wife. But thy wife can keep the bond farm ye had before and she will have her living from it. The king gave Karl a great and valuable farm, and provided him a good marriage, and he became a considerable man. This was reported far and wide and much praised, and thus it came to be told in Norway. 70. Of the Talk of the Court Men King Harald stayed in Oslo the winter after the battle at Nis River, A.D. 1063. In autumn, when the men came from the south, there was much talk and many stories about the battle which they had fought at Nis River, and every one who had been there thought he could tell something about it. Once some of them sat in a cellar and drank, and were very merry and talkative. They talked about the Nis River battle, and who had earned the greatest praise and renown. They all agreed that no man there had been at all equal to Earl Hakon. He was the boldest in arms, the quickest, and the most lucky, what he did was of the greatest help, and he won the battle. King Harold, in the meantime, was out in the yard, and spoke with some people. He went then to the room door, and said, Every one here would willingly be called Hakon, and then went his way. 71. Of the attempt to take Earl Hakon Earl Hakon went in winter to the uplands, and was all winter in his domains. He was much beloved by all the uplanders. It happened, toward spring, that some men were sitting drinking in the town, and the conversation turned, as usual, on the Nis River battle. And some praised Earl Hakon, and some thought others as deserving of praise as he. 
When they had thus disputed a while, one of them said, It is possible that others fought as bravely as the Earl at Nis River. But none, I think, has had such luck with him as he. The others replied, that his best luck was his driving so many Danes to flight along with other men. The same man replied, it was greater luck that he gave King Sven quarter. One of the company said to him, Thou dost not know what thou art saying. He replied, I know it for certain, for the man told me himself who brought the king to the land. It went, according to the old proverb, that the king has many ears. This was told the king, and he immediately ordered horses to be gathered, and rode away directly with nine hundred men. He rode all that night and the following day. Then some men met them who were riding to the town with mead and malt. In the king's retinue was a man called Gamal, who rode to one of these bonds who was an acquaintance of his, and spoke to him privately. I will pay thee, said he, to ride with the greatest speed, by the shortest private paths that thou knowest, to Earl Hakon, and tell him the king will kill him. For the king has got to the knowledge that Earl Hakon set King Sven on shore at Nis River. They agreed on the payment. The bond rode, and came to the earl just as he was sitting drinking, and had not yet gone to bed. When the bond told his errand, the earl immediately stood up with all his men, had all his loose property removed from the farm to the forest, and all the people left the house in the night. When the king came he halted there all night. But Hakon rode away, and came east to Svithjad to King Steinkel and stayed with him all summer. King Harald returned to the town, traveled northwards to Thrandjum district, and remained there all summer. But in autumn he returned eastwards to Viking. 72, of Earl Hakon. As soon as Earl Hakon heard the king had gone north he returned immediately in summer to the uplands, A.D. 1063, and remained there until the king had returned from the north. Then the earl went east into Vermeland, where he remained during the winter, and where the king, Steinkel, gave him fiefs. For a short time in winter he went west to Romerike with a great troop of men from Gotland and Vermeland, and received the scat and duties from the upland people which belonged to him, and then returned to Glutland, and remained there till spring. King Harald had his seat in Oslo all winter, A.D. 1064, and sent his men to the uplands to demand the scat, together with the king's land dues, and the mulks of court. But the Uplanders said they would pay all the scat and dues which they had to pay, to Earl Hakon as long as he was in life, and had forfeited his life or his fief, and the king got no dues that winter. 73. Agreement between King Harald and King Sven. This winter messengers and ambassadors went between Norway and Denmark, whose errand was that both Northmen and Danes should make peace, and a league with each other, and to ask the kings to agree to it. These messages gave favorable hopes of a peace, and the matter proceeded so far that a meeting for peace was appointed at the Gott River between King Harald and King Sven. When spring approached, both kings assembled many ships and people for this meeting. So says a skald in a poem on this expedition of the kings, which begins thus. The king, who from the northern sound. His land with warships girds around. The raven feeder, filled the coast. With his proud ships, a gallant host. The gold-tipped stems dash through the foam. That shakes the seaman's planked home. The high wave breaks up to the mast. As west of Halland on they passed. Harold whose word is fixed and sure. Whose ships his land from foes secure. And Sven, whose isles maintain is fleet. Hasten as friends again to meet. And every creek with vessels teems. All Denmark men and shipping seems. And all rejoice that strife will cease. And men meet now but to make peace. Here it is told that the two kings held the meeting that was agreed upon between them, and both came to the frontiers of their kingdoms. So says the skald. To meet, since peace the Dane now craves. On to the south upon the waves. Sailed forth our gallant northern king. Peace to the Danes with him to bring. Sven northward to his frontier highs. To get the peace his people prize. And meet King Harald, whom he finds. On land hard used by stormy winds. When the kings found each other, 
people began at once to talk of their being reconciled. But as soon as peace was proposed, many began to complain of the damage they had sustained by harrying, robbing and killing men, and for a long time it did not look very like peace. It is here related. Before this meeting of the kings. Each bend his own losses brings. And loudly claim some recompense. From his king's foes, at their expense. It is not easy to make peace. Where noise and talking never cease. The bond's warmth may quickly spread. And kings be by the people led. When kings are moved, no peace is sure. For that peace only is secure. Which they who make it fairly make. To each side give, from each side take. The kings will often rule but ill. Who listen to the people's will. The people often have no view. But their own interests to pursue. At last the best men, and those who were the wisest, came between the kings, and settled the peace thus, that Harold should have Norway, and Sven Denmark, according to the boundaries of old established between Denmark and Norway. Neither of them should pay to the other for any damage sustained, the war should cease as it now stood, each retaining what he had got, and this peace should endure as long as they were kings. This peace was confirmed by oath. Then the kings parted, having given each other hostages, as is here related. And I have heard that to set fast. The peace God brought about at last. Sven and stern herald pledges sent. Who witnessed to their sworn intent. And much I wish that they and all. In no such perjury may fall. That this peace ever should be broken. And oaths should fail before God spoken. King Harold with his people sailed northwards to Norway, and King Sven southwards to Denmark. 74. King Harold's Battle with Earl Hakon. King Harold was in Viking in the summer, AD 1064, and he sent his men to the uplands after the scat and duty which belonged to him. But the bonds paid no attention to the demand, but said they would hold all for Earl Hakon until he came for it. Earl Hakon was then up in Gotland with a large armed force. When summer was past King Harold went south to Conungahela. Then he took all the light sailing vessels he could get hold of and steered up the river. He had the vessels drawn past all the waterfalls and brought them thus into the Wenner Lake. Then he rode eastward across the lake to where he heard Earl Hakon was, but when the Earl got news of the king's expedition he retreated down the country, and would not let the king plunder the land. Earl Hakon had a large armed force which the Gotland people had raised for him. King Harold lay with his ships up in a river, and made a foray on land, but left some of his men behind to protect the ships. The king himself rode up with a part of the men, but the greater part were on foot. They had to cross a forest, where they found a mire or lake, and close to it a wood. And when they reached the wood they saw the earl's men, but the mire was between them. They drew up their people now on both sides. Then King Harold ordered his men to sit down on the hillside. We will first see if they will attack us. Earl Hakon does not usually wait to talk. It was frosty weather, with some snowdrift, and Harold's men sat down under their shields, but it was cold for the Gotlanders, who had but little clothing with them. The Earl told them to wait until King Harold came nearer, so that all would stand equally high on the ground. Earl Hakon had the same banner which had belonged to King Magnus Olofsson. The lagman of the Gotland people, Thorvid, sat upon a horse, and the bridle was fastened to a stake that stood in the mire. He broke out with these words, God knows we have many brave and handsome fellows here, and we shall let King Steinkel hear that we stood by the good Earl bravely. I am sure of one thing, we shall behave gallantly against these Northmen, if they attack us, but if our young people give way, and should not stand to it, let us not run farther than to that stream. But if they should give way farther, which I am sure they will not do, let it not be farther than to that hill. At that instant the Northmen sprang up, raised the war cry, and struck on their shields, and the Gotland army began also to shout. The lagman's horse got shy with the war cry, and backed so hard that the stake flew up and struck the lagman on the head. He said, Ill luck to thee, Northmen, for that arrow, and away fled the lagman. King Harold had told his people, 
if we do make a clash with the weapons, we shall not however, go down from the hill until they come nearer to us, and they did so. When the war cry was raised the earl let his banner advance. But when they came under the hill the king's army rushed down upon them, and killed some of the earl's people, and the rest fled. The northmen did not pursue the fugitives long, for it was the fall of day. But they took Earl Hacken's banner and all the arms and clothes they could get hold of. King Harold had both the banners carried before him as they marched away. They spoke among themselves that the Earl had probably fallen. As they were riding through the forest they could only ride singly, one following the other. Suddenly a man came full gallop across the path, struck his spear through him who was carrying the Earl's banner, seized the banner staff, and rode into the forest on the other side with the banner. When this was told the king he said, Bring me my armor, for the earl is alive. Then the king rode to his ships in the night, and many said that the earl had now taken his revenge. But Thyadolf sang thus. Steinkel's troops, who were so bold. Who the earl Hakon would uphold. Were driven by our horsemen's power. To hell, death goddess, in an hour. And the great earl, so men say. Who won't admit he ran away. Because his men fled from the ground. Retired, and cannot now be found. 75. Death of Hal, the murderer of Codron. The rest of the night Harold passed in his ships. But in the morning, when it was daylight, it was found that so thick ice had gathered about the vessels that one could walk around them. The king ordered his men to cut the ice from the ships all the way out to the clear water. On which they all went to break the ice. King Harold's son, Magnus, steered the vessel that lay lowest down the river and nearest the water. When the people had cleared the ice away almost entirely, a man ran out to the ice, and began hewing away at it like a madman. Then said one of the men, It is going now as usual, that none can do so much as Hal who killed Codron, when once he lays himself to the work. See how he is hewing away at the ice. There was a man in the crew of Magnus, the king's son, who was called Thormod Eindradason, and when he heard the name of Codron's murderer he ran up to Hal, and gave him a death wound. Codron was a son of Gudmund I. Jolfson. And Valgerd, who was a sister of Gudmund, was the mother of Joran, and the grandmother by the mother's side of this Thormod. Thormod was a year old when Codron was killed, and had never seen Hal Utrigsen until now. When the ice was broken all the way out to the water, Magnus drew his ship out, set sail directly, and sailed westward across the lake, but the king's ship, which lay farthest up the river, came out the last. Hal had been in the king's retinue, and was very dear to him, so that the king was enraged at his death. The king came the last into the harbour, and Magnus had let the murderer escape into the forest, and offered to pay the mulk for him. And the king had very nearly attacked Magnus and his crew, but their friends came up and reconciled them. 76. Of King Harold. That winter, A.D. 1065, King Harold went up to Romerike, and had many people with him. And he accused the bonds there of having kept from him his scat and duties, and of having aided his enemies to raise disturbance against him. He seized on the bonds and maimed some, killed others, and robbed many of all their property. They who could do it fled from him. He burned everything in the districts and laid them altogether waste. So says Thyadolf. He who the island people drove. When they against his power strove. Now bridles Romerike's men. Marching his forces through their glen. To punish them the fire he lights. That shines afar off in dark nights. From house and yard, and, as he says. Will warn the man who disobeys. Thereafter the king went up to Hedmark, burnt the dwellings, and made no less waste and havoc there than in Romerik. From thence he went to Hadeland and Ringerik, burning and ravaging all the land. So says Thyadolf. The bond's household goods are seen. Before his door upon the green. Smoking and singed, and sparks red hot. Glow in the thatched roof of his cot. In heed mark the bonds pray. The king his crushing hand to stay. In Ringerike and Hadeland. 
none gainst his fiery wrath can stand. Then the bonds left all to the king's mercy. After the death of King Magnus fifteen years had passed when the battle at Nis River took place, and afterwards two years elapsed before Harold and Sven made peace. So says Theodolf. The Hordland king under the land. At anchor lay close to the strand. At last, prepared with shield and spear. The peace was settled the third year. After this peace the disturbances with the people of the upland districts lasted a year and a half. So says Theodolf. No easy task it is to say. How the king brought beneath his sway. The upland bonds, and would give. Not but their plows from which to live. The king in eighteen months brought down. Their bond power, and raised his own. And the great honor he has gained. Will still in memory be retained. 77. Of the kings of England. Edward, Ethelred's son, was king of England after his brother Hardicanut. He was called Edward the Good, and so he was. King Edward's mother was Queen Emma, daughter of Richard, Earl of Rouen. Her brother was Earl Robert, whose son was William the Bastard, who at that time was Earl at Rouen in Normandy. King Edward's queen was Gaida, a daughter of Earl Godwin, the son of Ulfnad. Gaida's brothers were, Earl Toast, the eldest. Earl Moricare the next, Earl Walter the third, Earl Sven the fourth, and the fifth was Harold, who was the youngest, and he was brought up at King Edward's court, and was his foster son. The king loved him very much, and kept him as his own son. For he had no children. 78. Of Harold Godwinson. One summer it happened that Harold, the son of Godwin, made an expedition to Bretland with his ships, but when they got to sea they met a contrary wind, and were driven off into the ocean. They landed west in Normandy, after suffering from a dangerous storm. They brought up at Rouen, where they met Earl William, who received Harold and his company gladly. Harold remained there late in harvest, and was hospitably entertained. For the stormy weather continued, and there was no getting to sea, and this continued until winter set in, so the Earl and Harold agreed that he should remain there all winter. Harold sat on the high seat on one side of the Earl. And on the other side sat the Earl's wife, one of the most beautiful women that could be seen. They often talked together for amusement at the drinking table. And the Earl went generally to bed, but Harold and the Earl's wife sat long in the evenings talking together, and so it went on for a great part of the winter. In one of their conversations she said to Harold, The Earl has asked me what it is we have to talk about so much, for he is angry at it. Harold replies, We shall then at once let him know all our conversation. The following day, Harold asked the Earl to a conference, and they went together into the conference chamber, where also the Queen was, and some of the counsellors. Then Harold began thus, I have to inform you, Earl, that there lies more in my visit here than I have let you know. I would ask your daughter in marriage, and have often spoke over this matter with her mother, and she has promised to support my suit with you. As soon as Harold had made known this proposal of his, it was well received by all who were present. They explained the case to the Earl, and at last it came so far that the Earl was contracted to Harold, but as she was very young, it was resolved that the wedding should be deferred for some years. 79. King Edward's Death When spring came Harold rigged his ships and set off, and he and the Earl parted with great friendship. Harold sailed over to England to King Edward, but did not return to Valland to fulfill the marriage agreement. Edward was king over England for twenty-three years and died on a bed of sickness in London on the 5th of January, and was buried in Paul's church. Englishmen call him a saint. 80. Harold Godwinson made king of England. The sons of Earl Godwin were the most powerful men in England. Toast was made chief of the English king's army, and was his land defense man when the king began to grow old, and he was also placed above all the other earls. His brother Harold was always with the court itself, and nearest to the king in all service, and had the charge of the king's treasure chamber. It is said that when the king was approaching his last hour, Harold and a few others were with him. Harold first leans down over the king, and then said, 
I take you all to witness that the king has now given me the kingdom, and all the realm of England, and then the king was taken dead out of the bed. The same day there was a meeting of the chiefs, at which there was some talk of choosing a king, and then Harold brought forward his witnesses that King Edward had given him the kingdom on his dying day. The meeting ended by choosing Harold as king, and he was consecrated and crowned the thirteenth day of Yule, in Paul's church. Then all the chiefs and all the people submitted to him. Now when his brother, Earl Toast, heard of this he took it very ill, as he thought himself quite as well entitled to be king. I want, said he, that the principal men of the country choose him whom they think best fitted for it. And sharp words passed between the brothers. King Harold says he will not give up his kingly dignity, for he is seated on the throne which kings sat upon, and is anointed and consecrated a king. On his side also was the strength of the people, for he had the king's whole treasure. 81. Earl Toast's Expedition to Denmark Now when King Harold perceived that his brother Toast wanted to have him deprived of the kingdom he did not trust him, for Toast was a clever man, and a great warrior, and was in friendship with the principal men of the country. He therefore took the command of the army from Toast, and also all the power he had beyond that of the other earls of the country. Earl Toast, again, would not submit to be his own brother's serving man. Therefore he went with his people over the sea to Flanders, and stayed there a while, then went to Friesland, and from thence to Denmark to his relation King Sven. Earl Ulf, King Sven's father, and Gaida, Earl Toast's mother, were brothers and sister's children. The Earl now asked King Sven for support and help of men. And King Sven invited him to stay with him, with the promise that he should get so large an earldom in Denmark that he would be an important chief. The Earl replies, My inclination is to go back to my estate in England. But if I cannot get help from you for that purpose, I will agree to help you with all the power I can command in England, if you will go there with the Danish army, and win the country, as Canute, your mother's brother, did. The king replied, So much smaller a man am I than Canute the Great, that I can with difficulty defend my own Danish dominions against the Northmen. King Canute, on the other hand, got the Danish kingdom in heritage, took England by slash and blow, and sometimes was near losing his life in the contest, and Norway he took without slash or blow. Now it suits me much better to be guided by my own slender ability than to imitate my relation, King Canute's, lucky hits. Then Earl Toast said, The result of my errand here is less fortunate than I expected of thee who art so gallant a man, seeing that thy relative is in so great need. It may be that I will seek friendly help where it could less be expected. And that I may find a chief who is less afraid, king, than thou art of a great enterprise. Then the king and the earl parted, not just the best friends. 82. Earl Toast's Expedition to Norway Earl Toast turned away then and went to Norway, where he presented himself to King Harold, who was at that time in Viking. When they met the Earl explained his errand to the King. He told him all his proceedings since he left England, and asked his aid to recover his dominions in England. The King replied that the Northmen had no great desire for a campaign in England, and to have English chiefs over them there. People say, added he, that the English are not to be trusted. The Earl replied, Is it true what I have heard people tell in England, that thy relative, King Magnus, sent men to King Edward with the message that King Magnus had right to England as well as to Denmark? And had got that heritage after Hardicanut, in consequence of a regular agreement? The King replied, How came it that he did not get it, if he had a right to it? Why, replied the Earl, hast thou not Denmark, as King Magnus, thy predecessor, had it? The king replies, The Danes have nothing to brag of over us Northmen. For many a place have we laid in ashes to thy relations. Then said the earl, If thou wilt not tell me, I will tell thee. Magnus subdued Denmark, because all the chiefs of the country helped him. And thou hast not done it, because all the people of the country were against thee. Therefore, also, King Magnus did not strive for England, because all the nation would have Edward for king. Wilt thou take England now? I will bring the matter so far that most of the principal men in England shall be thy friends, and assist thee, for nothing is wanting to place me at the side of my brother Harold but the king's name. 
All men allow that there never was such a warrior in the northern lands as thou art, and it appears to me extraordinary that thou hast been fighting for fifteen years for Denmark, and wilt not take England that lies open to thee. King Harold weighed carefully the Earl's words, and perceived at once that there was truth in much of what he said, and he himself had also a great desire to acquire dominions. Then King Harold and the Earl talked long and frequently together. And at last he took the resolution to proceed in summer to England, and conquer the country. King Harold sent a message token through all Norway and ordered out a levy of one half of all the men in Norway able to carry arms. When this became generally known, there were many guesses about what might be the end of this expedition. Some reckoned up King Harold's great achievements, and thought he was also the man who could accomplish this. Others, again, said that England was difficult to attack, that it was very full of people, and the men-at-arms, who were called thing men, were so brave, that one of them was better than two of Harold's best men. Then said Ulf the Marshal, I am still ready gold to gain. But truly it would be in vain. And the king's marshal in the hall might leave his good post once for all. If two of us in any strife must for one thing man fly for life. My lovely Norse maid, in my youth, we thought the opposite the truth. Ulf the marshal died that spring, A.D. 1066. King Harold stood over his grave, and said, as he was leaving it, there lies now the truest of men, and the most devoted to his king. Earl Toast sailed in spring west to Flanders, to meet the people who had left England with him, and others besides who had gathered to him both out of England and Flanders. 83. G.Y.R.D.'s Dreams King Harold's fleet assembled at the Solens. When King Harold was ready to leave Nidaros he went to King Olaf's shrine, unlocked it, clipped his hair and nails, and locked the shrine again, and threw the keys into the NID. Some say he threw them overboard outside of Agdanes. And since then the shrine of St. Olaf, the king, has never been opened. Thirty-five years had passed since he was slain, and he lived thirty-five years here on earth, A.D. 1080-1066. King Harold sailed with his ships he had about him to the south to meet his people, and a great fleet was collected, so that, according to the people's reckoning, King Harold had nearly two hundred ships beside provision ships and small craft. While they lay at the Solens a man called G.Y.R.D., on board the king's ship, had a dream. He thought he was standing in the king's ship and saw a great witchwife standing on the island, with a fork in one hand and a trough in the other. He thought also that he saw over all the fleet, and that a fowl was sitting upon every ship's stern, and that these fowls were all ravens or urns. And the witchwife sang this song. From the east I'll tice the king. To the west the king I'll bring. Many a noble bone will be. Ravens o'er Juk's ship are fitting. Eyeing the prey they think most fitting. Upon the stem I'll sail with them. Upon the stem I'll sail with them. 84. Thord's Dream There was also a man called Thord, in a ship which lay not far from the king's. He dreamt one night that he saw King Harold's fleet coming to land, and he knew the land to be England. He saw a great battle array on the land, and he thought both sides began to fight, and had many banners flapping in the air. And before the army of the people of the country was riding a huge witchwife upon a wolf, and the wolf had a man's carcass in his mouth, and the blood was dropping from his jaws. And when he had eaten up one body she threw another into his mouth, and so one after another, and he swallowed them all. And she sang thus. Skade's eagle eyes. The king's ill luck espies. Though glancing shields. Hide the green fields. The king's ill luck she spies. To bode the doom of this great king. The flesh of bleeding men I fling. To hairy jaw and hungry maw. To hairy jaw and hungry maw. 85. King Harold's Dream. King Harold also dreamt one night that he was in Nidaros, and met his brother, King Olaf, who sang to him these verses. In many a fight. My name was bright. Men weep, and tell. How Olaf fell. Thy death is near. Thy corpse, I fear. 
The crow will feed. The witch wife steed. Many other dreams and forebodings were then told of, and most of them gloomy. Before King Harald left Thrandjum, he let his son Magnus be proclaimed king and set him as king over Norway while he was absent. Thora, the daughter of Thorberg, also remained behind. But he took with him Queen Elisif and her two daughters, Maria and Ingigerd. Olaf, King Harald's son, also accompanied his father abroad. 86. Battle at Scarborough When King Harald was clear for sea, and the wind became favorable, he sailed out into the ocean, and he himself landed in Shetland, but a part of his fleet in the Orkney Islands. King Harald stopped but a short time in Shetland before sailing to Orkney, from whence he took with him a great armed force, and the earls Paul and Erland, the sons of Earl Thorfinn. But he left behind him here the Queen Elisif, and her daughters Maria and Ingigerd. Then he sailed, leaving Scotland and England westward of him, and landed at a place called Cliffland. There he went on shore and plundered, and brought the country in subjection to him without opposition. Then he brought up at Skarderberg, and fought with the people of the place. He went up a hill which is there, and made a great pile upon it, which he set on fire. And when the pile was in clear flame, his men took large forks and pitched the burning wood down into the town, so that one house caught fire after the other, and the town surrendered. The Northmen killed many people there and took all the booty they could lay hold of. There was nothing left for the Englishmen now, if they would preserve their lives, but to submit to King Harold, and thus he subdued the country wherever he came. Then the king proceeded south along the land, and brought up at Helorns, where there came a force that had been assembled to oppose him, with which he had a battle, and gained the victory. 87. Of Harold's Order of Battle Thereafter the king sailed to the Humber, and up along the river, and then he landed. Up in Jorvik were two earls, Earl Morikare, and his brother, Earl Valthief, and they had an immense army. While the army of the earls was coming down from the upper part of the country, King Harold lay in the USA. King Harold now went on the land, and drew up his men. The one arm of this line stood at the outer edge of the river, the other turned up towards the land along a ditch, and there was also a morass, deep, broad, and full of water. The earls let their army proceed slowly down along the river, with all their troops in line. The king's banner was next the river, where the line was thickest. It was thinnest at the ditch, where also the weakest of the men were. When the earls advanced downwards along the ditch, the arm of the northmen's line which was at the ditch gave way, and the Englishmen followed, thinking the northmen would fly. The banner of Earl Morikare advanced then bravely. 88. The Battle at the Humber When King Harold saw that the English array had come to the ditch against him, he ordered the charge to be sounded, and urged on his men. He ordered the banner which was called the Land Ravager to be carried before him, and made so severe an assault that all had to give way before it. And there was a great loss among the men of the earls, and they soon broke into flight, some running up the river, some down, and the most leaping into the ditch, which was so filled with dead that the Norsemen could go dry foot over the fun. Their Earl Morikare fell. So says Stein Herdeisen. The gallant Harold drove along. Flying but fighting, the whole throng. At last, confused, they could not fight. And the whole body took to flight. Up from the river's silent stream. At once rose desperate splash and scream. But they who stood like men this fray. Round Morikare's body lay. This song was composed by Stein Herdeisen about Olaf, son of King Harald. And he speaks of Olaf being in this battle with King Harald, his father. These things are also spoken of in the song called Harald Stave. Earl Valthief's men. Lay in the fun. By sword down hewed. So thickly strewed. That Norsemen say. They paved a way. Across the fun. For the brave Norsemen. Earl Valthief, and the people who escaped, fled up to the castle of York, and there the greatest loss of men had been. This battle took place upon the Wednesday next Matthias Day, A.D. 1066. 89. Of Earl Toast. 
Earl Toast had come from Flanders to King Harold as soon as he arrived in England, and the Earl was present at all these battles. It happened, as he had foretold the King at their first meeting, that in England many people would flock to them, as being friends and relations of Earl Toast, and thus the King's forces were much strengthened. After the battle now told of, all people in the nearest districts submitted to Harold, but some fled. Then the king advanced to take the castle, and laid his army at Stanford Abrigier, Stanford Bridge. And as King Harold had gained so great a victory against so great chiefs and so great an army, the people were dismayed, and doubted if they could make any opposition. The men of the castle therefore determined, in a council, to send a message to King Harold, and deliver up the castle into his power. All this was soon settled. So that on Sunday the king proceeded with the whole army to the castle, and appointed a thing of the people without the castle, at which the people of the castle were to be present. At this thing all the people accepted the condition of submitting to Harold, and gave him, as hostages, the children of the most considerable persons, for Earl Toast was well acquainted with all the people of that town. In the evening the king returned down to his ships, after this victory achieved with his own force, and was very merry. A thing was appointed within the castle early on Monday morning, and then King Harold was to name officers to rule over the town, to give out laws, and bestow fiefs. The same evening, after sunset, King Harold Godwin's son came from the south to the castle with a numerous army, and rode into the city with the goodwill and consent of the people of the castle. All the gates and walls were beset so that the Northmen could receive no intelligence, and the army remained all night in the town. 90. Of King Harold's Landing On Monday, when King Harold Sigurdsson had taken breakfast, he ordered the trumpets to sound for going on shore. The army accordingly got ready, and he divided the men into the parties who should go, and who should stay behind. In every division he allowed two men to land, and one to remain behind. Earl Toast and his retinue prepared to land with King Harold, and, for watching the ships, remained behind the king's son Olaf, the earls of Orkney, Paul and Erland. And also Eistian Orr, a son of Thorberg Arneson, who was the most able and best beloved by the king of all the lendermen, and to whom the king had promised his daughter Maria. The weather was uncommonly fine, and it was hot sunshine. The men therefore laid aside their armor, and went on the land only with their shields, helmets and spears, and girt with swords, and many had also arrows and bows, and all were very merry. Now as they came near the castle a great army seemed coming against them, and they saw a cloud of dust as from horses' feet, and under it shining shields and bright armor. The king halted his people, and called to him Earl Toast, and asked him what army this could be. The earl replied that he thought it most likely to be a hostile army, but possibly it might be some of his relations who were seeking for mercy and friendship, in order to obtain certain peace and safety from the king. Then the king said, We must all halt, to discover what kind of a force this is. They did so, and the nearer this force came the greater it appeared, and their shining arms were to the sight like glancing ice. 91. Of Earl Toast's Council Then said King Harold, Let us now fall upon some good sensible counsel, for it is not to be concealed that this is an hostile army and the king himself without doubt is here. Then said the earl, the first counsel is to turn about as fast as we can to our ships to get our men and our weapons, and then we will make a defense according to our ability. Or otherwise let our ships defend us, for there these horsemen have no power over us. Then King Harold said, I have another counsel. Put three of our best horses under three of our briskest lads and let them ride with all speed to tell our people to come quickly to our relief. The Englishmen shall have a hard fray of it before we give ourselves up for lost. The Earl said the King must order in this, as in all things, as he thought best, adding, at the same time, it was by no means his wish to fly. Then King Harold ordered his banner land ravager to be set up. And Fryrek was the name of him who bore the banner. 92. Of King Harold's Army Then King Harold arranged his army, and made the line of battle long, but not deep. He bent both wings of it back, so that they met together. And formed a wide ring equally thick all round, shield to shield, both in the front and rear ranks. 
the king himself and his retinue were within the circle, and there was the banner, and a body of chosen men. Earl Toast, with his retinue, was at another place, and had a different banner. The army was arranged in this way, because the king knew that horsemen were accustomed to ride forwards with great vigor, but to turn back immediately. Now the king ordered that his own and the earl's attendants should ride forwards where it was most required. And our bowmen, said he, shall be near to us. And they who stand in the first rank shall set the spear shaft on the ground, and the spear point against the horseman's breast, if he rides at them, and those who stand in the second rank shall set the spear point against the horse's breast. 93. Of King Harold Godwinson. King Harold Godwinson had come with an immense army, both of cavalry and infantry. Now King Harold Sigurdsson rode around his array, to see how every part was drawn up. He was upon a black horse, and the horse stumbled under him, so that the king fell off. He got up in haste and said, A fall is lucky for a traveller. The English King Harold said to the Northmen who were with him, Do ye know the stout man who fell from his horse, with the blue kirtle and the beautiful helmet? That is the king himself, said they. The English king said, A great man, and of stately appearance is he, but I think his luck has left him. 94. Of the Troop of the Nobility Twenty horsemen rode forward from the thing men's troops against the Northmen's array. And all of them, and likewise their horses, were clothed in armor. One of the horsemen said, Is Earl Toast in this army? The Earl answered, It is not to be denied that ye will find him here. The horseman says, Thy brother, King Harold, sends thee salutation, with the message that thou shalt have the whole of Northumberland. And rather than thou shouldst not submit to him, he will give thee the third part of his kingdom to rule over along with himself. The earl replies, This is something different from the enmity and scorn he offered last winter. And if this had been offered then it would have saved many a man's life who now is dead, and it would have been better for the kingdom of England. But if I accept of this offer, what will he give King Harold Sigurdsson for his trouble? The horseman replied, He has also spoken of this, and will give him seven feet of English ground, or as much more as he may be taller than other men. Then, said the earl, go now and tell King Harold to get ready for battle. For never shall the Northmen say with truth that Earl Toast left King Harold Sigurdsson to join his enemy's troops, when he came to fight west here in England. We shall rather all take the resolution to die with honor, or to gain England by a victory. Then the horsemen rode back. King Harold Sigurdsson said to the Earl, Who was the man who spoke so well? The Earl replied, That was King Harold Godwinson. Then, said King Harold Sigurdsson, That was by far too long concealed from me. For they had come so near to our army, That this Harold should never have carried back the tidings of our men's slaughter. Then said the Earl, It was certainly imprudent for such chiefs, And it may be as you say. But I saw he was going to offer me peace and a great dominion, and that, on the other hand, I would be his murderer if I betrayed him, and I would rather he should be my murderer than I his, if one of two be to die. King Harold Sigurdsson observed to his men, that was but a little man, yet he sat firmly in his stirrups. It is said that Harold made these verses at this time. Advance. Advance. No helmets glance. But blue swords play. In our array. Advance. Advance. No mail coats glance. But hearts are here. That ne'er knew fear. His coat of mail was called Emma, and it was so long that it reached almost to the middle of his leg, and so strong that no weapon ever pierced it. Then said King Harold Sigurdsson, These verses are but ill composed, I must try to make better and he composed the following. In battle storm we seek no lee. With skulking head, and bending knee. Behind the hollow shield. With eye and hand we fend the head. Courage and skill stand in the stead. Of panzer, helm, and shield. In Hild's bloody field. Thereupon Thyadolf sang. And should our king in battle fall. A fate that God may give to all. His sons will vengeance take. And never shone the sun upon. Too nobler eaglet, in his run. And them will never forsake. 
95. Of the beginning of the battle. Now the battle began. The Englishmen made a hot assault upon the Northmen, who sustained it bravely. It was no easy matter for the English to ride against the Northmen on account of their spears. Therefore they rode in a circle around them. And the fight at first was but loose and light, as long as the Northmen kept their order of battle. For although the English rode hard against the Northmen, they gave way again immediately, as they could do nothing against them. Now when the Northmen thought they perceived that the enemy were making but weak assaults, they set after them, and would drive them into flight. But when they had broken their shield rampart the Englishmen rode up from all sides, and threw arrows and spears on them. Now when King Harold Sigurdsson saw this, he went into the fray where the greatest crash of weapons was, and there was a sharp conflict, in which many people fell on both sides. King Harold then was in a rage, and ran out in front of the array, and hewed down with both hands, so that neither helmet nor armor could withstand him, and all who were nearest gave way before him. It was then very near with the English that they had taken to flight. So says Arner, the Earl Scald. Where Battlestorm was ringing. Where Aerocloud was singing. Harold stood there. Of armor bare. His deadly sword still swinging. The foemen feel its bite. His Norsemen rush to fight. Danger to share. With Harold there. Where steel on steel was ringing. 96. Fall of King Harold. King Harold Sigurdsson was hit by an arrow in the windpipe, and that was his death wound. He fell, and all who had advanced with him, except those who retired with the banner. There was afterwards the warmest conflict, and Earl Toast had taken charge of the king's banner. They began on both sides to form their array again, and for a long time there was a pause in fighting. Then Theodolf sang these verses. The army stands in hushed dismay. Stilled is the clamor of the fray. Harold is dead, and with him goes. The spirit to withstand our foes. A bloody scat the folk must pay. For their king's folly on this day. He fell, and now, without disguise. We say this business was not wise. But before the battle began again Harold Godwinson offered his brother, Earl Toast, peace, and also quarter to the Northmen who were still alive. But the Northmen called out, all of them together, that they would rather fall, one across the other, than accept of quarter from the Englishmen. Then each side set up a war shout, and the battle began again. So says Arner, the Earl Scald. The king, whose name would ill-doers scare. The gold-tipped arrow would not spare. Unhelmed, unpanzered, without shield. He fell among us in the field. The gallant men who saw him fall. Would take no quarter. One and all. Resolved to die with their loved king. Around his corpse in a corpse ring. 97. Skirmish of War. Eistian Orr came up at this moment from the ships with the men who followed him, and all were clad in armor. Then Eistian got King Harold's banner land ravager, and now was, for the third time, one of the sharpest of conflicts, in which many Englishmen fell, and they were near to taking flight. This conflict is called Orr's Storm. Eistian and his men had hastened so fast from the ships that they were quite exhausted, and scarcely fit to fight before they came into the battle. But afterwards they became so furious, that they did not guard themselves with their shields as long as they could stand upright. At last they threw off their coats of ring mail, and then the Englishmen could easily lay their blows at them. And many fell from weariness, and died without a wound. Thus almost all the chief men fell among the Norway people. This happened towards evening. And then it went, as one might expect, that all had not the same fate, for many fled, and were lucky enough to escape in various ways, and darkness fell before the slaughter was altogether ended. 98. Of Sturker the Marshal. Sturker, King Harold Sigurdsson's marshal, a gallant man, escaped upon a horse, on which he rode away in the evening. It was blowing a cold wind, and Sturker had not much other clothing upon him but his shirt, and had a helmet on his head, and a drawn sword in his hand. As soon as his weariness was over, he began to feel cold. 
a wagoner met him in a lined skin coat. Sturker asks him, Wilt thou sell thy coat, friend? Not to thee, says the peasant, thou art a Northman, that I can hear by thy tongue. Sturker replies, If I were a Northman, what wouldst thou do? I would kill thee, replied the peasant, but as ill luck would have it, I have no weapon just now by me that would do it. Then Sturker says, As you can't kill me, friend, I shall try if I can't kill you. And with that he swung his sword, and struck him on the neck, so that his head came off. He then took the skin coat, sprang on his horse, and rode down to the strand. Olaf Haraldson had not gone on land with the others, and when he heard of his father's fall he made ready to sail away with the men who remained. 99. Of William the Bastard When the Earl of Rouen, William the Bastard, heard of his relation, King Edward's, death, and also that Harold Godwin's son was chosen, crowned, and consecrated King of England. It appeared to him that he had a better right to the Kingdom of England than Harold, by reason of the relationship between him and King Edward. He thought, also, that he had grounds for avenging the affront that Harold had put upon him with respect to his daughter. From all these grounds William gathered together a great army in Normandy, and had many men, and sufficient transport shipping. The day that he rode out of the castle to his ships, and had mounted his horse, his wife came to him, and wanted to speak with him. But when he saw her he struck at her with his heel, and set his spurs so deep into her breast that she fell down dead, and the earl rode on to his ships, and went with his ships over to England. His brother, Archbishop Otto, was with him. And when the earl came to England he began to plunder, and take possession of the land as he came along. Earl William was stouter and stronger than other men, a great horseman and warrior, but somewhat stern. And a very sensible man, but not considered a man to be relied on. 100. Fall of King Harold Godwinson King Harold Godwinson gave King Harold Sigurdsson's son Olaf leave to go away, with the men who had followed him and had not fallen in battle. But he himself turned round with his army to go south, for he had heard that William the Bastard was overwhelming the south of England with a vast army, and was subduing the country for himself. With King Harold went his brothers Sven and Gyrd, and Earl Valthief. King Harold and Earl William met each other south in England at Helsingeport, Hastings. There was a great battle in which King Harold and his brother Earl Gyrd and a great part of his men fell. This was the nineteenth day after the fall of King Harold Sigurdsson. Harold's brother, Earl Valthief, escaped by flight, and towards evening fell in with a division of William's people, consisting of one hundred men, and when they saw Earl Valthief's troop they fled to a wood. Earl Valthief set fire to the wood, and they were all burnt. So says Thorkel Skallison in Valthief's ballad. Earl Valthief the brave. His foes a warming gave. Within the blazing grove. A hundred men he drove. The wolf will soon return. And the witch's horse will burn. Her sharp claws in the ash. To taste the Frenchman's flesh. 101, Earl Valthief's death. William was proclaimed King of England. He sent a message to Earl Valthief that they should be reconciled, and gave him assurance of safety to come to the place of meeting. The Earl set out with a few men. But when he came to a heath north of Castalla Brigia, there met him two officers of King William, with many followers, who took him prisoner, put him in fetters, and afterwards he was beheaded, and the English call him a saint. Thorkel tells of this. William came o'er the sea. With bloody sword came he. Cold heart and bloody hand. Now rule the English land. Earl Valthief he slew. Valthief the brave and true. Cold heart and bloody hand. Now rule the English land. William was after this King of England for twenty-one years, and his descendants have been so ever since. 102, of Olaf Haraldsson's expedition to Norway. Olaf, the son of King Harald Sigurdsson, sailed with his fleet from England from Hrafnsir, and came in autumn to the Orkney Isles, where the event had happened that Maria, a daughter of Harald Sigurdsson, died a sudden death the very day and hour her father, King Harald, fell. Olaf remained there all winter, but the summer after he proceeded east to Norway, 
where he was proclaimed king along with his brother Magnus. Queen Elisif came from the west, along with her stepson Olaf and her daughter Ingigerd. There came also with Olaf over the West Sea Skjöl, a son of Earl Toast, and who since has been called the king's foster son, and his brother Kettlecrock. Both were gallant men, of high family in England, and both were very intelligent. And the brothers were much beloved by King Olaf. Kettlecrock went north to Halagaland, where King Olaf procured him a good marriage, and from him are descended many great people. Skjöl, the king's foster son, was a very clever man, and the handsomest man that could be seen. He was the commander of King Olaf's court men, spoke at the things, won, and took part in all the country affairs with the king. The king offered to give Skjöl whatever district in Norway he liked, with all the income and duties that belonged to the king in it. Skjöl thanked him very much for the offer, but said he would rather have something else from him. For if there came a shift of kings, said he, the gift might come to nothing. I would rather take some properties lying near to the merchant towns, where you, sire, usually take up your abode, and then I would enjoy your Yule feasts. The king agreed to this, and conferred on him lands eastward at Konungahela, Oslo, Tunsberg, Sarpsborg, Bergen, and north at Nidaros. These were nearly the best properties at each place, and have since descended to the family branches which came from Skjöl. King Olaf gave Skjöl his female relative, Gudrun, the daughter of Nefstein, in marriage. Her mother was Ingerid, a daughter of Sigurd Seer and Asta, King Olaf the Saint's mother. Ingerid was a sister of King Olaf the Saint and of King Harald. Skjöl and Gudrun's son was Asolf of Rain, who married Thora, a daughter of Skopt Ogmundsen. Asolf's and Thora's son was Guthorm of Rain, father of Bard, and grandfather of King Inga and of Duke Skjöl. End notes. 1. Another instance of the Old Norse or Icelandic tongue. Having been generally known in a part of England. 103. Of King Harald Sigurdsson. One year after King Harald's fall his body was transported from England north to Nidaros, and was buried in Mary Church, which he had built. It was a common observation that King Harald distinguished himself above all other men by wisdom and resources of mind, whether he had to take a resolution suddenly for himself and others, or after long deliberation. He was, also, above all other men, bold, brave, and lucky, until his dying day, as above related, and bravery is half victory. So says Theodolf. Harald, who till his dying day, came off the best in many a fray, had one good rule in battle plain, in Sealand and elsewhere, to gain, that, be his foe's strength more or less. Courage is always half success. King Harold was a handsome man, of noble appearance, his hair and beard yellow. He had a short beard, and long mustaches. The one eyebrow was somewhat higher than the other. He had large hands, one, and feet, but these were well made. His height was five L's. He was stern and severe to his enemies, and avenged cruelly all opposition or misdeed. So says Theodolf. Severe alike to friends or foes. Who dared his royal will oppose. Severe in discipline to hold. His men at arms wild and bold. Severe the bonds to repress. Severe to punish all excess. Severe was Harold, but we call. That just which was alike to all. King Harold was most greedy of power, and of all distinction and honor. He was bountiful to the friends who suited him. So says Theodolf. I got from him, in sea fight strong. A mark of gold for my ship song. Merit in any way. He generously would pay. King Harold was fifty years old when he fell. We have no particular account of his youth before he was fifteen years old, when he was with his brother, King Olaf, at the Battle of Stikelstad. He lived thirty-five years after that, and in all that time was never free from care and war. King Harold never fled from battle, but often tried cunning ways to escape when he had to do with great superiority of forces. All the men who followed King Harold in battle or skirmish said that when he stood in great danger, or anything came suddenly upon him, 
he always took that course which all afterwards saw gave the best hope of a fortunate issue. End notes. 1. It is a singular physical circumstance, that in almost all. The swords of those ages to be found in the collection of. Weapons in the Antiquarian Museum at Copenhagen. The handles. Indicate a size of hand very much smaller than the hands of. Modern people of any class or rank. No modern dandy, with. The most delicate hands, would find room for his hand to. Grasp or wield with case some of the swords of these. Northman. L. 104, King Harold and King Olaf compared. When Halder, a son of Brynjolf Ulfel the Old, who was a sensible man and a great chief, heard people talk of how unlike the brothers St. Olaf and King Harold were in disposition, he used to say, I was in great friendship with both the brothers. And I knew intimately the dispositions of both, and never did I know two men more like in disposition. Both were of the highest understanding, and bold in arms, and greedy of power and property, of great courage, but not acquainted with the way of winning the favor of the people, zealous in governing, and severe in their revenge. King Olaf forced the people into Christianity and good customs, and punished cruelly those who disobeyed. This just and rightful severity the chiefs of the country could not bear, but raised an army against him, and killed him in his own kingdom. And therefore he is held to be a saint. King Harold, again, marauded to obtain glory and power, forced all the people he could under his power, and died in another king's dominions. Both brothers, in daily life, were of a worthy and considerate manner of living, they were of great experience, and very laborious, and were known and celebrated far and wide for these qualities. 105. King Magnus' Death King Magnus Haraldsson ruled over Norway the first winter after King Harald's death, AD 1067, and afterwards two years, AD 1068-1069, along with his brother, King Olaf. Thus there were two kings of Norway at that time. And Magnus had the northern and Olaf the eastern part of the country. King Magnus had a son called Hakon, who was fostered by Thor of Stieg and Gudbrandsdal, who was a brother of King Magnus by the mother's side, and Hakon was a most agreeable man. After King Harald Sigurdsson's death the Danish king Sven let it be known that the peace between the Northmen and the Danes was at an end, and insisted that the league between Harald and Sven was not for longer time than their lives. There was a levy in both kingdoms. Harald's sons called out the whole people in Norway for procuring men and ships, and Sven set out from the south with the Danish army. Messengers then went between with proposals for a peace. And the Northmen said they would either have the same league as was concluded between King Harald and Sven, or otherwise give battle instantly on the spot. Verses were made on this occasion, viz. Ready for war or peace. King Olaf will not cease. From foeman's hand. To guard his land. So says also Stein Herdeisen in his Song of Olaf. From Thrandjum town, wherein repose. The holy king defies his foes. Another Olaf will defend. His kingdom from the greedy Sven. King Olaf had both power and right. And the saint's favor in the fight. The saint will ne'er his kin forsake. And let Sven Ulf's son Norway take. In this manner friendship was concluded between the kings and peace between the countries. King Magnus fell ill and died of the ringworm disease, after being ill for some time. He died and was buried at Nidaros. He was an amiable king and bewailed by the people. Saga of Olaf Kyr Preliminary Remarks Snorri's account of Olaf Kyr corresponds with the statements found in The Grip, Fagerskinna, and Morkinskinna. There are but few events in Olaf's long reign, and hence he is very appropriately called the Quiet, Kyr. As Hildebrand says, this saga seems to be written simply to fill out the empty space between Harald Hardraid and Magnus Barefoot. Skalds quoted in this saga are, Stein Herdeisen and Stuff. 1. Olaf's Personal Appearance Olaf remained sole king of Norway after the death, AD 1069, of his brother King Magnus. Olaf was a stout man, well grown in limbs, 
and every one said a handsomer man could not be seen, nor of a nobler appearance. His hair was yellow as silk, and became him well, his skin was white and fine over all his body, his eyes beautiful, and his limbs well proportioned. He was rather silent in general, and did not speak much even at things. But he was merry in drinking parties. He loved drinking much, and was talkative enough then, but quite peaceful. He was cheerful in conversation, peacefully inclined during all his reign, and loving gentleness and moderation in all things. Stein Herdeisen speaks thus of him. Our Thrandjum king is brave and wise. His love of peace our bonds prize. By friendly word and ready hand. He holds good peace through every land. He is for all a lucky star. England he frightens from a war. The stiff-necked Danes he drives to peace. Troubles by his good influence cease. 2. Of King Olaf's manner of living. It was the fashion in Norway in old times for the king's high seat to be on the middle of a long bench, and the ale was handed across the fire, one, but King Olaf had his high seat made on a high bench across the room. He also first had chimney places in the rooms, and the floors strewed both summer and winter. In King Olaf's time many merchant towns arose in Norway, and many new ones were founded. Thus King Olaf founded a merchant town at Bergen, where very soon many wealthy people settled themselves, and it was regularly frequented by merchants from foreign lands. He had the foundations laid for the large Christ church, which was to be a stone church, but in his time there was little done to it. Besides, he completed the old Christ church, which was of wood. King Olaf also had a great feasting house built in Nidaros, and in many other merchant towns, where before there were only private feasts. And in his time no one could drink in Norway but in these houses, adorned for the purpose with branches and leaves, and which stood under the king's protection. The great guild bell in Thrandjum, which was called the pride of the town, told to call together to these guilds. The guild brethren built Margaret's church in Nidaros of stone. In King Olaf's time there were general entertainments and hand-in-hand -hand feasts. At this time also much unusual splendor and foreign customs and fashions in the cut of clothes were introduced, as, for instance, costly hose plaited about the legs. Some had gold rings about the legs, and also used coats which had lists down the sides, and arms five ells long, and so narrow that they must be drawn up with ties, and lay in folds all the way up to the shoulders. The shoes were high, and all edged with silk, or even with gold. Many other kinds of wonderful ornaments were used at that time. End notes. 1. We may understand the arrangement by supposing the fire in the middle of the room, the smoke escaping by a hole in the roof, and a long bench on each side of the fire. One bench. Occupied by the high seat of the king and great guests, the other by the rest of the guests, and the cup handed across. The fire, which appears to have had a religious meaning. Previous to the introduction of Christianity. L. 3. Fashion of King Olaf's Court. King Olaf used the fashion, which was introduced from the courts of foreign kings, of letting his grand butler stand at the end of the table, and fill the table cups for himself and the other distinguished guests who sat at the table. He had also torch-bearers, who held as many candles at the table as there were guests of distinction present. There was also a marshal's bench outside of the table circle, where the marshal and other persons of distinction sat with their faces towards the high seat. King Harold, and the kings before him, used to drink out of deer horn. And the ale was handed from the high seat to the other side over the fire, and he drank to the memory of any one he thought of. So says Stuff the Scald. He who in battle is the first. And now in peace is best to trust. A welcome, hearty, and sincere. Gave to me on my coming here. He whom the ravens watch with care. He who the gold rings does not spare. A golden horn full to the brink. Gave me himself at Haug to drink. 4. Arrangement of King Olaf's Court. King Olaf had 120 courtmen at arms, and 60 pursuivants, besides 60 house servants, who provided what was wanted for the king's house wherever it might be, or did other work required for the king. 
When the bonds asked why he kept a greater retinue than the law allowed, or former kings kept when they went in guest quarters or feasts which the bonds had to provide for them, the king answered. It does not happen that I rule the kingdom better, or produce greater respect for me than ye had for my father, although I have one half more people than he had. I do not by any means do it merely to plague you, or to make your condition harder than formerly. 5. King Sven Ulfsson's Death King Sven Ulfsson died ten years after the fall of both the heralds, A.D. 1076. After him his son, Harald Hein, was king for three years, A.D. 1077-1080, then Canute the Holy for seven years, A.D. 1081-1087, afterwards Olaf, King Sven's third son, for eight years, A.D. 1088-1095. Then Eirik the Good, Sven's fourth son, for eight winters, A.D. 1096-1103. Olaf, the king of Norway, was married to Ingerid, a daughter of Sven, the Danish king. And Olaf, the Danish king Sven's son, married Ingegerd, a daughter of King Harald, and sister of King Olaf of Norway. King Olaf Haraldson, who was called by some Olaf Kyr, but by many Olaf the Bond, had a son by Thora, Joan's daughter, who was called Magnus, and was one of the handsomest lads that could be seen, and was promising in every respect. He was brought up in the king's court. 6. Miracles of King Olaf the Saint King Olaf had a church of stone built in Nidaros, on the spot where King Olaf's body had first been buried, and the altar was placed directly over the spot where the king's grave had been. This church was consecrated and called Christ Church. And King Olaf's shrine was removed to it, and was placed before the altar, and many miracles took place there. The following summer, on the same day of the year as the church was consecrated, which was the day before Olafsmas, there was a great assemblage of people, and then a blind man was restored to sight. And on the mass day itself, when the shrine and the holy relics were taken out and carried, and the shrine itself, according to custom, was taken and set down in the churchyard, a man who had long been dumb recovered his speech again. And sang with flowing tongue praise hymns to God, and to the honor of King Olaf the Saint. The third miracle was of a woman who had come from Svithjad, and had suffered much distress on this pilgrimage from her blindness, but trusting in God's mercy, had come travelling to this solemnity. She was led blind into the church to hear Mass this day, but before the service was ended she saw with both eyes, and got her sight fully and clearly, although she had been blind fourteen years. She returned with great joy, praising God and King Olaf the Saint. 7. Of the Shrine of King Olaf the Saint there happened a circumstance in Nidaros, when King Olaf's coffin was being carried about through the streets, that it became so heavy that people could not lift it from the spot. Now when the coffin was set down, the street was broken up to see what was under it at that spot, and the body of a child was found which had been murdered and concealed there. The body was carried away, the street put in order again as it had been before, and the shrine carried on according to custom. 8. King Olaf was blessed with peace. In the days of King Olaf there were bountiful harvests in Norway and many good things. In no man's life had times been so good in Norway since the days of Harald Harfager. King Olaf modified for the better many a matter that his father had inaugurated and maintained with severity. He was generous, but a strict ruler, for he was a wise man, and well understood what was of advantage to the kingdom. There are many stories of his good works. How much he loved and how kind he was to the people may be seen from the following words, which he once spoke at a large banquet. He was happy and in the best of spirits, when one of his men said, It pleases us, sire, to see you so happy. He answered, I have reason to be glad when I see my subjects sitting happy and free in a guild consecrated to my uncle, the sainted King Olaf. In the days of my father these people were subjected to much terror and fear. The most of them concealed their gold and their precious things, but now I see glittering on his person what each one owns, and your freedom is my gladness. In his reign there was no strife, and he protected himself and his realm against enemies abroad, and his nearest neighbors stood in great awe of him, although he was a most gentle man, as is confirmed by the skald. 9. Meeting of Olaf Kyr and Canute the Saint 
King Olaf Kier was a great friend of his brother-in-law, the Danish king, Knut the Holy. They appointed a meeting and met at the Gott River at Konungahela, where the kings used to have their meetings. Their king Canute made the proposal that they should send an army westward to England on account of the revenge they had to take there, first and foremost King Olaf himself, and also the Danish king. Do one of two things, said King Canute, either take sixty ships, which I will furnish thee with, and be thou the leader, or give me sixty ships, and I shall be the leader. Then said King Olaf, This speech of thine, King Canute, is altogether according to my mind but there is this great difference between us. Your family has had more luck in conquering England with great glory, and, among others, King Canute the Great, and it is likely that this good fortune follows your race. On the other hand, when King Harold, my father, went westward to England, he got his death there, and at that time the best men in Norway followed him. But Norway was so emptied then of chosen men, that such men have not since been to find in the country for that expedition there was the most excellent outfit, and you know what was the end of it. Now I know my own capacity, and how little I am suited to be the leader, so I would rather you should go, with my help and assistance. So King Olaf gave Canute sixty large ships, with excellent equipment and faithful men, and set his lendermen as chiefs over them, and all must allow that this armament was admirably equipped. It is also told in the saga about Canute, that the Northmen alone did not break the levy when the army was assembled, but the Danes would not obey their king's orders. This King Canute acknowledged, and gave them leave to trade in merchandise where they pleased through his country, and at the same time sent the King of Norway costly presents for his assistance. On the other hand he was enraged against the Danes, and laid heavy fines upon them. 10. A bond who understood the language of birds. One summer, when King Olaf's men had gone round the country collecting his income and land dues, it happened that the king, on their return home asked them where on their expedition they had been best entertained. They said it was in the house of a bond in one of the king's districts. There is an old bond there who knows many things before they happen. We asked him about many things, which he explained to us. Nay, we even believe that he understands perfectly the language of birds. The king replies, how can ye believe such nonsense, and insisted that it was wrong to put confidence in such things. It happened soon after that the king was sailing along the coast, and as they sailed through a sound the king said, What is that township up in the country? They replied, That is the district, sire, where we told you we were best entertained. Then said the king, What house is that which stands up there, not far from the sound? They replied, that house belongs to the wise old bond we told you of, sire. They saw now a horse standing close to the house. Then said the king, Go there, and take that horse, and kill him. They replied, We would not like to do him such harm. The king, I will command. Cut off the horse's head. But take care of yourselves that ye let no blood come to the ground, and bear the horse out to my ship. Go then and bring to me the old man but tell him nothing of what has happened, as ye shall answer for it with your lives. They did as they were ordered, and then came to the old man, and told him the king's message. When he came before the king, the king asked him, Who owns the house thou art dwelling in? He replies, Sire, you own it, and take rent for it. The king, show us the way round the ness, for here thou must be a good pilot. The old man went into his boat and rowed before the king's ship, and when he had rowed a little way a crow came flying over the ship, and croaking hideously. The peasant listens to the crow. The king said, Do you think, Bond, that betokens anything? Sire, that is certain, said he. Then another crow flies over the ship, and screeches dreadfully. The Bond was so ill hearing this that he could not row, and the oars hung loose in his hands. Then said the king, Thy mind is turned much to these crows, Bond, and to what they say. The bond replies, Now I suspect it is true what they say. The third time the crow came flying screeching at its very worst, and almost settling on the ship. Now the bond threw down his oars, regarded them no more, and stood up before the king. Then the king said, Thou art taking this much to heart, bond, what is it they say? The peasant, it is likely that either they or I have misunderstood. 
Say on, replied the king. The bond replied in a song. The one year old. Mere nonsense told. The two years chatter. Seemed senseless matter. The three years croak. Of wonders spoke. The foul bird said. My old mare's head. I row along. And, in her song. She said the thief. Was the land's chief. The king said, What is this, Bond? Wilt thou call me a thief? Then the king gave him good presents, and remitted all the land rent of the place he lived on. So says Stein. The pillar of our royal race. Stands forth adorned with every grace. What king before e'er took such pride? To scatter bounty far and wide. Hung round with shields that gleam afar. The merchant ship on one bestows. With painted streaks in glowing rows. The man at arms a golden ring. Boasts as the present of his king. At the king's table sits the guest. By the king's bounty richly drayest. King Olaf, Norway's royal son. Who from the English glory won. Pours out with ready giving hand. His wealth on children of the land. Brave clothes to servants he awards. Helms and ring mail coats grace his guards. Or axe and sword hars warriors gain. And heavy armor for the plain. Gold, too, for service duly paid. Red gold all pure, and duly weighed. King Olaf gives, he loves to pay. All service in a royal way. 11. Of King Olaf Kier's death. King Olaf lived principally in his domains on his large farms. Once when he was east in Ranreich, on his estate of Hawkby, he took the disease which ended in his death. He had then been king of Norway for twenty-six years, A.D. 1068 to 1093. For he was made king of Norway the year after King Harald's death. King Olaf's body was taken north to Nidaros, and buried in Christ Church, which he himself had built there. He was the most amiable king of his time, and Norway was much improved in riches and cultivation during his reign. Magnus Barefoot Saga Preliminary Remarks The greater part of the contents of this saga is also found in The Grip, Fagerskinna, and Morkenskinna. Magnus and his cousin Hakon became kings in 1093, but Hakon ruled only two years and died in 1095. King Magnus fell in the year 1103. Skalds quoted are, Bjorn Krefend, Thorkel Hammerskald, and Eljarn. 1. Beginning of the reign of King Magnus and his cousin Hakon. Magnus, King Olaf's son, was, immediately after King Olaf's death, proclaimed at Viking king of all Norway. But the upland people, on hearing of King Olaf's death, chose Hakon, Thor's foster son, a cousin of King Magnus, as king. Thereupon Hakon and Thor went north to the Thrandjum country, and when they came to Nidaros they summoned the Aerating. And at that thing Hakon desired the bonds to give him the kingly title, which was agreed to, and the Thrandjum people proclaimed him king of half of Norway, as his father, King Magnus, had been before. Hakon relieved the Thrandjum people of all harbor duties, and gave them many other privileges. He did away with Yule gifts, and gained by this the goodwill of all the Thrandjum people. Thereafter Hakon formed a court, and then proceeded to the uplands, where he gave the upland people the same privileges as the Thrandjum people, so that they also were perfectly well affected to him, and were his friends. The people in Thrandjum sang this ballad about him. Young Hakon was the Norseman's pride. And Stig Thorer was on his side. Young Hakon from the upland came. With royal birth, and blood, and name. Young Hakon from the king demands. His royal birthright, half the lands. Magnus will not the kingdom break. The whole or nothing he will take. 2. Hakon's death. King Magnus proceeded north to the merchant town, Nidaros, and on his arrival went straight to the king's house, and there took up his abode. He remained here the first part of the winter, A.D. 1094, and kept seven longships in the open water of the river N.I.D., abreast of the king's house. 
Now when King Hakon heard that King Magnus was come to Thrandjum, he came from the east over the Doverfield, and thence down from Thrandjum to the merchant town, where he took up his abode in the house of Skjul, opposite to Clement's church. Which had formerly been the king's house. King Magnus was ill pleased with the great gifts which Hakon had given to the bonds to gain their favor, and thought it was so much given out of his own property. This irritated his mind. And he thought he had suffered injustice from his relative in this respect, that he must now put up with less income than his father and his predecessors before him had enjoyed, and he gave Thor the blame. When King Hakon and Thor observed this, they were alarmed for what Magnus might do, and they thought it suspicious that Magnus kept long ships afloat rigged out, and with tents. The following spring, after Candlemas, King Magnus left the town in the night with his ships, the tents up, and lights burning in the tents. They brought up at Hefring, remained there all night, and kindled a fire on the land. Then Hakon and the men in the town thought some treachery was on foot, and he let the trumpets call all the men together out on the Aerar, where the whole people of the town came to him, and the people were gathering together the whole night. When it was light in the morning, King Magnus saw the people from all districts gathered together on the Aerar, and he sailed out of the fjord, and proceeded south to where the Gulathing is held. Hakon thanked the people for their support which they had given him, and got ready to travel east to Viking. But he first held a meeting in the town, where, in a speech, he asked the people for their friendship, promising them his. And added, that he had some suspicions of his relation, King Magnus' intentions. Then King Hakon mounted his horse, and was ready to travel. All men promised him their goodwill and support whenever he required them, and the people followed him out to the foot of Steinjorg. From thence King Hakon proceeded up the Doverfield. But as he was going over the mountains he rode all day after a ptarmigan, which flew up beside him, and in this chase a sickness overfell him, which ended in his death, and he died on the mountains. His body was carried north, and came to the merchant town just half a month after he left it. The whole townspeople went to meet the body, sorrowing, and the most of them weeping, for all people loved him with sincere affection. King Hakon's body was interred in Christ Church, and Hakon and Magnus had ruled the country for two years. Hakon was a man full twenty-five years old, and was one of the chiefs the most beloved by all the people. He had made a journey to Bjarmaland, where he had given battle and gained a victory. 3. Of a foray in Halland. King Magnus sailed in winter, A.D. 1095, eastward to Viking. But when spring approached he went southwards to Halland, and plundered far and wide. He laid waste Viscardal and many other districts, and returned with a great booty back to his own kingdom. So says Bjorn Krefend in his song on Magnus. Through Halland wide around. The clang and shriek resound. The houses burn. The people mourn. Through Halland wide around. The Norse king strides in flame. Through Viscardal he came. The fire sweeps. The widow weeps. The Norse king strides in flame. Here it is told that King Magnus made the greatest devastation through Halland. 4. Of Thor of Stieg. There was a man called Sven, a son of Harald Feeder. He was a Danish man by family, a great Viking champion, and a very clever man, and of high birth in his own country. He had been some time with King Hakon Magnusson, and was very dear to him. But after King Hakon's deceased Thor of Stieg, his foster father, had no great confidence in any treaty or friendship with King Magnus, if the whole country came into his power, on account of the position in which Thor had stood to King Magnus. And the opposition he had made to him. Thereupon Thor and Sven took counsel with each other, which they afterwards carried into effect, to raise, with Thor's assistance, and his men, a troop against Magnus. But as Thor was old and heavy, Sven took the command, and name of leader of the troop. In this design several chiefs took part, among whom the principal was Egil a slack son of Orland. Egil was a lenderman, and married to Ingebjorg, a daughter of Ogmund Thorbergsen, a sister of Skopt of Gisk. The rich and powerful man, Skjal Gerlingsen, also joined their party. Thorkel Hammerskald speaks of this in his Ballad of Magnus. Thor and Egil were not wise. 
They aimed too high to win a prize. There was no reason in their plan. And it hurt many a Yudelman. The stone, too great for them to throw, fell back, and hurt them with the blow. And now the Yudelman must rue. That to their friends they were so true. Thor and Sven collected a troop in the uplands, and went down through Romsdal into Sunmoor, and their collected vessels, with which they afterwards sailed north to Thrandjum. 5. Of Thor's Adventures The lenderman Sigurd Ulstrang, a son of Loden Vigierskal, collected men by sending round the war token, as soon as he heard of Thor and the troop which followed him, and had a rendezvous with all the men he could raise at Vigia. Sven and Thor also met there with their people, fought with Sigurd, and gained the victory after giving him a great defeat, and Sigurd fled, and joined King Magnus. Thor and his followers proceeded to the town, Nidaros, and remained there some time in the fjord, where many people joined them. King Magnus hearing this news immediately collected an army, and proceeded north to Thrandjum. And when he came into the fjord Thor and his party heard of it while they lay at Herring, and they were ready to leave the fjord. And they rowed their ships to the strand at Vagnvik, and left them, and came into Thekstal in Saliavirth, and Thor was carried in a litter over the mountains. Then they got hold of ships and sailed north to Halagaland. As soon as King Magnus was ready for sea, he sailed from Thrandjum in pursuit of them. Thor and his party went north all the way to Bjarki, and John, with his son Vidkin, fled from thence. Thor and his men robbed all the movable goods, and burnt the house, and a good long ship that belonged to Vidkin. While the hull was burning the vessel keeled to one side, and Thor called out, hard to starboard, Vidkin. Some verses were made about this burning in Bjarki. The sweetest farm that I have seen. Stood on Bjarki's island green. And now, where once this farmhouse stood. Fire crackles through a pile of wood. And the clear red flame, burning high. Flashes across the dark night sky. John and Vidkin, this dark night. Will not be wandering without light. 6. Death of Thor and Egil. John and Vidkin traveled day and night till they met King Magnus. Sven and Thor proceeded northwards with their men, and plundered far and wide in Halagaland. But while they lay in a fjord called Harm, Thor and his party saw King Magnus coming under sail towards them, and thinking they had not men enough to fight him, they rode away and fled. Thor and Egil brought up at Hesjotun. But Sven rode out to sea, and some of their people rode into the fjords. King Magnus pursued Thor, and the vessels struck together while they were landing. Thor stood in the forecastle of his ship, and Sigurd Ulstrang called out to him, and asked, Art thou well, Thor? Thor replied, I am well in hands, but ill on my feet. Then all Thor's men fled up the country, and Thor was taken prisoner. Egil was also taken prisoner, for he would not leave his wife. King Magnus then ordered both of them to be taken out to Vamberholm. And when they were leading Thor from the ship he tottered on his legs. Then Vidkin called out, more to the larboard, Thor. When he was being led to the gallows he sang. We were four comrades gay. Let one by the helm stay. When he came to the gallows he said, bad counsel comes to a bad end. Then Thor was hanged but when he was hoisted up the gallows tree he was so heavy that his neck gave way, and the body fell down to the ground. For Thor was a man exceedingly stout, both high of stature and thick. Egil was also led to the gallows, and when the king's thralls were about hanging him he said, Ye should not hang me, for in truth each of you deserves much more to be hanged. People sang these verses about it. I hear, my girl, that Egil said. When to the gallows he was led. That the king's thralls far more than he. Deserved to hang on gallows tree. It might be so. But, death in view. A man should to himself be true. End a stout life by death as stout. Showing no fear, or care, or doubt. King Magnus sat near while they were being hanged, and was in such a rage that none of his men was so bold as to ask mercy for them. The king said, when Egil was spinning at the gallows, thy great friends helped thee but poorly in time of need. 
From this people supposed that the king only wanted to have been entreated to have spared Egil's life. Bjorn Krefend speaks of these things. King Magnus in the robber's gore. Died red his sword. And round the shore. The wolves howled out their wild delight. At corpses swinging in their sight. Have ye not heard how the king's sword? Punished the traitors to their lord? How the king's thralls hung on the gallows? Old Thor and his traitor fellows. 7. Of the punishment of the Thrangem people. After this King Magnus sailed south to Thrangem, and brought up in the fjord, and punished severely all who had been guilty of treason towards him, killing some, and burning the houses of others. So says Bjorn Krefend. He who despises fence of shields. Drove terror through the Thrangem fields. When all the land through which he came. Was swimming in a flood of flame. The raven feeder, will I know. Cut off two chieftains at a blow. The wolf could scarcely ravenous be. The urns flew round the gallows tree. Sven Harald Fletter's son, fled out to sea first, and sailed then to Denmark, and remained there. And at last came into great favor with King Eystein, the son of King Magnus, who took so great a liking to Sven that he made him his dishbearer, and held him in great respect. King Magnus had now alone the whole kingdom, and he kept good peace in the land, and rooted out all Vikings and lawless men. He was a man quick, warlike, and able, and more like in all things to his grandfather, King Harold, in disposition and talents than to his father. 8. Of the Bond Svenk and Sigurd Ulstrang. There was a man called Svenk Steinarsen, who was very wealthy, and dwelt in Viking at the Gott River. 